Hello there, welcome back to another episode of Decoding the Unknown. I, as always, am your host Simon. In today's episode, the Dial of Pass incident, what happens here if you're new, our writer for this channel, go, I say R, it's some giant operation. My writer for this channel, Katie, writes me a script. I'm going to read it, and then afterwards, Jen, our wonderful video editor, adds some music and some images. If you're watching, if you're thinking, images, Simon, what are you talking about? This is a podcast. Well, it's also available on YouTube, isn't it? So if you want to see the pictures that go along with today's episode, which aren't necessary, because of course, as always, I will paint a beautiful picture in your mind head on over to youtube and check it out look before we get started if you're watching this make sure you give a thumbs up make sure you're subscribed if you're listening as a podcast subscribe leave a review five stars except maybe four because you'd be like why doesn't it get started sooner that's not important let's just jump into today's episode gruesome deaths strange lights in the sky government cover-ups if that sounds like an episode of the x-files you're not far wrong however this strange case occurred in real life in russia in 1959 i recently found out that the x-files had returned i don't know how i didn't discover this or anything like that but uh i've got two seasons of the x-files to catch up on i heard that the x-files were still being filmed and i was like what but I saw last saw the x-files 20 years ago and didn't Mulder and scully go off and do whole other bigger projects and now they're back making the x-files and it's exciting what has made it even more tantalizing throughout the years is that while there are theories galore as to what happened to the nine young hikers caught up in this strange event, there's not one theory to rule them all. Nothing so far has adequately explained all the elements in the case. This is not one for the weak of stomach, because we're talking about the Dyatlov Pass incident. And with that Dyatlov Pass incident, I will just say, I know there's going to be lots of Russian pronunciations in here, which I'm, I'm just going to do terribly wrong. I'm so sorry, but I'm too lazy to look them up. And also, I just... <laughs> It sounds really bad, but I just like sitting here and reading the script and having a good time and looking up the pronunciations is a bit too much like work. <laughs> oh my god, let's just carry on the mystery. In early February 1959, a group of nine hikers led by Igor Dyatlov were camping on the side of a mountain in the northern Ural region of Russia. Is it just a coincidence that his name is Dyatlov and he was in the Dyatlov Pass, or was it named after him? Uh, well, I guess we're going to find out. This was not necessarily the best place for them to pitch their tents, but darkness was fast approaching and they had a big day of climbing plans for the next day. During the night, an event occurred which sent the campers scrambling from their tent in a mad panic, ripping it open from the inside to get out. Their bodies were found over a series of many weeks, some with no obvious sign of injury, others with huge trauma to their chests and heads. Two people had missing eyeballs, one had a missing tongue. They were not dressed for winter in the Russian mountains. Rather, they were all wearing items of each other's clothing, and some were in little more than underwear when they were found. Two of the hikers had high levels of radiation on their clothes. Others had burns on their bodies. What in the living heck could have happened to cause these experienced people to flee into the night and then come to a horrible, grisly end? Around the time of the events, other hikers and local people had described seeing lights in the sky. The last photograph taken from one of the Dyatlov group's cameras is a blurry image of what looks like at least two lights hovering about in the night. There were rumors that one or more of the group were working for the KGB. The hikers were in range of a military base, which only added to the conspiracy theories. In May 1959, less than four months after the tragic events, the case on the Dyatlov Pass incident was closed. Blame was handed off to Igor Dyatlov for camping in a dangerous area, and the official explanation given to cover up the entire weird manners of death was this. Quote, it is concluded that the cause of their demise was overwhelming force, which the hikers were not able to overcome. <laughs> That's not an explanation. That's just a statement of what happened. It's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. He was hit really hard. Yeah, but by who? Why? Again, come on. What? <laughs> it's not. That's not. That's that. No. Uh, excuse me. Could you be a little more vague there, please? What kind of overwhelming force are we talking about? A natural one, like an avalanche, or a violent one, like an animal, or a human attack, or maybe an extraterrestrial force, the flipping force from Star Wars? 
Also, calling it the Dyatlov Pass incident seems to tone down the whole thing a bit. An incident sounds fairly benign, or like a title from a Victorian detective story. How about the Dyatlov Pass mass killing event? <laughs> Let's get into the details then here. A lot of them ain't pretty, but it's mainly because of the range of weird injuries that the hikers sustained that this case has kept the public's attention for the last six decades. I mean, I'm vaguely familiar with Dyatlov, so I, d- I worry that I'm going to spoil bits of it. But I mean... So trauma and stuff can be, you know, avalanche, animal attack, stuff like that. What really I don't think I've ever heard explained properly is why was there radiation on their clothes? Like high levels of radiation? That is super bizarre. The lights on the camera and stuff and the KGB and the military base. I'm like, all right, yeah, maybe it was a military thing. Definitely wasn't aliens. (laughs) No way it wasn't the aliens. The History On the 23rd of January, 1959, a group of 10 people, 8 men and 2 women, set off for what they were expecting to be a challenging but rewarding hiking and skiing trip up the Ural Mountains. They had all completed many hikes and treks before and were all considered to be more than capable of finishing this expedition. In the time before cell phones and quick communication, they told friends and family they expected to arrive back at Vizhe, a very small town, by February the 12th. And that was that. Nothing was expected to go wrong, and if it did, the party was large enough and contained at least one person with experience as a medic to be able to sort things out on their own. The people in what's become known as the Dyatlov group were as follows. Leader of the group, 23-year-old Igor Dyatlov. It's kind of weird they have a leader. Like if I, I, I often go hiking and camping with my friends. I don't know, five or six of us. We don't have a designated leader because <laughs> we're not in the scouts. We're not 12. We're just like, what do we do? We're going hiking. Are we going to have to make any complicated decisions which we need to defer to a leader on? No, we're going hiking. That's it. Simple. I will just point out that the Dialogue Pass was so named after the, spoiler alert, tragic events that befell the party. It wasn't as though Igor Dyatlov said, Hey guys, let's go for a hike over in the Urals. I'll let you check out my pass. The Dyatlov Pass is located near, but not exactly in the area where the bodies were found. Dyatlov was studying radio engineering at UPI, the Ural Polytechnic Institute, as it was known at the time. Next, Yuri Doroshenko, a 21-year-old radio engineering student. Ludmina du. Benina, the youngest of the group at 20 years old, she was studying engineering and economics. Alexander Kolyevatov, a 24-year-old physics student. Zinaida Kolomogorov, a 22-year-old radio engineering student who had hiked extensively with Dyatlov. This is, seems to be a group of very smart people. <laughs> Yuri Krivonishenko, a 23-year-old construction graduate who had been part of the crew to clean up after the 1957 Kishtim nuclear disaster. Rustam Slobodin, a 23-year-old graduate of UPI with a fondness for long-distance running. Nikolai Thybo-Brignoli, a 23-year-old civil engineer. Simon Semyon Zolotaryov, the man... The old man of the group at 37. He was a late and mysterious addition to the party. He died on his 38th birthday. And finally, Yuri Yudin, the only surviving member of the group. He was unable to carry on due to problems with sciatica. They, that left nine people in the Dyatlov party. He was probably like, oh my god, <laughs> I'm really glad that I went away from the crazy eye-eating radiation situation. The remaining nine carried on with the trip, hiking, skiing, taking photos, and writing in various diaries. The group dynamic seemed fine, with no one mentioning particular tensions over leadership or romantic rivalry of any kind. The weather was noted in the group diary as being around minus 16 degrees Celsius during the day, 3.2 Fahrenheit, dropping to around minus 26 centigrade, minus 14.8 degrees Fahrenheit at night. That is bloody cold. Oh my god. You've got to be Russian to want to go hiking in that, right? Yes, it was cold. Katie and I, same page. The last entry in the group diary is the 31st of January, 1959. In it, Dyatlov notes that the weather had closed in and that they're making slow progress at a rate of about one mile an hour. They're extremely tired, but managed to make camp in front of the forest, ready to push on to the mountains the next day. The last part of the entry reads, quote, We're exhausted, but start setting up for the night. Firewood is scarce, mostly damp furs. We build the campfire on the logs, too tired to dig a fire pit. Dinner's in the tent, nice and warm. Can't imagine such comfort on the ridge with howling wind outside, hundreds of kilometers away from human settlements. This is the area where the now-named Dyatlov Pass is situated. This camping sounds miserable. I, I, those camping trips I take with my friends, sometimes we go in the winter, 
a couple of times. I don't really go anymore just because I'm doing this for fun. And I get there and I'm just like, it's bloody freezing. It's cold in the night. Even with a four season sleeping bed, the first time I forgot my bloody roll mat, you know, the thing you sleep on. And it was so, so cold just on the ground. The next night I just cut down loads of uh, bracken, not bracken, it's, it was winter, like a uh, fir tree, like little fir tree branches and put them down underneath me to keep me off the ground. And that made it better. But then I was like, why am I going camping in winter? There's like a meter of snow. I just don't want to do this. So I, I don't camp in winter anymore because I'm a big adult man. I can make my own decisions. <laughs> On the 1st of February, the group left some of their belongings behind to make it easier to climb the mountain and also have a stash of provisions for the return leg. It's then theorized that they went a bit off course on their trek and decided to pitch their tent on the north slope of the mountainside rather than having to backtrack however far and then to do the route again the next day. The mountain they camped on was Kolat Syachal, which has been translated as Dead Mountain or Mountain of the Dead from the native Mansi language. <laughs> Sounds like a brilliant place to camp. While this is a creepy foreshadowing, the definition is really more like meager or lack of game, i.e. not a place that's going to kill you, just a place that's not great for hunting. The Dialov group's target climb was Mount Otterton. This has similarly become known as meaning don't go there, a warning for people just to stay the heck away. This might be another mistranslation, however, and the name might actually refer to a different mountain further away in the Urals. The apparent Mansi name for the mountain, referred to as Ototon, actually translates as mountain with swirling winds, which doesn't really fit into the whole death omen narrative, so it has been ignored for the more obvious monikers. That night, something happened which left all the hikers dead, which has never been fully explained. We'll go into the theories in a minute, but first, let's talk about how the bodies were found. I, I, I'm regretting having my lunch immediately before recording this episode because the eye removal the it's just this isn't going to be a good time is it as previously mentioned the group wasn't expected back until february the 12th when yuri yudin had to leave them due to illness dial have told him that actually they'd be back on the 15th instead after a few more miscommunications bad weather and desperate attempts from family and friends to find out where they were a search party was eventually sent out on february the 21st which was obviously far too late to rescue anyone Dyatlov also hadn't filed a copy of the route they were taking anywhere, so that made it even harder for searchers to locate the party. It wasn't until five days later, on February the 26th, that a group from the rescue party found the Dyatlov group's tent. The front of the tent was propped open, but the rest was covered in snow. It was not particularly deep, and it was deemed at the time to have just been a natural accumulation of wind-blown snow. Searchers recovered nine backpacks, coats, pants, shoes, boots, skis, hats, blankets, foods, papers, a stove, and axe. Basically everything a group would have needed to survive in the mountains in the winter. Yeah, finding that. You're like, dudes, it's like minus 26 degrees outside, and we found your coat. Yeah, you're, you're not alive anymore. The tent had holes and was ripped in a way that looked like maybe someone had cut their way in. It was only after later analysis that it was determined that the cuts were made from inside the tent, pointing to the hikers having cut their way out in a great hurry. There were photographs taken of several sets of footprints heading away from the tent. One of the rescue party noted, There were footprints of bare feet but in socks. Some were from Valenki soft felt boots, and occasionally we could make out the tread of a ski boot. All of these prints were raised higher than the actual wind-scoured surface of the slope. We followed these prints from the tent in the direction of a spreading cedar, which was clearly prominent on the hill. First we lost, then we found the tracks again. They appeared again in the birch tree undergrowth, and then they went down along the ravine, which led to the Lozva River. From what rescuers noted at the time, the tracks that these footprints made seemed quite orderly and not evidence of the group sprinting out haphazardly into the night. I don't know, although leaving your tent in urgency, you cutting yourself out of your tent is a pretty urgent statement. It's like, no, 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 I couldn't, I couldn't do the zipper. <laughs> Just ripping it right open and then casually walking away seems like a bit of a contradiction. The only conclusions the rescue party could draw was that someone or something had forced the Dyatlov group to leave their tent in the dark, practically taking nothing with them. They had headed for the forest and not the supplies they had left the previous day, and they never returned to the tent. This is so creepy. <laughs> The first bodies were found on February the 27th, almost a month after the actual event took place. Under the prominent cedar tree noted by the search party about a mile from the tent were Yuri Doroshenko and Yuri Krivonoshenko. It looked as if they 
I built a fire, but it hadn't been enough. They had practically no clothes on and burns to their feet. An investigation of the cedar tree found traces of human flesh several meters up, perhaps indicating that they had scrambled up the tree to get away from something. Doroshenko also had a burn on his head and foam on his cheek, possibly caused by pressure to his chest. Oh my god, this is... I don't rem- my, I'm familiar with the Datlov Pass incident. I think it's come up in videos that I've made before, but only very briefly. I had no idea about this being chased by something and the burns on the feet and the like climbing up the tree to escape. That is so intense. Krivonoshenko had apparently bitten off a piece of his own knuckle. Good lord. Yes, this gets a whole lot grimmer, so if you're already wrinkling your nose up, prepare yourself for a whole lot of grossness. <laughs> Good. Yeah, I mean, to be fair, I do another podcast called The Casual Criminalist, which, uh, well, there's been beheadings on Greyhound buses and people eating hearts and children's serial killers. So, you know, my, my stomach has become a bit leathery, having been through that traumatic experience of a podcast. So, but I mean, eating your own knuckle, pretty intense. Neither man was wearing shoes or a jacket. They were lying next to each other when found, as it looked as if one or both had been moved post-mortem. Their cause of death was given as hypothermia. Later that same day, bodies of Zineda Kolmogorova and Igor Dyatlov were discovered. Dyatlov was found a few hundred meters from the cedar tree, wearing ski pants, a shirt, and a sweater, but no hat and, again, no shoes. He had some minor facial injuries, but he had bruising on the knuckles of both hands, similar to what you might get if you're in a fist fight and you punch someone really hard. He also had injuries on both ankles. His skin was described in the report as bluish red. He was found lying with his head toward the tent, perhaps indicating that he was trying to climb back up the slope when he died. His watch had stopped at 5.31. Kolomoga Rover was found under 50 centimeters, that's 20 inches of snow, by a search dog. She was about 630 meters, that's 2,066 feet, from the cedar tree and the nearest body to the tent. She was also found with her head towards the tent as if trying to get back to it. Of the first four bodies found, she was the best dressed, wearing several layers but still no shoes. This episode is so creepy <laughs> that I'm like in my dark office. It's the middle of the day, but it's dark in here and I'm looking around being like, ah, oh, there's monsters. I don't like it. Oh. <laughs> She had some facial and hand injuries similar to Dialov, and her skin was noted as being purple-red. Further investigations also found a huge bruise on her side, like she'd been hit hard with a bat or a bat on. The cause of death for these two was also given as hypothermia. Oh my god, there is a lot to explain. And I get, you know, we're obviously not going to come to a conclusion, because Katie said right at the start that this is not, uh, is still not explained to this very day. But I'm sure people have attempted it. And I'm truly curious how, like, all of this random stuff is, like, explained. I feel like it's got to be multiple things. Because the people, like, escaping the tents and the radiation and stuff, this has all got to be a series of events, right? Rather than one global thing, because that's just more likely. But, I mean, it's a lot to explain, right? Despite search teams searching the area meticulously after these finds, it wasn't until March the 5th, another week later, that the next member of the group was found. Rustem Slobodin was found between Dialov and Kolomogorova, also lying with his head in the direction of the tent. Because of the way the ice had melted under him, the search party concluded that it had been alive and warm when he lay down, and for whatever reason, he just didn't get up again. He had four pairs of socks on and a couple of layers of sweaters and trousers, making him the best dressed of the group so far. He was also considered the strongest of the party, meaning that he would be expected to keep going longer unless something happened to impair him. This might be explained by the huge fracture to his skull. Slobodin also had wounds to his arms and bruising on his leg. His watch had stopped at 8.45 a.m. His cause of death? Hypothermia. If you're wondering why it took the search party so long to find anybody, it's because they were basically completely blind. Any visible footprints stopped at a certain point, snow had fallen constantly, and the search didn't even start until weeks after the group had died, so they were completely hidden from view. Yeah, that woman was like 50 centimeters of snow above her. A dog had to find her. Searchers used metal detectors, but none of the Datlov group had any significant amounts of metal on them to make using them worthwhile. In the end, they just had to fan out and use rods to poke down into the snow until they hit the ground or something else. They did this every 50 centimeters, 20 inches, over a huge area, with no real idea where to look. Most of the volunteers were students, friends of the Dyatlov group, desperately hoping to find their friends safe and sound. One of the search party detailed how tough it was in his report. Quote, Every day we worked in deep snow, at least knee-deep, but often waist-deep. 
so we worked very slowly for many hours per day testing with the three meter probes sometimes when our probes touched something and we thought we'd found a body we would dig feverishly with full power shovels and hands but the snow would fall back finally we'd find something oh shit. it's a tree trunk we'd start again because of the difficulty of the search another two months went by before the final group of body was found on may the 5th a trail of cut branches was noticed and eventually a small den or shelter was uncovered the remaining four hikers had cut branches and piled clothes on them to form makeshift seats off the snow there were a few other items near the den but the knife used to cut the branches was never found about 20 meters 66 feet on by a stream they found the body of ludmilla de benina under about four meters of snow that's 13 feet she was also on her knees upright against a rock with her head facing upstream she had damage to her face with significant amounts of soft tissue missing her eyeballs were completely gone as was her tongue she had broken ribs on both sides of her chest her cause of death was given as hemorrhage following the chest fractures and internal bleeding she was wearing a brown sweater which later tested positive for radiation i feel like the 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 missing eyes and the missing flesh on the face has got to be animals right like the person died and then the animals come and did their thing lovely Semyon Zolotaryov was next to be discovered, right next to Alexander Kalevatov, and appeared to be in a position of protection around the younger man. Zolotaryov was wearing quite a lot of clothes and also had a camera around his neck. There was a deep wound on the back of his head, and his eyeballs were also missing. He had crushed ribs on the right side of his chest. Kolovatov also had major trauma around the eye area and some major trauma around the eye area. <laughs> oh my god yeah he's missing his eyes wasn't he and an open wound behind one ear his neck is reported as deformed but i'm not sure if that means broken or crushed either way not a good thing to happen to a neck his skin color was noted as gray green with a tinge of purple because he'd been lying in the water for so long his hands and feet were decaying part of his clothing tested positive for radiation his official cause of death was given as hypothermia the final person in the group to be found was Nikolai Thabobrignol. Like Zolotaryov, he was quite well dressed and was wearing a pair of soft boots that the hikers put on when they were in the tent. He had suffered a massive temporal skull fracture and had also got an injury on one arm. For some reason, he was wearing two watches, one of which had stopped at 814 and the other which had stopped at 839. These last four hikers were all found very close together, and despite the broken bones they had, there were no outside signs of damage in those areas, like bruising or tissue damage to the chest. It was later reported that the force needed to cause these types of injuries would be the equivalent of being hit by a car which definitely implies an avalanche right like a giant fast moving bit of snow that can hit you with the speed of a car or more it's also of note that the last four autopsies seem to have been reported in far less detail than the previous five de benina's tongue is just noted as missing and left at that for example <laughs> guys for one of the biggest mysteries ever you could have at least done proper autopsies although they didn't really seem very keen on investigating it did they what was it they said at the beginning it's like yeah it was caused by something they definitely died it's like thank you thank you so much great information as you'd expect after the long slog to recover the bodies and the subsequent autopsies and radiation testing on them there would be a thorough official report to try and get to the bottom of the whole strange affair right well no on the 28th of may 1959 just over three weeks after the final bodies were found the conclusion to the case by junior justice counselor lev ivanov was typed up on just four pieces of paper and submitted as closed so let's just recap the official explanation here and this is a quote considering the absence of external injuries to the bodies or signs of a fight the presence of all valuables of the group and also taking into account the conclusion of the medical examinations for the causes of deaths of the hikers it is concluded that the cause of death was overwhelming force which the hikers were not able to overcome it's absurd to say this this makes no sense and also considering the absence of external injuries are you joking they just had injuries their eyes and tongues were missing they got they look with they had the force of a car so we've got nine dead people various different types of injuries radiation mixed up clothing so what the heck happens here oh my god so many theories you could probably have a whole series on the theories alone to call some of them a can of worms is a bit of an understatement it's like opening a can of worms and then having those worms fall out into more cans at infinitum we're going to go down some weird rabbit holes so strap in and remember that it can't possibly be all of them or can it it might be easier to get the older ones out of the way first and for once aliens are not one of the other theories but cryptids are 
Yes, perennial mischief maker the Yeti makes a guest cameo in the Dyatlov Pass incidents. It's not aliens, it's got to be the Yeti, a creature that doesn't exist. It's like the abominable snowman. What's that other one? The, uh, there's the, there's the Mexican one, the Chupacabra. What's that one in the, in the, uh, in the Pacific Northwest that I'm totally blanking on the name for? Is it Yeti? No, Bigfoot, of course, Bigfoot. Also not real. Like that video, it's just a man in a gorilla suit, isn't it? There wasn't there even a dude who came out later and was like, yeah, I was the man in the gorilla suit. People were like, no, you weren't. <laughs> even though I thought he could prove it somehow or something. It doesn't matter. It's just not real, is it? Was it a yeti or some other large beast roaming around the Russian wilderness? I think we can cross this particular cryptid off the list, even though the Dyatlov group actually mentioned it themselves in a group newsletter they created during the trip. Although the original copy of the Evening Ototon had been lost, there was apparently a brief paragraph saying something like, From now on, we know the snowmen exist. According to recent reports, yetis live in northern Urals near Mount Ototon. There was also a photograph recovered from one of the group's cameras showing a large figure coming out from behind a tree. The missing tongue of Ludmilla de Benina also gave this theory credence. As why else would that be missing apart from that a yeti ripped it out and ate it? I don't know, that some other animal ripped it out and ate it? Some other animal that we know for a fact exists rather than some cryptid? The paper the group made was just a fun satirical news leaflet, not a scientific journal. The photo of the Yeti just looks like one of the group wearing full-on winter clothes, standing a little awkwardly next to a tree. I'm obviously no Yeti expert, but I've never heard that they particularly like tongues, and if they do, why stop at one? Sorry, snowman, I don't think you're responsible for this one. The Mansi. What is a Mansi? If ever there was an easy target, the local Mansi people were it. Ah, these are the people with the, the, the language that there was something, wasn't there? I did keep track of that. Sure, blame the indigenous locals and their unfamiliar religious practices for the horribly grisly end of nine young Russians. There's no evidence that the Mansi tribe were in any way involved in the Dartlov group's deaths. The area the group were hiking in was not considered sacred or forbidden in any way, and it was not unusual for hiking groups to have perfectly cordial interactions with the Mansi. No crimes had commit been committed in the area, and the Mansi did not have a confrontational or violent reputation. None of the diaries note any worries or misgivings about the local people, and the evidence left behind pretty much does away with any credible motive. Why would the group be attacked and then everything be left untouched? Nothing seemed to have been taken from the tent and there were plenty of things that would have been useful for people living in cold conditions. There were also gems, watches, matches and other things left on the bodies that seemed to rule out an attack for personal gain. Ah yes, when I go robbing bodies I take gems, watches and matches. The footprints leading out of the tent were easily followed, at least to begin with. There wasn't a sign of a large number of people present, and if the Mansi were the culprits, surely they would have used their know-how to hide the bodies better instead of just leaving them where they fell. They also aided in the search for the hikers and used their own dogs to help discover the bodies. I know that it's a trope that killers will involve themselves in the search for their victims, but this doesn't really seem to be the case here. Yeah, and I feel like the killers searching for their victims is like that rare example of it happening and then people are like whoa so they think it happens more than it does so these it wasn't these people <laughs> what about other human involvement then a psychotic murderer maybe an escaped prisoner or two there was a prison camp a few miles away from the group's final camping site so there was the possibility of criminal involvement except remember this was on a mountainside in the middle of a russian winter yet also they got hit with the force of a car there's an escaped prisoner with a car in the mountains that can drive on the mountains? Just no. If anyone had escaped and there were no recordings of this having happened at the time, they wouldn't be in a fit state to take on nine strong hikers by the time they'd reached the camp. Injuries to some of the hikers' hands might coincide with having punched something, maybe a person, but at this point, it's just not possible to tell. Also of note, however grim, is that none of the bodies had any signs of sexual assault and other strike against an attack by people. And again, the fact that many useful and valuable things were left behind seems to close the door on any sort of attack by random criminals. Animal Attack 
Picture the scene. You're setting up to cook a nice meal for your buddies on the mountainside when all of a sudden a wild animal, maybe a large wolverine, comes leaping out of the forest at you. It charges the tent, starts ripping it to shreds, and in its panic it unleashes its smelly spray stinking up the place. Everyone calmly gathers a few bits and bobs and heads off to give the animal some space and let the stench clear. Okay, sounds vaguely reasonable. It might even explain why the hikers left the tent in the first place. But then what? They all split up, fell over enough to give themselves skull fractures and died? There's no way an animal attack even begins to explain their deaths. So, well, next. I don't think we can rule out, like, animal attack post-mortem, though. Like the eating of the eyes and the tongues and the mutilation, some of the damage. Again, I'm assuming it happened post-mortem. The actual post-mortems weren't very useful or we didn't get much information about them, so... If their tongues were ripped out where they were when they were alive, it'd be a bit different. But I just think it's like scavenging animals. Some sort of mania. There are a couple of different theories suggesting that the group was basically off its face and everyone wandered around in a disorientated state until they all killed each other or fell down the ravine and died. The first culprit for this state is what's known as Arctic hysteria. As the name suggests, the cold conditions induce some sort of hysterical reaction, which can be passed around the group leading to confusion and ultimately their death. This hysteria only appears to affect native tribes though, i.e. people living constantly in that environment. The Datlock group were very experienced hikers, had plenty of warm clothes and supplies, and were just passing through. It seems unlikely that they'd fall prey. To this sort of thing also none of these so far explain that radiation or a bunch of other stuff that i'm sure i've forgotten it's pretty intense another strand to this theory is methanol poisoning maybe somehow the group ingested methanol that was meant for the stove and a few hours later it made them all blind and disoriented in their panic they all ran away and met with various grim fates while poisoning might explain why they left the tent that's about it. The fact that one of the group managed to make a makeshift shelter after leaving the tent and another had made a fire shows that they must have been thinking somewhat coherently. There is also no evidence that the group used anything other than wood for their stove. Also, I feel like if we'd done the autopsies properly, then we'd know about the methanol thing. I'm pretty sure that would come up on some blood work or some such. So what about magic mushrooms, or shrooms, as they're irritatingly called? Could some or all of the group have knowingly or unknowingly taken some sort of hallucinogen and ended up throwing all of their clothes off? Or was it a person or persons unknown who were on a drug-fueled killing spree in the Datlov group or in the wrong place at the wrong time? Now, it's not totally beyond the realm of possibility. In a book by Svetlana Ars called Don't Go There, she speculates that another indigenous tribe called the Kanti were under the influence of fly agaric mushrooms and had stalked and attacked the dialogue group, kicking Rust and Slobodin in the head and causing the chest injuries to the others by kicking or jumping on them. Ouch. The previously mentioned Yeti photo could instead be one of the group capturing evidence of someone following them, which might explain why they didn't camp in the forest as they were worried about this other tribe. While some things can be explained by this mushroom theory, it doesn't explain how other members of the group might have died or why nothing was taken. Don't forget about that radiation too, whether the group was attacked by drug-fueled loons or took the drugs themselves, it wouldn't have caused anybody to be radioactive. Yeah, none of this stuff would so far. The radiation is one of the biggest mystery ones. I'd feel like they were like physicists, right? They were radio engineers. Maybe at the university, like a couple of them would have been involved with like radiation somehow and their coats had been contaminated prior to going hiking? Because I can't see how you're going to get irradiated out in the wilderness, right? And can they date when that radiation started? Probably not. Remember how the correct translation for Mount Ototon is supposedly mountain with swirling winds? Well, maybe this is relevant after all. There is a natural phenomenon known as catabatic wind or descending wind. It's also known as gravity wind, and it can occur in mountains or over glaciers. Basically, a strong wind can roll downhill at huge speeds, wreaking havoc in its path. In places like Antarctica, catabatic winds are fairly common. They spring up out of nowhere and can quickly reach speeds of 15 to 20 meters or 50 to 66 feet per second. That is a mega wind. This could be a reason why the group hurriedly left their tent, and it might even explain why some of it was covered in snow if they quickly heaped some on top of it to stop it from blowing away. I don't know, if I was worried about my tent from blowing away because there's super strong winds, I feel like the most sensible thing to do would be to get in the bloody tent and weigh it down with my body, and that way I'm also not in the crazy wind.
If they were caught in hurricane force winds, this might also explain the trauma to their bodies if they were thrown or fell against rocks or were hit by flying objects. Yeah, that makes sense. Perhaps the strong winds also triggered a slab avalanche which finished off the rest of the hikers. Such rare events are almost impossible to reconstruct, but on the face of it, it's a credible theory if you ignore some of the other injuries such as the burns and why the backpacks and other contents of the tent were all still close by and not flung around everywhere. Ah, and now we enter major conspiracy theory territory. So enter at your own risk. Oh no, the conspiracy theories begin. Here we go. KGB special forces and other undercover shenanigans. This whole take thing takes place in Soviet Russia during the Cold War. That alone should have you reading the official reports with a liberal sprinkling of salt, but some elements of this case just smack of a cover-up. It has been posited that at least two members of the group were working for the KGB and using the trip to carry out some sort of secret mission, maybe to find some pesky CIA agents hiding in the wilderness. Yes, <laughs> seems likely. Remember that hastily added member, Semyon Zolotaryov? He had a shadowy past involving the military and sported cryptic tattoos that nobody could work out the meaning of. This might not mean anything, though. I've read enough tattoo mistake clickbait articles to know that a lot of tats are not particularly significant to the wearer. Yeah, <laughs> those favorite ones are where someone gets like a Chinese symbol, like from the... Oh god, what's the Chinese alphabet called? I don't remember, but it's like it doesn't make any sense. And there's the translation. <laughs> it's like, oh no, what have you done? His identity has been subject to debate over the years, and he was even exhumed in 2018 to check if he was who people thought he was. Turns out, he wasn't. While the skull in his grave matched known photographs of Zolotarov, a DNA test from a private lab showed no matches to his sister's daughter, leading people to wonder if the real Zolotaryov had been rescued by his KGB handlers and some other body planted in his grave. A further DNA test carried out by the Russian Center of Forensic Expertise, however, did find that DNA from the body of Zolotaryov's grave matched that of his niece. That's confusing. How can DNA be so different and so wrong? Are the two like different parts of the same body buried in that grave? This is weird and worrying. So maybe I should recant my previous statement. The story doesn't quite end there, though. The way the DNA was collected means that it could potentially have come from another family member. Zolotaryov's brother disappeared during the Second World War, leading some people to speculate that it was actually his body that was buried, leaving special agent Semyon Zolotaryov free and clear. Wow, so this was... That genuinely sounds like a super shady KGB way to cover up someone's death so they can go off and live some other life like putting the brother's body in the grave instead that is intense alexander kovatov has also been tapped as a potential kgb agent his source of income didn't really match the average wage a young science grad could normally expect and he had been given a work placement in a secretive ministry department straight out of university the theory goes that the undercover agents were meant to deliver radioactive samples to the cia but things went horribly wrong leading to the deaths of the entire dyatlov group it was also theorized that Dialov Group accidentally came across a group of special forces soldiers and were killed by them. Remember the deformed neck of Alexander Kolovatov? He also had an injury behind his ear. A blow to that area, plus a neck snap, is a special forces calling card. As previously mentioned, though, the whole group's autopsy reports were oddly light on detail, so we can't say for sure that these were his actual injuries. It's also been noted that it looked like Yuri Doroshenko, the first hiker found, had foam on his cheek, which may have been caused by a pulmonary edema by someone, i.e. special forces, putting pressure on his chest. While you can fall down a dark spiral where this all seems perfectly credible, and I have to say right now, I'm like, this is it. The special forces did it. I mean, the guy, the two guys who potentially work for the CIA, the radiation, the... I don't know this the 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 autopsies not being done properly and you know I'm sure they're done by the government in the USSR it's all like it's all very shady isn't it However, we have to remember that all the members of the group left the tent. Something then happened which prevented them from returning and either caused or led to their subsequent injuries and deaths over a period of at least several hours and possibly longer. A group of military agents attacking them doesn't really fit the scenario, although it's not the last time shadowy government involvement will pop up. Lights in the sky Okay, so was it our extraterrestrial friends paying a visit? Ah always a familiar one when it comes to the conspiracy theories strange lights had appeared in the sky in the area with other hiking groups in other parts of the mountains confirming their appearance around the time of the dyatlov group's deaths the mansi tribe had drawings of orbs in the sky and thanks to the launch of sputnik in 1957 interest in all things spacey and ufoe were to quite high point 
There was also an intriguing photo, the last on the roll taken by one of the groups showing at least two blurry lights. This theory states that weird lights were appearing in the sky. The group left the tent in a huge rush to capture photographic evidence and then whatever happens, happens. Ah, they were in a huge rush. Who is like, I'm going to see, I see some lights in the sky. I really want to go take a photo of them. So I'm going to cut my tent open so I can get out faster. I don't think that ever happens. You'll just be like, oh, I missed the lights in the sky, didn't I? That's a shame. And at least my tent isn't ruined. Were they attacked by an alien craft? There were trees in the forest that were burned at the tops, maybe by some sort of precision heat-seeking ray. Some of the hikers sustained burns, a strange injury on a snowy mountainside. And the lead investigator, Dev Ivanov, was actually told to remove all mention of unidentified flying objects from his report. In his later years, he said, quote, When E.P. Maslenikov and I examined the scene in May. We found that some young pine trees at the edge of the forest had burn marks, but those marks did not have a concentric form or some other pattern. There was no epicenter. This once again confirms that heated beams of a strong but completely unknown, at least to us, energy were directing their firepower towards specific objects, in this case, people acting selectively. I'm not thinking as aliens, I'm thinking wasn't there a weird secret military base nearby? I mean, directed energy weapons are a thing, right? They use those powerful lasers. I mean, I know this was the 1950s, but secret military bases. So, if even the lead investigator was convinced these lights had something to do with it, what other explanations could there be for them? It might be worth pointing out here that while the photo of the blurry lights fits with this theory well, other people have said that the photo was not the last to be taken by the group, but rather the first to be taken in the lab when the photos were being developed. The shutter was half open, meaning that to remove the film, the technician had to take a photo to advance the film and open the camera. The blurry lights were therefore just some lights in the lab. That's a disappointingly boring explanation, though, so let's stick with the UFO lights one. <laughs> <laughs> yes, like the conspiracy theorists have done for the last 60 years, I'm sure. Anyway, back to what else might have caused the light. There is a phenomenon called ball lightning, which is, funnily enough, a ball of lightning. It's pretty rare, but can last for several seconds and can even move around quite near to the ground. One theory is that atmospheric conditions caused ball lightning to appear near the Dyatlov group's tent. They all pegged it outside and waited for it to pass, but it didn't, and several people fell victim to close proximity electrocution by lightning strike. The victims by the the cedar tree did have burns and injuries that could be explained by a lightning strike. The lightning strikes could also have created an explosion in the ravine, accounting for the blunt force trauma that the group in the den suffered. So, is this it? A plausible, if statistically rare, explanation? Well, it's not really possible to say definitively, as there are too many other threads to too many other theories. The radiation found on two of the victims is still perplexing, as is the time frame with the hikers dying over a period of hours, if not a day or more. And there is one other theory that links to the lights in the sky, and that's rocket launchers. Does anybody smell a nuclear test launch gone wrong? A subsequent government cover-up? I absolutely didn't. And I'm thinking, okay, radiation, there's a lot of trauma that burns, okay. But then the whole area would be hugely radioactive. It's not like two people's coats or whatever it was. Or was it two of the people? They're going to be radioactive and no one else is. I mean, I'm pretty sure nuclear blasts cover a large area with radiation, not just like a really small place. If your nostrils are twitching, this is the theory for you. There were no official rocket tests on the 1st or 2nd of February. Allegedly. Evidence exists of a radiogram sent to the search party making mention of a meteorological rocket that was sent uh, that was seen in Ivedel, about 100 miles, 160 kilometers away on the 1st of February, that was also observed separately by a different group. It was suggested in the radiogram that the Dyatlov group had made the fatal error of leaving their tent to see what was going on in the sky because of this rocket. We can now expand on that theory by suggesting that either the military killed them for having accidentally seen some secret testing going on or their campsite was bombed maybe by accident maybe not the group in the den in particular had injuries that could be explained by being caught up in an explosion and maybe the radiation found on their clothes came from a nuke after the military realized their oopsie the scene was carefully staged before the search team came in hiding any evidence of military involvement you had me a rocket explosion but staging of the aftermath not so much. Why leave everything in such a state as to arouse more confusion and suspicion in the future? Yeah, if you did the military and you're covering up some sort of rocket blast that went wrong, cover it up properly. You'd do a proper job and you'd get rid of the bodies and no one would ever know. They'd just have disappeared and that would be that, wouldn't it? It would have been the least effective cover-up of all time as we're still talking about it 60 years later. Exactly. 
There are many other theories relating to the case, from other atmospheric phenomena to death by snowmobile, but let's end it on a slightly anticlimactic note. Avalanche When you hear that a group of hikers who had camped on the side of a mountain had cut their way out of a tent in a panic and ended up in a ravine further down the mountain, the first thing that probably springs to your mind is avalanche. Yeah, I mean, cutting yourself out of a tent is leaving with urgency. If your tent is being whisked away by an avalanche or you hear an avalanche coming, you need to get a tent ASAP, whip out that knife and just cut yourself out. They heard the noise or in the process of being buried in the tent, so they scrambled to get out and were carried away, sustaining horrible injuries and later dying of them as a result. The theory does seem to be the flavor du jour as the Dyatlov case was reopened in 2018. In 2020, the official report was that yes, an avalanche was to blame. Perhaps triggered by the activity of the group themselves, a slab avalanche took out the tent and forced the group to take shelter in the ravine. From there, they failed to survive their injuries and the freezing conditions and eventually all died. This is a neat theory. It also has a lot of holes. Why were the frozen footprints the search party found so orderly if the group were fleeing for their lives? Why was there a flashlight found on top of the snow by the tent and not buried under it? Was it left there accidentally by the government agency stages after they moved the tent to make it look like the hikers had just picked a really bad place to pitch it? How unlucky was it that this happened in an otherwise non-avalanche prone area? Although we keep referring to the mountainside, the slope the hikers on was not actually that steep, so how deadly could a local avalanche be? How do you account for the burns on some of the victims? How out a group of nine very experienced hikers could not even one person escape the avalanche or make it back to campsite? Why didn't Ivanov mention the possibility of an avalanche in his closing report instead of leaving it so vague? Loose ends. If you've been wondering about the mixed up clothing and the fact that some people were found with not much on, there there are, yeah, various theories about it. Sure, friends let friends borrow a pair of woolly socks or a spare sweater now and then, but every single member of the group was sporting at least one item from someone else. One explanation is that they were suffering from hypothermia, and a contradictory side effect of freezing to death is that you start to feel very hot, and it's not unusual to find people who have removed their clothes in very inclement conditions. Yeah, I've heard of this. It sounds so crazy, but apparently it's true. Like, you get so cold, and then you're like, oh my god, it's so hot, and then you take off your clothes and die sooner. If you're ever freezing to death, don't suddenly think that you're really hot. You're not. Leave your clothes on. It's also probably because some of the group died significantly earlier than others. The two men found under the cedar are largely agreed upon to have been the first to die, with surviving members of the group moving them to a more respectful position before pillaging their clothes in order to keep themselves alive. As other members died, their clothes were taken by the remaining hikers and so on. The group of four that were found last had time to dig out a makeshift den and use branches to create something to sit on off the snow, so whatever occurred did not kill everyone instantaneously. Now, come on. You didn't think I was going to forget about those missing eyes and tongues, did you? No, I mean, I definitely didn't, and I assume we're going to address it. It's wild animals eating after the body. Right? I mean, what else could it be? While being very creepy and weird, it's maybe not that difficult to explain. The bodies had missing eyes. Ludmilla Dubnina and possible KGB agent, for all the good it did him, Semyon Zolotaryov, were found right by a stream. They also weren't found until months after the incident happened, which is long enough time to be in contact with running water. The bodies were noted as decaying when they were found, so it's pretty likely that any soft tissue would be rotting away, and eyeballs would be either fair game for the local fauna, or maybe they just rot and fell out by themselves so, yeah i mean they are sort of the a big liquidy soft part of your body which is probably going to decompose fast right the tongue might have gone the same way Domnina was positioned with water running over over her head so it might just have rotted off she could have also bitten through it if she'd been flung against something due to an explosion or a fall through the snow oh that is nasty. Or yes, aliens could have removed it for their own nefarious purposes. No, they did it! The autopsy report gave zero detail about the tongue, apart from that it was missing. Sensational reports have said that there was blood in her stomach, meaning that she was alive when the tongue went missing or was removed, but this has been challenged as being a mucosal mass and not blood. So think what you like about that, but in my opinion, if you've suffered facial injuries and have been dead for months with your head under running water, you're lucky to have much of a face left at all. Yeah, I don't there's nothing mysterious about the eyes and tongue it's just human decay or animals or something boring it's been months of course your eyeballs are going to get all fucked up 
And what are the weird skin colors variously being gray, green, brown, purple, and purple red in the autopsy reports? Mikhail Sharavin, who was one of the first people to find the bodies of the hikers by the cedar tree, described seeing that their feet and hands were reddish brown. Igor Dyatlov's mother said she had trouble recognizing him at his funeral and that his hair had been gray. These colors may be due to frostbite, or maybe they were just flash burns from being caught in an explosion. Or maybe the real Dyatlov had been killed in a secret military operation and this was the body of an older person used in his place. Or, you know, maybe not. Or maybe it was due to something else. I mean, who really knows at this point? This is such a big mystery. I mean, I do really think that it was some sort of avalanche or something like that, and then all the other stuff is just explained away by a series of coincidences, like animals eating the eyes, the people having radiation on their clothes from beforehand, this kind of stuff. The the lights being the lab lights. It's all explainable. It's just altogether it's weird. The other remaining standout thing is, of course, the radiation on the clothing. Why were the clothes even tested for radiation in the first place? Is this routine for what he's found on a mountain? Whatever. Radiation was detected on a sweater Dubnina was wearing, she of the missing tongue and eyes, and on the sweater and ski pants of Alexander Kolvatov, who was the guy with the deformed neck. These two were both found in close proximity near the makeshift den they'd created. It's interesting to note that even after being exposed to running water for a few months, the radiation level in the clothes was still significant. Was it something in the water then? Unlikely, as neither of the other two hikers found in the same spot had any trace on their clothes. Also, the sweater Dibnina was wearing was not hers. When while it was not formally identified during the investigation, it's been speculated that it belonged to Yuri Krivonoshenko. If you recall, and I'd be impressed if you did, it was several thousand words ago. <laughs> Krivonoshenko had worked in a nuclear facility and was involved in the cleanup after the Krishtim nuclear accident. Now, I don't know how easy it is to get a lot of radiation on your jumper and for it to still be significantly radioactive two years later. Radiation lasts a long time, though, right? That's kind of radiation's thing. But at least that's kind of a reason for his clothes to have traces on them. As for why Kolovatov's clothes also tested positive, apparently he and Krivonoshenko had previously trekked in a site known to have been contaminated by the Christian explosion on more than one occasion, so maybe that's how they picked up such high amounts of radiation. Or maybe they were smuggling radioactive samples to the CIA in an undercover operation of some sorts. Your guess is as good as mine. <laughs> no, if you're guessing that, it's less likely than the radiation from somewhere else ex theory your guess isn't as good so there you have it a mystery that everybody has an opinion on but nobody can explain every aspect of while it can't be everything maybe it was a combination of things like a wayward rocket exploded by the camp which also set off an avalanche hey now that i mention that that does seem like a plausible theory newsflash i guess we've cracked the case or like when i mentioned this to my daughter she immediately suggested a murderer broke into the tent and set a radioactive animal on the ground <laughs> This is exactly the sort of thing a kid would come up with. Just, like, explain it all away, but in the most ridiculous way possible. Oh, yeah, maybe I should keep a closer eye on what she's watching on YouTube. Yes, Katie, you should. I know a YouTuber. I, I could recommend someone. <laughs> now there's a giant granite memorial to the nine dead hikers at the pass that's been named after them, and the Dyatlov Pass incident, with its wide range of tantalizing clues and theories, will remain one of those weird, unknown events that keeps history interesting. And on that note, I do hope you found today's video interesting. Ah, uh, I, I mean, I like the ones where we get to the end and it's like nice wrapped up in a bow with a solution. But it is also interesting to just speculate about the ones that have no answer. Look, if you enjoyed this show, please do give it a thumbs up below. If you're watching it on YouTube, make sure you're subscribed. If you're enjoying the podcast version of it, uh, leave a review. That would be amazing. I truly appreciate that. Apple Podcasts, wherever you get your podcasts, we love it. It's uh, five stars preferred, of course. But if you think it deserves a one star or two star, that's okay. It just hurts my soul. Thank you for watching. Hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Decoding the Unknown. As always, I'm your host, Simon. And this one today, the ghost ship, the Mary Celeste. If you're new here, if you're a new listener or watcher depending on how you consume this show it goes out as both a podcast and a youtube channel so there's that what a thrill katie writes me a script i've got it right in front of me right here did i say it's the ghost ship the mary celeste i've definitely heard of this there's that creepy painting that there's nothing creepy about the painting of the Mary Celeste. Jen, for viewers, if you're watching it now, our video editor Jen, I'm sure we'll put it up on the screen. There's nothing creepy about it except for the fact that you know it disappeared and it's appeared in, you know, all those like horror movies and stuff or, you know, 
I don't know, maybe just one horror movie where you've seen where th- this picture comes up and it's like, it's not scary. But because of the context, for some reason, that painting of the Mary Celeste is super creepy. Anyway, maybe you've never heard of it and you're wondering what on earth I'm banging on about. In that case, welcome. Good news, you're about to find out an awful lot. Let's go. Abandoned places have always held an eerie fascination for those of us left behind. This could be a house or even a whole town that has been left to the elements, slowly succumbing back to nature with a few creepy reminders of its past life remaining for those curious enough to go looking. And also, they do great as YouTube videos. Like I've got a channel called Side Projects on YouTube in addition to this one and several others, uh, if, you, if you didn't know. And uh, anytime it's like abandoned buildings, that's going to be a winner. <laughs> Then there's the other type of abandonment. The feeling that you've walked into a place and just missed someone. Everything is still in place, but there's no one to be found. What would make this creepier still was if the abandoned place you found was a fully stocked ship sailing in the middle of the ocean with not a soul on board. Oh my god, it's like it shivers down the spine. Creepy, isn't it? Welcome everybody to the mysterious case of the ghost ship, the Mary Celeste. The mystery. On the 4th of December, 1872, the Brigantine de Gracia. No idea where this ship comes from. No idea what language I should even be... It sounds kind of Italian. De Gracia. But I don't know. Under the command of Captain David Morehouse, well, he sounds decidedly less Italian, was on its way across the Atlantic when it spotted another ship coming towards them. Nothing weird about that, but this ship was sailing oddly and seemed out of control. The De Gracia tried signaling the ship, but got nothing back, confirming Morehouse's suspicions that something was wrong. As they got nearer, it was clear that no one else was on deck, so sailors Oliver DeVoe and John Wright rode over to check out what was going on. Luckily for them, they didn't find dead or dying crew littered about the deck with a wild-eyed psychopath lying in wait for them behind a pile of ropes. Oh my god, Katie, your imagination's running wild. Although, definitely if I was on that little rowboat going, going, you're just in the middle of the ocean. This is the setup to a horror movie. You're in the middle of the ocean, you're rowing over in some tiny boat with some other dude called, I don't know, John. <laughs> it's like, all right, Ollie and John going over there. You're like, oh my god, why is with this creepy ship we're gonna die? Using the 19th century maritime equivalent of Hello, anybody home? <laughs> Which I estimate to be Ahoy, be there anybody aboard? Well, they found nobody. There was some damage to the sails and rigging and some loose ropes flapping about, but the ship was seaworthy with no obvious signs of an attack. Months' worth of food and water were still stowed neatly on board. All the barrels of cargo were still in the hold. But the ten-person crew? Not a trace. The ship they had boarded was the Mary Celeste, another brigantine which had left New York in November of that year under Captain Benjamin Briggs. DeVoe and Wright found a ship's log, but there were no clues as to what might have happened. The last entry was dated November the 25th, a full nine days earlier. Pretty crazy that a ship, like 19th century ship, even a ship today, just abandoned, I'd be like, isn't it going to like hit some rocks at some point and sink? It's just been floating around for nine days. Also, the fact that there's no log entry doesn't surprise me. Whatever happened, everyone left really fast because otherwise they'd have written something, they'd have taken something with them. They left in a hurry for some reason. The only things that did appear missing from the ship, apart from the people, of course, were some navigational equipment, official paperwork, and the Mary Celeste small lifeboat. All things that you'd take if you were off that boat super fast. You'd be like, what should we grab? Navigational stuff. I I guess I'd grab the documents, like I'd grab my passports or whatever. I guess there's boat equivalents of 19th century boat equivalents of that. And uh, the lifeboat, because obviously you need the lifeboat. So where was everybody? Why was the ship abandoned in the middle of the sea when it didn't seem that there was anything wrong with it? Morehouse and his crew weren't the only ones scratching their head. Nearly 150 years later, we're still not sure what happened to the crew of the Mary Celeste. There are theories, of course, ranging from the possible to the bizarre, but could it also be that the ship was just unlucky from the start? Eh, there's no such thing as... I don't want to say there's no such thing as luck, because obviously there's such a thing as luck, but... It's like, yeah, that's an unlucky ship. It's a cursed ship. That chip, it, it's been bad news from the start. So that's just nonsense, isn't it? The history. Let's go back in time to 1861, 11 years before the empty ship was discovered. A newly constructed brigantine, almost 100 feet long, that's 30 meters, was registered in Parsborough, Nova Scotia, as a British ship under the name Amazon. In case you've been wondering what a brigantine is this whole time. <laughs> 
Yeah, I might have been wondering that. <laughs> Isn't it? It's a sort of small transport ship, right? I'm probably wrong, but I just didn't bring it up because I didn't want to embarrass myself, but I don't really know what a brigantine is. It's a two-masted ship with different types of rigging on the fore and aft, although to be honest, the term is not concrete and I got a bit lost in the weeds with all the gaff rigging and square masts going on. So just look up a picture if you care that much. Good news, I don't. Just imagine a big old sailing ship with lots of sails and that will do. Yeah, just, just do it. I don't know, that's exactly what I had in my mind. Some sort of pirate ship, just less piratey is what I had in my mind uh, all the time. As well as, oh, so, I mean, I guess that picture of the Mary Celeste, but in my mind, it's not even that clear. More I remember is just like, why is it very two-dimensional? And like, it's at this blue back. I just remember it being blue, like the background being blue. Am I even thinking of the, a picture of the Mary Celeste, or is it just some other creepy ship? Doesn't matter. Let's move on. What matters is just picture a big old sailing ship. It's not that hard, is it? As well as being an internet search headache in the future, Amazon did not have an auspicious start in life. It's like, I'm looking for a 19th century ship called Amazon. Amazon pops up, Amazon.com. Are you interested in purchasing a 19th century ship? In a bottle or just a regular ship? Her first captain was Robert McLellan, who was a part owner of the boat along with eight other people. In June 1861, on Amazon's maiden voyage, where she was supposed to be transporting timber across the Atlantic, Captain McKellen became ill. He got progressively worse, the ship turned around and they sailed back to Spencer's Island, Nova Scotia. After a mere nine days as captain, McClellan was dead and the Amazon's legacy was on its way. A new captain took over to sail the wood to London. His name was John Nutting Parker, but it feels like his middle name should be in quotation marks as a nickname or something because a pair of safe hands he was not. Amazon hit fishing equipment or a fishing boat almost immediately after they set out again and had to be brought back for repairs. After they finally made it to London and unloaded, Parker seems to have taken his eyes off the ball again because Amazon hit a smaller ship in the English Channel, causing the other ship to sink. Dude, you go on one journey on a boat and you hit two other boats? Why are you a sailor? What's going on? Parker was thankfully replaced by Captain William Thompson in 1863, but his bad luck wasn't over as it appears he had drowned in 1868. I mean, it surprises absolutely nobody because he seemed like a total incompetent. It's like, no, 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 he can't swim and he just falls off boats. Up. Well, then he's going to die, isn't he? Making him the second captain of the ship to die prematurely. Yeah, but that's not the ship's fault. He's just a sailor. Amazon seems to have behaved herself under Captain Thompson, with nothing notable happening until October 1867 when she was caught in a storm by Cape Breton Island in Canada and driven ashore. The consortium that owned Amazon declared the ship a wreck as it was so badly damaged, as they had no intention of reclaiming it. A man called Alexander McBean claimed it under maritime derelict salvage laws, which I think means that as the original owners left it abandoned, he could claim ownership without having to pay anything. That's pretty cool. It's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm saying he's like some sort of legal pirate. Wait, there are such things as legal pirates, though. Ah, oh, they've got a name. Privateers, where you could be a pirate for like a crown. So you could be like a British dude, and you're like, yeah, I just want to go pirate some stuff. And the British will be like, if you're British, they'll be like, yo, you can go pirate all the Spanish ships, and you don't just don't pirate the English ships, and we'll let you get away with it. And I'm like, that sounds like the best type of piracy. It's like, sure, you can't pirate all the British ships, but you can legally pirate the Spanish ships. I mean, I guess the Spanish didn't see it that way. And they'd probably be like, well, I don't know, set a bull on you or something. But uh, what are we talking about? Let's get back to what we're actually talking about today. I'm so sorry. These maritime laws are not like the laws of the land, though, so I wouldn't go messing around with anything until you know what you're doing. <laughs> Katie, no one was going to go do that. <laughs> People are listening to us like, oh, that, that, that does sound like an interesting career path. No one thought that. McBean sold it on pretty quickly as wreck ships aren't that useful or valuable if you're not going to do anything with them. Amazon was then sold on again in 1868 to the American Richard W. Haynes, after shelling out nearly 9,000 19th century dollars, which equates to just over $174,000 in today's money to restore her, Haynes registered his new toy as an American vessel. The bad luck continued, however. In 1869, Haynes' bad credit caught up with him and the ship was seized and sold to another consortium of American men. Who could have thought that the guy that buys sunken ships and restores them for an extraordinary amount of money would would uh, would have a credit problem. After disappearing from the records for a time, the ship popped up again in 1872, where it underwent a major overhaul to enlarge it and upgrade it, including a new deck. So, why am I talking so much about this ship, you may ask? Well, despite the renovations, it was still the same old willful Amazon, only when bad credit Haynes had it registered as an American ship in 1868, he also changed its name 
to Mary Celeste. Oh, that's my. I have to. I have to say, I just got totally lost in the story of this new ship. I, was, I forgot what we were talking about. But so that ship became the Mary Celeste. It's interesting. You just keep renovating them. This happens today. Those like huge. Um, what do they call them? Like the post Panamax giant shipping vessels. They adjust them all the time. The largest ship in the world. They ex- was it called the Knock Nevis or something? I'm pretty sure that's the one they extended. They just cut it open, make the like the two parts, pull them apart, fill in the middle with some more stuff, and they're like, now it's even bigger, isn't it? <laughs> it's pretty crazy. I always just assume they made new ships. It's not like, you know, when your family grows and you're like, oh, now I need a people carry. You're not like, well, let's just get, get the sedan, cut it open and put a new section in there. It just doesn't work like that, does it? Now with a new name, new owners, and a new captain, the Mary Celeste was ready to take to the waters once again. The Mary Celeste. Now that we're all caught up on the history of the ghost ship, let's go back to the story of the mystery voyage. The new captain of the Mary Celeste was a man called Benjamin Spooner Briggs. He was an experienced sea captain, and for the Mary Celeste's first outing following all the upgrades, he was going to sail her to Genoa, Italy, with a large cargo of denatured alcohol. Well, the first thing I want to feel like is, finally, a competent captain. <laughs> a guy who's probably, although maybe he's the one who loses the ship, or, you know, just abandons it. But also, the last guy crashed it twice, so, you know, that was a pretty, pretty bad place to start. Briggs came from a solid sailing background, with most of his immediate family also working in the maritime sector. As is usually the case with, spoiler alert, tragic stories, Briggs had intended to give up his seafaring ways and open a shop with his brother, as they both had an increasing number of small children to support. Oh no. It's like the guy in that, you know, every detective movie is like, four days from retirement. <laughs> Uh, not detective movie, a buddy cop movie. They decided against this in the end, though, and both ended up buying shares in ships instead, making Briggs a part owner of the Mary Celeste. For his first voyage as captain, Briggs was accompanied by his wife Sarah and their two-year-old daughter Sophia. They also had a seven-year-old son Arthur, but luckily for him, they didn't want to take him out of school, so he stayed in the States with his grandparents. His existence also plays a role in debunking some of the more Scurrilous? Sc- scurrilous? <laughs> my, my stupidity's showing. <laughs> Never heard of this word before. Uh, theories that come up later in the story. Sometimes when I'm reading these, I'm like, ah, oh, yeah. Ah, yes, not so bright, whistle boy. You is smart. You is important. During the refit, the main cabin had been modified to accommodate his wife and daughter, so it seems that the voyage was supposed to be a nice family trip while also carrying some cargo to Italy. That does sound really nice. Like, I know it's going to be months long and stuff, and you're like a sailor or whatever, but it's, uh, you know, just going on a nice, like, across the Atlantic trip to Italy with your family and getting paid for it. Also, you're doing denatured, wait, denatured alcohol is the time you can't drink, right? (laughs) <laughs> that's a shame you just like just take a little bit off the top Briggs wrote to his mother before they departed with some updates about two-year-old Sophia a few instructions for her if she needed money and he also wrote we finished loading last night and shall leave on Tuesday morning if we don't get off tomorrow night the Lord willing our vessel is in beautiful trim and I hope we shall have a fine passage but I have never been in her before and can't say how she'll sail that's sorry about like the <laughs> awkward reading of that it's like the 19th century words they're, they're just always a bit more awkward to read. They spell shall with one L. Brilliant. We know that Briggs had many years of sailing experience, so presumably he wasn't particularly worried about the technical aspects of their trip. Briggs chose a small crew and mentioned his regret that he hadn't also brought his son Arthur along after all. Quote, We seem to have a very good mate and steward, and I hope I shall have a pleasant voyage. We both have missed Arthur, and I believe we should have sent for him if I could have thought of a good place to stow him away. <laughs> says gotta find him a little locker somewhere sophia calls for him occasionally and wants to see him in the album which by the way is a favorite book of hers as well as wanting him to remain in school it appears that there just wasn't a convenient place for arthur to stay on board the ship when the mary celeste set off for genoa there were 10 people on board captain briggs his wife sarah daughter sophia first mate albert richardson second mate andrew gilling stewart edward head or Edhead, as I like to call him, and four German crewmates, Gottlieb Gutschard or Gutschall, Arian Martens, and brother Volker Lorenzen, or, and Boz or Boy Lorenzen. We have to introduce the Germans, didn't we? It's like, so I'm reading those names, it's like, boom, John, Peter, easy. Oh, God. Jer- no. 
After waiting for the bad weather to clear, the Mary Celeste left New York on November the 7th, 1872, and nobody ever saw her again. Dramatic voice. While the Mary Celeste was making final preparations, another brigantine was also... I'm just realizing I'm not even sure if I'm pronouncing brigantine correctly. Brigantine? 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 Another brigantine also waiting to sail to Genoa. This was the Die Gratia, meaning by the grace of God, under the command of Captain David Morehouse. Ah, this is the boat that finds them afloat. It has not been definitively proven that Morehouse and Briggs were friends or, or had met for dinner the night before the Mary Celeste departed, but they would have been aware of each other and were probably acquaintances at the very least. The day Gratia set off eight days after the Mary Celeste on a parallel but more northern route, heading for Gibraltar on the way to Genoa. On the 4th of December, 1872, land time, which was December the 5th in sea time, which I had no idea was a thing, but apparently the sea is living in the future. Yeah, what is that about? Is that still a thing today? I always assumed you were just in the time zone of, well, whatever time zone you're in. They have those lines that, you know, go down the globe and tell you what time zone you're in. Is that still a thing? Wow. The De Gratia spotted the Mary Celeste behaving oddly. This was between the Azores and Gibraltar, and there was no way that the De Gratia could have caught up with a ship which had left over a week before it. Wanting to find out what was going on, the sailors from the De Gratia went on board. Now let's talk about what the Mary Celeste looked like when it was boarded. You may have heard stories of hot meals on the table, a fire still alight in the galley, and the ship being in dry and pristine condition. We'll talk more about this type of thing later, but in actual fact, this was not the case. The scene to the crew of the Del Grey ship looked like this. The ship was in a bedraggled but seaworthy condition. There were ropes hanging loose and some sails were damaged. The main hatch to the cargo hold was secured and no barrels were missing, although nine barrels of the 1,701 were later found to be empty. Ah, ah, maybe they were drinking that. That uh, is denatured. So that is that the is that like methylated spirit? Is that the one that makes you blind? <laughs> Maybe that's what they drank it, then they all went blind, and they just walked off the side of the ship. I don't think that's what happened, but I'm sure there's a conspiracy theory about that. Also, this ship, in my mind, was not that big. But it had 1,701 barrels on board? It's a big ship. They could have just taken 1,700 and, you know, put Peter at whatever the kid's name is in a barrel. A disassembled pump was found on the deck, one of two that Mary Celeste had. There was over three feet, one meter of water in the ship's hull. The small lifeboat was not there. The only things that were obviously missing were a chronometer and a sextant, which were essential tools for navigation and timekeeping, as well as the ship's register and, of course, the entire crew. The daily log was still there, which put the most recent position of the Mary Celeste as near Santa Maria Island in the Azores. This entry was dated November the 25th, which was nine days earlier. When the De Gratia found it, the Mary Celeste was around 400 nautical miles, that's 740 kilometers, away from where the last entry said it was. With nothing to be done, Morehouse decided to sail the Mary Celeste to Gibraltar and claim it as salvage, for which he could expect to get quite a chunk of change under maritime law. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> this is some intense finders keepers. It's like, yeah, I was just sailing along and discovered a massive boat full of booze. And also, it seems like a pretty nice boat. Mine now. I feel like the company or whoever, like, wasn't there a brother who owns like half of it? Be like, my dude, you can get like a little bit of it, but I want my boat back and I want my alcohol back. I've no idea how this works. Maritime law is totally nuts. If you recovered, say, an abandoned truck filled with stuff and notified authorities or drove to the police station yourself, surely the original owners would be located and then goods return to them. Exactly. Katie and I are on the same page on this one. Like, <laughs> I feel like you'd get like 10%. Isn't the maritime thing like you get 10% of what you find or something? Like if you discover treasure, it belongs to like the government or whatever, but they'll they'll like slice a little bit off for you. I mean, allegedly, <laughs> if I like found some treasure, I'd be such a piece of shit because they'll be like, yeah, it's like if I found some chest of gold and it was like, yeah, yeah, you got to, you know, you got to declare that to like the antiquities organization. And they're going to look through it and they'll give you 1% of the gold you found. I'll be like, I I'm just saying, I wouldn't do this. Allegedly. <laughs> I mean, I I look, there, are there must be plenty of gold that people find. And then they're like, yeah, I'm not just not handing that in. <laughs> I'm just melting that gold down and selling that so hard. That's gold, Jerry. Gold! You got to give people more than just a little slice, guys.
You may or may not receive a reward at their discretion. If you sold all of the goods yourself, it would definitely be a crime. I guess things are different out there in the world of the sea. Anyway, Morehouse sailed into Gibraltar on the 12th of December 1872 on the day Gratia with four of his crew. On the 13th of December, the Mary Celeste finally arrived. He's just shouting, look what I found, I'm rich! Having been crewed by the remaining three of Morehouse's men. However, instead of a hero's welcome, he found himself on the wrong ends of a criminal investigation and under suspicion of insurance fraud at best and murder at the worst. It wasn't until February 25, 1873 that Mary Celeste was released by the court and eventually made it to Genoa to deliver those damn barrels in March of 1873. So, well, thoughts? Let's get into it. Theories. I'm like... My my big thing now is, look, nothing crazy happens. It's like maybe there was a storm. Maybe they had to abandon the ship and then they abandoned the ship and then the ship, because it's a ship, managed to stay afloat. I know like modern ships, they're quite hard to sink. Um, but I don't know about 19th century ships. So it's like they abandoned the ship because they thought, oh God, shit's going down. And then it turns out that it's totally fine. That's my theory. That's my guess. <laughs> Insurance fraud. Well, first off, insurance fraud. They all died. Or like, I mean, 10 people disappeared. I'm assuming they're dead. It's a pretty shitty insurance fraud racket if you die. As we're here, let's start with the day Gratia, Captain Morehouse, and the possible case of abandonment for insurance fraud. There are two strands to this theory. The first is that Morehouse and Briggs were in it together, with Briggs purposefully stranding the Mary Celeste for Morehouse to find. Once the booty had been collected, the two would split the proceeds. Now, if this were the case, either it went horribly awry or Briggs and his whole crew secretly landed somewhere and spent the rest of their lives under assumed identities as they were never seen or heard from again. Yeah, I don't believe that at all, because at some point over their entire lives, there was, what, ten of them and a fam- the family and all of the other dudes? At some point, at some point in the next decades, that's just going to come out, because it just is. It's like why the moon landing can't be fake. Because, yeah, maybe at the time it's a bit more plausible because you'd be like, well, okay, you know, people can keep a secret for about 10 minutes and it's been 10 minutes since we landed on the moon. But then, like, what, 50 years go by? It's like no one spills the beans on it being like this cover-up? It's like, just not, just not happening. Thousands of people were involved. I'm sure tens of thousands. And no one talked. Yeah, right. Except for that one crazy guy. There's that one crazy guy, right, who keeps talking about it, and he was like a contractor for some tiny part of it, and he's like, no, it's fake. No, but that guy's just crazy. And he's just one dude, and no one else came forward to back him up. Please. Simon, this isn't a video about the moon landing. Get on with it, fact boy. Why Briggs would be involved in this scam is difficult to believe, as he was by all accounts an upstanding figure of good character. The addition of his family to the crew also makes it unlikely that he was planning anything nefarious, as he would be putting them at risk. He'd left his older son in America, which is again not something you'd do if you were planning to start a new life somewhere else. Well, what if his son was a dick? <laughs> I mean, unless the kid was really, really annoying or something. I swear to God, I don't read these ahead. The other strands of the insurance theory is that the day Gratia found the Mary Celeste in some difficulty, boarded her, murdered the entire crew, and sailed the ship back to claim a reward. Holy sh! So we just went from like finding a boat to be like, yeah, those guys are like some old school hardcore pirates. I mean, damn. Unlikely though this may seem, it was the theory that the Attorney General of Gibraltar, one Mr. Frederick Solly Flood, was working under when the salvage hearing came up for the Mary Celeste. He got it into his head that the crew of the Degratia broke into the alcoholic cargo that the Mary Celeste was carrying, got homicidally drunk, and proceeded to off the ten crew members. There was absolutely zero evidence for this, and even in the 19th century, people were capable of seeing whether a huge fight had taken place on a wooden boat or not. Yeah, they didn't have, like, elite CSI teams, but they also just weren't that sh**. It just, this judge is like, yeah, 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 and then they boarded the ship, and then they killed him, and it's like, judge, what's up? You're just making this shit up. What's wrong with you? You're a judge. Try and base things on facts just a little bit. One of the sailors who had initially boarded the Mary Celeste had reported seeing a sword which was immediately seized upon as a murder weapon. It was quickly found out, however, that the sword was not covered in damning blood as per Solly Flood's assertions, but rather was a bit rusty. Cuts and other damage to the boat could also have been caused by bad weather or possibly the original crew. 
Solly Flood's idea that the De Gracia's uh, sailors were drunk on the alcohol in the hold was also majorly flawed, as this alcohol was not yummy casks of rum or wine. I've seen various descriptions of the alcohol that Mary Celeste was carrying as denatured, industrial, and American. <laughs> Whatever that means. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like a British way of describing it. It's a bit shit, isn't it? Is that a dirty American alcohol? Nonetheless, this was not drinking alcohol. If the sailors had broken into the barrels and tried some, one mouthful would have been more than enough. It was probably toxic, and it's not likely that more than one person would be able to drink enough of it to then be able to go on a murderous drunken rampage. They'd probably be sick, go blind, or die themselves. So, sorry, Solly Flood. But your theory is utter rubbish. It's like there's no evidence for this, Judge Flood. Poor old Captain Morehouse stayed in Gibraltar throughout this damaging investigation and was finally awarded a salvage settlement in April, some four months after it arrived. Well, Gibraltar's quite nice. It's like on the south of Spain, the weather's quite good, there's a big rock with monkeys on it. I've been there. It's also weirdly British. For some reason, the British own it. I think I made a video about this on a geographics channel that I do. It's a bit weird that Gibraltar's British. But it's kind of nice you like cross over from Spain and all the cars are like they've got British license plates. I think they drive on the left at that. Maybe. I'm not even sure about that. No, that would be a bit weird, wouldn't it? But it does feel like they could, right? And the, there's that big mountain with monkeys. It's quite nice. The monkeys grab from you. They, they want food. To go to Gibraltar. It's a pleasant place. Why are we talking about Gibraltar, Simon? Get on with the story. The settlement you can receive can vary depending on how hazardous it was to retrieve the goods and whatever else the unpredictable maritime laws deem relevant. It seems like all the maritime judges are crazy as, as crazy as the law. Morass's crew had sailed the Mary Celeste back with only three sailors, meaning it was a hard journey for both them and the De Gracia, who also went down to five men. There was also bad weather, meaning that Morehouse was hoping for quite a lot of money. The value of the alcohol on board was about $35,000 at the time, or three quarters of a million dollars in today's money. And the whole kit of caboodle was insured for over a million of today's bucks adjusted for inflation. That's pretty nice. Although it seems quite reasonable. It's like a thousand something, thousand seven hundred barrels of alcohol and a boat? For a million, a large boat for a million dollars or million pounds, whatever it was, not bad. Ultimately, after all his literal trials and tribulations, Morehouse received 1,700 British pounds at a rough conversion. This would equal between 150,000 and $200,000 today, which seems okay to me, but this would be split eight ways between his crew, and it was only about a fifth of the worth of the salvage. Yes, kind of a bummer. That's not so great. Given that possible substantial reward amount, might he actually have been tempted to murder the crew after all? No. I mean, yes, it's substantial, but it's also like, what, 150 grand split between eight people. So what, you're talking like 20 grand each to murder like a cr 10 people, including someone's family, and then risk sailing their ship back and going to prison? It doesn't seem worth it at all. Also, the Mary Celeste had over a week's head start on the De Gracia, so if it had continued to be fully crewed, the two would have never been anywhere near each other. It seems that the murder for insurance theory can be safely put to rest. Agreed. It's a dumb theory. The paranormal. Oh boy, here we go. <laughs> Come on, let's get a little wacky. The eeriness of a fully stocked abandoned ship has, of course, given rise to many Weird and wonderful theories. Maybe the crew was zapped up by aliens. Oh no. Eaten by the Kraken or fell into the Bermuda Triangle never to be heard from again. I think we could safely discount the Kraken or sea monster theory as there would have been some signs of damage from said monster as it tried to grab up all the humans from the ship unless it was very, very dainty. And why would you abandon a large ship with lots of useful hidey holes in favor of a tiny exposed lifeboat? Did they fall into the Bermuda Triangle? No. The Bermuda Triangle is called the Bermuda Triangle because it's near Bermuda. <laughs> the Mary Celeste is also not real. It's not a real thing. There's no more ships lost in the Bermuda Triangle than there are anywhere else at sea. It's just an urban legend. Maybe I'll make a video about it at some point. Let me know in the comments below if you want that. I'm pretty sure I'm right on that, though, so it'd be a pretty boring video. The Mary Celeste set sail from New York, which is many hundreds of miles to the north. I guess we can never really totally rule out alien abduction, but as the Mary Celeste's lifeboat and ship documents were also missing, it seems a tad more likely that they left on their own volition. Or did they? Or maybe those aliens really needed the documentation for the boat. That's what they're after. It's like they're going to abduct those people, probe them anally, and also examine the boat's documentation. Because... Yeah, of course. Pirates. 
If it wasn't a sea monster or the crew of the De Gracia attacking the Mary Celeste, what about a scurvy crew of pirates? Not to pass judgment on the alcohol consumption of a band of salty sea dogs, but maybe their tolerance was higher so they could handle a bit more of the industrial strength paint stripper in the hold. Uh, I don't think that's how it works. I don't think if you're a really good drinker, you know, if you're really good at drinking, you can't go drink methylated spirit. It's still going to ruin you. <laughs> it's like, it's it's chemistry, not like how good you are at drinking. I realize being good at drinking is not the right descriptor, but if you're an alcoholic, you can't, you still can't drink poison. While pirates may seem a slightly possible theory for the deserted ship, the fact that nothing of value was taken puts the kibosh on it. They would have to be the world's worst pirates to forget to take the booty with them after capturing the entire cargo ship and again, no signs of a struggle, all cargo intact, etc. etc. Mutiny and or murder. Oh, by the way, I'll also just say that I'm, it, it, it's kind of it's kind of sad that the paranormal section actually gets a bigger section than pirates. <laughs> pirates were way more likely, even if still extremely unlikely. The two German brothers, Volkert and Boz, or Boy Lorenzen, have come under suspicion over the years. When going through the stuff left on the Mary Celeste, it was noted that none of their belongings were there. Could they have killed everyone, thrown them overboard, and escaped in the lifeboat? The biggest question here would be, well, what the heck for? All of the crew were handpicked or personally recommended by Benjamin Briggs. If the Lorenzens did do a mass homicide, there was no evidence of a fight, they didn't take anything of value, and why would they do it in the middle of the ocean where they couldn't, couldn't be sure of making it back to land themselves. It was stated by a relative of the Lorenzens that the reason their belongings were not on the ship was because they didn't have any in the first place. Prior to landing the job on the Mary Celeste, the brothers had been on another boat which was wrecked and they had lost all their stuff. Presumably, you don't need to bring much to work on a newly fitted out, fully stocked boat, so that seems to close that loophole. Yeah, I mean, 100%. This, there's, there's no motivation. If there's no motivation for the crime, it's really like, why? Just why would they do it? It just seems extremely dangerous and pointless. Other theories regarding mutiny have popped up, but this seems kind of stupid as the voyage wasn't very long, there was plenty of food and water, all the crew were experienced, and the only alcohol on board was a crap load of undrinkable stuff that was the whole point of the journey in the first place. And mutiny... I don't think so. I totally agree. This seems like a good point to add another string to the tangled web of the Mary Celeste story. If you've been thinking, I always thought it was the Marie Celeste, or what about the hot meals on the table or the fire still burning? Wait, I always thought it was Mary Celeste. Marie Celeste doesn't ring bells, but I guess there's another version of this story which has an incorrect name. Well, I'm afraid to say that you've been diddled, so to speak, by future Sherlock Holmes dad and professional meddler Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. If not for him, the strange... <laughs> I was like, for a moment there, wait, Sherlock Holmes isn't a real person, so he didn't have a dad? <laughs> but I understand. If not for him, the strange case of the Mary Celeste might not be the mystery that it is today. It's not the only ship that's ever been found abandoned in the middle of the sea, but one of the main reasons it's at the top of the list is the influence of a short story over the official narrative. In 1884, a whole 12 years after the crew disappeared and basically apropos of nothing, an anonymous story was published in the Cornhill magazine called J. Habakkuk Jeffson's Statement. I'm not sure how anyone could have believed it with a name like that, but it was written in the first person, as though this terribly named J. Habakkuk Jefferson fellow was a survivor of the episode. In the story, the ship is called the Marie Celeste, which actually flows a lot better than Mary Celeste. It does, does it? Marie Celeste. Mary Celeste. It does. And after the crew is murdered by a serial killer with a hatred for white people, it's left abandoned for none other than the correctly named De Gracia to find. The name Marie Celeste seemed to stick in the popular consciousness better than Mary Celeste, as did some of the details like the pristine condition that the Del Gracia found it in. In their first hand accounts, the crew of the De Gracia who boarded the Mary Celeste said, a lot of things were wet and disorganized, as though people had just dropped what they were doing and vanished. The ship's interior was definitely not 100% dry. Yeah, there was like a meter of water in the bottom of the boat. Conan Doyle's story then goes off on a tangent about a magical stone from a stone idol that had done enough to muddy the historical waters that even to this day... <laughs> What's a magical stone from a stone idol? All right, mate. So even to this day, his made-up events are still thought of as facts. As recently as 1992, the Maldives issued a stamp using the incorrect Marie Celeste name as part of its Mysteries of the Universe series. 
<laughs> Mysteries of the Universe sounds like it could have been a name for this channel, couldn't it? Although obviously their research is not as good. Government of the Maldives, come on! Now we've got the less probable stuff out of the way, let's move on to some more probable theories. About time, a natural disaster. Yes, now we're cooking with gas. While the term seaquake might seem to belong in the realm of the paranormal theories, it's actually a thing. I'd have never heard of a seaquake before, but it sounds exactly like what would happen if there was an earthquake under the sea and you get like a tsunami or something. Or like, if the bottom of the sea moved, like the plate was like chunk chunk to one side, it's going to drop all that water and that's going to be pretty intense, right? I don't even know if that's what a sea quake is. That is my speculation. Activity under the seafloor can cause huge waves and tsunamis, and it seems that the region around the Azores has experienced many significant seismic events over the years. Even a small submarine rumbling might be enough to jeopardize a ship, or at least make you think it's in danger of sinking, even if it turns out it isn't. A random event like a water spout, aka a sea tornado, might also cause enough of a panic to force the crew into the smaller boat. But due to their combined experience, you'd have thought that they would ride out their chances a bit further before everyone abandoned ship altogether. As proved by the day Gratia, the Mary Celeste was a bit battered, but otherwise in good enough condition that three people could sail it to Gibraltar, so you wouldn't think that Briggs and his crew would have been so easily put off by a spot of bad weather. Yeah, but you don't know how bad the weather could be. It would be like, okay, if suddenly a storm comes and it looks like it's absolutely not going to end, and within five minutes you've got like a, a, a meter of water in the bottom of your boat and it's just absolutely pelting it down i don't know it seems very reasonable that this could have been the case alcohol explosion remember that alcohol that the mary celeste was carrying of course you do how could you forget well whether it was denatured industrial or whatever american ah it was also it was not for casually sipping on Captain Briggs was a staunch non-drinker and was apparently quite anxious about his cargo as he didn't know anything about alcohol at all. So, what were those empty barrels about that we mentioned earlier? Were they drained by the Lorenzen brothers, the crew of the Del Gracia, or pirates? Were they decanted into other containers for some unknown reason? Were they perhaps knocked over on rough seas or during the previously mentioned seaquake? There were 1,701 bottles on, in the hold. 1,692 of them were made of white oak. The remaining nine, which were also the empty ones, were made of red oak. Red oak is more porous than white oak, which meant that the liquid contents were far more likely to leak out over time. This fact leads on to one of the possible reasons why the crew of the Mary Celeste might have thought it prudent to abandon the ship, if only temporarily. The fumes from the industrial strength alcohol would be pretty strong, and if you're a God-fearing alcohol abstainer with your young child on board, you might think it a good idea to hop into the lifeboat for a while to let things air out. That doesn't seem too unlikely on paper, but it doesn't really explain the apparent rush to leave the ship, as it would be pretty clear where the smell was coming from and what it was. So let's add some more pressing events into the mix. What if there was an explosion? That would certainly make you shift faster if some of the barrels exploded below deck due to the alcohol vapors heating up. That would be an immediate trigger to drop what you're doing, grab the barest of essentials, and head for the lifeboat. Yeah, if your ship is filling with a flammable gas that is absolutely capable of blowing up, you'd be like, guys, guys, we should leave now. What happens then is just even more speculation, but maybe the seas were rough or the tethering rope wasn't tethered enough, but once out in the lifeboat, the crew never made it back to the ship and instead floated out to an eventual watery grave. But wouldn't an explosion have left some more obvious evidence behind? Well, yes, after any other sort of explosion, you might expect to see scorch marks, holes, things get blown apart, and there wasn't any of this on the Mary Celeste. Also, it's possible. Like, you smell that alcohol, right? And you're like, oh my god, the entire boat is now filled with like vaporized alcohol. And if this burns, we're all screwed. Let's open all the windows. Let's pop out to the lifeboat for a spell. Let it all air out. And then we'll go back and get on board. That doesn't necessarily need to have been an explosion. That's the cargo was still closed and all the barrels were in one piece. The boarding party of the Degratia didn't mention smelling any fumes, although the ship had been adrift for almost a week at this point, so probably it had more than enough time to air out. It is possible, however, to have an explosion that leaves no obvious traces behind. Ooh. In 2006, a chemist from University College London demonstrated that an explosion could occur, but if a wave of cooler air followed it, no soot or charring would be left behind. 
For some, this is the answer to why the ship was abandoned so abruptly. There is more than enough leakage from the red oak barrels to be ignited by a freak spark from the galley fire, perhaps, or maybe there was just one poor idiot who dumped his pipe out into the wrong hatch. The only things holding this theory back are the fact that the main hatch was fastened and not blown off its hinges, and that the conditions necessary for this type of non-evidential explosion are rare. Still, even the possibility that the ship might be about to blow up would be enough to get most people jumping into that lifeboat. Yeah, exactly. I don't think it's that it was that it blew up. I think it's just like they were worried it was going to blow up. So they got off the ship, they got into the lifeboat, and then the tether broke, and they floated away, and the ship floated away, and it got knocked about a bit on the ocean. Seems like that seems by far the most likeliest thing to me. Captain's Mistake According to Anne McGregor, a documentary maker who made the true story of the Mary Celeste with the, with the Smithsonian Network, currently at 6.5 on IMDb if you're interested, ooh. This is the mother of all theories. It all started with a dodgy chronometer and just devolved from there. Using the location of the drifting Mary Celeste and backtracking its journey with the last recorded position in the running log, McGregor found that it was possible for the ship to have been where Briggs said they were just before abandoning it. It then sailed by itself for 400 odd nautical miles until the Dergratia found it. However, further information from the log, which was lost a few years after the Mary Celeste was recovered, was copied down by Frederick Solly Flood, the zealous attorney general of Gibraltar with an axe to grind against poor old Captain Morehouse. Assuming he copied down the last few entries correctly, McGregor and oceanographer Phil Richardson looked at historical weather and ocean current data and worked out that Briggs and the Mary Celeste were actually off course by over 100 miles. A bad storm was noted in the log the day before the last entry, and if they had been on track, they should have already reached Santa Maria three days previously. More pieces of the puzzle started coming together. The disassembled pump found on deck could have been clogged up with coal dust from the Mary Celeste's previous voyage and debris from the refit. Following the storm, the bottom of the ship would have been filled up with water. When it was found, the Mary Celeste had about three and a half feet or just over a meter of water in the hold. As proven by the fact that it was still afloat, this wasn't a dangerous amount of water to be carrying, although it's about the same height as an average five-year-old <laughs> child, which seems like quite a lot to me. <laughs> Like, that's how we measure height. We're unaware of three foot, but the average height of a five-year-old child. I don't know how tall a five-year-old child is. Children are one of those interesting things. Like, before I had kids of my own, and someone showed me a child, be like, how old is this child? I'd be like, I have absolutely no idea. But now, up to the age of my child, so nearly two, I could be, I could, I can accurately tell you. It's interesting, but in no way surprising. Get back to the facts, fact boy. The hundreds and hundreds of barrels made judging the amount of water difficult, and with the pump out of action, there was no way to quickly get rid of it. Having finally sighted land after being kind of lost for a couple of days in terrible water, maybe being in fear of the boat imminently sinking or exploding, the crew took their chances in the lifeboat in a gamble that ultimately didn't pay off. They either tried to row to land, which was still many miles away, or accidentally cut adrift from the ship, but either way, they were never seen again. Aftermath after finally delivering her blooming alcohol to Genoa, what happened to the Mary Celeste, who had now had another captain die on her watch? After being passed around a bit and wreaking financial losses wherever she went, she sailed to St. Helena in 1879 because the current captain, Edgar Tuthill, was ill. And guess what? He died too. That brings her total serving captain deaths to three, with one ex-captain who died prematurely so shortly after sailing her. In 18... I mean, I don't believe in any of this sh- but I'd still be like, I don't want that boat, thanks. I don't want to be the captain of the death boat. In 1885, her reign of terror finally came to an end when she was intentionally wrecked by Captain Gilman Parker on the Rochelois Bank Coral Reef off the island of Haiti. Ironically, this was all for an insurance scam. She was packed full of worthless junk, bought it to be valuable items, but still managed to get the last laugh by not actually sinking, so the fraud was quickly revealed. Oh no! The intentional wrecking of the ship was a crime known as Barratry. And in the 19th century, it was punishable by death. Holy <laughs> is like stealing horses and sinking ships. Death! Man, those laws of the sea are scary. Just remind me never to go on a boat again in case I accidentally commit a serious crime. Captain Parker was let off the hook, however, as his judge thought the death was a bit harsh and just made him pay back the people that he had defrauded instead. That's, it's like what, you, you, <laughs> the potential punishment is death. The punishment he actually got is just give the money back to the people you were going to rip off. That's crazy. The Mary Celeste had a bit of an appetite left, and just three months later, after having lost his reputation and all his money, Gilman Parker was dead, adding yet another captain to her tally. After hitting the reef, the Mary Celeste was damaged beyond repair and was left to rot where she lay, perhaps extending her bad vibes into the sea around Haiti, but 
Probably not. While it will never be 100% figured out, the most likely cause of the abandonment of the Mary Celeste was that Captain Briggs thought the crew was in imminent danger. The abandoned ship was not in dry and pristine condition when it was found, contrary to the beliefs popularized by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, but it did seem to carry a weird streak of bad luck, which has earned it a place in the canon of the mysterious and the unknown, and a reason why it is appearing on this show. If you enjoyed this episode of the program, please make sure, if, well, if you're watching on YouTube, smash that like button below. Make sure you're subscribed if you're consuming this in its alternative podcast form. Hello there, dear listener. Why not leave a review? That would be awesome of you, you legends. And thank you for watching or listening, if you're listening. Hello everybody, welcome back to another episode of Decoding the Unknown. As always, I'm your host, Simon, and what happens is today we're looking at Did anyone ever really escape Alcatraz? I have a feeling no one did, right? And I don't know if it's a... I don't really know much about this. That's what, what happens here is Katie has written me a script. I've got it in front of me right now. I'm going to read it. I'm going to add some comments if I feel like it. And then our wonderful uh, video editor, Jen... <laughs> is going to uh well if you're watching this on youtube she's going to add some pictures and images and all sorts of stuff like that and then if you're just listening to it you're going to get some nice audio stuff and like i always say don't you won't miss out on the pictures i'll paint a picture in your mind with my words (laughs) it's like probably overselling it a little bit there simon um all i know about alcatraz is and it's probably an urban legend but didn't they were they were like the only prison to have hot showers because then the prisoners would all be really warm and they wouldn't want to try and swim uh, across the, the like sea or bay or whatever it is to the mainland. Um, but I, that's, that definitely sounds like one of those things that you see on like a fact video or like some fact website online that it's like two minutes of fact checking. You're like, oh no, that was, that's a lie. Anyway, let's just jump into it today, shall we? Uh, if you're uh, listening to this as its podcast form, as I always say, if you want to leave me a review, that would be most welcome. And if you're watching on YouTube, maybe it's a little bit early, but if you felt like smashing that like button already... Maybe you're like, this is brilliant. I love introductions. I love overly long introductions on YouTube. I'm going to hit that like button. Thank you. Let's go. Prison cells an isolated rocky islands, freezing cold waters and man-eating sharks. There's no man-eating sharks. Is this it? Alcatraz, 90% certain, 99% cer- certain is in like that bay in San Francisco, right? There's no sharks there, are there? It's no surprise that Alcatraz Federal Penitentiary was where the troublemakers, the bad apples, the worst of the worst were sent. Al Capone, Whitey Bulger, Machine Gun Kelly, no, not that one, the original one, all served time on the small island. Yeah, I'm vaguely aware that there's a musician called Machine Gun Kelly. I got paper cards. And people make fun of him? Is his music particularly bad? Of course, I don't know his music, but uh, I know people make fun of him. With a reputation as America's strongest prison to uphold, the guards made sure that the inmates served their sentences in barren cells or solitary confinement. No one would be smart or maybe stupid enough to try and escape, as if they managed to get out of their cells, they would still have to escape the heavily guarded prison and reckon with over a mile of the rough waters of the San Francisco Bay. To this day, nobody has officially been given the title of having escaped from Alcatraz. But is that really the case? Oh, we're going into cover-up territory. I mean, this is one where there's a strong motivation for a cover-up, right? Because if someone did escape from Alcatraz, it's not going to look good for Alcatraz. You want everyone to believe that you can't escape from it. Even if, like, you'd be like, well, the prisoners would notice that someone's missing. You're just, you're definitely doing misinformation. Be like, no, 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 they died in the sea. They were eaten by a man-eating shark and froze to death, both at once, in pieces. Alcatraz. Here's a brief history of Alcatraz Federal Penitentiary, or The Rock, if you prefer, although please note I'm not going to be referring it to to it as The Rock going forward, as I don't want to sound like a total douchebag. (laughs) The Rock! Also, it'd be very confusing, because you might confuse it with uh, The Rock, Dwayne The Rock Johnson. I don't think anyone would do that, but uh... Anyway, let's move on. The name Alcatraz came from European explorers mapping the San Francisco Bay Area in the late 1700s and is believed to be derived from the old Spanish word for pelican, as presumably it used to have loads of pelicans on it. It doesn't anymore. The United States officially got their hands on it in 1846 when John C. Freemans bought it for £5,000, or about $150,000 today, adjusted for inflation. That'd be a bargain. (laughs) 
<laughs> Even adjusting for inflation, £150,000. I don't think that buys you like a parking spot in San Francisco. I really don't know if that's a good deal for a 22 hectare, nine acre rocky island covered in pelican poop, but it certainly didn't turn out to be a good idea for Freeman, who totally got screwed over by the US government when they decided it would make a good place to put a military fort. Tell you what, if someone offered me Alcatraz for $150,000, I'd be like, yes, 100% yes. I once met someone who lived in San Francisco, and I'm not entirely sure, but I'm fairly sure they were renting their apartment from like a landlord or whatever. And they just wanted to go traveling. They were like, no, I've had enough of work for a while, so I'm going to. I met this guy in Europe. And I'm just like, you know, oh, what, you know, what do you do? How do you afford travel to travel around Europe and stuff? This is all rather nice. He's like, oh, I just rent out my rented apartment in San Francisco on Airbnb. (laughs) Because apparently you just can rent an apartment on Airbnb and turn a profit. And I'm like, that's crazy. And then he told me how much rent was in San Francisco. And I was like, well, I mean, or just airbnb in san francisco is like well i guess i'm never going there (laughs) they paid him zero dollars for it and even after decades of legal wranglings his family was never able to claim a penny back from the sale well that is a douchebag move government i'm sure there's like isn't it called eminent domain where the government could just take your property and be like that's ours now because we're building a highway but they have to pay you for it i'm fairly sure they have to pay you for it because as you know I don't think the government's that much of a dickhead anymore. The West Coast's first lighthouse was built on Alcatraz Island in 1854, and the first soldiers arrived at the fort in 1858. Not long after, military prisoners and Civil War POWs started being held on the island, and by 1868, Alcatraz had officially switched from being a military defense outpost to being a detention center for military prisoners. In 1909, the main recognizable cell block was built as well as a new lighthouse tall enough to be seen over the new buildings. In 1934, Alcatraz was designated as a general federal prison, and in the following 29 years that it was open, it was home to over 1,500 prisoners as well as the prison staff who lived with their families on the island too. That's kind of got to suck, right? Uh, you got to live on the island? I mean, like, can't I just commute by boat? It's not that far from, like, the San Francisco shore, is it? Is it in the bay? I really think it's in the, there's a bay in San Francisco. I feel like it's in the bay. Did we say that already and did I already forget? Alcatraz seemed to be a weird mixture of ultimate punishment and relative comfort with men sent there who were considered too much trouble at other prisons, but once there, they had the luxury of individual cells and pretty good food compared to the rest of the prison system. It had a capacity of 336, but the most prisoners it ever held at one time was 302. Whenever I hear about prisons, it's like they always seem to be over capacity, but like not by small amounts. It's like, yeah, yeah, we built this prison. It's supposed to house a thousand people, but there's 5,000 people in it. And it's like, that's just, I mean, it's probably an over-exaggeration, but also might not be. Prison, like, over, prison sounds bad enough. Overcrowded prison just sounds horrible. That's not to say that it was a fun place to be, of course, although the practice was only used in the 1930s under Warden James A. Johnston. Inmates were routinely subjected to a rule of total silence and only allowed to talk to each other during recreation periods and to order food at mealtimes. This did nothing for their mental health, and many prisoners ended up using their cells' plumbing pipes as rudimentary telephones when the oppressive atmosphere got too bad. The rule was said to have driven men insane, and one inmate supposedly chopped off some of his fingers to get a transfer. God damn. I mean, this is like that one thing. I always, thought, I'd always think like, yeah, if I was going to prison, I'd be like, I really want to be in solitary because I don't want to hang out with all the other prisoners. Like, even if like you get sent to prison for murder, I'd be like, I don't want to hang out with the other murderers. <laughs> that sounds scary. I murdered someone who was weak. I can't murder other murderers or stand up to them. I'd be like, can I go to solitary confinement? But apparently, it's horrible. And you're just like, yeah, yeah, no, I really want to hang out with the murderers just because I need someone to talk to. <laughs> the risk of getting stabbed is wor- is better than solitary, which to my in my mind is like, that's insane. Can't I just read some books or just look at the wall? <laughs> I'd be like, yeah, I'd just rather look at the wall than hang out with the murderers and risk being murdered. Um, but apparently not. Apparently people really don't like solitary confinement, which is why it's a punishment. Anyone caught breaking the rule was punished with solitary confinement. Well, there we go. In one of the prison's notorious D-block cells, what was known as the dungeon, the underground remains of earlier buildings. Once tales of this treatment eventually started filtering out, this simple rule of silence was considered so inhumane that the U.S. Attorney General wanted to shut the whole prison down. Well, that's okay. Just let them talk to each other. Be like, yo, warden, you're fired. You're a bit sh**. That's crazy and inhuman. And the prisoners can now talk to each other. We don't need to shut down the prison, do we? Warden Johnson agreed to relax the rule. How did you keep your job, Johnson? Re- relax the rule, and by 1940, prisoners were allowed to hold conversations whenever they wanted, albeit quietly. I think the quiet conversation is a good idea. Like, if you're shouting, that's punishable. Because I feel like then, without shouting, things don't tend to escalate. The calls in my 
opinion. Yeah, the cells in Alcatraz were small, but as we said previously, single occupancy. In the main block, they measured 5 feet by 9 feet, that's 1.5 by 2.7 meters, and were only about 7 feet or 2.1 meters high. That sounds, I mean, better than I expected, which is kind of intense. They consisted of three solid walls, with the front wall being the cell door. As these were made of bars, there was no privacy in the cells, which also had a toilet, small basin, desk, and bed squeezed in. There wasn't a way for inmates to individually pick the locks on their cell doors because there weren't any locks. The doors were operated by levers at the end of the row of cells that the prisoners couldn't reach. All of the cells were enclosed inside the prison itself, meaning that none of them had a back wall leading to the open air. There were gun galleries at each end of the rows of cells, and guards regularly patrolled the main corridors, which were ironically named after famous streets such as Broadway and Park Avenue. Outside, too, there was a strong guard presence with lookouts for both the prisoners and also to make sure that unidentified craft on the water didn't come within 300 yards, that's 274 meters, of the island. And what about the man-eating sharks patrolling the waves just waiting for someone to try their luck? There are sharks in the San Francisco Bay! Really? With the most common being the not at all dangerous leopard shark. Okay, yeah. Because, I mean, you have those sharks and it's just that they don't all bite. I mean, I guess they bite. They don't all bite people. And you could also just spread the rumor, right? Like, this was back in the day before the internet. You can't look it up and be like, there's no sharks in the bay. Someone could just say, yeah, prisoners, there's sharks in the bay. They would eat you alive. And you'd be like, okay, I guess so. <laughs> Better not risk it. The rest are small and generally stay at the bottom of the water. Great whites don't venture into the bay that often, although they have been documented passing through. Salmon sharks, which look pretty similar to great whites, are more common in the area, but do not have a history of attacking humans. Either way, it seems that any tales of shark-infested waters around Alcatraz have just been hugely exaggerated to add to the mythos of the inescapable prison. The water by itself is a far more dangerous proposition than meeting a shark. It's cold and has strong currents that would quickly tire out inexperienced swimmers if any of the inmates did attempt to swim to freedom they'd have over a mile to go yeah which you could do like swimming a mile it's pretty long i guess it's going to be pretty cold yeah it's going to be pretty tough look having this having the prison on the island is better than having the prison on the land i guess unless it's in like the middle of the desert or something isn't that like adx florence the one where they keep like the unabomber and stuff that's in the middle of nowhere right so even if you escape it's like where are you gonna go it's just miles and miles of nothing. Escaping the Rock If many people, some known to be habitual jailbreakers, are sequestered away in an apparently inescapable island prison in the middle of the sea, you can bet your life some of them are going to try and escape, even if it's just for the kudos. Officially, nobody has ever escaped from Alcatraz. Then argue, I would argue that this is just semantics. What does escape actually mean? Well, it means like you manage to get away like because aren't all prisoners like if you escape prison prison you're almost always recaptured like 24 hours later the police pick you up because you did something stupid i was reading a story and it was just the guy escaped prison and the first thing he did was went home it's like bro i i mean kind of a double bluff in a way because if i was the police there's I mean, there's no way i'm sending guys to this guy's home he's not going to go to his home but I guess they did, because they picked him up at home and sent him back to prison. But that does, account as, that does count as escaping prison. You just got put back in prison later. If you made it, if you got away, I'm saying, from the prison system. Like, if you got to the shore and were escaped for 24 hours, you 100% escaped prison. If you got to the shore and were captured immediately, you didn't escape prison. We'll go over some attempts in a minute, but surely if a prisoner, prisoner managed to leave the island, that counts as escaping, even if they re were recaptured or died. Uh, it depends where they died. If they died in the swim, I don't think they escaped prison. I would say escaping prison is getting to shore and running off. The authorities are sticking by it, though, and they just concluded that in the most contentious escape attempt, the man merely drowned. Don't worry, we'll be coming back to that one. It's kind of the whole point of the story. First, let's look at a few of those other escape attempts. In all, 14 attempts were made over the course of Alcatraz's 29 years as a federal penitentiary. That's almost two a year, which is pretty good going for a place with such a fearsome reputation. The first escape attempt happened in 1936 when Joe Bowers just decided that he had enough one day and started climbing the prison's chain-link fence. After ignoring warnings from guards, he was shot and fell down to the shore below, dying from his injuries. Yeah, well, that guy definitely didn't escape. <laughs> like, dude, what are you doing? Why are you even trying this? But like, get down or we'll shoot you. No! Well, now you're shot and dead. 
not an escape. He made it over the fence, though, and even with his totally low rent low rent approach, it counts as an escape in my book. Oh, Casey and I are not on the same page with that one. Climbing over a fence and getting shot while just because you got over the top. I mean, if you're a guard, you'd wait till he gets over the top. Or like wait until he gets to the top, right? Because you're like, well, let's not shoot him until he's actually made. Oh, okay, he's over the bang bang. You know, you're not going to shoot him early. You're going to shoot him at the last possible moment, hopefully. Because then you're not a horrible person. It's like, yeah, he's starting to climb the fence. Shoot him. Just shoot him now. That guy touched the fence. Shoot him. The first people to brave the waters were Theodore Cole and Ralph Rowe, who succeeded in 1937 in breaking out through a window of a building they'd been working in. Unfortunately, they picked a bad day to do it as there was a storm happening at the time and the waters would have been treacherous. Their bodies were never recovered and they are presumed dead, which I think I agree with in the circumstances. Unless, unless they made it ashore and actually escaped. Seems very unlikely. The award for my favorite escape attempt goes to John Giles in 1945. For his prison job, he worked at the loading dock, and one of his tasks included unloading army laundry that was being sent to Alcatraz for cleaning. Eventually, Giles managed to steal enough pieces of clothing to make up a full army uniform, and one day he got dressed up in it and stowed away into the army boat heading back to the mainland. That is genius. I mean, it's, it's very simple, but I love it. It's like catch me if you can style. Or he so he thought. Unfortunately, the boat didn't go to San Francisco, but rather to Angel Island, another small island in the bay. Because Giles' disappearance had already been flagged, a speedboat had been dispatched to bring him back. He managed to disembark the army boat, but his uniform wasn't quite right, so his cover was quickly blown. He was recaptured and returned to Alcatraz. Uh, again, I don't think that counts as an escape. He didn't make it far enough. It's kind of, I see why this is like not black and white. But it's like, you didn't... That's like climbing the fence. Getting on the boat is like climbing the fence. You didn't, you didn't get away and then were recaptured. You basically never got away. The final escape attempt before the prison was closed was in December 1962. John Paul Scott and Dar Parker climbed out of a basement window and headed for the water. Parker managed to break his ankle during the escape and was quickly apprehended on some rocks nearby, but Scott tried to swim to freedom. He had fashioned some rudimentary buoyancy aids by blowing up some washing up gloves that he was about uh, and that was about as prepared as he had gotten. He was at the mercy of the currents and the cold water and wasn't found for about two hours when some teenagers found him washed up and unconscious under the Golden Gate Bridge. Holy crap, he survived? Again, this sounds like a successful escape to me. He made it out of the prison, off the island, and to the mainland, whether by swimming or by sheer luck, he still made it. He was taken to hospital and once recovered, was sent back to Alcatraz. That's, in my opinion, that's the closest we've gotten to an escape. But he failed to escape. You it's like he lost consciousness while swimming to shore and was immediately apprehended. He didn't make a break. He just... He just didn't. He, he, he failed. Immediately. <laughs> Nowadays, there are regular swim events to and from Alcatraz with the youngest person to swim there and back being nine? God damn. Nine-year-old Simon would not have been into that shit. The oldest person to make the swim from Alcatraz did it on his 87th birthday, so it doesn't seem like that much of a big deal after all. Okay, so now we'll move on to the most audacious escape of them all and the mystery surrounding the outcome. It's time for Frank Morris and the Anglin Brothers. The Great Escape I don't know if you've seen the 1979 movie Escape from Alcatraz starring Clint Eastwood. Ah, Katie, how little you know me. Of course I haven't. I have not, but it's also worth pointing out that while it's based on this escape attempt, it's also dramatized. Dra tra dramatized. Thank you, big brain. So it's not a totally accurate version of the events. It's also worth saying that there is no 100% totally accurate version of events. While it's been possible to work out various aspects of the escape, once the inmates reach a certain point, nobody can say for sure what happened next. Indeed, much of the detail was provided by only one man, Alan West, who I thought was called Alien West for a second, but no, it's Alan with two L's who might have been hyping up his own level of importance in the plan or just telling people what they wanted to hear to gain some sort of respect or leniency on his sentence. With that being said, let's get into what probably happened. This escape, number 13 out of the 14 attempts, was by far the most well thought out and well planned. Which honestly isn't saying a lot, because most of the other guys is like, what was the plan? Well, we're just going to climb over the fence. What was the plan? Well, we're going to swim to shore. The guy with the army uniform plan, that was pretty good, but it also kind of fell into his lap. Serial near do well and actually very intelligent person Frank Morris was the leader of the group along with the brothers John and Clarence Anglin, who were known for previous escape attempts at other prisons, and the aforementioned Alan West. 
Frank Morris and the Anglins did already know each other from previous jail stints, so were familiar with each other's very particular set of skills. Sounds like some Liam Neeson sh**. I have a very particular set of skills. Isn't that? That's he does say that, right? In that uh, those Taken movies. I have a very particular set of skills. The Anglins were in adjacent cells, which was not an unusual arrangement for the sake of keeping the peace, and Morris and West were also next to each other. Over the course of several months, starting in December 1961, the group used things such as old saw blades that they'd found and other makeshift tools and managed to dig out and enlarge the vents in the back walls of their cells. They worked on these every evening from about 5.30 to 9.00 p.m., with one sawing away and the other as a lookout. As the holes got bigger, they covered them over with painted cardboard. I love, I have to say, there is something super fascinating about prison escape right like these guys just gr- all they've got to think about all day doesn't you know you're in prison what else are you gonna do sit in the cell and think of ways to escape um it, it's just i don't know why it's so interesting but it is if you remember from earlier i said that all of the cells were housed inside the main wall so chipping through wouldn't lead you to the outside of the prison that's true but what the cells did back onto was na- was were narrow utility corridors which were closed at both ends and not patrolled. Once they successfully broken through to the corridor, Morris and the Anglins, who now sound like a 70s music group indeed, started working on breaking through events that led to the roof. To help their work go faster, the men came up with all sorts of ingenious tools such as drills made from electric hair clippers and vacuum cleaner motors, but these ended up either being not effective enough or just a bit too loud to use. Yeah, like old school vacuum cleaners? Oh my god, extremely loud. This is really some prison break stuff. Like, uh, not like obviously, this is a prison break, Simon. Well done, you big brain. I mean, like the show, you know, where it's like a super elaborate escape from prison. We did it, was it this? Maybe it was a casual criminalist. I did a, this is another podcast they do, a casual criminalist. And uh, the guy kept escaping from jail, but it was super simple. His wife just flew a helicopter in and just picked him up. He grabs on and off they go. And then it's like season 17 of prison break, Michael Schofield's like up to some crazy ass shit that is just seems wildly unnecessary. Just get, get someone you know to have a helicopter mic. Come on. In another strand to this plan, the group had also managed to amass a large number of prison raincoats, either as donations by other inmates or just by nicking them. They had over 50 raincoats, which, by using purloined glue and hot air vents to seal them, they managed to make into a 6 foot by 14 foot or 1.8 meter by 4 meter raft. That is pretty clever. There was even enough left over to make some pretty sweet life jackets. <laughs> Just that is the last thing I'll be thinking about. Yeah, we're going to escape from prison. We're going to build a boat. Don't forget the life jackets. It's like I can swim. It's like we're not leaving without the life jackets. Safety first. They should have told that to the guy who tried climbing over the wall. <laughs> Safety first. When they say they're going to shoot you, just stop climbing over the wall. They were working on and stashing all of this stuff above their cells. By the way, in an area in an empty area accessible from the utility corridor. But how were they working on these things without their absence being noted? Well, they had like dummies. They had like, I don't know, just pillows under the sheets, right? Or something (laughs) like super cliche. Well, in yet another strand of the plan, they also constructed dummy heads out of anything they could get their hands on, including toilet paper, toothpaste, soap, and cement powder. They also used paint from prison supplies to give them a slightly more lifelike color, and even managed to snag hair clippings from the prison barber to stick onto the tops. While these dummy heads have been described as crude, I'm pretty impressed, and I doubt that I'll be able to do much better with actual real art materials, let alone random bits and bobs that I'd managed to catch from bathrooms and barbershop floors. They also obviously worked as they weren't discovered to be dummies until after spoiler alert the men had escaped yeah it's pretty cool i mean i give them a lot of credit for that this is this is a pretty good plan i hope these guys weren't like horrible rapist murderers or something did we discuss what crimes they did sometimes i read these and i'm like did i just not pay attention for a second (laughs) because now i'm kind of like rooting for these guys they're like yeah you can do it but if it turns out it's like no 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 they were pedophile murderers it's like on i mean they didn't murder pedophiles that would you know not be the worst thing in the world would it they were uh murderous pedophiles then i'll be like I hope these guys don't escape. (laughs) At 9.30 p.m. on the 11th of June 1962, after six months of preparation, it was decided that the time was right to make an escape attempt. Morris and the Anglins planted their trusty dummy heads in their beds, crawled into the utility corridor, and covered up their escape holes with the painted cardboard. Unfortunately for Alan West, he hadn't needed to leave his cell to make the rafts, and staffers had been tasked with smaller items such as the paddles and the life preservers. I've seen a photo of a recovered life preserver or jacket, and West did some really neat work. Oh, that's good. Because of this, however, he hadn't spent as much time trying to break through the back wall of his cell, so he couldn't get out. 
Wait, <laughs> I feel like sure it's really thought of that one through. Clarence Anglin did try and kick the vent out from the corridor side, but couldn't manage it, so poor old Alan West was left behind, while his three friends climbed into the night and the history books and disappeared. Wait, so what? Did, how did Alan West? This seems like the most obvious thing to think through. They spent months, like from 5 pm to 9 30 pm, digging through the concrete wall at the back of their cells and enlarging the vent space. Alan West was just like, nah, 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 I'll figure it out later. And then they left and he was like, I should have figured it out. What's up, Alan? Come on. Because the only witness to the event so far was now stuck in his cell, we can only speculate on what happened next. Gathering their rafts and supplies, Frank Morris and Clarence and John Anglin climbed onto the roof of Alcatraz prison and made their way across and eventually over the fence and down to the shore. Using some bellows they made from a modified concertina, which was similar to an accordion, that is amazing, guys. They inflated their raft and pushed out into the water. According to West, the original plan was to paddle the raft to Angel Island first, which is about 2.4 miles, 3.8 kilometers north of Alcatraz. Given that we only have West's uh, testimony here, these guys either escaped or they died at sea, right? I hope they escaped, unless they were murderous pedophiles. From there, they would head to Marin County via the Raccoon Strait, steal a car and some clothes, and head off into the sunset. So, did they make it? Well, therein lies the mystery. Alan West had eventually managed to bust out of his cell later that night. Okay, but without anyone to help him uh, climb up to the roof and with no raft, his chances were totally blown, so he sheepishly tiptoed back to his cell and went back to bed. Legends. <laughs> In his future reports to the authorities, on the condition that he wasn't punished for the escape attempt, West painted himself as the mastermind of the whole operation, although <laughs> I don't think so, mate. You forgot to make a hole in your cell. Although I think it's even more embarrassing that he was the only one not to make it out of his cell if he was so smart. Yes. In the movie Escape from Alcatraz, the main characters use the real names of Frank Morris, John Anglin, and Clarence Anglin. Alan West is represented, but out of all the names in the world they could have given him, his character's name is Charlie Butt which seems like a pretty disparaging burn. Yes, unfortunate. The dummy heads, and therefore the missing men, weren't discovered until 7.15 a.m. on the 12th of June, giving them about 10 hours head start. The FBI were called in almost immediate. That is, okay, I feel like now this is getting... The others were kind of like failed attempts. This seems like pretty solid successful attempt, like a 10-hour head start. You made it. That's, that's an escape. Unless they drowned immediately, but we'll never know. So, again, it's grey. It's grey. Let's stop trying to say whether these are escapes or not. The FBI were called in almost immediately, and although in the first two days they found some sealed up personal letters relating to the Anglins and some debris from a homemade paddle, no substantial evidence or any bodies were found. On the 21st of June, what is believed to be the tattered remains of the raft were found, and a life preserver also, also washed up the day after, but these could have been discarded after the men had already landed somewhere. Yeah, yo, yo, yo. If that is washing up and the bodies aren't washing up anywhere, like, I'm not expecting to wash up in the same place. These dudes escaped. The FBI worked the case for 17 years until the 31st of December 1979 when they officially closed their investigation and turned it over to the U.S. Marshal Service. The U.S. Marshal's like, what's up? Why are we getting this? It's 17 years old. You expect us to do something? Hell no! The FBI thought the men had probably drowned in the waters of the bay and never made it to shore as no trace was found of them over the years. They also decided that... I, I mean, I kind of disagree with that. I think they escaped. They also decided that the packet of family info the Anglins had made was so valuable to them that the men could have drowned before leaving them behind. Ri <laughs> okay. Katie also writes, really? And I do dis I, I agree with that. That really, like, what? That's what you base the case they died on? Perhaps the package just fell out of someone's pocket, or it wasn't really that valuable, and the Anglins left it behind intentionally as a red herring, or just thought, sod it, and kept on with the more important task of, you know, rowing to freedom. The U.S. Marshal Service still lists Frank Morris, Clarence Anglin, and John Anglin as wanted fugitives, and their case is still open, despite the escape having happening almost 60 years ago. Apparently, the case will close in 2030, when all the fugitives will be over 100. Oh my god, U.S. Marshal Service is intense. It's like, when do we close the case only when we're fairly certain that they're all dead oh man what a birthday present maybe they'll have been hanging on and will finally all pop out of the woodwork to enjoy some very limited time as free men there's going to be a statute of limitations right or does that not apply to escaping from prison because then it's like you haven't finished serving out the punishment that's been dished out to you but then escaping prison is a crime in itself surely there's something's going to expire there all right i'm not a liar i have no idea how any of this stuff works
Maybe once you're convicted, that doesn't count anymore. So, did they all drown before even making it to their first stop at Angel Island, as the FBI thought? Well, this is by no means conclusive. As proved by 9-year-olds and 87-year-olds, it is more than possible to swim all around the islands in the Bay Area. These men were in decent shape, were no strangers to swimming, had inflated life jackets, and a raft with paddles. They were also hell-bent on escaping, which tends to give impetus to whatever you happen to be doing. According, yes, like the guy swimming to the islands, you know, just for fun, that summer, is going to be way less motivated than the guy swimming for his freedom. According to recent digital recreations of current patterns and virtual raft launchings, if the trio had gotten into the water at about 11.30 p.m., which definitely meshed with their known timeline, they would have had a fairly easy ride up past the Golden Gate Bridge, and what's more, if they'd abandoned everything in the water when they made land, the currents would have washed it all back up on Angel Island, which is where it was found. They escaped. Just as, Although then they managed to like live on the run all this time? I feel like the... the the people who escape prison always get caught later. Just as compellingly, though, the computer model also showed that if the raft had been launched prior to 11 p.m., again, with the, again within the probable time frame, they probably wouldn't have been able to handle the current and would have been carried out to sea. There have been many reports of a raft found on Angel Island with footprints leading away from it, but this is literally all the information we have. Well, if they were washed out to sea, it's unlikely for it to come back in and wash up on that island, right? So it's more likely they departed later, took it to shore, and then the island... Right? That would make more sense. It was in a typed-up FBI report with no uh, follow-up. Wait, what was? Oh, the raft on Angel Island. So they found it. There was no follow-up. The raft wasn't actually there. Only shreds of it were found. If the men had followed the original plan and made it to Angel Island, this would prove they landed there. If they caught a, a different current, they could have passed Angel Island altogether and gone straight for the mainland, meaning that the footprints were not theirs and were just coincidentally close to where the debris washed up. The lack of bodies is also kind of a point in their favor, although at least two other escapees drowned without their bodies being recovered. How do you know? People known to have jumped from the Golden Gate Bridge have also never been found, despite recovery operations being quickly launched. The currents really can be treacherous, and if you're caught in one and end up being pulled out to sea, the chances of rescue or recovery are very, very slim. There was a body found floating after the escape in what was apparently the prison garb of shirt and denim trousers, although it wasn't spotted until over a month later, and the boat that spotted it didn't get that close and didn't even report it until October. What are you up to? By the time it was recovered, it had deteriorated to the point of no longer being identifiable, if it was even the same body at all. While some people thought it must have been one of the three, others thought it might be the body of a much more recently deceased man, and that it was unlikely that the body would still be floating four months later. The jury's out on that one. Don't we know that? I mean, don't they have those death farms or whatever they call them? Probably not death farm. There's like uh, where they do experiments with dead bodies to see how fast they decompose and stuff. I'm fairly sure I made a video about it on some other channel I do. And they, you know, just to see. Surely they've put a body in a tank and been like, well, four months with some salt water. Is that body still going to be there in four months of like being washed around? Or is it just going to be disintegrated into various pieces? I feel like it's not going to last like four months, right? There's going to be like a skeleton left. And th also fish will eat the body and all of that nasty stuff. It's also unlikely that the men had any outside help, like a boat picking them up or a rendezvous with a friend or family member. For one thing, it would be almost impossible to arrange anything like that being stuck on a rock and all. Also, they seem to have decided on the spur of the moment to make their escape that night, meaning that if anyone was enlisted to help them, they would have been hanging around every night for a long time for the men to make their move. Unknown boats weren't allowed anywhere near the island, and the Anglin family, who are farm workers based in Florida, didn't have the ways or means to help their brothers out. Morris was an orphan with no other family to call on, and even if they did have associates willing to help out, the three had been moved to California far away from their previous networks. Well, they're missing out on one of those like famous tropes of prison escape movies. You've got to bring someone in who's like in the mafia or like super rich or something because they're the guy who has the contacts on the outside to like arrange the car or the plane to pick people up. Look, I've learned a lot from the TV show Prison Break. You got to bring on what was the dude's name? The mafia guy? The gang guy? I don't remember. But he was the one who arranged their plane. So what other evidence do we have for their survival, apart from just hoping that these scrappy underdogs managed to stick it to the man? Yes, I know they were all hardened criminals, but after all that effort, you've got to root for them a little bit. Okay, let's root for them. Assuming they're not murderous pedophiles. There were several sightings over the years, including a tip that Clarence Anglin was living at large in Brazil in the mid-1960s. The FBI did even go and check this out. Or maybe it was just you know, it's a thin excuse for holiday. I'm like, if I was in the FBI, some guy was like, yeah, 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 we've really heard that he's having an absolutely wonderful time at the Four Seasons in Brazil. I'd be like, well, 
we better go check out that Four Seasons Resort and Hotel, better we? Because, I mean, we gotta make sure. I think about two and a half weeks would do it nicely. But nothing came of the sighting. The Anglin family was extensive, with Clarence and John being two of 13 or 14 children. Their mother played down their place in her affections by bemoaning their criminal activity, but it may just have been a facade to keep their whereabouts a secret. At the beginning of the search, the Anglin family was, understandably, under huge scrutiny and pressure from the FBI. They probably didn't have anything to do with the escape attempt or much knowledge of where the men were, but if they did, they certainly didn't spill it. As the years have gone by, however, it seems that they are more amenable to getting the record set straight a few members have said that clarence and john's mother received roses and signed cards from her missing sons over the years and that as a family they all believed the brothers had successfully escaped there was even a christmas card sent to their mother the first year they escaped signed by john there were rumors of a suspiciously disguised pair turning up at the funerals of both their mother and father but presumably no one snitched on them at the time yeah all of this is just super circumstantial and in my mind isn't really important it's i don't know you can't rely on all of the stuff to 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 show that something's true it's super circumstantial one of their older brothers robert apparently admitted on his deathbed that he had been in touch with both clarence and john a few times when they were on the run and john's nephew david wilder has been quoted as saying we have a lot inside the family that we haven't shared how infuriating but it does give a spark of hope to the survival theory well just wait until they're over 100 and spill the beans what was happening in 2030 I, I don't know if anything will happen, but it'll be exciting. I reckon they escaped. I truly do. The FBI tried to pour more cold water o- uh, over the escape by saying that no cars had been reported stolen in a 12-day period after the escape in the area they, they were looking in, but a documentary made by National Geographic in 2011 said that a car was reported as stolen the, stolen the morning that the escape was discovered, and this was backed up by reports in at least two newspapers at the time. <laughs> Shit, National Geographic, you are digging into it. The FBI are like, no, 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 car theft. National Geographic is all contraire, FBI. How do you... I guess those records are, like, public because it's super old. Also, I guess, like, theft and... Is this public? I don't know. Another tick in the survived column is that a friend of the Anglin family, Fred Brizzy, claims that he had met up with the Anglin brothers in Brazil in 1975. FBI wants another holiday. <laughs> and they had a photo to prove it. In the picture, which from the shirts they were wearing could only have been taken in the 1970s, two men wearing sunglasses are standing on either side of a termite mount. A bit odd, but these were apparently Clarence and John Anglin in the flash, and expert photo analysis carried out has since confirmed that the photo is a genuine one from the 1970s. As recently as 2020, advanced facial recognition technology was done, was used on known photos of the Anglins, and compared them to the men in the photo. The company that ran the project, Rothko, has said that as far as they are concerned, the men in the pictures were most definitely the Anglins. Okay. Well, I mean, like, yeah. Yeah. That kind of settles it, right? Well, let's carry on. Well, old Fred Brizzy had form as a con man and was known to tell tall tales. Yeah, but I mean, I just if the forensic photo analysis shows that they're the same people, then the forensic photo analysis shows they're the same people. His own wife had never heard the story of when he met up with the famous escapees in Rio, so maybe he was just making it all up, although the photo for me is quite strong evidence. Yeah, fully agree. It's it's very strong evidence. It didn't even surface until 2015, as Brizzy may not have wanted to cause trouble for his friends, so he didn't send it on to their family members for many years. Also, while photographic evidence may be enough in some cases, it could still be two men who just bear very strong resemblances to future versions of the Anglins. Yeah, but this, they proved the photos accurate. They both look really like them. What are the odds? Stranger things happen all the time. Yeah, but this isn't strange. This is just evidence <laughs> they are wearing sunglasses in the photo which might throw off the facial recognition software a bit and the picture is not the clearest that it could be and of course the company carrying out the project would be courting as much publicity as it possibly could also the picture is all there is there's no conclusive dna evidence or written confessions to go with it yeah but it's still fairly compelling isn't it In 2013, the police in San Francisco received a letter, purportedly from John Anglin himself. In the letter, he says that when they made the escape, they all barely made it to shore and that Frank Morris had died in 2005 and Clarence had died in 2008. He also said he was 83, had cancer, and needed treatment, so threw a deal out there of turning himself in in exchange for a maximum of one year in jail and medical treatment. 
The letter was not made public for years, and the U.S. Marshal sent it to the FBI for forensic and handwriting analysis. The results were not conclusive, but John could have had someone else write it for him, and also a person's handwriting probably changed a bit over the course of five decades. If it wasn't him, but just some canny old cove trying to get healthcare in exchange for a year of free living and three square meals a day, well, more power to him. It really says something about the U.S. healthcare system. Yeah, this is insane. That people are prepared to spend a year in jail in exchange for getting treated for an increasingly common illness. The claim wasn't investigated any further, and nobody, John Anglin or fake John Anglin, got taken up on the offer. Oh, that's such a shame. That would have been cool. I mean, not cool. It's a horrible situation to be in that you have to exchange prison time for cancer treatment, but uh, it would have been nice to know the like a definitive conclusion to the story. Several people have confessed helping the trio carry out their escape over the years, but they've all been dismissed as just lies, basically, with no concrete evidence for or against three having made it. It's all just noise at this point. Yeah, like this is the similar looking people and at the funeral, it's all just nah, noise. While it does seem at least possible that the group could have made land and driven off into the sunset, what does make it slightly less probable is they were never heard from again. They were wanted men, their faces everywhere, and they'd all been lawbreakers from a very young age. Sure, they had the best reason to stay under the radar for a while, but would they really be able to keep their noses totally clean for the rest of their lives? Maybe heading to another country would have afforded them the extra layer of anonymity that they needed. While they may have been familiar faces in the US, laying low in Brazil in a time before everyone had a camera and a phone in their pocket would definitely have been a simpler proposition than it would be today. Yeah, I mean, and also wearing the sunglasses be like, yeah, 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 I'm a wanted criminal. So in, in photos, I wear big sunglasses. <laughs> Fairly sensible precaution. There haven't been any leads or credible sightings regarding Frank Morris, but if the letter is to be believed, he also survived and kept in touch with the brothers until his death in 2005. Officially, Frank Morris, Clarence Anglin, and John Anglin are recorded as missing and presumed drowned by Alcatraz Records, but I think there's more than enough to, sh uh, to uh, more than enough stray threads to cast doubt on the official version. And it does seem that the feds were just a bit useless in this instance, especially if the photo of the brothers in Brazil is actually them. They got the Brazil tip years earlier, but failed to find any trace of the escapees. So maybe they chalked the whole thing up to a presumed drowning to save base rather than admit they were outwitted by three men and a bunch of raincoats. In 1964, shortly after the amazing escape and John Paul Scott's swim to almost freedom, Alcatraz was closed due to high running costs and crumbling infrastructure. In 1969, in a rare show of unity, protest group Indians of all tribes occupied Alcatraz for over a year and a half, bringing attention to Native American issues, sparking activism, movements, and calling for the island to be returned to the Native Americans now that it was no longer being used. As time went on, accidental deaths and infighting spelled the end for the protest, as well as the government cutting off power to the island. It officially ended in June 1971. Alcatraz became part of the Golden Gate National Recreational Area in 1972 and opened to the public as a tourist attraction in 1973. I have to say, I'd love to go and see that. It sounds pretty fascinating. Thanks to its rich history, it became a National Historic Landmark in 1986. Now you can visit the island by ferry and see for yourself where John Angling cut his way out of his cell and possibly into a new life. That is cool. I'd like to see that. I have to say that while it started off as wishful thinking that the men might have made it after all their careful, careful and ingenious planning, with this new evidence that's been trickling out from the Anglin family and the discovery of that photo, Alcatraz may have to grit its teeth and finally mark a three in the escaped column after all. Yeah, I have to say, normally, I mean, that's the end of Katie's script, by the way. Normally, I'm, if you're regular to this podcast, I'm usually fairly skeptical about all of this stuff. And I'm like, ah, well, yeah, probably not. But this one, I'm kind of like, yeah, I think they escaped. I'm kind of into it. I think they escaped. I think that letter, I don't know if it was genuine, but it seems just bizarre enough to be. Uh, but it's kind of noise. But anyway, uh, yeah, I'm kind of into it. I'm persuaded by this one. Great script, Katie. Thank you. Thank you uh, listening at home or watching or however you consume this. If you do want to give it a like and subscribe to this channel, if you're watching on YouTube, that would be wonderful. Thank you so much. If you're listening to it as a podcast, a five-star review, wherever you get your podcasts, especially Apple Podcasts, by the way, because they're like their podcast ranking thing the more reviews we get the more it gets up there and people see it which is nice I, I like that it's obviously nice when more people listen to the show for me at least it encourages me to make more this uh that would be great thank you so much and as always i'll see you in the next episode
Hello everybody, welcome back to another brand new episode of Decoding the Unknown. As always, I'm your host, Simon. What happens here? If you're new, welcome. Thank you for stopping by. If you're listening to this show as a podcast, why not review it? Well, probably because if you're brand new here and all you've heard so far is me blather on about asking for a review, you're not really feeling like it right now. But maybe at the end of today's episode, you will. What happens? Uh, Katie has written me a script and uh, I'm going to read it and then afterwards our wonderful producer on this channel Jen is going to add some images if you're watching some sounds if you're listening that's how we do it we're covering the mystery of Oak Island I don't really know anything about this people have been asking for this in the comments and it wasn't just on this channel people have been like asking me what cover Oak Island there's some treasure there or something I I wonder if it might be more of an American thing this Oak Island like buried treasure because I have no idea where Oak Island is or anything about it uh that's what we're going to find out today they call it a cold read or I, I read it. Never read this before. We're going to go on a little exploration journey together, dear listener. Let's go. Pronunciation notes. Legina is Legina. Oh, okay. So it's not pronounced like... Kate even makes the immediate joke that comes to my mind. Le- Legina is not pronounced... Legina is not pronounced like you know what. You know what rhymes with Legina. I'm definitely going to screw this all up throughout this episode, so uh, I apologize for that, even though I've been told exactly how to pronounce it. Everybody loves buried treasure. The possibility that you might be inches away from a fortune is a siren's call that's lured people from across continents for hundreds of years, just like the lottery, <laughs> which you shouldn't play because statistically you won't win. Please don't play the lottery. It's just a way of taking your money. Most will end up disappointed, or probably worse off when they started, but it's those lucky few who strike it rich that keeps the dream alive for everyone else. One such hotspot for treasure seekers throughout the years has been Oak Island, a small privately owned island off the southern shore of Nova Scotia, Canada. The mysterious tale of what could lie beneath has had people searching since the 18th century in what has become the world's longest running treasure hunt. But what are they looking for, and why do they think it's there? Is there a curse protecting the treasure? <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> Let's dig into it. Dig into it. But I'm a bunch. The history of the mystery. We're going to start with the proper treasure hunter version of the story. Oak Island is itself pretty small, covering an area of about 57 hectares or 140 acres. That is very small. Early European settlers to Nova Scotia, to the Nova Scotia area in the 1750s, had long whispered about a dying pirate from the notorious Captain Kidd's crew who confessed on his deathbed to having buried about two million pounds worth of treasure on Oak Island. He couldn't recover it himself, as it would reveal him to be a pirate, and he'd probably be arrested before being able to enjoy his spoils. I really thought that pirates bre- burying their treasure was just a legend. Like, pirates would use their treasure to, like, buy things. They were pirates. They weren't like, oh, well, we better take that and invest it wisely. It's like, no, no, no. They took the treasure, and then they sold it for money, and then used it to buy shit. They didn't just bury it places. Why would you? Fast forward a little to 1795 and fresh-faced teen Daniel McInnes, aware of the local legend of a dying pirate whispering about his buried loot on the island, was going about his business one day when he found the remains of some sort of pulley or tackle block in a tree. Nearby, he noticed a depression in the grounds and immediately, thinking of the buried treasure, he decided to t- try digging it up. He's not actually going to find treasure, is he? That would be the most amazing thing ever. Can you being a kid and actually finding treasure? I used to like think it'd be really cool to have like a metal. De- In fact, I got a metal detector. My nan bought me a metal detector. It was like some toy one that I'm sure was a bit shit, and I never found anything with it. But having a metal detector as a kid, I always wanted it because you dream of finding treasure. I can't believe some that kid actually did it. I mean, we don't know if he did, maybe he didn't, but otherwise why would he be in this story? Along with a couple of friends, he got to work. A couple of feet down, they hit some flagstones, which would probably have signaled the end of my excavations, but they were evidently made of stronger stuff. They kept going, the earth under the flagstones being looser and easier to dig through. At ten feet down, just over three meters! These kids dug three meters deep? Damn! They uncovered a platform of oak logs. Weird. A sure sign this level was created by humans and not a naturally occurring geological feature. The logs were removed and the digging continued. A further 10 feet down. These kids are deep. This is dangerous. My parents would be like, yo, 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 fill in that hole. What are you doing? I remember with my cousin, 
I went to the beach and we dug a hole that was so deep. Like, I mean, we must have been like early teens and we just dug a properly deep hole that you had to climb down into and eventually a lifeguard just came over and was like, boys, you have to fill the hole in. It's actually dangerous. <laughs> I was like, okay, but what are these kids up to? A further 10 feet down, they once again encountered a log platform. At 30 feet deep? What are you up to? This is amazing! They found yet another level of logs, and being quite out of puff by this point, they must have done this over many days, no? They asked some townspeople for help. None was forthcoming, so they had to abandon the dig, as it was just getting too hard for these young fellows to do by themselves. I'm presuming that they were also using ropes or ladders or something, as a 30-foot hole in loose earth is a heck of a climb back up. It wasn't until several years later, between 1802 and 1804, that the excavation of the pit resumed. They must have had, like... Who are these kids? I'm so amazed. Maybe just kids in the past, they just had more gumption and less uh, less video games to distract. Because I'd be like, yeah, yeah, we dug it down about a foot. And then the earth got really hard and we just had like one shovel between us. So we, we just gave up and went home to play Xbox. That's what had happened to me as a kid. <laughs> A group called Onslow Company, which included Daniel McInnes and his two friends, returned to the island and the area, which had since become known as the Money Pit. They kept digging down, still finding the wooden platforms every 10 feet, and also incongruous materials such as coconut fiber. When the dig hit 90 feet, 27 and a half meters, a strange dark stone was found. Inscribed on it were symbols that nobody could translate at the time, but were much later decoded to read, 40 feet below, 2 million pounds are buried. Eventually, this is an, uh, is this, this reads like a fiction story. I love it. It's also definitely reminds me of something like, I feel like I've, I've read about this or heard about this somewhere. I might have even made a video about this at some point, but I've made so many videos, it's like, I definitely forget about all this stuff. But it does seem a bit more familiar to me now. Eventually, the Onslow company hit something hard, which some people thought to be a treasure chest, and decided to stop for the night and save the excitement of the discovery for the next morning. This turned out to be a foolish decision, however, as the shaft they had dug flooded with water overnight. After trying to get around this by digging a secondary tunnel, which also kept flooding, the project was once again put on hold. Some 40 years later, in 1848 or 1849, an outfit calling itself the Truro Company tried to become the next group to claim treasure hunting glory. Also stymied by the now regular flooding of the main tunnel, the Truro Company expanded the search to other areas of the island where they found further underground tunnel systems in an area known as Smith's Cove. What was going on on this island? I can't believe that pirates were actually burying their treasure. But then again, who would go to the effort of putting those logs every 10 feet and then putting a weird stone? Like, that's wild. After digging at another shaft to try and negate the flooded tunnels, the bottom of the original money pit hole collapsed, possibly sending the treasure even further down. The Truro Company uncovered a few artifacts such as a gold chain, such as some gold chain links and some wire, but admitted defeat and abandoned the dig in 1851 after funding dried up. The Oak Island Association was the next group to have a go, armed with pumps to try and keep the tunnels from flooding. It's a good idea. They again dug more shafts to try and access the original money pit and divert the flood water. They were also unsuccessful as the water kept coming back and Oak Island claimed its first victim when a pump exploded in 1861, killing one of the workers. Their search was abandoned in 1865 when funding again ran out. We better have solved this. <laughs> it's a hundred and something years ago. Nearly 200 years ago. No, not quite. Like 150 years ago, right? This better be solved. <laughs> Undeterred treasure hunters kept coming to the island throughout the rest of the 19th century, deepening the money pit to almost 160 feet, that's 49 meters underground. At this depth, a box was found containing pieces of parchment that allegedly pointed to documents by 16th century author Francis Bacon being part of the treasure trove. In 1897, the island claimed its second victim when a man fell to his death down one of the shafts. In 1868, excavators tried to discover which areas the flood water was coming from by pouring paint or dye into the hole, but the dye just fed out from several different locations around the island not really helping them. If this is all some elaborate pr prank, right, that some like old school pirate or dude back in the day just buried this stone saying there's loads of treasure here just as a prank, he'd be like, he probably didn't see it coming to this, did he? <laughs> With like people dying, I'm assuming millions of Canadian dollars being, or pounds or whatever they had back in the day uh, being spent on this. I mean, it's kind of intense. 
Entering the 20th century, people were still as convinced as ever that there was a giant haul of loot somewhere on this increasingly holy island. In 1909, future president of the USA, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, was one of a group to further investigate the money pit, although nothing of much interest was found. After a constant stream of other attempts, Robert Restall arrived in 1959 with a small group to try his luck. Unfortunately, while digging in Smith's Cove in 1965, he passed out due to hydrogen sulfide fumes. In the rescue attempt, Restall, his son, and two other workers all lost their lives, bringing Oaks Treasure Island's hunting victims to six. And the death toll goes up. Excavators were getting serious now, and heavy machinery was starting to be used to help dig out those annoyingly flooded tunnels. Later, in 1965, a 200-meter, 656-foot-long causeway was built to attach the islands to the mainland so a crane could be brought across. This causeway is still in place today, all to hunt for some treasure. I mean, on the chance that you would find it, on the chance that it's actually there, I mean, how much are we really talking about here? It's not going to be two million, like, physical pounds, like... What would that be, like 2,000 tons of gold? That would be insane. Is there even 2,000 tons of gold in the world? I am mean, probably. How much gold is there in the world? 244,000 metric tons. Isn't Google amazing? So yes, there'd, there'd be enough gold for that. Way, way enough. It's a lot of gold. In 1969, most of Oak Island was bought by the Triton Alliance, and a new shaft known Elon Muskly as Borehole 10X was dug, going down to a whopping 235 feet or 72 meters. Cameras lowered into the hole recorded images of human skulls, tools, and treasure chests, but unfortunately the shaft collapsed before further work could be done. Oh, what? This is. It's like a fiction story. In 1981, another intriguing line of inquiry opened up. One member of the Triton Alliance, Fred Nolan, found five boulders that formed a symmetrical cross. Not quite an X marks the spot, but in the middle was a sixth boulder with the image of a sword and a face. These are symbols linked to the Knights Templar, which in turn created the theory that legendary lost treasures, the Ark of the Covenant, or even the Holy Grail, might be hidden on Oak Island. While the island was still being explored over the course of the 80s and early 1990s, legal battles over ownership and other financial financing problems brought most of the work to a halt. In 2007, yet another group was set up to search for the lost treasure. Oak Island Tours consisted, consisted of Dave Blankenship, the original founder of Triton Alliance, and rich Michigan bros Rick and Marty Legina, not Ricky Martin, not Rick and Morty, Rick and Marty, yes! In 2014, the brothers Legina entered, it's so hard not to say Legina. <laughs> Legina started documenting their explorations via a show on the History Channel called The Curse of Oak Island. This is a great idea for a show. Although, why do you have to call it the curse? a curse? The Curse of Oak Island. That's only something the History Channel would do. Why not just call it Searching for Kick-Ass Treasure on, Lonely, on Oak Island with Rick and Marty? That's a brilliant name, and it doesn't involve any bullshit curses, History Channel. Why do you have to do this? In case you were wondering, the curse refers to a legend saying that seven people would die before the Oak Island treasure is revealed. If you recall, six people have already died in the search, so place your bets on which brother is going to cop it before the other gets all the glory. Uh, neither of them, because it's not real. And even if one of them did die and then they find the treasure, it's still not real. It's just a coincidence. The real history. Ah, finally. <laughs> All right, you've heard the legend version featuring pirate treasure, a curse, a mysteriously engraved stone, and tantalizing glimpses of possible riches. Wait, 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 wait. I was saying, I, I was saying this whole time that it reads like a fiction story. Is this just basically a legend? Because it sounds, they seem to be like real groups and companies and people digging for this stuff, right? I mean, it does seem a little bit like all through, I'm like, you know. It sounds like fiction, which is another way of saying it's a little bit unbelievable, isn't it? Is this not real? Katie, have you led me down the garden path? And people listening to this knowing about Oak Island are probably like, Simon is absolutely falling for all this shit right now. Let's find out. All right, you've heard the legend version featuring pirate treasure, a curse, a mysteriously engraved stone, and tantalizing glimpses of possible riches. Let's go through and basically crap all over it then. Starting at the beginning, the whole story about teenager Daniel McInnes, or McGuinness, uh, is open to debate. As you can see, there's not even a consensus on how to spell his last name. Yeah, it's McInnes with an I, or McGuinness with a G. Most sources say that he was a teenager, but apparently he was actually a man in his late 30s and he was on Oak Island to potentially buy a farm. While it's not a massive deal that he was 20 years older than most people thought, it does set the tone for the story 
story of the island's treasure and that's that it's all about hearsay nova scotia had, has been explored by europeans since at least the 1500s with the portuguese scottish french and english variously calling it home this does mean that pirates could also have been paying visit to the small island over the years stashing their loot away for future retrieval Unfortunately, the whole dying pirate deathbed confession story that the settlers brought with them is just that. It's a story. There's absolutely no evidence for it whatsoever, and it also makes no real sense. Why would a pirate give away his lifetime of booty to anyone in the future who cared to have it? Surely two million quid of treasure in those days would be more than enough to keep you out of the reach of the law for any pirate-related activities. And were pirates really the saving type? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> what I said at the beginning. And how did one man become the last person in the world with knowledge of this gigantic stash? Anyway, legends have a habit of sticking in our minds, so it's quite possible that McGuinness was thinking there might be something buried under the ground. Now, again, this whole part of the next story is totally unreliable. Nobody wrote anything down or recorded the initial dig in any way. Yeah, I mean, there's, the kids digging down like 30 feet is just like, come on, come on. They're children, they're teenagers. I mean, I was making a joke about them not having Xboxes to be distracted by, but 30 feet is a proper excavation. The story was not related until years later. We only have passed down hearsay that the men found these log platforms at the random spot McInnes had decided to dig. There are rumors again of trees forming a triangle and cut marks in the bark to give him a clue, but this was probably just made up later to add to the mystery. Nothing was documented until the Onslow company started searching in 1804, but this was also not particularly detailed and they didn't carry out the excavation as an archaeological project. They and every subsequent search party just dug straight down through whatever they found, potentially destroying useful information along the way. In the legend version, there are log platforms every 10 feet down the original money pit to about 90 feet deep. In recorded versions, it's only stated that there are markings every 10 feet or so, which really could mean anything and reduces the impact of the idea that these were man-made platforms. So all of this stuff that's just really crazy and unbelievable turns out to be unbelievable. Shocking. The story was too cool. That's the problem. The story was too cool. So what about the engraved stone stating that there's only 40 feet to go before you reach the treasure? Well, let's have a look at it. Oh, we can't because no one's seen it since the late 1800s and there are varying reports of it having inscriptions or just being a big old stone with nothing on it. If there were inscriptions, nobody took a rubbing, copied them, or seemed in any way curious as to what they might mean. The purported inscription you can find now is just made up of what looked like standard symbols and was cracked by a simple letter substitution that apparently nobody was able to work out in the hundreds of years between it being found and the message being revealed. The code was eventually passed on by people vaguely rem- remembering what it looked like after maybe having seen it a couple of times, so how it managed to survive intact and turn out to be this very specific message is incredibly suspicious. It's not just incredibly suspicious, it's basically entirely unbelievable, and I can begin to see why the History Channel chose to pick this up. The message, which was 40 feet below, 2 million pounds are buried, is not in itself very much help. So why was it even coded in the first place? Plus, the money pit went way further than 40 feet under the stone and nothing of value was ever found. The stone seems to be an unprovable red herring. Seems to be a lot of unprovable red herrings, doesn't there? Let's move on to the mysterious flooding of the money pit, just when they were getting to the good bits. Some people think that the treasure was protected by booby traps and that the diggers had activated the flooding system as they got closer. Or, or alternatively, you're on an island and when you dig down, you're going to get to the water table, aren't you? Because you're on an island. I mean, anyway, you're going to get to the water table eventually and it's going to flood. You, 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 come on, there's no booby traps. Due to all the many other shafts dug, the natural geology of the island and the systems under it, it's been difficult to tell where the water had been coming from, but a more recent dye test by the Legina's has shown that it's likely connected to a channel from the Smith's Cove area of the island some 520 feet, 158 meters away. It's still not clear whether this is just a natural channel or a pirate-made booby trap, but I'm starting to swing towards the non-man-made explanations for the whole thing. Yeah, water table, underwater channel, whatever, it's natural. No one's digging burying their treasure, all of this crazy and then digging some complicated, like, ancient Egypt pharaoh-style trap. Come on. No. Also, as the tunnel has been flooded for two centuries, what are the chances that anything in there is still worth having? Well, I mean, gold's definitely not gonna, like, decay or anything, is it? 
And what about the cameras put down Borehole 10X in the early 1970s? Reports came back of human remains and possible treasure chests, but watching it today, the footage is pretty grainy, and the shadows, water, and video quality make it hard to even work out the orientation of things that you might be looking at. It's just a matter of seeing what you want to see. There's no obvious chest, skull, or anything really, and the tunnel collapsed shortly afterwards, reburying whatever might have been there in the first place, which was probably nothing. So, let's sidestep this whole mess and talk about some of the things that people have thought might be buried on the island. It's a pretty crazy list, and just imagine if all of this totally unconnected stuff is actually there. That'd have me eating my words at the tea party thrown by the Loch Ness Monster. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Tell you what, I'll literally save this script, and I will slowly consume it if uh, it turns out that they find... Um, two million pounds worth of treasure on this island. And I don't mean they find like some little coins from back in the day. I mean they find a proper big ass treasure hole. Then I will eat this script. I will eat it. Slowly over time. I obviously can't eat it all in one session or I'll probably die. But I'll eat little pieces of it over time. <laughs> I'm not going to have to do it there, am I? Because I'm just not. Treasure Theories so we know the one about pirate treasure possibly from captain kidd who sailed the seas in the late 17th century and was really yes really known to have stashed small amounts of treasure in various places oh there you go a pirate who did bury his treasure simon not such a big brain after all the thing that makes this whole pirate loot theory fall apart for me is that it just seems to involve way too much effort if you're a swashbuckling scurvy sea dog who's doing quite well it makes sense to hide a bit of gold here and there for future use i get that but how much effort would you go to to hide it would you dig a hole over 200 feet 61 meters deep and then construct multiple log platforms to block the way down wouldn't they serve as obvious markers that something was down there and then would you really have the time to set up and dig out some elaborate flooding booby trap tunnel that nobody's been able to figure out in over 200 years it all seems a bit far-fetched speaking of far-fetched let's look at what else is supposedly possibly buried on oak island i mentioned the knights templar and the ark of the covenant or holy grail before yes if you hear buried treasure and see a hint of religious iconography you're going to jump straight to the biggest lost treasures there are the knights templar were disbanded in the early 1300s so if they did make it to canada they were pretty far ahead of the game <laughs> yes it's possible that their treasure was passed to other religious orders or the freemasons and were then hidden on oak island at a later day but nothing substantive has been found so far and while obviously none of this impossible is impossible it just seems absolutely wildly unlikely a couple of templar connected things have been found but most of them are symbolic like the supposed cross made up of boulders this also seems a bit sus the island is very small and it was only in the 1980s that the five boulders were noted as being in a cross formation from above the man who discovered the cross fred nolan dug in the center of it and unearthed another boulder that was roughly in the shape of a head the legend version calls this a stone with a head and a sword on it but it really is just one of those objects that can look like a head if you want it to yeah it's just the human brain just we're spying patterns in absolutely nothing it's the same reason you look at clouds and be like oh that one looks a bit like a lion doesn't it ah it's like it's not a lion you know it's not a lion it's just a cloud that looks like a lion it doesn't even really look like a lion it's just humans are really good at spotting patterns even when they're not there and there was no sword symbol and just an indented area that excavators decided could be a place to rest a sword the other issue i have with all of this is that the nolan cross from above does not look like the traditional templar cross which is a symmetrical one with arms of all equal length the one fred discovered on his land is much longer with the arms connecting nearer the top i'm not opposed to the possibility of there being templar artifacts on the island but the holy grail well give me a break something else that might be on the island apparently is a load of documents by francis bacon that will prove that he's the true author of shakespeare's works oh this is painfully wrong this is the 16th century statesman francis bacon not the 20th century unsettling artist francis bacon although at this point it's just as likely that a folio of his undiscovered works are also hidden somewhere on the islands yeah entirely this is truly ridiculous i mean if you're listening to this and you believe that on oak island there's a document stash from a dude called francis bacon saying that he's the author of shakespeare's plays you need to smoke less crack 
To be honest, I have absolutely no clue as to how or why this Shakespeare theory is even a thing. This was found in 1897. No other paper or documents have been found since then. It's been stated that the visible link formed the letters of VI or WI, but it is not conclusive and looks more like an R to me. Did someone extrapolate William Shakespeare from this total piece of nothing? Well, there is an R in Shakespeare, so uh, it could have been part of that. I mean, come on, Katie. Easily. Not really. That's a joke. Theories also popped up that clues in Shakespeare's works pointed to Francis Bacon being the author, and someone even managed to wrangle a destination near Oak Island out of random capitalizations in his works, but it all seems pretty ropey to me. Mm Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yes. I mean, also in the past, they didn't really give a shit about like capitalization and grammar and stuff. They just made it up as they went along. Like, looking at original Shakespeare, like, what is this? <laughs> Do you even know English? And it's Shakespeare. Let's have another one. The Jewels of Mary Antoinette. I mean, why not? This was the favorite theory of Franklin D. Roosevelt, who was a bit, a bit of an Oak Island nut. I absolutely assumed that Katie was putting that in there as a joke, but uh, apparently not. FDR, come on, man. You're cooler than that. Prior to her arrest by the revolutionaries, Marie Antoinette gave her favorite jewels to a maid who smuggled them out of the palace and ended up hiding them in a deep hole on a small island off the coast of Nova Scotia. Of course, this theory was considered fairly credible and seemed to be very popular until 2018, when a veritable treasure trove, you might say, of her jewelry was auctioned by Sotheby's. Far from being in a damp hole in the ground this whole time, they were actually in possession of Mary Antoinette's heirs, and the ten items, made up of mostly exquisite diamonds and pearl pieces, sold for a combined $42.7 million. Holy shit. So yes, quite a haul if they'd been buried on Oak Island, but they weren't. They were passed down to her heirs. Can you imagine just having a bag of Marie Antoinette stuff? You'd be like, oh my god, we're going to be so rich. It's like our great, 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 great grandmother. Yes! 42.7 minutes. She must have a lot of descendants, though. Other theories. There are other less outlandish theories as to what might be under Oak Island. A popular one is that it's the spoils of a wrecked Spanish galleon found by the English aristocrat William Pipps. He had already looted it once before and was tasked with finding more funds to help overthrow the unpopular Catholic king, James II. Pips went back to his secret sunken ship, that is a tongue twister, and his crew decided to put a bit aside for themselves on Oak Island. While they were trying to do this, however, an underground cavern collapsed and flooded, effectively making it impossible to retrieve the treasure. All of that is just infinitely more likely than anything that has been mentioned so far. The money pit for that is what they dug was sealed off by pips and they went back to England and admitted that it lost all the loot on the island. Sometime in the 1750s, the British came back to dig more tunnels to booby trap the treasure, ensuring that nobody would ever be able to get their hands on it. Well, why didn't they just dig it up and take it home? Makes no sense. There have been some wood and tools found which date to the right period, and it seems more likely that if the tunnels were purposefully made to flood, an organized group with the remit to do just that are more than likely to have dug it than a group of pirates, are more likely to have dug it than a group of pirates, but I'm still hung up on why anyone even thinks there's treasure there at all. Yeah. It's just super unlikely, isn't it? Another idea is that the money pit is actually a Viking ship that's been sucked into a sinkhole and is standing on ends. Okay, because of the the wood things that they're digging through, this is ridiculous. This is actually ridiculous. The log plat again, I will eat the script if this turns out to be true. It's like, yeah, 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 we dug those log platforms and it turns out to be a Viking ship pointed like vertical and there's treasure in it. Another thing, if they find I will eat this script slowly over time, a piece at a time. The log platforms could be seat rests for rowers. Not really convincing stuff, is it? Where is any other other evidence of a ship, and how did it get onto the mainland and then fall vertically into a hole? Also, as previously mentioned, we have no physical or written evidence of the finding of these wooden platforms. It's literally word of mouth from 1795, and in case you didn't know, that's a really long time ago. And while there might have been something there, it might have just been lost in the retelling, and something like branches or a few logs, which might have naturally fallen in and been covered up over time, turned into the regularly spaced wooden platforms in the Treasure Hunter version. This leads on to another credible idea that the whole pit is just a big old sinkhole. There has been at least one other sinkhole found on Oak Island, and it would explain how the ground was easy to dig. Anything found in the shaft could just be flotsam or jetsam, washed up and onto the island over time, or just left behind by indigenous people, early Europeans, or any of the many 
many, many previous digging teams. The coconut fibers found in the tunnel seem to be some proof that humans created the tunnel system. Coconut trees are obviously not native to Canada, but the fibers were commonly used as packing materials and were also made into rope in the 18th and 19th centuries, so any found since then might be remnants from previous excavations. As this was not an uncommon area for ships to be in, it might also just be debris left over from other visitors to the island or something that had been washed up and accumulated from nearby shipwrecks or lost cargo. Ah yes, actually reasonable explanations for all of this stuff. And what of this very specific curse of seven people dying before the treasure is revealed? Was it written down somewhere and then discovered during an excavation? Was it part of the original story from the dying pirate? No, it just sort of sprung up out of nowhere as these things do. I'm not even sure if it started before or after the current death toll of six workers on the islands. But maybe one of the Legionists should do the decent thing, which would finally solve the mystery either way. There's no mystery. There's no curse. It's just ridiculous. And it's ridiculous the History Channel of a show about this. Artifacts found. And what have they found in 225 years of digging? Well, not a whole lot. Probably less, in fact, than you'll find almost anywhere else on the planet. Okay, that's not a fact, but there is very little to show for the amount of work that's been put into plumbing the depths of the island for all it's worth. There is a list of artifacts on on the oakislandmystery.com. That's all as one word, and it was hard to read all as one word. Oakislandmystery.com. Uh, and one of them is listed as a valuable item from a money pit. Sounds intriguing. Was it, perchance, a piece of gold or anything at all that might give credence to there being actual treasure underground? Nope. It was reported in a newspaper that in 1849, a man with the possibly made-up name of Pit Blado was seen pocketing an item he took off the end of his drill. The person reporting this to the papers just seems to have decided for himself that it was valuable. So maybe the 19th century teams just stole everything for themselves. Also, the newspaper report was from 1862, some 13 years after the alleged pocketing. So this website claims that something's valuable, when really it's a second-hand or a third-hand story from someone who saw something which doesn't sound like that convincing at all. This never happens. It never happens. With razor-sharp cataloging and reporting like this, it's no wonder the seam of hope has been left alive for future generations to mine. But really, there had been really there has been barely anything of note found on the island. The gold chain that's bandied about wasn't a gold necklace or some nice thick links, but rather something that could have fallen off a military uniform. And it was found in 1849, with no other context given as to what else might have been with it. On the History Channel's website, there is a list of top 25 treasures found on the island so far, but a quick perusal will tell you that treasures is a clickbait title if there ever was one. Shocking behavior from the History Channel right there, isn't it? Coming in at number one is the money pit itself, which is not necessarily a treasure and has not divulged any treasure thus far. Also included on this list are the dull as all buggery coconut fibers and a Roman sword, which would have been a colossal find as the Romans didn't make it to North America as far as anyone knows. <laughs> they did not. Well, as you might have guessed, the sword was just a modern replica and totally worthless. And that is an item that makes it onto the History Channel's website of most valuable items. A piece of sh Roman replica sword that someone just left on the island. Next up, yeah, it's an empty can of Diet Coke that someone left behind. History Channel. Everybody. History Channel. In the present day, the Legionas haven't found much either, with their haul so far totaling about one coin and a silver button, which can be topped in about half an hour these days by anybody, anywhere, with a metal detector. Yes, I mean, their greatest treasure, though, has been the money that they've made from a show on the History Channel. So why do people keep digging here when there doesn't appear to be much of a reason to keep digging? A budget from the History Channel. <laughs> The current owners are basically totally invested in the search now and have a History Channel show to prove it. Thank you. They've dragged it out a bit. The Curse of Oak Island started in 2014 and eight seasons and 140 episodes later, the treasure is yet to be unearthed. How do you do it, History Channel? How do you do it? How would I make 140 episodes that was just basically what we've covered today? It's amazing. And I don't understand how people still watch that crap. Allegedly in my opinion. Is this a canny ploy by the brothers to spin it out for as long as possible? Yes, it is. How long can they go before admitting defeat? It's well, when the views and the money dry up. That's how long. It's not clear how much money has been spent on excavating Oak Island, but it's definitely spiraling into the multi-millions now. 
While Marty Legina and his business partner are apparently partially funding the current dig, they likely also receive funding from other investors, the History Channel, tourism to the island, and possibly grants from the Canadian government. Canadian government, why are you wasting money on this? In researching the history of Oak Island, all I can conclude is that the money pit is so-called not because there's a ton of money in it, but I know where this is going, but because of the amount that's been chucked in by gullible fools throughout the centuries and the History Channel. And the so-called curse is not something that's haunting the islands to protect the treasure, it's something intangible, the lust for gold, that's taken hold of these people and won't let go until it's bled them all financially dry. If there ever was any loot in a hole on the island, with all the tunnel floodings and collapses, it's likely past the point of retrieval by now. Of course, I shall be as excited as the next person if anything ever does pop up, but I'm not holding my breath. And I'm not excited about it, because if they do find two million pounds of treasure, eating this script, aren't I? And this has been an episode of Decoding the Unknown. I do hope you enjoyed it, our sarcastic troll through the treasure on Oak Island. So if you're planning a trip there, well, hopefully you're not anymore because it's a total waste of time. If you enjoy this show and you're listening to it as a podcast, please do leave it a review. If you're watching on YouTube, smash that thumbs up button. Make sure you're subscribed. And thank you for watching. Hello everybody, welcome back to another episode of Decoding the Unknown. As always, I am your host, Simon. What happens here is Katie has written us a script on Decker, the Poltergeist Rain Boy. I, as always, am going to read it. It's about poltergeists. I don't believe in any of this stuff. Uh, so this is, is, is going to be fun. Jen, afterwards, our wonderful video editor, is going to, uh, well, edit the video. That's what she does. Let us get into it. <laughs> Hi, Simon. Oh, no, I am supposed to read this. This is uh, for broadcast. Hi, Simon. I know you're going to want to dump all over this being the skeptical, level-headed chap that you are. Yes, I take all of that as a compliment. Often people are like, Simon, couldn't you be a little bit more open-minded? And I'm like, yo, yo. People have been talking about ghosts for a really long time and poltergeists and supernatural and all of this stuff. And all we have to show for it is absolutely nothing. And there's this absolute legend called James Randi, who was like, he died recently, RIP, you absolute legend. And he was like, yo, if you can prove to me and meet these criteria that, you know, ghosts or whatever, I can't even remember exactly what it was, exist, I'll give you like a million dollars. It wasn't a million dollars, it was a lot of money. And no one ever could, which says something about it, doesn't it? But I mean, if you want to believe, believe, that's fine. I don't mind. I just think you're a little silly. But just take a moment to hear the story before poo-pooing it so readily. Okay, I'm going in with an open mind, Katie. Maybe there are really some things that can't be explained away. Do you think you could do it? Okay, this episode is not a strange 80s movie mashup in which a young Dustin Hoffman makes playing cards fly about by themselves. It's about Don Decker, a man who was possessed by a demon and acquired the ability to make it rain indoors. Um, except no, he didn't. <laughs> Shh, no, hush now. Let's be Katie. I swear I don't read these ahead of time. Katie knows exactly what I'd be saying at that point. It's like, no, you didn't. No, you didn't. She's like, shut up and listen to the story, fact boy. Okay, I'm going in with an open mind. Let me see if I can be persuaded. And I just wanted to pull something out here. Maybe there are some things that can't be explained away. Fully accept that. There are some things that cannot be explained. But you know how they will be explained eventually? It's not by ghosts. It's not by any of that sh It's by science isn't it? That's how it will eventually be shown. Don Decker and the Mysterious Moisture. I feel like that's a better name for this whole episode. In February 1983, Don Decker, who sounds a lot like he could be a minor character from Mad Men, was granted a furlough from his jail in the Pocona Mountains, Pennsylvania, to go to his grandfather's funeral. He was not considered dangerous or violent and was on a 4-12 to month stretch for receiving stolen goods. Apparently, his time out of jail was for several days with no police officer with him. Uh, at the at the risk of sense telling the story again i've tro told that story the time i bought a stolen drone you know like a photography drone by accident off ebay i fortunately didn't get four to twelve months in prison i know buying stolen goods is a crime but you have to know you're doing it right you can't just buy a drone off ebay for a reasonable price and then be guilty of a crime i mean i hope not at least otherwise 
Well, I'm guessing I'm going to have to face the music for that at some point. Anyway, Don was allowed out of jail for a few days uh, for this sad family occasion, but it wasn't particularly sad for him. That's because, according to Don, his grandfather had been abusive to him since he was seven years old. That sounds like an absolute double win for Don, doesn't it? It's like, yes, abusive grandfather's dead, and I get to go out of jail for his funeral. And by funeral, I mean I'm going to go to the pub. Because, granddad. We only have Don's word for it, but it does seem pretty low to not believe him about something like this, so let's go and give him the benefit of the doubt here. Yeah, I mean, why not? Why would we not believe this? They'd be like, yeah, yeah, granddad abused me. Why are you lying, Don? I'm not lying. I have no reason not to believe you. Yet, Don. Yet. His grandfather died from cirrhosis of the liver, and although I'm not a medical professional, it's more than likely that this was caused by alcohol abuse, giving Don's claim more credence. The funeral was an upsetting time for Don, and he, as he was seeing his abuser lauded and celebrated by the rest of the party while he kept his dark secret to himself. I just not go. He's not any police with him. Just go to the pub. It's okay, Don. After a while, Don said goodbye to his not beloved relative and went to stay the night with his friends, Bob and Jenny Kiefer. There are conflicting reports as to why he didn't stay with his family, either he wanted nothing to do with them or vice versa, but whatever the reason, he stayed that night at the house of his pals in Stroud. Aldsburg, Pennsylvania. Maybe because he wanted to see his friends at the same time. It's like, yo, yo, family, I'll see you at the funeral. Then afterwards, I'm going to go to the pub with my dear friends, Bob and whoever. While washing his hands in the upstairs bathroom prior to having dinner, Don started to feel very weird and saw a vision of an old man wearing a crown that was looking at him through a window that had appeared out of nowhere. Sounds realistic. Or either that, or Don has mental health difficulties. <laughs> there was a sense of intense evil in the air, and as the vision disappeared, Don saw that he had deep, bleeding scratches on his wrist. I feel a sense of impatience from you, Mr. Whistler. <laughs> How could you tell, Katie? How could you tell? So far, so laughable, right? Well, hold on. We're getting to the good bit. As he went back downstairs to sit with Bob and Jenny. Uh, is it Jenny? Genie? Genie, maybe. Genie. Bob and Genie. A change came over Don, and he seemed to be in some sort of trance state. As his friends started asking about the blood on his arm, he told them, that it had been Satan, <laughs> as you do. All of a sudden, water started dripping from the walls and the ceiling of the living room, what can only be described as a homeowner's nightmare. Oh my god. <laughs> Once I absolutely did this in my own home, but it wasn't because I was like magically possessed by Satan. Uh, I grew up in this old, like, it was it Edwardian or Victorian house. It was really old, really old. And uh, I we had an upstairs bathroom, obviously, and it had this big old like iron. I don't know if it's iron. It was some sort of weird metal, and it was so old that you know that emergency water. You know where the bath gets too full, and then there's that thing to take the water out. This bath was so old that there was that that was just entirely blocked by lime scale. And I started running a bath. I must have been like 13, 14 years old. Absolutely forgot about it. And my parents were on holiday, and uh, yeah, that bath overflowed. And the down to the utility room, which was directly beneath the bathroom, was absolutely flooded the <laughs> out of. Like, the water was dripping from the ceiling. It was like Satan had possessed me. Luckily for the Kaifers, they were renting the property on Ann Street, so Bob got straight onto the phone on the, with the landlord and awesome name owner, Ron Van Wy. Legend. By the time he turned up, the water was still appearing, but weirdly, only in the living room. I know what you're thinking. Obviously a burst pipe there. Well, no, smarty pants. According to the landlord, the plumbing was all in the back of the house, so there were no pipes going over the living room. That's Van Wy. Did they turn the water off in an attempt to stop the deluge? I don't know. This doesn't appear to have occurred to anyone, and as it was restricted to the living room, it seems that there were weirder things afoot. Oh, well, the other day, I just wake up in the middle of the night, and my wife's like, the bathroom's flooded. And I'm like, what are you talking about? And I go in the bathroom, and there's the, the pipe by the shower is just absolutely spraying everywhere. I immediately turn off the master watercock. Because that's what you do. Anyway, Ron Van Wy said that not only was water coming down the walls, drops were also drifting from wall to wall and even coming up into the air from the floor in a display that shattered the laws of physics and gravity. Now that's a little more weird. I'm not sure like shutting off the master water is going to stop the whole gravity thing. Unsure of what to do, he called the local police. My first thought might have been a plumber, but that's Van Wy for you. Enter officers Richard Walbert and rejected Le Miserable clamorant character Jean Beaujean. 
Nowadays, you might not be so quickly inclined to believe the words of a police officer just because they're a police officer, but both men had gone on the record to state that they experienced the same thing as the Kaifers and Van Wy. Robert described ever entering the house and being absolutely pelted. Both men say they saw a droplet of water travel horizontally between them and go out of the room. The timeline gets a little muddled here, with some sources saying that the rest of the events played out on the same night, while others say that the next stage happened the next day. Either way, there's nobody had a clue what to do and Decker was just sitting there the whole time. At some point, the Kaifers and Decker left the house to get some food and the police officers called their chief to include him in the crazy happenings that were going on on Ann Street. Ron Van Wy noted that as soon as the group left the house, the interior rain dried up. Across the street was a pizza restaurant, so the Kaifers and Don went in there for some food. The proprietor, a certain Ms. Pam Scrifano, had apparently visited the Kaifer house earlier in the proceedings and was familiar with the whole indoor rain thing as you are she also noticed that don was behaving a bit weirdly and seemed to be in some sort of trance seemingly given to jumping to conclusions pam scrafano declared that it looked like don was possessed as if in confirmation water started coming down the pizza restaurant walls as well so now it's raining inside the restaurant vindicated pam did the only sensible thing you could do when faced with a water summoning demon i get the feeling the the next line is going to be ridiculous. She headed to the cash register and pulled, pulled out a crucifix. That's one does. <laughs> Why she had a crucifix in the cash register is not explained. Although, as the owner of a pizza restaurant, you probably are subjected to many unholy encounters throughout your tenure, so it's a good idea to have one handy. She forced the crucifix against Don's skin, and according to her and Don, it burned him. So yes, the definitive textbook proof of demonic possession. It was at this point that things finally seemed to click, and Don realized that he wasn't just hanging about in buildings with terrible plumbing issues. It was he himself that was making it rain. <laughs> this, is, this is so ridiculous. And this is one of those things where it's like, all right, all right, so obviously something weird's going on. There are a lot of people involved for this just to be made up somehow. But I mean, unless I saw it myself, there is... Uh, and even if I did see it myself, I'd still be like, there is a rational explanation. And that's like, obviously not everything can be explained away. Like, I cannot explain this. I don't have close to enough information. But what I do know is it's not Don the Poltergeist possessed by a demon and his burning flesh. It's just a bit silly. Dampening the toppings was not doing anything to endear him to Pam, so the party left once again and went back to the Kaifer's place. If you thought you'd heard the last of the good names, we're going to pull another one out of the bag here, possibly named after the priciest salad on the menu at TJI Fridays. It's Ron's wife, Romaine Van Wy. Van Wy is such a good name. Is that, it's like got to be Dutch or something. As soon as Don got back inside, the rain started up again, and Romaine and Jenny Kiefer started yelling at Don to just get a hold of himself and stop ruining the soft furnishings. Perhaps miffed at being yelled at, possessed Don reacted in a totally predictable way. First, all the pots and pans started banging about by themselves. Then Don levitated off the floor and flew across the room. I suppose after that, the women felt bad about having a go at him, as he wasn't thrown out or asked to leave, which might have been a decent idea. You know, hey Don, why didn't you go out and stand in the garden and help my beans along? <laughs> or whatever. I'll just get the hell out of my house and stop ruining shit. I don't care if you're possessed by a demon or have just set up some weird sprinkler system in my living room. Either way, I want you out, Don. You're ruining my sofa. Shortly after this, police officers Warbert and Baojan returns with their chief Gary Roberts in tow. Disappointingly for them, instead of being wowed at the indoor rain shower and giving everybody promotions, the chief was totally dismissive, writing it off as a plumbing issue. I like you, chief. Telling the officers to telling the officers off for wasting his time and forbidding them to mention it again or make this into a police matter. In an episode of Unsolved Mysteries that aired a decade after the events in Stroudsburg, Officer Baojan said of the chief's reaction, quote, I got the impression that he was put on the spot, maybe a little embarrassed, like we expected something out of him that he could answer. There was no way to explain what happened. I think he was put in a position where he might have felt a little uncomfortable. He just flat out denied it. It didn't happen, and he tried to convince me that nothing happened. And he wasn't going to do that. I saw it, and that's all there is to it. Except you're saying he, you saw it, and you're saying the chief saw it, and then is lying about not seeing it, which is a bit weird. Like, I feel that you, like random police officer coming to this, have a reason to lie. It's like, ah, oh, you know, it's a little bit of fame. You're going to appear on a TV show. The chief has absolutely nothing, like, 
what's he got to gain by saying that it didn't happen? Like, what? I can't spot it. Ignoring the chief's orders, the police officers, of course, told their colleagues about the mysterious events going on in the Kaifa house, and the next day, two more of them headed over. Yes, I know the timeline seems to be dragging on. Presumably, it was raining all night in the living room, too. I'm not sure. And if this had been me, spending more time with a possessed criminal playing havoc with my rental deposit would not be what I'd choose to be doing. The next team of officers showed up again, and Don was acting all sullen and dopey and trance-like. In a reenactment in the Unsolved Mysteries episode, it shows the police officers putting a paper bag over Don's head and then, without him seeing, pressing another crucifix onto his hand. Is this correct police procedure? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it sure is. It's about, as, it's about as right as everything else in this episode. If only cell phones were around in those days. Anyway, according to Officer Bill Davies, quote, We're standing there and I give Mr. Decker this gold cross to hold. Next thing he says is, It's burning my hands! And there's no explanation from it. When you picked it up, when you grabbed it, it's not hot hot, but it's hot, and I held on to it. Well, good for you, Mr. Davies. I think we've already established from the whole cash register crucifix episode that Don was undoubtedly possessed. Even if there is some like supernatural goings on, to then tie it into like religion and crucifixes is even just more silly. You see, it's just like, no, no, don't, no. He also did the whole levitating and flying across the room thing again when the officers rushed over to him, and he had three deep scratches on his neck. Cue everyone freaking out. Nobody had ever experienced anything like it. As Don was still in his furlough break and hadn't committed any crimes, the police officers left him be and went back to work. On Don's final night before going back to jail, the Van Wise, after exhausting the go-to priests for exorcisms around the Stroudsburg area, eventually found a priest to come to their house and try to expel the rain demon from within Don Decker. And it worked! As she prayed, the Van Wise and the Kaifers saw Don shudder and convulse in the way possessed people do when there's a battle for their body and soul. Everyone knows that, and it's not from real life, it's from movies. Fictional movies. Also, this guy, Don Decker, definitely has something to gain from this, right? Like, he's supposed to be in prison for this thing, and I don't know if, like, he's possessed or whatever. They're gonna, you know, is he gonna be allowed out of prison for a longer time because they want to get to the bottom of this possession or whatever i don't know it just is so unbelievable it's silly finally he seemed to snap out of his chance and return trance and return to his mob man itself the rain also ceased and the property never had the problem again after the world's least relaxing time away from jail don had to go back but this time he took with him the knowledge that he could somehow control water he was put in a cell with another man and decided to test his new powers out again and you know what within minutes there was water rising out of the concrete prison floor water flying horizontally and his cellmate was yelling to be moved to another room i feel like that is something that there's going to be documented evidence of like it's a prison right they're gonna write that in some sort of prison journal a guard came along to see what all the commotion was and don told him that he was causing the water to do this and he had the ability to make it rain Oh yes, said the guard. Make it rain in the warden's office then, tough guy. That's not a direct quote, it just feels like how the guard would talk. <laughs> it's like, yes. The unsuspecting warden, Dave Keenhold, was minding his own beeswax in his office when another officer came in to let him know what the kerfuffle was about with the rain boy when he gasped and told Keen to Keenhold to look at his shirt. There was no rain cloud in the warden's office, but a large damp patch had appeared on his shirt. Yes, I know. Let's keep the skepticism until the end of the story, please. Okay, okay, Katie. I will hold my tongue. Come on, we're nearly at the end. You can do it. <laughs> I've just ruined it so many times. Katie has to remind me not to be a d This freaked the warden out so much that he called for the second divine intervention in as many days, and the Reverend William Blackburn answered the call. After talking with Don for a few minutes, the Reverend noticed a change come over him and suddenly smelled something terrible, like the stench of death. Extremely creepily, Don leaned forward, and here's what the reverend said next. He raised his hand and rubbed his fingers together. All of a sudden, it started to rain. It was like the devil's rain. It was a mist. I was in the presence of evil. I opened up the Bible and started to read to him, but the pages never got wet. So help me. It was a frightening thing. I sure do hope he was like yelling in like a deep southern preacher, like the televangelist preacher, like, and God dispelled you from these pages. You know, that sort of thing. That's how I'm imagining this. This is like a movie and not fact. As Blackburn read the Bible at him, a look came over Don and the foreboding atmosphere, as well as the rain, it lifted. It was the last occurrence of Don's strange rain summoning powers, but still offered no real explanation as to what had been going on.
explanations. <laughs> but now let's dig into it. Okay, so you've been waiting ever so patiently to bash this story. <laughs> I've been anything but patient, Katie. <laughs> Not patient at all. So let's go through a few of the details now. There are some elements that can be explained or at least alternative theories that can be offered. We'll start with the whole possession element. It's a nice, neat story that after the death of his wicked grandfather, Don is possessed and tormented by the demon of an old man. Was it the spirit of his grandfather? Don seems to think that it was, stating in an Unsolved Mysteries episode, And as for my grandfather, I think what had happened was his doing. Because he abused me when I was young, you had a chance to abuse me again. This episode was filmed ten years after the events with not much press in between. However, there was no mention of the old man with a crown demon vision in the show. In fact, it wasn't mentioned until the case was televised again in an episode of Paranormal Witness in 2011, so it's not outside the realms of possibility that Don's story was sexed up to create stories storylines that weren't originally there shocking and also like there's the motivation right you're making up some sort of paranormal story so you can go on these paranormal shows and sell your bullshit to someone who's probably paying you something small or maybe just you know you get some craft services so you get a free lunch i mean it's all very silly isn't it looking back that might not have been the best phrase to use but you get what i mean regarding the trance state yes he probably was feeling pretty weird after his grandfather's funeral maybe he had sunk into some sort of depression or was suffering from ptsd after the abuse that he had suffered this would make his behavior seem odd but it wouldn't mean he was possessed it's also highly <laughs> yes someone looks a bit disgruntled and sort of just sad stare uh, not disgruntled what's the word um dis something like just sort of sitting there staring off into space like all melancholic <laughs> i know it's melancholic uh but i mean that doesn't mean you're possessed does it does it it's also highly possible that he himself caused the scratches on his arm either knowingly or unknowingly if he was in a deep funk once one person such as pam scrofano of the pizza place has got it in the heads that there's devilry about it's probably easy to convince other people who have also witnessed some weird that this is the cause a priest reading the bible to you might act as some sort of relief because everyone knows that that's how you're supposed to help someone who is apparently possessed <laughs> everyone knows this possession's a real thing except it's not it's almost always mental illness and reading a bible at them ain't gonna do d you can also fake being burned by a crucifix by just saying that it burns did anyone try any other shaped metal on don to see if it had any effect no they went straight for the tried and true cross shape i'm not saying don was deliberately trying to pretend that he was possessed just that it might have been in such a weird state that it just all happened and he was taken along with it him levitating and flying around the room could potentially just have been him throwing himself around but why this whole story has endured as a mystery is that there were nine other eyewitnesses to many of these events who have gone on record to state what they saw and many of these were serving police officers who could have been putting their reputations and therefore their jobs on the line by sticking to this bizarre story there's a line of thought that states that what we sometimes refer to as poltergeist activity for example the rattling of pots and pans and don being thrown around the room is a manifestation of adolescent energy as this kind of thing usually occurs around teenagers don was 21 at the time and while i Making no judgments on him being a late bloomer maybe his distress was channeled this way another thing that's a bit fishy about this part of the story is that everyone seems to have jumped straight to possession and not some sort of medical issue yeah i feel this possession of this kind of feels like an excuse for improper diagnosis and mental issues if my friends had been acting strangely for a while and had deep scratches on his arms my first thought might be to consult a medical practitioner or mental health professional not my local ghostbuster that local ghostbuster should be far 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 down your list it's not possible to say now if these things actually happened as reported or whether the real events were blown up by the witnesses minds due to the other strange happenings coercion by tv producers and the passage of time but if we really must we could probably discount the whole possession part of the story dismissed it before you even got started <laughs> which brings us on to the rain some of the elements here can be explained let's get back to warden keenhold's shirt if you remember don was in jail and had been challenged to make it rain in the warden's office when another officer had gone in there the warden was made aware of a wet patch on his shirt which frightened him so much that he called an exorcist this seems like the most easily explainable part of the story that patch could have been anything he could have been sitting under a real leak he could have been sweating he could have splashed his shirt when he was washing his hands there are 
so many possibilities here so i'm just ignoring this one as quite frankly it's kind of stupid <laughs> Moving on, being caught in an indoor rainstorm in one house is weird, in two locations is even weirder, but in three, it's more than a coincidence. Don was the only person to experience all these indoor rain shenanigans, so it stands to reason that it was him that was the target or the cause. People have tried to explain the interior rain and the Kaith House as being linked to the weather. Researcher and skeptic Robert Bartholomew has posited that the rain inside the Kaith House was due to a weather condition known as ice damming. This occurs when snow or ice on a roof is melted due to warmer air in the attic beneath it. This creates pools of water which can then leak into the house. There had been a snowstorm not long before these events which might lead you to believe that this might be the answer until you remember that this happens in a downstairs room and the room above it was perfectly fine and if this was a weather related thing wouldn't some people have been familiar with it and be like oh yeah it's just another ice damming leak instead of being totally awestruck by the water which i remind you is stated to have been flowing in all kinds of directions not just dripping down and it surely can't have happened in all three locations that decker was in over those few days so how can we explain this the short answer is that we can't the only non-mysterious explanation is that this whole thing was just a hoax the evidence that points away from hoax though is that again nine people have been recorded more than once swearing to what they saw this includes a man of god a prison warder and john bojan who had gone on to become the regional police chief when he told the story again for paranormal witness i mean why would everybody involved keep lying about it what would anyone in this story have gotten to gain now, like i said small tv appearance fees or something a little bit of fame people are weird an increase in footfall to the pizza place hardly the first tv show came out a decade after the events happened and two tv shows in almost 30 years this isn't exactly raking in the big bucks for keeping up such a pretense you might expect one or two people to maybe carry it on for the minor fame i'm looking at you pam scrofano but for several police officers to maintain their stories even when it could cast doubt on their judgment and quite frankly their sanity is quite compelling i'd agree it's a lot of people to like get in on something and make it up i guess like it's a combination of the two that would be my guts like it's a hoax perpetrated by maybe the main dude and the kaifers and then the, they call the police and the police see it and they're like nah it's real even though it's a hoax probably a combination of the two is what i would say so maybe not a hoax a prank then played by decker himself on these unsuspecting witnesses okay here we go this was my idea pretty weird prank and how could he have pulled it off in three places unless he was some sort of plumbing genius which he was not there is one big flaw in the whole indoor rain story though there's no evidence we literally only have people's word for it nobody took pictures or video of any of the instances of rain or don being possessed or exercised pretty suspicious yeah well yes and no this was 1983 so people couldn't suddenly whip out a cell phone and start live streaming what was going on so what about camcorders well the first consumer camcorder hit the shelves the very same year and they were large betamax jobbies that you had to put on your shoulder so even in the unlikely event that the kaifners or the van wise were super early adopters on the home video trend it's not surprising that nobody thought to pick it up normal film cameras were very much available though but maybe in the wet and evil feeling atmosphere it wasn't at the forefront of anybody's mind to snap a few pics to be mailed off to the development lab and then returned a few weeks later only to find out that most of the blurry shots had been covered by somebody's thumb ah the past <laughs> i remember when you'd have cameras and they'd have like what 24 or 36 shots per roll of film and you have to send it off and it was always cheaper if you'd wait like a couple of weeks for them to send the photos back to you but you had no idea how any photo was until like that came back and it was always quite exciting like after holiday you'd come back and you'd get your photo developed your photos developed and then they'd come back in by oh yeah this was a nice holiday look at all these pictures like a nice little blast from the past whereas today it's all very present isn't it i mean it's better obviously better did nobody think to alert the local media apparently not but again this doesn't scream hoax to me you could explain it just as an event that people were trying to get through and were then relieved when it was older when it was over why should they involve the media there was no evidence and don's powers had left him so they had nothing to show maybe it was only years later that they realized what a completely unexplainable thing it still was and what happened to don decker after all that in an ironic twist the man once known as rain boy was sent back to jail in 2012 for guess what arson yep for his part in destroying a restaurant and an insurance scam that the man with the power to magically flood it out instead decided to burn it down does this cast doubt on him as a reliable narrator of his paranormal moisture-based activities 
yeah. <laughs> but even discounting him as a witness, everyone else is still in play. And if you see footage of Don, he's not a charismatic Svengali figure who could bend people to his will and make them say the things he wants them to say. He's a soft-spoken, unassuming fellow who appears to have had a weird experience for a few days in the 1980s. Paranormal investigators have taken great interest in this case, mainly because of the credibility of the witnesses, and have been unable to come up with any plausible explanation for the appearance of the gravity-defying indoor rain. One of them, Peter Jordan, said in the Unexplained Mysteries episode, quote, The Donald Decker case is by far the singularly most fascinating and important case I have ever personally been involved in. That does not mean I believe that it necessarily is proof positive to me of demonic infestation. But it is the case, in my own personal experience up to this point, that comes the closest to that hypothesis. <laughs> Way to hedge your bets there, Peter. Yeah, this is, I mean, if this is the most compelling thing ever, I'm like, yeah, but it could have been a hoax that a couple of people fell for. And then it spread around. It's like, that's the most compelling ever really so don decker real life rain boy and poltergeist vessel complete hoax monkey or traumatized young man who's at the center of some extremely strange occurrences maybe this one really can be filed as unknown so i really hope you enjoyed that little episode there if you did please do if you're watching this make sure you smash that like button make sure you're subscribed if you're just listening to this show in its podcast form leave it a review that would be fantastic <laughs> your could review could go something like this i don't like how simon constantly laughs at all the paranormal stuff he makes it seem like he doesn't believe at all which is disappointing go for it go for it type away this has been an episode of decoding the unknown thank you for watching Hello everybody, welcome back to another brand new episode of Decoding the Unknown. I, as always, am your host, Simon. In this show, what happens is Katie will write me a script. This one, uh, did aliens build the pyramids? I feel is almost is almost too cliched. When I was coming up, this channel's relatively new. If you're new here, hello. If you're watching from distant times in the future and you just came back through the archive, I hope this channel's doing well. Or it was cancelled a few episodes after it got going. Or, you know, that could have happened. Anyway, I think I came up with this as, like, the example of the sort of thing we could be doing on this channel, but kind of like, but let's not do this. And then I thought, eh, let's do it anyway. Why not? Because it is so ridiculous and, uh, this... The original name for this channel was going to be called The Mystery Channel. And then we decided that we didn't want to get sued by Disney, who do absolutely own everything. Because I was like, wait, who owns the History Channel? Because we we're making, you know, make, it's making fun of the History Channel by calling it The Mystery Channel and making fun of pyramids being built by aliens. Because what happened to you, History Channel? And then I found out the History Channel was owned by A&E, which is owned by Disney. And then it's like, no, you don't go to war with Disney. <laughs> Just don't do it. Let's get into it. Pyramids are huge. First three words, true. Sometimes made up of millions of blocks weighing multiple tons transported for many miles. They act as shrines and monuments, but also as solar calendars and compasses, accurate to within tenths of a degree. So how were people in ancient Egypt able to pull off this feat of construction when they hadn't even invented the wheel? Those idiots! How were the pyramids built so well that many of them are still standing today? For some people, there's only one plausible answer aliens and by those sub people we mean the history channel and then a door opened and people walked out it's just so bizarre like I, I i was actually reading about this before i got started on this episode like what happened to the history channel and it was basically like yeah yeah, yeah. history content just doesn't do as well as like uh, crazy reality shows and conspiracy theories so that's what happens like they make business decisions I mean, obviously, I've made incorrect business decisions because here I am on YouTube making skeptical history videos and podcasts and stuff. It's like, well done, Simon. What? Learn some business lessons from the business daddy of them all, Disney. E.T. at work. Why do people think that visitors from outer space either built the pyramids themselves or helped poor old ancient humans do it? There are clues if you look hard enough. The Egyptian pyramids were and still are an endearing testament to building and engineering. The Great Pyramid of Giza was the oldest of the original seven wonders of the ancient world and is what is the only one on the list that's still standing today over 4,600 years later. That's impressive. When it was originally built, it stood at 481 feet, that's 146 meters tall. Over the years, the casing outside side has been eroded, leaving the slightly smaller inner structure that we can see today. It was all marble, or not marble, but it was it like white limestone or sandstone or 
they used to be white and more gleaming than they are today which i thought was cool but it wasn't just they were eroded those pieces were also taken away to build other stuff because in the past people were like ah it's pyramids just old and shit let's uh let's use its bricks to build something else the mystery of how the pyramids were built has never been 100 percent definitively solved so this leaves room for the shall we say alternative theories the extraterrestrial helpers theory was floating around before the 20th century whoa really that's a long time ago but it really gained ground when Swiss, or Swiss author Eric von Daniken published Chariots of the Gods, Unsolved Mysteries of the Past, in 1968. The book, which touted the theory of ancient astronauts visiting the Earth to help build some of the best-known ancient structures, was a runaway success. Interest. People just love a conspiracy theory. It's not a run runaway success doesn't mean it's correct. You know? Like, Back to the Future. Wait a minute runaway success of a movie doesn't mean it was correct there's no facts in there <laughs> interest was still high in 2009 when von daniken started appearing in and eventually producing the show ancient aliens it's the same dude Shit. god damn it man what are you up to why do you have to do this to everyone why do you have to spread this like, misinformation you'd be banned from youtube or twitter or whichever one of those platforms bans people for like spreading covid misinformation and shit. it's probably not that piece of shit that is facebook is it to be honest allegedly facebook's a piece of shit. i mean not it, it, in my opinion not an objective fact please don't sue me one of the questions people have with the pyramids is how were the stone blocks most of which weighed over two tons moved to the site the pyramids were built some many miles away from where the stone was quarried, so how is it possible without wheel transport? How are the cut blocks then lifted so high up a steep-sided structure? The main tools used at the time were made from copper and weren't particularly well suited for large-scale projects like a pyramid. The Great Pyramid at Giza was constructed about over about 20 years, meaning that workers would be working at a mind-boggling rate of placing multiple blocks per minute. This is impossible without some sort of advanced technology. But well, they also had a lot of people working really hard, didn't they? And also uh we did a, i did a video on another channel that i call, uh that i that i present called uh today i found out and it posited the theory and it's like well it wasn't our theory it was like a theory by some academic egyptologist dude that the pyramids were possibly the bricks were possibly cement like they were liquid and then poured and left to set and that's how they did it and it's like, ah, i'm not sure i left that video entirely believing this dude's theory but i was like it's an interesting one isn't it Go watch the video. I'm not going to elaborate on it more now because I half remember it and I'm definitely going to get all the facts wrong. But uh, if you want to go check that video out, why not? There was also the alignment of the pyramids to take into account. Many were very accurately aligned with True North. Surely not a likely feat for ancient builders. The three main pyramids at Giza, Khufu's Great Pyramid, the Pyramid of Khafra, and the Pyramid of Menkare, are arranged in the same formation as the stars in Orion's belt constellation. And here's where it gets even more intense. Robert Balval and Adrian Gilbert wrote a book called The Orion Mystery, Unlocking the Secrets of the Pyramids in 1995. Amongst other things, one of their findings was that by backtracking the movement of the stars with a computer program, they could work out exactly when the Orion's belt constellation lined up with the pyramids at Giza, therefore telling us the precise date that they were built. Using this method, it was revealed that the pyramids weren't in fact built around 2560 BC, but rather 10,450 BC. Um, at that point, isn't it just like a coincidence that the stars are lining up? Because we could be pretty sure. I mean, I don't know the size, but I'm sure there's like carbon dating or like other archaeological evidence. Or I mean, that period of time, don't they have like that sand sediment layers to go through and all this stuff? We didn't get it wrong by 7,000 years. I mean, by we, I mean like established science. As this was way before the Egyptians or humans in general were doing anything remotely resembling large-scale engineering projects, surely this is the time that a highly advanced culture swooped in and planted their 3D triangular flags. What have the pyramids got to do with ancient human culture anyway? They're too big for an efficient use of resources and suddenly started popping up from nowhere. Yo, let's talk about humans and efficient uses of resources because we're terrible at this. And also when it comes into like weird... like yeah yeah this would be as confusing to people in the future like cathedrals why did they build these super elaborate cathedrals to something like assuming in the future that i mean like, my opinion like uh i'm not like some super atheist dude i'm probably like agnostic ish i don't know if that's the thing but i'm like not denying that there's possibly a god and all of that stuff i mean of course it's entirely possible but yo the idea that like the the, the cathedral you built is that's the way to worship god is like the the god that's in books and stuff of any religion i just find that a bit silly 
Um, so people in the long future, assuming that like the ancient Egyptians' religions, we've kind of largely forgotten and they've all fallen out of favor. Like, let's assume we've forgotten all about it. Like, wasting resources, people are going to be like, yo, what's up with all these cathedrals? That's as weird as the pyramids. I mean, the pyramids are a bit bigger, but cathedrals are super elaborate and they've got all these paintings of like, who will probably think in the future are all just fictional people. It's really weird. Was Eric von Däniken right with his ancient astronaut theory? No! <laughs> well, there are various Egyptian carvings and cave art from around the globe showing what proponents say are ancient astronauts. It's generally because the figures are wearing some sort of helmet akin to what human astronauts use nowadays. Also, some pharaohs are portrayed in godlike proportions, sometimes with elongated heads. This has given rise to theories about ancient alien gods mating with humans and then causing a great flood to wipe out this transgression, but I think that's a rabbit hole for another day. Yeah, or just let's leave that because it's obviously a bit crazy. To wrap this section up, the idea that aliens built or helped build the pyramids exists because the technology at the time was insufficient to build these gigantic structures. There is pictorial proof of ancient space beings, and the fact remains that even with today's knowledge, no one has been able to plausibly recreate a large pyramid using non-modern methods. So, aliens must be the answer. Right? Well, please imagine a record scratch now. Well, because this is a show, a podcast, a YouTube video... Jen, the producer on this show, could probably add a record scratch right about now. Thank you, Jen. Humans. Surprisingly clever. This is a very niche reference, but if you ever watched a pre-crib celebrity Holmes TV show in the 90s called Through the Keyhole, imagine the weirdly accident co-presenter Lloyd Grossman saying, Let's look at the evidence. Wait, I have no idea what this pre-cribs TV show is. I've seen cribs, I mean a few times. It's a bit weird. But uh, they'll just be like, if so, <laughs> can we come look at your house, Whistler? No one's coming to look at my I'm not anywhere near famous enough to like, for anyone to want to come and look at my house. But if they did, I'd be like, no, it's my house. <laughs> Why would I let you look around my house? It's weird. Get out. First off, the whole astronauts in artwork. In the examples given by von Däniken, it's always a case of seeing what you want to see. The fact that there are so few examples throughout history of humanoid figures with re something resembling a spacesuit or helmet goes to show that are, they are probably not depicting alien or future space travelers. There's a carving on Mayan Rida Pakal, the great sarcophagus lid, that shows him piloting a spaceship, according to Van Daniken. According to actual experts in Mayan history, <laughs> ah, screw those guys though, the carvings are common and important ones symbolizing cosmological signs, the, the world, tree, and death. The pose Pakal is in denotes rebirth, not in picking out a location in time and space to help some humans build a big pyramid. Shocking. Pharaohs were depicted as larger than life, as that's how they were perceived by their people, and many had self-proclaimed first-hand links to the various deities. The whole elongated head thing is a bit weird, but we know that Egyptians' rulers liked to keep it in the family when it came to the line of succession, so genetic abnormalities were to be expected. Keep it in the family is the nicest way that I've ever heard incest. Generations of incest being described. Also, head binding was totally a thing and was practiced by many cultures around the world to mold the head into whatever shape was considered to be the optimum one. I feel like the optimum head shape is the one that evolution has decided is the, the optimum head shape. And probably, I mean, I'm assuming there's some head shape that we're going to evolve in the future, which is going to be more optimum. But I don't think we're going to be like necessarily getting a better head shape by wrapping it in cloth in the ancient times. <laughs> Just sounds like a recipe for trouble, to be honest. Weird by today's standards? Yes. Linked to aliens? No. So let's look at the Orion's Belt 10,000 BC theory. It's just a coincidence, right? You're just lining it up and being like, well, that's when it lines up, so that's when it must have been built. It's like, well, that's just when it lines up. Doesn't mean that's when it was built at all. I don't know why you'd think that. What's wrong with you? I mean, wow, if true, that's probably the biggest proof of extraterrestrial visitors having come to Earth. The likelihood of that, though, is not super high. Get any three things in a rough line, and I'm pretty sure they match the position of Orion's Belt at some point in the history of the universe. This seems to be a case of engineering the result to fit your theory. Yes, I'm over to the fact that the three main pyramids at Giza might have been aligned to copy Orion's Belt, that seems fair. But they are also aligned so that they don't block each other, and the one in the middle of Khafre's pyramid is built on a higher piece of land to look taller than his father's great pyramid, even though it isn't really. So, aesthetics and one-up shit seem to play a big role. But what about all the other astrological alignments and compass points etc how can they be so accurate i hear you whine yeah but not me 
I'm already like, yeah, yeah, it's ridiculous. But maybe, maybe there's someone who's less skeptical listening to this right now. Well, sorry to break it to you people, but back in the day, they're actually quite adept at tracking the stars. I mean, think about it. It was the only system of mapping they had, so they could easily use them to work out which way things were supposed to face. Yeah, I mean, that's how they navigated in the past, right? They had also developed things to make construction easier, such as a set square and simple weighted leveler. The examples of these have been found at pyramid construction sites, more advanced alien technology has not. So now let's get on to how these pyramids were actually built. Yes, I know we haven't been able to build one exactly like the ancient people bit did, but it's probably because we haven't really tried. It's like because it would be an enormous use of resources. Some academic somewhere is going to try and get a grant to do this, and they're going to be like, yo, we could put money into so much other cool stuff for the cost of you building a giant pyramid in the desert that's going to, you know, I mean, that's a big grant. That's a really big grant. This is because we haven't tried to, exactly. No one needs to build a 500-foot pyramid in the middle of the desert anymore. They, expect they ne- never needed to in the first place, arguably. Experiments have been carried out showing that, yes, it's easily possible to transport extremely heavy stone blocks without modern technology. The Egyptians probably used wooden sleds and likely wet the ground in front of them to help them slide across. They could use manpower or oxen to pull or push the sleds. The Nova Pyramid Building Experiment carried out in 1997 could get a two-ton stone moving with fewer than 20 men. There were thousands of people in the Egyptian workforce. This is not a big mystery. Also, stone cutting was their thing. It might seem like a huge task to us today to cut up big chunks of stone, but it was the obvious choice for Egyptians. Copper tools were also capable of doing this, provided there was also a team of people to sharpen them up. As previously mentioned, the workforce numbered into the tens of thousands, so having a tool maintenance crew seems likely. Yeah, I mean, it really is amazing when you just get tens of thousands of people together and be like, get something done. (laughs) It's so many hands working. It's like that, you know, you can lift up a car. You get like, I don't know how many people, like round a car. It's like, and you just lift it up. And everyone's just putting in a little bit of effort and it all happens. It's just, uh, you know, when lots of people get cracking on something. The rate at which the pyramids went up also seems to be a sticking point. During my research, I came across various people saying that the rate at which the Great Pyramid was built, with 2.3 million blocks placed in 20 years, was totally inconceivable. That's a hell of a lot of blocks. But again, there's a lot of people. To that I say, welcome to the ancient Egyptian workforce. It's been estimated that 310 blocks would be needed to, placed, needed to be placed a day to stay within this time frame. That's not per person, it's the total amount per day. Evidence physically carved onto pyramid stones confirms the existence of many teams of workers. Broken up between a few teams, 310 blocks a day seems much more doable. King Khufu's reign was 23 years, so adding on a couple of years to the bids, build schedule bril- brings the average time per block down again. The construction was also planned out beforehand, so it could all go rapidly up once the building phase started. The lower, wider levels of the pyramids use up the vast majority of the building material, so they could be constructed relatively quickly before the blocks needed to be carried up higher. Also, the pyramids are not perfect, jigsaw pieced together things. There are gaps, cracks, and holes filled with smaller bits of rock, rubble, and gypsum mortar. If aliens did build them, they certainly left in lots of fake evidence of human participation. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing about building a pyramid. Like, it's easy to put the first layer down, and it's also the biggest layer. Every step you go up, it becomes easier. I mean, it becomes harder to place the bricks, but it also becomes easier because there's way less of them to do. It's quite a nice thing to build, I guess. As to how the blocks were lifted up so high without cranes or alien levitating skills, recent evidence has come to show that Egyptians used that really advanced technology of a ramp (laughs) using a system of ramps ropes and post holes a team of workers could haul a stone block or a sled carrying a block up the side of the pyramid even at a steep angle sure it wasn't easy but it was not impossible it didn't need to be easy they had loads of people who were working really hard and i don't think they were slaves right i think i made a video about that as well before they weren't slaves and they drank lots of beer i think that's right there was beer evidence has also been found that the pyramids were not built by oh my god it's like i read these ahead or something which I don't do. Uh, built by, by paid workers. In 2010, archaeologists announced that they had uncovered tombs in the Giza complex containing preserved skeletons buried with jars of food for the afterlife. Slaves would have not been afforded this respect, and even though the work was hard, at least there was reward for doing it. These ideas did not come fully formed to the Egyptians, and the pyramids didn't just start appearing overnight. They evolved from earlier rectangular tombs called mastabas and gradually changed over time with a lot of trial and error. There are examples of the development of the Egyptians' methods with earlier incarnations such as the Stepped Pyramid of Jujosa and the Bent Pyramid of Darshur. By the way, I, just, I, I know the comments. there's people in the comments, but it's like, yes, I am absolutely guessing all of the names of the 
Egyptian pyramid dudes. And why pyramids at all? There are many reasons for the shape, most likely linked to the ancient Egyptians' religious beliefs, but they're also just massive symbols to show how powerful their pharaohs were. To be able to mobilize the manpower and resources necessary to build one of these things is a testament to that. The shape, too, is key. The, a pyramid is an incredibly strong and stable shape, and these babies have lasted almost 5,000 years. What a lot of this seems to come down to is just really ragging on ancient people. We seem to find them incapable of being intelligent enough to work this out when it's clear that in a lot of ways they were far more ingenious than we give them credit for. It's also noticeable that people like Von Dana can only really concentrate on non-European, i.e. non-white people's achievements. Again, taking the stance that these people were primitive thinkers, could no way have worked it out for themselves, so some other power must have helped them. This is a racist and historically damaging way of thinking, but at least most people don't share his views. Perhaps the final nail in the coffin for von Daniken was that his worldwide bestseller, Chariots of the God, with a question mark, was reprinted for the 50th anniversary edition with the question mark dropped and the title on the title and a disclaimer on the copyright page now stating that this book is a work of fiction yes yeah, so anyone like this is an interesting point it's like yeah yeah yeah. people are like said ancient humans couldn't have built the pyramids it's kind of a little bit racist when you really think about it isn't it i'm not actually saying there's no such thing as aliens definitely not i truly believe there are aliens do i think they visited earth probably not do i think they built the pyramids no there's just no evidence they built the pyramids. A well-organized, hard-working, engineering-minded, prosperous culture did that, and they were totally human. What I am saying is, while it's good to have an open mind, please think responsibly. Yes, and on that note, thank you for responsibly watching this episode. And if you want to be extra responsible, if you're listening to this in its podcast form, please do leave me a review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get this show. If you're watching this on YouTube, hello there. Please make sure you're subscribed. Make sure you're smashing that like button. Hard, but not too hard. Or if you didn't like it, if you do believe that aliens built the pyramids, there is a dislike button for you to utilize below. Thanks for the watch time anyway, and I'll see you next time. Hello everybody, welcome back to another brand new episode of Decoding the Unknown. As always, I am your host, Simon, and what happens here is we tackle a topic. We decode the unknown. It does what it says on the tin. Thank you, Katie, for writing today's script. I'm going to read it. I'm going to add some comments if I feel like it, which I can assure you I will, because we're dealing with did a book predict the sinking of the Titanic and other Titanic coincidences. Then afterwards, Jen, our wonderful producer slash video editor or a memeologist, perhaps, will add in some graphics and some audio and all of that wonderful stuff. If you are enjoying this show in its podcast form, please leave it a review. That would be much appreciated. Five stars preferred. Or if you feel like giving me one star and be like, stop blathering and get into the concept. The introduction's much too long. One star. Go ahead. That's okay. It just hurts my soul. Or if you're watching on YouTube, like, subscribe, all of that jazz. And let's jump in. As far as I can tell, there are three interpretations of what it means when people say, I don't believe in coincidences. Anyone who says that, though, is dumb. Because obviously there are coincidences. Like, coincidences happen all the time. Not everything is a conspiracy theory. Coincidence, you know? Um... God, I mean, there are so... <laughs> I sound so dumb now, but I'm trying to think. Coincidence. I wanted breakfast cereal for breakfast. There was just the right amount of milk left. No one planned that. It just happened to be just the right amount of milk. It's a coincidence. That's a terrible example, but please, I hope you understand what I mean. I'm fairly sure what the majority means is that coincidences are not random happenstances of two things being in a certain place at the same time. They believe that these events have happened for a reason. Yeah, you got just the right amount of milk. It's a reason behind everything, except there's not. That there's something karmic, spiritual, or religious going on to have caused these people or events to come together. Although I suspect that that's only when the coincidences are a positive interaction, as nobody enjoys thinking about God or the universe conspiring to hasten your demise. I don't know. I feel like if I was thinking about either of these things, I'd think about them equally. Or I don't know, I don't really see myself as a pessimist. But I'd be like, yeah, if anything, you know, I'd probably be, probably be conspiring against me rather than for me. I guess I am a pessimist anyway. 
This is more of a meet cute situation of two fresh faced young people who bump into each other somewhere and then, when it happens again, one of them will gaze at the other and proclaim that they don't believe in coincidences. Blah. Yes, blah indeed. Sticking with the TV tropes, there's also the slightly grimmer, hard nosed police investigator example who, when faced with a similar crime or modus operandi, will say, I don't believe in coincidences to make us, the viewer, realize that it's the same person behind all the crimes, even though we probably already knew this. One of the greatest coincidences of my life. And I mean, thinking about it, it's not like that unbelievable of a coincidence. But I was on holiday in Thailand with my wife. We were on some like island down south, just chilling out at the beach. And we were exploring this like local market where there's this food and, you know, you can eat in the evening and all of this stuff. And I'm walking around and some guy comes up to me and it's like, whoa, hey, Simon. And I'm like, this guy looks a lot like my cousin, but he can't be my cousin. But then he knows me. And I'm like harry (laughs) and he's like yes and neither of us had any idea that we just happened to be in thailand at the same time i've got quite a big family and i just had no idea no one knew so that was pretty in in insane in my thoughts but then it's like also this was a pretty popular tourist destination thailand's a pretty popular tourist country so i guess it's not the most insane thing in the world but it did blow my mind it absolutely blew my mind but it's just a coincidence no one was conspiring to bring me and my cousin together on the island we had dinner and then we continued enjoying our holidays and that was that then there's the people who say i don't believe in coincidences and mean exactly that no matter how inexplicable or interesting the events are they point blank refuse to acknowledge any sort of link or similarity and just see them as events that happen to occur at the same time if you're in this latter group you aren't gonna like this episode very much (laughs) am i in the latter group i think i'm in the latter group it's all just like i mean it's fun i don't think i'm not gonna like it i'm vaguely familiar with this this story about the um i think the book's called the titan and then there's the titanic and it's like coincidences are fascinating because it's like what are the odds but it's um they're they're just coincidences (laughs) the mystery let's see how much i like this in the early hours of april the 15th 1912 the titanic the largest and most luxurious passenger liner of its time was on its way to the bottom of the atlantic after having hit an iceberg just a couple of hours earlier over 2200 passengers and crew were on board for a maiden voyage from southampton to new york and only 706 of these survived we know that there were many things that could have been done to reduce the lives lost in the disaster yeah famously it was the lifeboats thing right they didn't have enough lifeboats for the number of people on board (laughs) which seems like a bit of an error doesn't it the Titanic didn't have enough lifeboats on board, even though it was designed to hold enough to give everybody a seat. The crew were not very well trained on how to launch these boats, and there was no cohesive plan to evacuate the ship. The design of some of the interior compartments was also at fault. Supposedly watertight, the compartments weren't actually tall enough to stop water flowing over the top once the hull had been breached. <laughs> Brilliant design work there, guys. Mwah, top notch. This meant that once the water came flooding in, it caused the ship to tilt forward until the ship's propellers were lifted right out of the water, and with so much stress on the steel structure of the ship, it eventually broke in two with both parts headed down to the bottom of the sea. As I understood it, they didn't know that the Titanic had broken in two until they discovered it on the ocean floor in like the 80s or 90s, right? Because they had all these pictures of the Titanic sinking, you know, paintings, sorry, paintings back in the day. And it was always in one piece, and then they discovered it had actually broken in two which is uh, fascinating and, and, and morbid. What made the whole event even more shocking was that the Titanic had been widely touted as unsinkable, with the definition of the adjective Titanic being of exceptional strength, size, or power. So you'll think it'd be nice and safe on such an enormous metal ship cruising through the freezing waters of the North Atlantic. After the accident, people were quick to throw fancy words like hubris around, blaming the Titanic's owners for tempting fate by calling it unsinkable. Ah, it's just marketing. I mean, in retrospect, it looks bad, but I'm sure it did sell some tickets. And then those people died. And it was probably a long time before anyone called a ship unsinkable again. In fact, I don't think they call ships unsinkable anymore because the uh, the PR would be real bad if it sank and ships sink often there was that costa concordia the one that sank off greece i want to say that was a bit of a disaster didn't the captain end up going to prison for ages but was fate really involved in some way or was the sinking of the titanic just a totally unfortunate accident that nobody could have predicted nobody you say well let's get into it i feel like predicting like calling something unsinkable but then when you look 
a little bit deeper at the engineering like the watertight things not really working the design floor of it the one part becoming heavier and lifting it up in the air the fact that they had not really a preparation for the lifeboats i mean that doesn't stop it sinking but the bigger if everyone had escaped unharmed it wouldn't be such a disaster so they sh- you know come on the wreck of the titan in 1898 american morgan robertson pu- published a novella called futility no big deal there i hear you say and indeed it was no big deal until it was republished in 1912 following the titanic disaster and people really started taking notice why because it seemed as though robertson had actually predicted the sinking of the titanic years before the ship was even a twinkle in the white star line's eye let's start with the title it was originally published under the name futility but to draw attention to the similarities and therefore bump sales it was republished in 1912 as the wreck of the titan okay was the ship actually called titan in the book though okay oh <laughs> simon maybe you should read these ahead because the next sentence is yes the ship in robinson's story was named the titan true to its name the titan was the largest ship of its day and the first line of robinson's story is she was the largest craft afloat and the greatest of the works of men not far into the story the titan hits an iceberg while traveling in foggy conditions and the description of the crash is eerily similar to that of the titanic robertson wrote and with her keel cutting the ice like the steel runner of an ice boat and her great weight resting on the starboard bilge she rose out of the sea higher and higher until the propellers in the stern were half exposed then meeting as easy spiral rise in the ice under her port bow she heeled overbalanced and crashed down on her side to starboard not only were the names and the manner of sinking very similar the titan in the story was also traveling in the north atlantic and also in april exactly where the titanic was sailing and that's not all the sizes of the liners and passenger capacity were also pretty close i mean all of these things the, the, the simon leave your skepticism just give it a second we could tear it all apart later let's just enjoy suspending our disbelief for a while shall we the titan was 800 feet that's 244 meters long while the real life titanic was 882 feet or 269 meters long the titan was carrying 2500 passengers although it had room for 3000 the titanic was officially carrying 2229 passengers although it had room for around 3500 the titan was sailing fast through foggy waters and hit an iceberg at a rate of 50 feet per second according to robertson that translates to about 30 knots although to be honest 50 feet per second or about 15 meters per second is a much more relatable way to picture it if you're not that familiar with nautical terms yeah indeed (laughs) anyway the titanic was also going way too fast at 22.5 knots which is 38 feet or 11.5 meters per second the titanic was largely going full steam ahead at just half a knot under her top speed which seems pretty risky looking back on it now it's like yeah why are you going so fast it's a leisurely cruise across the atlantic and also there's loads of icebergs (laughs) and most of what i learned most of what i know about the titanic is from titanic the movie but they really plow into the iceberg it's like oh my god there's an iceberg bang Mm, mistake made slow down take it easy it looked really nice on board the titanic even if you were in the the poor people accommodation it didn't look that bad it looked pretty nice like they were having a good time the people in the rich people accommodation it's like that's way nicer than my house The lifeboat situation was also almost identical as mentioned the titanic only carried 20 lifeboats enough to seat 1178 people while this was far below what would be needed for a full ship it was above the legal requirement for lifeboats at the time this was in part because nobody thought the whole boat would sink and everybody would be in need of lifeboats all at once much less life-threatening scenarios were envisioned where they would be just used to ferry people from a damaged or broken ship down to another rescue boat under no immediate pressure of sinking yeah that seems like a terrible idea i know in retrospect like now that we've had these maritime disasters and stuff where it's like oh yeah we need to have enough lifeboats for everybody and everybody needs to be able to get off the ship but i guess back in the day but there'd been disasters there'd been maritime disasters before when whole ships had sunk we really that confident in the engineering guys i mean chill out in the wreck of the titan we find that the titan was also woefully short on lifeboats here is main character john rowland's description of the situation after the titan hit the iceberg curse them with their watertight compartments and their logging of the lookouts 24 boats for 3,000 people lashed down with tarred gripe lashings 30 men to clear them away and not an axe on the boat deck or a sheath knife on a man 
I mean, a similarity goes, that's pretty creepy. Also in the novella, survivor John Rowland mentions that New York was 900 miles away. The wreck of the Titanic is 1,084 nautical miles from New York. That's a hell of a coincidence. Practically next to the Titan, if you consider the vastness of the Atlantic. Yeah, I mean, some of it... Look, whatever you're feeling about, like, fate and all of this stuff, this is a hell of a coincidence. So what on earth was going on here was Morgan Robertson psychically predicting the Titanic disaster. According to the highest authority we have on the matter, the man himself, the answer is no. If he did have any clairvoyant capabilities, he would have made an absolute killing on the spiritualist circuit, so I think it's safe to say that it was all just a coincidence. Hell of a coincidence, though. Absolutely wild. But then again, I mean, also, the ship being the same size, hitting an iceberg, going the same speed, not having enough lifeboats. I imagine these were all fairly common things. Like, there were lots of boats without enough lifeboats. There were they were all kind of traveling on a similar course this is where the icebergs were they were a similar size because the book is written around the same time as the boats being built mm, you know you know robertson spent 20 years on the seas mainly as a merchant seaman so he had a deep knowledge of sailing shipbuilding and possible shortcomings of the industry he was also writing an adventure story and knew all about ice fields in the north atlantic so having a huge ship collide with an iceberg wasn't that far out of an idea while that whole part of his book is very similar to what ended up happening to the titanic the sinking of the titan is over and done with by page 30 of a 243 page book whoa holy shit! i thought this was a novella are novellas like 100 pages less than 100 pages 50 pages this is a this is a book there are also polar bears pirates and a doomed and drug drug addicted main character just trying to do a good deed you can read it free online if you're interested this actually sounds quite good i mean i'd read this the problem is it's going to be all like that 19th century language like even the the bits that i read i'm like am i reading this right i'm not exactly sure if this makes sense in modern day english because the like sentence constructions are weird because language changes all the time anyone if this was if someone listens to this in 100 years they'll be like what is this guy talking about why is he using all these weird words i don't know <laughs> why is he so un pc why is he calling boats it the similarity in names of the liners is also not that coincidental if you think about it you're talking about naming the biggest ships of the time so what kind of names are you going to come up with stuff like gigantamax colossotron <laughs> ginormo mcgiant <laughs> Oh, it's a boating with boat face was a joke i want to say five years ago four or five years ago about that uh boat that the british government made and then they were like hey public name our boat and there was a poll and boating boat face was the most popular option and i don't find it as funny as i did then but that was the that shit was the funniest thing i have i think it's one of the funniest things i've ever heard in my life i loved it ginormo mcgiant face <laughs> you get the idea titan and titanic both point the ship to the ship's enormous sizes and strength so really the naming pool was probably a rather small all in all this was an event in an adventure story that was horribly close to a future real life event you could argue it was actually a prediction as going too fast in bad conditions and the shortage of lifeboats should have clued people in about how to run a ship safely but of course no one takes any notice of these things until it's too late the mail steamer all right moving on from a book that may have predicted the sinking of the titanic to another book that may have predicted the sinking of the titanic this one is a slightly different one though as it was specifically written as a cautionary tale for lifeboat shortages on ships and even directly flagged up the issue at the end not that it helps of course it took a real life disaster and a huge loss of life before shipping companies thought it might be a good idea to have enough room for everybody in case of an emergency this story by journalist and editor wt stead was originally published he's a famous journalist uh or publisher right didn't he start a bunch of newspapers i feel like i know his maybe i've made a video about him i've got a channel called biographics where i do biographies of famous people i think i might have done one about him and it's worrying that i remember very little about him it's just like sometimes it's in the eyes and out the mouth you know i make a lot of videos it was originally published in the pall mall gazette in 1886 and casually titled how the mail steamer went down in the middle atlantic by a survivor in it a character on board a packed ship suddenly has a thought about lifeboat safety and goes to check on the situation his conclusions 
are as follows. At the finish, I calculated that by loading all the eight boats down to the water's edge and packing the children along the bottom boards, we might accommodate 390 people. We were carrying 916 altogether. In the story, the ship, which is again going fast in bad conditions, collides with another vessel and starts sinking almost straight away. There's pandemonium everywhere with people fighting to get into the limited boats, the boats not being easy to release, guns being fired, and even the main character shoving a baby away that a mother is trying to give to him to take to safety. Holy sh! <laughs> this book sounds intense, Dad. It's every man for themselves, with the crew jumping to get into the boats before any passengers, lifeboats going off half full, and even being destroyed by people throwing themselves overboard into them. In the end, there's one boat left for the 700 people remaining on the steamer. They plunge into the water, with the main character managing to grab onto a lifeboat as it passes by. Oh my god, back in the day, I'll be like, let's just take an inflatable, let's just take, you know, just pack it in the luggage. We'll take an inflatable boat, just in case. Um, I mean, I guess they didn't have, like, did they have plastics and shit back in the day? you could like they probably didn't did they so you couldn't or well, modern day lifeboats though are amazing they come in these like uh they're like these big plastic boxes and you just throw them in the ocean and they explode into lifeboats and like that's pretty sick i'm glad we have that nowadays they plunge into the water with the main character managing to grab onto a lifeboat as it passes by charitably this exchange occurs shall i hit his fingers said a man no let him come and then I was laid sick and dizzy on the bottom boards of a crowded boat. The story ends with an editor's note. This is exactly what might take place and what will take place if the liners are sent to sea short of boats. And yes, it turns out that Stead was exactly right. I mean, it's not exactly clairvoyance, though, is it? It's like there's a bunch of boats going out all the time. Boats sink and they don't have enough lifeboats. And at some point they're going to sink and there's not going to be enough lifeboats. It's, I mean, yeah, that's very very predictable i'm sure there's lots of predictable things that are gonna happen like there's a there's gonna be a plane crash there's gonna be a plane crash because um pilots are flying less because of covid so they're less practiced so there's gonna be plane crashes once people get back into flying everywhere and it's busy again probably it's not really clairvoyance it's just logic and that's not my idea i read it in like some paper or something about pilots not being as much in practice because of covid in fact i'm, I'm learning to fly and my flight instructor on this little diddly plane is a proper like pilot for an airline and he's just like yeah i don't fly as much anymore but fortunately i've got my instructor's license so i can teach people to fly so i can earn some money while i'm not flying giant planes around the world and i'm like that's pretty cool tell me lots of things about flying planes but his coincidental link to the high what, what we talked about <laughs> his coincidental link to the titanic doesn't end there wt stead was also a pretty hardcore spiritualist and wrote another story called from the old world to the new in 1892. in this story a character has a dream or a vision of a ship sailing through the icebergs hitting one and sinking only seven people are left as survivors on an iceberg as the rest go down with the ship another character confirms that he too received psychic message of a ship in the north atlantic hitting an iceberg in the fog and sinking a ship called the majestic goes off to search for the survivors receiving telepathic messages along the way and finds them but only one is still alive maritime accidents were quite a theme in his work and stead himself had visions of drowning and asking for help only to be denied it by people in rescue boats in night seems like a very legitimate fear like if you're going on boats all the time it might i'm absolutely not certain about this but i feel like uh stead was an american who lived in the uk um and set up newspapers there or something so he's probably going back and forth on boats all the time and he's like oh there's not enough lifeboats are there this is something that could very much happen to me it's like you know i'll occasionally have like nightmares and stuff and it's like yeah plane crashes they'll make an appearance because it's like yeah i mean before covid i used to fly a lot and then it was like you know that's that's a fear i know it's extremely unlikely and all of that stuff but it's definitely gonna it's definitely on the mind because it's like extremely terrifying <laughs> I mean, as, as safe as you know air travel is and everything, you're like in a little metal tube, flying enormously fast, really high above the earth. And if something goes wrong, you're really f***ed. Happy, happy joy, joy. In 1912, he was asked to give a talk at New York's Carnegie Hall on the topic of world peace. You may have guessed where this is going, but on the 10th... I, I, I don't know where this is going. I assume it's got something to do with the Titanic. On the 10th of April 1912, lifeboat shortage wary Stead set out for New York on none other than the Titanic. Oh no, he was on the Titanic? I feel like he survives though, because I don't remember him dying on the Titanic. 
While it's hard to confirm accounts of his last... Oh, no, he did die on the Titanic. My bad. Last moments on the ship, it's generally agreed that he was calm and collected and may have last been seen in the freezing water with multi-millionaire John Jacob Astor IV. Stead's body was never recovered, and while he seemed to predict his own death by drowning, he wasn't worried about this particular trip. One of his last published right... Dude, how can he not be worried about the particular trip? It's exactly the problem you've been talking about. Boats with not enough lifeboats. One of the la- his last published writings includes the line, I expect to leave by the Titanic on April the 10th, and I hope I shall be back in London in May. So yes, in a sad and ironic coincidence, the man who foretold and warned about the dangers of lifeboat shortages on boats died on the most famous boat in history due to its shortage of lifeboats. Oh man, like dying of the very thing you're terrified of. <laughs> I know it makes absolutely no logical sense whatsoever. It's just one of those stupid, like, human mind things. But it's like, no, no, no. I'm not going to die of the thing that I think about all the time. What are the chances of that? And then you drowning in the Titanic or I'm dying in a plane crash. You'd be like, ah, why? There were things going on at the time that caused people to book passage on the Titanic, to cancel their bookings on the Titanic, and move over to another ship at practically the last minute. There was also an event that occurred before the Titanic had even hit open water that could be seen as foreshadowing of the disaster to come. One of the things going on was the first national coal strike in England that started in March of 1912. Oh yeah, these like ships run on coal. (laughs) It's so old school. (laughs) This meant that there was a huge shortage of coal for steamliners, so many couldn't sail when they were supposed to. As the Titanic was a big, flashy new flagship of the White Star Line, a couple of other ships had given their coal to her to be able to sail, and the passengers were also given the option to swap to the Titanic, which some did. We all know that the Titanic was sailing to New York on a maiden voyage, but did you know that there was something known as the New York Incident before she had even set out? I did not know that. Let's find out what it is. The SS City of New York, later known as the SS New York, was a popular passenger liner for crossing the Atlantic, but in April 1912, it was temporarily out of service due to the lack of coal. Some of the crew of the New York transferred over to the Titanic in time for the latter's grand outing. When it was time for the Titanic to leave the harbor, it sailed past sister liner Oceanic, which I believe also sank later, right? And the SS New York, due to the size of the Titanic, it created a huge amount of suction as it went past. So much so, in fact, that the New York's mooring ropes actually snapped and the ship drifted out into the path of the Titanic. A newspaper report of the incident called it an exciting start. Due to the Titanic being the largest ship of its time, the whole suction theory had been hypothetical and not really believed until people saw it that day with their own eyes. The article went on to say, Between the Titanic and the quay, a distance of two or three hundred yards, the New York was drifting stern first towards the outgoing liner. What was said to have happened seemed a fantastic absurdity until I saw the frayed end of a steel wire hawser about as thick as a man's wrist lying on the key. It snapped like the crack of a gun, the man told me who saw it break. Broken hem cables hung along the New York side. The crowd was breathless with excitement. People climbed into railway trucks to see what was going to happen. Unfortunately for the expected crowd, thanks to some quick thinking by Captain Smith, the Titanic's engines were shut down and reversed to create some distance, and a couple of tugboats helped move the New York back to the side, or whatever the naval term is, for the size of the harbor. In what we can say now is another link to the forthcoming disaster. One of the helpful tugs that day was called Neptune. There are photos online that you can see of the Titanic, the New York, and the Neptune. Which is quite eerie when you think that New York was the intended destination, but instead the Titanic ended up in Neptune. Domain, the reign of God of the Sea, and an auspicious start then for the doomed ship. Yeah, I mean, that is just, that's not even that much of a coincidence, and that is reading way too far into things. Like the one with the story, it's like, holy shit, this is a pretty like pressy. It's not, it's not like, uh, psychic, it's just being prescient. This is just silly. That's just silly though. Repeat survivors. Being caught up in one sip shrinking incident is pretty rare and probably not something people actively seek out, but what are the chances of surviving two sinkings? And then, how about three? Introducing Violet Constance Jessup, good luck amulet or maybe curse bringer of the White Star Line. Jessup started off small with a bump in the RMS Olympic in 1911 where she was working as a stewardess. Oh, okay, didn't sink. 
but it was involved in some oceanic incidents. The ship hit another HMS Hawk, which was designed to ram ships, and the, o- uh, and the Olympic hit it right on the ramming part. With two holes in the hull, it limped back to Southampton, but in order to repair it, the manufacturers had to use parts that were supposed to go in the Titanic, which was going to be ready the following year. The Olympic needed further repairs a few months later, again meaning that parts meant for the Titanic were used for the Olympic instead, delaying the Titanic's maiden voyage to the fateful week in April. All right, so the Olympic didn't actually sink, but it was still a maritime accident and would have certainly been quite scary. The captain of the Olympic at the time was Edward Smith. Oh, who went on to captain the Titanic when it was eventually ready to set sail? Jessup was once again a stewardess when the Titanic was finally ready to go. As the ship was going down, Jessup was used as a model passenger to calm people down and show non-English speakers what they needed to be doing. She watched as other people were given priority to get into the lifeboats, but she eventually managed to get a seat in lifeboat 16. As if getting off a sinking ship wasn't stressful enough, an officer tossed a baby at her that it found lying on the deck, and she had held onto it for eight hours until the lifeboat was rescued by the Carpathia. According to Jessup's memoirs, as soon as she reached the Carpathia, a woman grabbed the baby from her and ran off. She recounted, I was still clutching the baby against my hard cork lifeboat I was wearing when a woman leaped at me and grabbed the baby. She rushed off with it. It appeared that she put it down on the deck of the Titanic when she went off to fetch something, and when she came back, the baby had gone. I was too frozen and numb to think it strange that this woman had not stopped to say thank you. That was one lucky baby. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> holy sh**. If someone, like, I've got a baby. It's like a month old at the time of recording. If someone saved my baby's life, I'd be like, oh my god, thank you. <laughs> Please, give me a phone number. <laughs> I'm going to do something nice for you. Really nice. After surviving the Titanic with no injuries, Jessup joined the British Red Cross at the start of World War One. Hitting the seas once again, she boarded the Britannic, which was another White Star Line luxury liner, and had been converted into a hospital ship in 1915. On November 21, 1916, the Britannic hit a sea mine, which exploded and sank the ship in less than an hour. Although she easily made it into a lifeboat this time, horrifically, the small boats were getting sucked under the ship by the strength of the propellers. Oh my god, that is a nightmare fuel right there. You get into a lifeboat, you're like, why are we moving towards that? Oh my god, no! Jessup dived out of the lifeboat and managed to swim to safety. It wasn't until years later that a doctor said she'd probably have fractured her skull at some point in the escape. Even rocking a broken skull didn't slow her down, though. To the disbelief of her family and friends, she returned to work on the White Star Line in 1920. Oh my god, I guess you really need a job because that's... I mean, like, no, no, after almost getting into sucked into a propeller and breaking my skull hard pass, I'm going to do a different job. I'm, I'm going to do a different job. Uh, she returned to work in 1920 and continued a life at sea for the next 40 years or so. She died at the age of 83, getting sucked into a pro- Not really. Weirdly, she wasn't the only survivor of the Titanic and the Britannic. Boiler stoker Arthur John Priest also survived both disasters, and in fact was the survivor in incredible five sinkings in total. Oh my god. If I was a boat company, I'd be like, I'd have his name on some sort of blacklist. <laughs> I'd be like, no, get out. Sailor Archie Jewell was the third person to survive both but he was later killed in the sinking of the SS Donegal during World War I. The Titanian Still up for some more coincidences? Good. Here's the last one. First we had the Titan, then the Titanic. Now it's the turn of the Titanian. This was a real ship carrying coal across the Atlantic in 1935. According to William Reeves, who was the lookout at the time, he was familiar with Morgan Robertson's Titan novella and also, obviously, the fate of the Titanic. All of a sudden, in the middle of the ocean, he got a creepy feeling and called out that there was an iceberg ahead, even though he couldn't actually see anything. The crew heeded his warning, and the Titanian stopped. As the air cleared, they found that they were indeed right in front of an iceberg and miraculously had managed not to hit it. Reeves also claimed that they were in the same spot the Titanic had sunk, which is what gave him the premonition, but sources disputed this afterwards. There is proof from the telegraphs that the Titanium was in an, in an ice field, got damaged, and requested an icebreak to come and rescue them, though, so I guess Reeves just got a bit carried away way in the last bit of his storytelling. If you thought that was a bit weak, here's a little bit extra for you to perk you up. William Reeves was born on the 15th of April 1912, the exact date the Titanic sank. Cue the X-Files music. And actually, here's another little tidbit. Also in 1935, the Times newspaper reported another British passenger steamer that got into a collision in Hamburg, Germany. Its name? The Titan. Maybe we should just retire that name from the list now. It's obviously got major bad vibes. Of course, it's easy to see things with hindsight and make connections that wouldn't mean anything if the accident hadn't happened, but it's always interesting and sometimes quite amazing when you see some of these coincidences occur. If you believe in coincidences, of course. Whatever that means.
And I really hope you enjoyed this episode of the show. This has been Decoding the Unknown. I have been Simon. Thank you to Katie for writing it. Thank you for Jen, to Jen for doing the editing work and all of that jazz. Uh, if you uh, enjoyed the show, please do leave it a review. It really does make a difference. The more reviews we get, the more people see this podcast because that's how uh, podcast charts work, apparently. I looked into it. It was complicated and a bit boring, but I understood that getting reviews is important. And uh, yeah, or if you're on YouTube, hello, please like, button, subscribe, all of that good YouTubery stuff. And I'll see you next time. Thanks for watching. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another brand new episode of Decoding the Unknown, the show where we decode the unknown. Or more accurately, Casey, the fine writer on this channel, decodes the unknown and then I read it and add some stupid comments and then Jen afterwards adds some images if you're watching the video and some music and some sound effects if you're listening as a podcast. Well, as a video, you get them both. But uh, yeah, this show is a YouTube channel and a podcast. So yes, welcome. Let's jump in. Today, we're talking about Roanoke. Uh, it's a colony that disappeared, right? Weirdly enough, I was just watching an episode of The Blacklist, that uh, um, James Spader show, and there was a guy called Roanoke, and I can't remember why. It was something to do with this colony. I might have fallen asleep. The Blacklist got really weird in the later seasons. I'm like, just what is going on? <laughs> We're not talking about The Blacklist today, so let's move on to the actual content that you're here for. Yes? <laughs> The Lost Colony of Roanoke is one of those enduring historical mysteries that refuses to be definitively sold. <coughs> solved. And as time goes by, more and more theories get added to the mix. To give you a very brief history, Queen Elizabeth I wanted to colonize the New World and had given her favorite nobleman, Sir Walter Raleigh, first crack at controlling as much of the America south of Newfoundland as he wanted. Ah, the pastor is just like, the queen in some random country just says to a dude, yeah, 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 just go over there and take it. No worries. Yeah, what about the people living there? Ah, they don't, it's, it's fine. It's going to be ours now. It's going to be ours. Oh, colonialism. Weird times. Bad times. I don't want to say weird like, ah, oh, yeah, yeah, it was weird. As a British person, you can't. It's, <laughs> it's like, this is not good. It's not good. In something that sounds kind of like the beginning of an ominous fairy tale, he was given seven years to set up a colony before losing his exclusive rights to do so. The first real attempt to set up a colony under Raleigh happened in 1585. This all-male group did not do very well as their leader, Ralph Lane, was basically a giant jerk and ruined relations with nearby Native American tribes by kidnapping whenever the English needed anything and in general behaving like the world's worst next-door neighbor. Also, I mean, the very fact of him being there makes him a terrible neighbor because he's an unwanted neighbor who just, it'd be like someone showing up in your garden, pitching a tent and then being a dickhead. It would be like, wait, 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 isn't it bad enough that you pitched a tent in my garden, you homeless weirdo? And then at least you could be nice. Maybe come and knock on the door and introduce yourself rather than kidnapping my children and then making them your slaves. A bit weird. A bit weird, Ralph. Maybe don't do that. The group eventually gave up and returned to England in 1586, good, but they did bring potatoes with them, so I suppose Lane was good for something in the end. Yes, he was. Potatoes are amazing, especially when they're chopped up into little slices and fried. The next serious attempt to establish a settlement came with John White, who had been part of Lane's previous attempt, and he led a new group of men, women, and children back to North Carolina in 1587. The group included modern-day North Carolina. They weren't back then being like, let's go to North Carolina because North Carolina certainly didn't exist. The group included his daughter, Eleanor, her husband, and Anna Nace, maybe, Dare. That is a great name, the surname Dare. And later on, their baby, Virginia Dare, who was the first English baby born on American soil. John White didn't stay long with the settlers and returned to England that same year for supplies, intending to come back as soon as he could. Unfortunately, because of England's conflict with Spain, it ended up taking him three years. That seems like a bit of a dick move. It's like, so what are you doing? There's this land far away that no one has succeeded in colonizing. So what you do is you pack up your whole family, you put them on a boat for what I'm sure is a horrible journey across the Atlantic. Then you arrive in America and then you're like, oh no, we need a bit more food. So you bugger off back to England and you can't get back there for three years. And your family's there. It's like, mate, what are you up to? When he did eventually make it back in August 1590, he got a huge shock. It wasn't that the settlement was merely abandoned, it had totally, it had almost totally disappeared. There were no people, no buildings, no boats. The only thing that Y could find was a single word carved into a post. 
Croatoan. So this is where the mystery began. Nobody had been able to say for sure what happened to the Roanoke settlers. But when you dig in a bit, there is more than one theory to their fate. Let's start with what we know. The only clue left behind by White's group was the word Croato. And this sounds creepy until you realize it was just the name of a nearby island and the tribe of indigenous Americans who the Roanoke settlers were on friendly terms with. There were also the letters C-R-O carved into a tree, but presumably they ran out of room to finish the word. So to most people, including John White, it seemed obvious that after however long of being on Roanoke Island, maybe the settlers just weren't doing that well, so they moved off to hang out with the Croato and tribe and left White a note saying where they'd gone. Yeah, I mean, it seems pretty obvious, right? If you were going to go somewhere, like, to pop out and get milk, and, like, if I was, and I knew my wife was going to get home in the time that I'd popped out to get milk, I'd be like, gone to get milk. Maybe I'd just even write, gone for milk. I don't think I'd just write milk, because I could write a little bit more, but if I had to carve it into a tree, I'd probably just write milk, and then she'd know what's going on. So it seems like that's pretty obvious. Fortunately, we don't have to carve these sorts of things into trees. He had been gone for three years after all, and the settlers might have been desperately waiting for things that never arrived, so they thought, saw this and up sticks, literally, all their buildings were seemingly taken down and moved, not destroyed. To further drive home the theory that they merely moved on, there was, there was no Maltese cross symbol carved onto the post, which was a pre-agreed distress code. If the colonists had time to carve an eight-letter word into the post and a three-letter word into a tree, they would have had time to carve some sort of cross too, if they were being forced to flee. So, John White trucked on over to Croatan and met up with his family and the other English people, right? Well, no, wrong. He never actually made it over to follow up on his theory. What? Mate, come on, you sailed all the way across the Atlantic. White did attempt to make it to Croatan after discovering the colony had gone, but due to various things happening to the ship uh, he was on and bad weather, the exploration party had to abandon the plan and arrived back in England in 1590. Wait, in October 1590. Wait, wait, wait. So you made it all the way across the Atlantic. You got there. They were like, you were like, oh, they made, they went to the other islands. And you tried to go there, but you couldn't. But somehow you magically made it all the way back across the Atlantic. It sounds like you don't like your family very much, doesn't it? What was his name? White? John White? Or either that, or you're just lazy. There was another attempt set up by Walter Raleigh to see if the colonists were still alive, but the whole thing was pretty shady. If the colonists were dead, he would lose his claim on the land as seven years of good luck would run out and there wouldn't be time to establish another party. If he could fudge the issue and try to convince everyone they might still be alive, his claim would be protected. He was also trying to get a jump on other business leads at the time and was basically using the search for the lost colonists as a smokescreen to put rivals off the scent. Other expeditions tried to find traces of the colonists over the years, but as time went by, it would have been harder and harder to work out the exact details. Relaying any sort of news was also subject to time delays, biases, and possible misinformation due to the large amount of spying going on. There were stories of massacres by local tribes, but also of contact with Native Americans who had fair skin, gray eyes, and wore a European style of dress. Okay, so that's pointing to two theories, right? right? One, uh, they were they were massacred and their buildings i guess were stolen or used for resources or something or two they integrated so they became i mean it's over a really long time like three years at the absolute minimum so it's kind of possible that they just joined in with the tribe and then they had children with the uh, native americans and they liked some of their clothes so uh, you know so apart from peaceful assimilation with nearby locals what else might have happened well it all depends on who you believe the whole thing got off on the wrong foot from the start the settlers weren't actually supposed to colonize roanoke they had intended to travel to chesapeake but after stopping off at roanoke to check on some soldiers who'd been holding the fort after the 1585 ralph lane attempt the ship's captain simon fernandez abandoned them there the soldiers had also met a mysterious fate as a couple of skeletons were found but the rest of the 15 men were never heard from again the ship's captain sounds like a bit of a d He dropped off 15 of the people he was supposed to take all the way and was just like, yeah, 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 have fun. <laughs> Nob. It seems likely they were attacked by a native tribe and, oh, and then they died. Brilliant. And those that were still alive tried sailing off and didn't make it. But again, with no actual evidence of this, it's impossible to say for sure. If anthropologist Lee Miller as DB believed the 1587 colonists were deliberately abandoned, in a plot by jealous enemies of Walter Raleigh to mess up his attempt to claim land 
for himself. There had already been one failed attempt at Roanoke, after all, and Fernandez, Fer, Fernandez sorry, had dropped the 1587 settlers off in July, long after they could begin planting anything, so it seemed like this attempt would fail too. This all sounds really, like, just not well organized. While sabotage for political reasons is a possibility, Fernandez was also quite mercenary in a previous form as a pirate. <laughs> what is this guy doing in charge? So not only did he drop them off and then just abandon them on the island, but it's also like, why did we choose this guy? He used to be a pilot and just seems like an absolute dickhead. He might have just ditched the boring English people at the first convenient spot and then gone off to more lucrative pursuits again. Why is this guy leading an expedition? Spain and England were at each other's throats during this period, and some historians have suggested that the colony was pillaged by nearby Spaniards who were also grabbing up the land. The fate of the colonists would likely have been slavery or death, but there's no evidence from English or Spanish sources that the Roanoke settlement was ever discovered by Spain. Well, if Spain did discover it, uh, and I don't want to get too conspiracy theory here, but they're not going to be like, yeah, 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 we found it, and then we enslaved and executed the locals. I mean, not the locals, the, the colonists who were more local. Who... You get what I mean. Was it an attack by a Native American tribe fed up with su uh, supporting underprepared foreigners and angered by previous hostilities? Maybe, but the settlement didn't show any signs of an attack and there were no bodies left behind. Other indigenous people also reported seeing the English settlers fighting among themselves at the time, leading to a belief that they might have contracted some form of disease that caused delusions and paranoia. Yeah, if they killed each other off, though, there would have been remains to find. Yeah, also, then they got all this disease and they got deluded and paranoid, and then they perfectly deconstructed their buildings. Ah! Ah! And then they wrote on the trees, Crow Turn. Ah! No. Super unlikely. Another clue that popped up centuries later in 1937 was what became known as the First Dare Stone. This was a large stone with a message inscribed in it, purportedly from Eleanor Dare, daughter of John White and mother of Virginia Dare. It was found the first, uh, that was the first kid born, English kid born in the Americas, right? It was found near the Chowan River in North Carolina, and it was a message to John saying that they'd all had a terrible time since he left, with more than half the population dying from sickness or in war. There had then been a further massacre, with victims including a husband and child, and only seven people had survived. They had all been buried in a mass grave a few miles east of the river. It was signed E.W.D. or Eleanor White Dare. Interestingly, the reference to seven survivors matches a claim by William Strachey, a 17th century writer who had claimed that the Powhatan tribe had attacked another group and seven English people had managed to escape. Historians and the general public went nuts for the stone, but no further evidence of the colony or mass grave was found. Is this stone just a forgery? We may, may, may. Rewards were offered for a similar finds, so of course, loads of engraved stones started coming out of the woodwork, muddying historical research and casting doubt on the veracity of the original stone. Well, obviously, all the later ones were fake because people love money. While 47 of the 48 catalogued stones were eventually found to be the work of one man. Whoa! Bill Eberhardt, a, as you guessed it, stone cutter from Georgia, the original stone was different enough to be taken on its own merit. Well, yeah, it just sounds like old Bill was like, yeah, there's money to be made in these fake stones, isn't there? So he got cracking on the fake stone business. Uh, it doesn't really, it doesn't really add any discredit or credit to the original stone being real or not. Just all the later ones were faken by one dude. The original can be still fake, just by a different dude. Unfortunately, it had been so undermined by the other fake stones, as well as the original finder, Lewis Hammond, being a bit vague about where it found it, that it faded in importance as primary source material. Because it's never definitively been proved real or fake, historians have shied away from the story the original Dare Stone relates. But if it is real, the settlers had a pretty torrid time of it, with most of them dying horribly. Even more recent finds have also thrown light on the possible fate of the settlers with the discovery of a secret fort on a map that John Y created in the 16th century. The symbol for the fort was hidden under a patch on his map that was created with a rudimentary form of invisible ink. Oh my god, this is so cool. <laughs> so it was only visible when lit from behind. It wasn't until 2012 that anyone realized anything was under the patch, and it seems to point to a possible new settlement about 50 miles inland from Roanoke Island, a distance White had previously referred to in his reports. Digs at the site, known as Site X, were carried out in 2015 and a couple of miles away at another site known as Site Y in 2019. These digs did turn up some European pottery, but it might have come from later settlers and not necessarily the Roanoke group. Also, the new site would have been in the heart of hostile territory, so it seems unlikely that the whole group would have decided that that's a safe bet. That is, like, cool and suspicious, though. 
The choices for the fate of the settlers basically comes down to assimilation or annihilation. For my money, the settlers did go to Croatoan Island. Uh, yeah, yeah, Katie, I agree with you. This is now known as Hatteras Island, and archaeological excavations have found traces of 16th century English life, like guns mixed in with traditional native arrowheads. From there, they either lived with the Croatoan tribe or potentially split into smaller groups that traveled further inland and maybe assimilated with other tribes too. They may then have experienced attacks, etc., as per the Dare Stone. Yeah, the Dare Stone can be real, and it can still fit in with this assimilation theory. I like the assimilation theory. It's kind of a, a happy ending for them, and it's also cool. And, I mean, with the European clothes and the, the people who looked like semi-European and stuff, this seems likely. To this day, there are Native American tribes claiming to be descendants of Roanoke, but it's difficult to prove without DNA from the original colonists who have never been found. The grey-eyed, light-skinned people with western dress sense that explorer John Lawson encountered in the early 1700s seems to be a pretty compelling argument for assimilation. The Hatteras area was not particularly popular with later settlers, so it is possible that the only European candidates were the Roanoke people. They also apparently spoke English, but again, more English colonies had sprung up since 1587, so we can't categorically confirm the Roanoke settlers as the source. And just to throw a little more doubt in here, some populations of indigenous Americans have really high instances of albinism. It can occur once in every 1,500 to 2,000 people in Navajo populations and one in every 200 people in Hopi populations. That is incredibly high. I mean, I think about all, like, I don't know any albino people and I, I mean, I've never met an albino person, so it must be rare. In, in Europe, at least. So, while it might seem very far-fetched, there is just the smallest chance that the purported mixed-race descendants Lawson saw were not actually mixed at all. And of course, there's always, yeah, but there's a difference between someone albino and who looks, like, European. Isn't there? I mean, there is. And, it, and you'd know someone who's albino. You're like, it, I mean, I've seen pictures of albino people. I've seen TV shows with albino people. They, you could tell they're albino. <laughs> don't discriminate i'm not discriminating i'm not trying to be on pc here i'm just saying that if you <laughs> it's like that level of like i don't even notice their albinoism albinism albinism it's like but it's obvious and of course there's always the old fallback of alien abduction <laughs> of course there is a ship came down beamed the group up lock stop and stock and barrel leaving a one-word clue that baffled the human race for the next four and a half centuries there's no proof it happens but there's also no proof it didn't and let's absolutely ignore the alien theory because it's absurd this has been another episode of decoding the unknown i do hope you enjoyed it if you're watching this on youtube smash that like button subscribe if you're listening as a podcast and you want to review this show especially if you want to give it a five-star review that would be grand please do that and i'll see you next time hello everybody welcome back to another episode of decoding the unknown the show where we me simon and my writer katie decode the unknown you can see what we did with the name there except today this one's about amelia earhart and like the thing about that is we've never solved it have we i remember there was a few years ago there was something about a bone that someone found and they thought this is amelia earhart and then it turns out not to be or something like that but i don't think we ever solved it solved this one um so we're just going to try and decode it what we're going to say is it's not like the bermuda triangle or anything like that well i'm assuming if you're new here what happens is uh, as i said katie's the writer for this channel i'm going to read what she has written and uh, that's that's really how this show works. Oh, and also, our wonderful producer, Jen, is going to uh, make the video spicy. And by spicy, I mean she's going to add some music and images. Thanks, Jen. Let's go. One of the most enduring missing persons mysteries of modern times is that of Amelia Earhart, a world-famous pilot or aviatrix, to give her her sexier title. I feel like there's this big movement and i mean great like i'm all for equality of women or equality between men and women or however the correct way of phrasing that is but it's like yo sometimes women just have cooler titles like i heard that like actresses want to be called actors and i'm like wait or like someone wanted this and i'm like but isn't actress cooler like aviatrix is cooler than aviator actress is cooler than actor i mean at least in my mind anyway <laughs> it's because i'm so progressive did just the words sound cooler 
She and her navigator Fred Noonan vanished while Earhart was attempting to be the first woman to circumnavigate the globe. This had previously been done by American Wiley Post in 1931 and 1933, but Earhart's route would be closer to the equator and therefore quite a bit longer. Apparently, just she wanted an additional challenge. It's like, what do you want to do, Amelia? I'm going to fly around the world, but uh, just to make it extra challenging, we're going to do it near the equator. Why, Amelia? If you look at her actual flight map, though, close to the equator seems to be stretching it a bit, given that the starting point was above the Tropic of Cancer. <laughs> That's not near the equator, then. Those tropics are really far above it. But if it was completed, it would have been a seriously impressive piece of flying. On July the 2nd, 1937, deep into the last portion of the journey and on the longest leg, Earhart and Noonan, flying in a custom-built Lockheed Electra, failed to arrive on Howland Island in the Pacific Ocean. Many theories have sprung up as to what happened to her and Fred, but as yet, nearly 85 years later, neither the plane nor trace of the two aviators has ever been found. There were a number of issues leading up to this particular leg of the journey which culminated in the plane never reaching its destination. One of the most telling issues was that Earhart had been having radio problems which were not properly fixed during previous stops. While she was able to transmit, she could not receive incoming messages. This was compounded by the fact that the ships and landing party at Howland Island did not usually transmit on the frequency that she was expecting them to. This snafu was in part due to her husband, George Putnam, being the person to organize the landing details at Howland Island. Was he an expert in radio communications? I think he was a publishing magnate, wasn't he? I feel I've made a video about Amelia Earhart before for my biographics channel where we talk about her whole life, not just her disappearance. And I think she was married to a publishing dude. I'm, that we're about to find out. No, he was a publisher. <laughs> Well done, Simon. Just read the scripts, fact boy. Why this task was left to him is also up for debate, but presumably both he and Amelia reckon that the U.S. Coast Guard, who were stationed there in the Itasca, would know what they were doing. Unfortunately, the transmissions from the Itasca did not reach Earhart. Also, some radio equipment had been left at the previous stop to make way for more fuel, although apparently not enough fuel was available to completely fill the plane. Another possible factor in the situation was navigator Fred Noonan. He was a top-class navigator, but in prior calls with her husband, Earhart had mentioned having personal problems on more than one occasion. Given that it was only her and Noonan in the plane, it's pretty likely she was referring to him. He was a known drinker, so if it had a little too much the night before, which caused him to navigate even a little off course, they were in serious trouble. I feel like if you're choosing someone, like, what are we going to do? We're going to fly around the world. It's like, who are we going to choose as a navigator? How about that? That drunk Fred Noonan. He'll be great. He can't stay away from the bottle, which is everything you want in someone navigating a plane, said no one ever. Of course, he might have been perfectly fine and made a mistake anyway, or Earhart may have decided to overrule his navigation, as she had done in the past, and set them on the wrong track. The skies were cloudy that day, making it difficult for celestial navigation, and experts have since claimed that Earhart's map may have put Howland Island up to six miles away from its actual position. <laughs> what? I when was this going on? It was like 1930s? Yeah, 1930s. I feel like maps that were accurate were a thing in the 1930s, right? <laughs> Six miles seems like a fairly major mistake. Either way, Howland Island is tiny, like the proverbial needle in a haystack of the Pacific Ocean, which is also extra hard to find when your, ne when your map to the needle in the haystack says it's somewhere else. In case you didn't realize how big the Pacific is, it's bigger than all the landmass on Earth combined. It covers almost a third of the planet, and it's handily also the deepest ocean as well. The crazy thing about the Pacific, go on to like Google Earth, and you can rotate the Earth, or just get any, you know, you don't have to go to Google Earth, I sound like such a, <laughs> such a turbo millennial. Get a globe, and twist that thing around, and you can angle it so it just looks like the Earth is a water world. I mean, just about, like there's the, the landmass, like New Zealand or whatever the pokey one is over there. Is it New Zealand? I don't know. Or like one of those islands in Asia, they're just touching the edge, but it does it like a water world. Is it Kevin Costner who's in water world? This is not relevant. Let's move on. So, yes, trying to find a minuscule island that's a mile and a half long, if you're even a smidge off course, is going to be pretty tricky. The plane was running low on fuel by this point, and her last transmission to the Itasca stated, We are in a line position of 157337. We'll report on 6210 kilocycles. Wait, listen on 6210 kilocycles. We are running north and south. They seemed to think that they were in the right place, but no trace of them 
was ever seen again. After extensive searching for almost three weeks, the U.S. government concluded that the Lockheed Electra had crashed in the Pacific and Earhart and Noonan had drowned. Earhart was legally declared dead 18 months later, in January of 1939, when she would have been 41. In May of that year, George Putnam married his third wife. Make of that what you will. That is... That is moving pretty fast, eh, George? <laughs> also, check out the picture of George P. Putnam with Amelia Earhart on his Wikipedia page. It's so weird. It is? Okay. We're checking it out right now? Oh, it is weird. Jen, put this up on screen and I'll describe it for our, our podcast listeners. He's extremely tall and it seems that she's sitting down. He's got his hands in his pocket and he's just like looking down on her from a great height. I mean, it's a very weird portrait and he's also like frowning okay mate i mean it's not the picture that i'd choose but all right <laughs> it's bizarre because the official government statement of crashing into the sea was the most obvious and therefore the least interesting <laughs> many diverse theories have sprung up as to what could have happened to earhart in her plane unfortunately nobody seems interested in poor old fred noonan but that's the price you pay for being a celebrity sidekick holy crucial moment All right, so let's get into some of these theories. The first is that Earhart and Noonan landed somewhere near the then Japanese controlled Marshall Islands and were taken prisoner by the Japanese. This was 1937, and American Japanese tensions were starting to run high, so capturing the famous Amelia Earhart would have been a valuable get for the Japanese. But then, yeah, absolutely. But then the Japanese would have been like, yo, ah, 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 look who we've got. We've got Amelia Earhart. Ha ha. But they didn't. They were just completely silent, which makes me think that they didn't have Amelia Earhart. Boom! Theory discharged. No, well, maybe there's more to it. Let's see. Depending on who you ask, and there are eyewitnesses to both stories, the aviators were either shot and killed almost immediately or held captive on Saipan until they died. There's a branching theory that suggests that Amelia was taken off to be the voice of Tokyo Rose. Yes, but if that was the case, they wouldn't be like, it's mystery Tokyo Rose. They'd be like, it's Amelia Earhart. Not Tokyo Rose mystery person. I mean, and also people would be like, well, that's the voice of Amelia Earhart because she was very famous. Or a husband would be like, that's not that. That's my wife. Right? <laughs> These theories are sometimes so silly. Fred doesn't feature any further in this side theory, but I'm giving him another shout out because I kind of feel bad for him. Fred Noonan! Anyway, Tokyo Rose was the name given by the Allies, the female broadcaster in the South Pacific. Again, I feel like I made a video about this on one of my other channels, so I was familiar. She regularly broadcast Japanese propaganda to bolster their spirits and demoralize Allied troops. It wasn't just one English speaker that had this role, but multiple different women, and it was never definitively proven who any of their identities were. Allied troops at the time thought they were sure they recognized one of the voices, though it was Amelia Earhart now telling them how crap they were. Well, this, well, okay, I mean, maybe there's something to that. What about her husband? While this seems like a bit of a reach, it must have been irritating to hear a familiar voice and not be able to place it. When somebody realized it sounded like Earhart, who, remember, was a major celebrity in the US in particular, you can see how the link was made to her being captured and forced to work as a propaganda broadcaster for the enemy. Yeah, maybe. Okay, very skeptical. And also, they'd be like, it's bloody Amelia Earhart. Because that, hearing Amelia Earhart tell you that you're shite is a lot because she's like some super famous american hero is way more demoralizing than just some random woman telling you that you're shite so convinced with the truth troops that this was amelia earhart that her husband george ah uh, ah uh, went through hours of recording before publicly stating that it wasn't her voice although remember that he moved on pretty quick after her disappearance so maybe it would have been inconvenient to suddenly have her pop back up again <laughs> no 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 it's definitely not amelia she's definitely dead and i'm not uh what's the opposite of monogamous where you get married twice i don't remember but it's definitely he's definitely not that another theory that then branched off from this was one that yes amelia earhart was captured by the japanese but then was rescued and repatriated back to the u.s in secret why you may ask yes indeed i mean wouldn't this have been a really uplifting outcome to the whole debacle well it was done secretly because she was a spy oh my and for some reason it would have hurt the u.s's intelligence operations if this was public knowledge she hadn't been flying to tiny howland island on a whim oh no it was to spy on the japanese and see what they were up to unfortunately the plan was scuppered when she was captured so she had to go and live under an assumed identity when she was returned to the states more likely but still incredibly unlikely 
There are other reasons why the Japanese theory to took such strong root. The first is a film that came out in 1943 called Flight for Freedom. See if this sounds a bit familiar. In this movie, a famed aviatrix is asked to use her round the world flying attempt to spy on the Japanese. Spoiler alert, she mysteriously vanishes and her ultimate fate is never revealed. Uh Amelia Earhart's estate better got bloody paid for that because <laughs> that is her that is her story. This took the idea that Earhart was a spy and ran or flew with it, spreading the theory far and wide at the same time acting as Jap and anti-Japanese propaganda. So people ended up thinking this must have been what happened, even though the roots of it were a, from a sensationalized version of unconfirmed events. Yes, a massive stretch. Even recently, the Japanese must be involved theory was still alive. A photo unearthed in 2017 purportedly showing Amelia and Fred on the Marshall Islands being towed by a barge. Upon further investigation, however, it turned out this photo was probably taken in 1935, two years before her disappearance, and it's not conclusive who the people in the picture are anyway. The lack of soldiers or any other hint of capture also makes me question why not so much news coverage. But hey, it's not a famous mystery for nothing. The reason it got so much news coverage is because the title, Picture of Amelia Earhart After Death, maybe, or just a question mark thrown in there, or maybe not at all, depending on how clickbait you are, is something that gets clicks and drives advertising dollars. And uh, yes, this is the world we live in. It's the equivalent of selling newspapers in the past. If you've lost count of the branches of this one, sorry, but here's another. When she did go back to the US, Amelia Earhart slipped back into her everyday life under the name of Irene Bolam. This is a pretty wild ride, but some people are convinced that they've cracked the case. It all stems from one man, Joseph Gervais, spotting a woman at a party in 1965 and becoming obsessed with the idea that she was the missing Earhart. While the two do look very alike, and Bolam did move in the same circles as Earhart, and had also been a pilot, that's as far as it went. The fact that her life did overlap so much should have been another indicator that it was not Earhart, as a secret identity would not give you such a similar backstory to the real one. Yeah, of course not. If you're like Amelia Earhart, and you're taken back to the US, and they're like, all right, we're going to give you a secret identity. Well, first off, you're a female pilot in the 1930s. It's going to be like, wait, 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 how many female pilots are there? Who And you also look extremely like Amelia Earhart. It's going to, that, is, that is massively suspicious, and it would never happen. Or maybe it's so obvious that people immediately discount it. Also, while there are small facial differences, if Amelia Earhart had had surgery to alter her appearance, surely she would have looked significantly different to her former self and not be so readily identifiable. Despite being an actual real person with a birth certificate, marriage certificate, and a child, poor Irene Bolam was subject subjected to obsessive levels of scrutiny by Gervais and author Joe Class, who published a book about the theory in 1970 called Amelia Earhart Lives. Ah, uh, there better be some lawsuit because. If I can you imagine looking like someone who disappeared and then someone writing a book saying that you're that person, the kind of that you're going to get is going to be so annoying that there better be some sort of injunction that stopped this book being published. Bolam sued and the book was pulled. Excellent. But that wasn't the end of this theory. Even after her death, Gervais wouldn't leave her alone and asked to take photographs and fingerprints from her body. Thankfully, this wasn't allowed. More books sprung up after classes, touting the same notion, but it's been unequivocally disproved, so hopefully the world will move on from thinking that the two people who look alike are the same. All right, so we got the crash and drown theory, the Japanese capture and kill theory, or the Japanese capture and imprison a potential spy theory, and Irene Bolam down. What else could have happened to the unlucky duo? A long-standing and very popular theory is that the Lockheed Electra la landed near Gardner Island, now called Nikomaroro, and Amelia and possibly Fred eked out a castaway existence for a while before eventually dying. I feel like I've heard of that one. While Nico, while Nico, oh my God, while Nikomaroro is 653 kilometers, that's 405 miles from Howland Island. It's a heck of a lot closer than the Marshall Islands, which is where all the Japanese action is supposed to have taken place. They're over 1,500 kilometers, that's 932 miles from the scheduled landing spot. This castaway theory, the Marshall Islands, that is. This castaway theory came about when conducting their initial search for the lost aviators. The U.S. Navy flew over Gardner Island, as it was then called, and reported signs of recent habitation. Apparently unknown to them, the islands had been uninhabited since the late 19th century. Subsequent radio signals that people think may have been from the stranded Earhart also seemed to coalesce around the islands. Gardner Island was checked by the Navy in the subsequent months following Earhart's disappearance, but nothing was found. In 1988, Richard Gillespie, founder of the International Group for Historic Aircraft Recovery, <sighs> that's a mouthful, 
Oh, handily pronounced Tiger, which is a cool and better name, got on the case. After multiple trips to Nicomororo throughout the years, however, no conclusive evidence of Earhart, Noon, and on the plane has ever been recovered. While some artifacts have been found due to Tiger already working on the assumption that Earhart did live on the island, the evidence has been used and sometimes bent to point to that conclusion instead of being taken at face value. The island was re-inhabited from 1938, the period right around the disappearance, so anything dating from that time would likely be related to those inhabitants. Bones were found on the island in 1940, but after initial examination by a doctor, they were determined to be those of a short male around 5'5". Five five. For the record, Amelia Earhart was around 5'8", and our hero, Fred <laughs> Fred Noonan was a towering six-footer. The British officer who found them even said at the time that they looked older than four years. While it seems unlikely the whole skeleton was not found and techniques for working out gender have improved a lot since 1940, many people think that the first doctor just got it wrong. Using photographs of the bones and computer analysis to try and work out their original owner, anthropologist <laughs> owning the bones, you own your bones. That's a weird concept. Anthropologist Richard Jantz concluded in 2018 that they more than likely belong to a five foot eight inch tall white woman. Well, that could be her. As the bones were lost a long time ago, it's not possible to perform any sort of DNA testing, leaving yet another dangling loose end to the mystery. Even the big guns have failed to prove the Nicomororo theory conclusively. In 2019, Robert Ballard, who found the Titanic no less, conducted a deep water exploration around the island, but nary a trace of the Lockheed Electra was found. Basically, short of finding the plane or something with Earhart's name on it, it's going to be impossible to prove. That she was ever there. Mundane conclusion though it is, it does seem as if the plane was off course, out of fuel, and just ended up ditching in the Pacific, creating a legacy for Earhart that persists to this day. Yeah, uh, with this one, I'm like, maybe some of these theories are a little more believable than others. I don't think the Japanese one has anything to it. Maybe the one of her landing on the island and subsisting for a while and then dying. Maybe, yes, unlikely. We found really nothing conclusive to that. The plane crashed in the ocean and they all drowned and the Pacific's massive, so they're never going to find it, right? If they lost that giant Malaysian Airlines plane, and no one could find that, even with all the modern technology, this it's, it's not hard to imagine that it's just lost in the Pacific, is it? Anyway, this has been an episode of Decoding the Unknown. If you enjoyed this, while this show is obviously relatively new, so please, if you're watching on YouTube, make sure you're subscribed. Hey, if you're listening as a podcast, this show is broadcast as both things. Well, make sure you're subscribed as well. Leave a review if you fancy it. And thank you for watching or listening. Hello everybody, welcome back to another brand new episode of Decoding the Unknown. As always, I'm your host here, I'm Simon, and what happens is Katie, our excellent writer for this channel, uh, slash podcast, has written me a script, The Georgia Guidestones, Tips for a Post-Apocalyptic World. These are like these monolithic stones that were put up in, I'm gonna guess, Georgia, and not Georgia like near Russia, Georgia, but Georgia like, uh, Atlanta. Georgia. Um, and they were weird, and no one really knows what they're about. I am assuming, because people do, that people think they were put there by aliens. They probably weren't. Let's just jump in. Uh, I'm going to read what Katie's written. I'm going to add some thoughts if I have any. I usually do. People sometimes complain about them. Sometimes they say, oh, it's nice when you add your own thoughts, fact boy. We love that. We love that about you. Anyway, let's just jump in. We're all familiar with the concept of some sort of apocalypse happening. In recent, I mean, I hope not literally. In recent pop culture, there have been many, many zombie apocalypses, and humanity has always seemed to make it through at the other end. Wait, <laughs> that's not what happens in zombie movies. You know, in zombie movies, there's always like almost everyone is destroyed by zombies, and then there's like a ragtag group of survivors. But the reality is, like, 99% of humanity has been destroyed by zombies, and the, you know. So will probably the rest. Best case scenario, they reach some safe haven that they've heard about over a radio. They go there and uh, they live out their days in a compound. And that's where it ends, with 99% of humanity dead. <laughs> that's the reality of zombie movies. Not wanting to jinx anything, we've also had very recent run-ins with highly contagious diseases. But again, so far the majority of the population has survived. But what would happen if there was an event so monumental and civilization as we know it took such a hit that the very foundations of our society would have to be rebuilt almost from scratch? I mean, like, okay, let's try and do it better this time around, shall we? Because there's a whole lot of f***ed up stuff that I don't like. I don't think most people like. Let's just try and do a better job, you know? It's like a blank canvas to paint a better society on. 
Would you know what to do if this happens? Would anyone? I actually got a book for Christmas last year. It's called How to Invent Everything. And it's a book about that basically, you know, is like, uh, explains the most basic stuff because most people, you know, there's the example, I think it's given in this book, or maybe this is just another example of like, no one knows how to make a pencil. Like the reality is like the wood is harvested by one company, then it's made into like little long things by another company and other companies working on graphite. And the reality is that no one person knows how to make a pencil, which is kind of a problem. And this book explains how you could make a simple pencil. Fascinating tangent, Simon. Thank you for that. Well, luckily, there are a set of granite stones in a field in Elberton, Georgia, in the USA, that have all the tips you need for how to start rebuilding a society following an apocalyptic event. Wait, what? Yeah, I mean, how much information are you going to get on these stones? This book is relatively thin. And I'm like, yeah, I know it's, it's mostly like for fun. But I, it's not going to be a super useful actual guide for the end of the world. The Mystery Elberton, Georgia is known as the granite capital of the world. This is because there's tons and tons of granite. Shocking news there, but also because the granite found there is finer grains and higher quality than the crappy old granite found anywhere else. So if you're looking to build a monument of something that will last, Elberton might be the place to go. You're welcome, Elberton. Next time you can sponsor this show for all the people looking for high-quality granite. In 1979, none other than the president of the Elberton Granite Finishing Corporation himself, Joe H. Fendley Sr., was contacted by a mysterious stranger. This stranger was a well-put-together man who said that he represented a group of fellow Americans, all of whom wished to remain anonymous. This group wanted to leave an enduring message for future generations and wanted Elberton both as the source of granite for the project and to act as the actual site for the monument. I mean, it makes sense, because otherwise you got to ship those granite big granite stones somewhere, which I'm sure is expensive. Sensing a potential matter in the immediate proximity, Fendley gave a ridiculous high quote for the project, assuming that that would end the matter. Yeah, I've definitely done that at points where it's like, I really don't want to work with you, but I can't think of a reason. So just quoting like absolutely massive prices and then people are like, oh, okay, thanks. No longer interested. And it's like, yeah, you and me both. The stranger surprised him by agreeing to the amount, and Fendley's colleague Wyatt Martin ended up being nominated as the intermediary agent between this anonymous group and the people actually constructing the piece for them. Yeah, one time, the, there's one time this really happened to me, and I quoted like a ridiculously high number, like, you know, just a go away number. And then they came back with quite a, quite a ridiculously high number as well, and I was like, I really don't, I, but I still don't want to work with you, so hard pass. <laughs> The stranger gave his name as R.C. Christian at the time, which was a pseudonym, and even if Wyatt Martin did ever know his real name or who he was, he has publicly sworn that he would never divulge it, even under pain of death. Whoa. <laughs> I'll be like, yeah, 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 but really, if you were going to kill me, I'd be like, yeah, yeah, it was John. It was John. The granite slab guy he wanted to build these granite slabs is not that big of a secret after handing over a scale model and finalizing the details of the monument rc christian swept out of town never to be seen again by the following year the monument was ready to be unveiled and on the 22nd of march 1980 oh for some reason i thought this was much more recently the public got their first official view of the mysterious project Here's what they saw. Four large rectangular granite slabs were angled around a narrower central granite column. The central column had a slit like a letterbox carved into it through which a small round hole could be seen. And I'm sure if you're just listening to this show right now, you're enjoying this picture that Katie is painting with your mind, you know, because this show is a podcast, but it's also a YouTube channel. And if you're watching the YouTube channel right now, you're probably getting some glorious images of this, which do a better job than the picture in your mind. I mean... Not always. Sometimes the picture in your mind is better, but considering this is a factual thing, um, the, the picture on the screen, if you're watching, is, is more accurate. A rectangular capstone sat on top of all five upright pieces. A little way off from the monument was another granite slab set into the ground. So, what was the big deal? It just sounds like a bunch of old granite. Well, the group behind the stones wanted them to function not only as guidelines for future generations, but also as a calendar and a clock. There were inscriptions all over the slabs, sandblasted in letters 4 inches, 10 centimeters high. Those are big letters. You're not going to be able to fit much, even on these giant granite stones. The capstone was inscribed with the same message in four ancient languages, one on each side. The four main stones carried inscriptions on both sides. The same messages repeated in eight different languages. And what do these meticulously inscribed letters say? Around each edge of the capstone is a message in Babylonian cuneiform, classical Greek, Sanskrit, and Egyptian hieroglyphics. The message translates to, 
Let these be guide stones to an age of reason. Pretty grandiose. And the messages on the four main stones were a set of ten. I hesitate to call them rules. Let's call them guidelines in English, Spanish, Swahili, Hindi, Hebrew, Arabic, Chinese, and Russian. This is something that's going to really confuse future archaeologists in like a thousand years. They'll be like, wait, why is there ancient Egyptian hieroglyphics in North America? That doesn't make any sense. Although, I assume by the future they've got way better like archaeological techniques and they're like, yeah, no, no, no. Archaeology really got a bit it got a bit pointless when we invented this device which can just look into the past. Anyway, these guidelines are inscribed as follows. Maintain humanity under 500 million in perpetual balance with nature. Wait, like a population under 500 million? That's going to be really difficult because you're eventually going to get to 500 million and someone's going to be like, oh, don't forget that granite stone said no more people. So we have to wait for people to die now. People are going to be like, uh, dude, seems like there's plenty of space. So f*** that. Guide reproduction wisely, improving fitness and diversity. Uh oh. <laughs> Wait, that sounds a little bit like. Oh god, I've forgotten the word. A eugenics. That sounds a little bit like eugenics. Don't say eugenics so positively. <laughs> that sounds like eugenics. I meant that sounds like eugenics. Unite humanity with a living new language. Rule passion, faith, tradition, and all things with tempered reason. Protect people and nations with fair laws and just courts. Let all nations rule internally, resolving external disputes in a world court. Avoid petty laws and useless officials. Uh, balance personal rights with social duties. Prize truth, beauty, love, seeking harmony with the infinite. Be not a cancer on the earth. Leave room for nature. Leave room for nature. All right. I mean, this all feels a bit, I don't know. I don't want to see cl say cliche because they are like, you know, okay, great. But it is a bit like dreamy, isn't it? Let all nations rule internally, resolving external disputes in a world court. Yeah, I mean, we tried that, didn't we? With the like League of Nations in the 1920s. Then we had World War II. It didn't work brilliantly. It's just saying a lot, but not doing a lot, isn't it? Not to worry, we should be coming back to these later. The granite slab set into the ground is a useful explanation tablet, giving the date the stones were erected and a guide to the languages used. It also explains the astronomical uses for the guide stones, saying that the oblique cut hole in the central column indicates celestial pole, which appears to mean that you can always see the North Star through it. Okay. This is one of those things where it's like, this is just going to confuse future people because they're like, these messages on here, but then why are they lining it up with the stars? That feels like very 3,000 years before this was made. So it feels like Stonehenge era rather than like modern era. The letterbox like slot is for tracking the sun and the movement is oriented so the sun will shine through a slit in the capstone at noon each day. From above, the guide stones are set in an X shape, apparently following the annual journey of the moon. It also handily gives the physical data for the monument so no one had to bother getting their measuring sticks out to know the overall height is 19 feet 3 inches, that's 5.87 meters, the total weight is 237,746 pounds, that's 107,000 kilograms. God damn, this is big and heavy. And that the whole thing is made up of 951 cubic feet, uh, 26.9 20, cubic meters of granite. This thing is massive. I saw pictures of this thing, and uh, I didn't quite get a uh, 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 feel for the, the true scope of it. The weight of each of the big slabs is over 20 tons. There are also other measurements, but I couldn't be bothered converting all those numbers, and you can easily look it up for yourself. Yes, agreed, Katie. It's also not that interesting, so I'll happily just move on. The tablet only gave the imperial measurements, by the way, not the metric ones, because as we all know, we're making something for the long-distant future, and imperial measurements make a lot of sense, said no one. Ever. Also, the tablet had an inscription relating to a time capsule buried six feet below, but the parts showing when it was buried and when it should be dug up are blank, so maybe they didn't get around to doing it. Or maybe it was someone in the group's idea, but other people thought it was a bit lame to welcome civilization back with a copy of the Daily Elberton Rag, a scrambled up Rubik's Cube, and a cassette tape of My Sharona. Yes, and none of that stuff. This thing is clearly made of granite and built to last like thousands of years. All of that stuff will have decayed a really long time ago. I made a fast fascinating video about like there's a time capsule like beneath some university somewhere where it's a big room full of stuff and to stop it all to de de like um God, what's wrong with my brain today it's the end of a long day and i didn't sleep very much last night uh it's filled like with inert gas so uh, the stuff doesn't degrade over time i think like they sealed it up and they pumped it full of nitrogen or something and that's pretty cool. It's designed to last for like a thousand years or 70,000 years or something crazy. The other inscription on this highly detailed explanatory tablet states that the sponsors are a small group of Americans who seek the age of reason. That sounds a lot like you're hoping for the end of the world there, doesn't it, mate? 
And the author is engraved as R.C. Christian and underneath in brackets, a pseudonym. Yes, agonizingly, on a permanent memorial to the rebuilding of humankind, there is a spelling mistake. Oh no! It says pseudonym! I didn't even, I just read it as pseudonym. But they spelt it wrong. Oh my god. How did no one making this giant granite thing realize that that should be an M, not an N? Oh my according to the specifications set by the mysterious rc christian the monument was to be in a remotish area not near any touristy sites he wanted it to be left in a natural state and accessible to all so no fences or historic site paraphernalia were to be put up around it from the moment it was unveiled people started having opinions about it with local priests declaring it a symbol of the occult all right guys chill out it's not that and others wondering if there were hidden meanings behind the messages again no it's like this group of people were just like would like to leave a nice little message a nice little slightly cliched message for future generations after there's been some apocalyptic event. There's no... It's not cursed. <laughs> it's not mysterious. It's just a giant block of granite that someone carved some shit into. So, in the decades since they were erected, have we found out any more about these mysterious stones that have been referred to as America's Stonehenge? Could the inscriptions maybe hold hidden, darker meanings? Why did the anonymous group think these guidelines would even be necessary? Is there devilry afoot? Let's find out. Uh, it's just like it's some weird club and they were like let's build a weird thing shall we probably some dudes who have too much money because they bought like a hundred thousand kilograms of granite and i know granite's expensive like i don't have a granite countertop in my kitchen because i was like well one i'm definitely gonna have to i'm definitely gonna break it at some point i've already broken the one i have there now and i'm sure it's gonna be super ex- it is super expensive and it's hard to fix so i got some like artificial granite thing where you can actually fix it which is useful because i've already chipped it twice because i'm such a big brain but these dudes, whoever they are, had a lot of money. Reading the stones. On the face of it, the messages on the guide stone seem pretty straightforward, and the sponsor group declared that people should totally take them at face value and try not to read into them any more than what they said. However, there was so much speculation about what they might mean that the anonymous group, probably heaving a deep sigh, had to publish a list of explanatory precepts in order that their message for the future wasn't twisted or misinterpreted in any way. We'll go into what these guidelines are supposed to mean in greater detail in a minute, but first I think we should talk about why these guide stones were created the group behind the stones had fears for the future and wanted to ensure that should anything happen there was a list of points on how to do it right next time depending on how far you're talking into the future though i always want to just come back to the idea of the world court right or any of those precepts really it's just there's so much of a problem with this you're talking about a time where there's obviously been some major disaster because there were like eight billion people in the world seven billion eight billion i don't know there's billions of people in the world today and there's going to be 500 million and that's where you should cap it out so obviously there's been some world ending disaster and they're even talking about this could be like a future society which is going to have a different language and all this stuff i mean translate into all the different old languages you want and whatever what's a court who's going to know what a court is like it'd be like I wonder what this court thing was. <laughs> no one knows. No one could possibly know. It could be like, nations? What are nations? <laughs> we all live in peaceful harmony. According to R.C. Christian, the stones and messages had been 20 years in the planning, meaning that worries about future world wars and nuclear annihilation were probably the motives that kick-started the idea for the monument. Good, we don't have to worry about those anymore. <laughs> At all. Oh my. Uh, it's. I am so like, it's so sad that at some point there's going to be, just because time is, you know, it goes on forever, basically. At some point, there's going to be some other major war that's going to kill billions or hundreds of millions of people. And the whole of the world is going to get all screwed up and all sort of old stuff's going to get destroyed. And there's going to be like more genocides. I mean, not that genocides aren't going on, but there's going to be like some other turbo genocide. And it's going to be like, it's just a bit depressing. And I like the fact that I'm like 30 something years old and i like the fact that my parents are like 60 something years old and we haven't lived through any i mean there's been wars and stuff but we haven't lived through anything crazy like my grandparents and stuff they were like born at the tail end of tail end i don't know how old are my grandparents like they're like 90s so yeah i mean they lived through some warry shit like i remember my nan talking about rationing and stuff and it's just like yeah i'm glad they had to live through that and not us and i hope that my children and my children's children don't have to but the reality is that at some point little like grandchildren whistlers that's my name if you didn't know it were uh are, like going to have to go off and find some sort of war and probably die and i'm like that's really depressing because i like my kids and i don't want their kids or kids kids to have to do that because it'll be sad well, this has been a tangent obviously war is depressing fact boy just carry on with the story 
The group was worried about a nuclear event so large that civilization would have to be rebuilt from the ground up, and nuclear war definitely fits into that category. Another reason for the stone's placement in Alberton was that it was off the beaten track and likely to survive a missile strike due to being pretty much in the middle of nowhere. All that granite under the ground would also make it a more stable place to build a long-lasting monument in case of a natural disaster. So this group of like-minded and presumably rich Americans decided to bestow their wisdom upon the poor people who were left scrambling to rebuild society after the world ended. So, let's get back to those messages and the explanations given for them. Some of them are very specific and others are a bit more vague, so it seems likely that some or all of them were written by different people. Yeah, it does feel pretty disjointed, so it feels like you know everyone chipped in a bit and got to come up with a rule. Now, if you break any of these rules, you can't sit with us at lunch. Maybe everyone in the group got to have their own guideline passed down forever, and that's why they seem a bit inconsistent. I agree, Katie. There we go. Same page. Here are the guidelines again, followed by their explanatory precepts. Number one, maintain humanity under 500 million in perpetual balance with nature. And then the explanatory quote was, means the entire human race at its climax level for permanent balance with nature. Wait, the explanatory note means less than the actual thing on the stone, which I guess is good. Okay, here we go. We all know that the planet is groaning under the weight of humans, and we're really cocking up the place as far as living with nature goes. But 500 million people? Even in 1980, the population was nudging 4.5 billion. It's so crazy that we've basically doubled that since 1980. I know it's only going to get faster and faster, but it's so crazy. And also, I feel like, I know, I even live in a city. But I'm like, it doesn't feel very crowded. And then you go out into the countryside, and you're like, there's no one here. This is really nice. And I live in a fairly, you know, not super densely packed country. But then, I mean, then you go to somewhere like truly uninhabited. Like, I don't know, a friend of mine's from Montana. And I live in Prague in the Czech Republic. And coming from the UK, I'm like, quite, it's pretty sparsely populated here. You go out into the countryside, and there's just no one there. And then my friend from Montana, who lives here as well, he's like, my dude... What are you talking about? It's so crowded here all the time. And I'm like, Grant, mate. Yeah, I know. But you, you, he's told stories where it's like, yeah, it was like three hours drive and I didn't see another car. I'm like, what is going on in Montana? Why does no one live there? Uh, what are we talking about? Okay, so it's 1980, the population's four and a half billion, so R.C. Christian's group is expecting a hell of a cull. According to worldometers.info, interesting website name the world population hasn't been as low as 500 million since the 1600s so who knows why they decided on that number i know 1600s were great wasn't that when there was that big plague <laughs> while there is no denying that a mass extinction event of humans would be great for the planet uh <laughs> holy shit, this guideline seems a bit strict and really who's going to be checking on how many people there are when 95 percent of the human race has been snuffed out what happens if the population accidentally pops over the line well obviously you gotta kill them <laughs> Is there going to be an annual call <laughs> when taken with subsequent messages on the stones? This piece of advice starts to take on a darker tone. Oh god, where are we going? Guideline number two. Guide reproduction wisely, improving fitness and diversity. Explanatory note. Without going into details as yet undiscovered, this means humanity should apply reason and knowledge to guiding its own reproduction. Fitness could be translated as health. Diversity could be translated as variety. Mate. This is just sounding straight like eugenics, right? Like uh, selective breeding of humans. Well, thanks for the lesson on how to use the thesaurus, anonymous American person, and way to dodge a bullet by adding diversity to the guideline. Although the explanation sort of narrows this down with the word variety. Diversity implies to broaden the genetic pool as much as possible by reproducing with other races. Variety, to my mind, means, for example, different hair color within the same racial group. Yeah, I guess. I guess, yeah. Divert. I mean, diversity seems like a more clear word other than variety, which is generally not applied when talking about this stuff. It seems a, it's all very weird, isn't it? Also, if humanity's taken such a hit that it's been reduced to practically nothing, it's probably pretty slim pickings out there for who you might want to start re repopulating the planet with. Yes, we seem to be edging around the murky world of eugenics here, and it definitely bears pointing out that during the inception of this granite monument, forced sterilizations of people deemed mentally unfit were being carried out all over the United States, and minorities such as Native Americans were still being sterilized against their will into the 1970s. Which is insane, America. And not just America, let's just go with humanity in general. What the f*** are you up to? And this guideline, and that, I mean, I don't want to make any excuses for, for eugenics, because obviously it's wrong. 
but uh doing it based on race is insane like i'm not going to make the argument for because i find it morally pretty horrible but you can see a reason for weeding out genetic diseases you can see the logic behind that someone could and but just doing it on race is just insane it's like there's no logic there (laughs) it's just racism (laughs) And this, and this guideline was written after the Second World War and all that Hitler's obsession with a master race entailed, so it's hard to take anything like this as an innocent statement. I don't really care what the guideline says or even what the explanation means. There is no way that this isn't a very loaded message. Yeah, I can see why these people wanted to remain anonymous because it's like, yeah, yeah, what are you into? Yeah, yeah, well, I've got, you know, everyone's contributing their lines to the song. It's like one guy's like, well, I think that nations should resolve all their differences with a world court. And the guy's like, yeehaw! <laughs> I want my one to be about eugenics and racism. <laughs> oh no. It seems that you should only reproduce to give birth to increasingly superior specimens and not for any other reason, like, I don't know, wanting to have children with a partner you love. Man, the future sounds bleak. Number three, unite humanity li- with a living new language. Uh, okay, I hope they clarify like what a living language is, because aren't all languages living? It's not like, yeah, yeah, Latin. Okay, great. So let's not do Latin or any of the other dead languages. Let's use a language that can evolve, which language does all the time. Oh, okay. Well, they are explaining it. This is the explanation. Living language grows and changes with advancing knowledge. A new language will be developed de novo and need not necessarily be adapted from any languages now in existence. Ah, these people sound like uh, the, the person who wants you to think that they're smarter than they actually are. But then someone reasoning goes, that it's a bit stupid, isn't it? Phew, at least this one is a little less contentious. Okay, so we've got a bunch of people living all over the place, speaking different languages. What is one to do? Well, refer to the guidelines and just make up a whole new language that somehow everyone will be able to learn. It sounds hard, it does. And it's been tried before with Esperanto, I know about that language, and it never really took off. It. If I, I think if humanity's down to the bare bones, people are just going to stay where they are and continue using the language of the people that they now live with. Yeah, it's like, oh my god, the world's been destroyed destroyed by nuclear war fortunately we've got these guidestones to guide us to a better thing and they say that we should be learning a new language so we'll be like yo 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 peter how about we just speak english because there's other shit we have to worry about like you know radiation and food and shelter and basic survival peter's like no the guidelines say new language jeff i always like to give my people character names like peter and jeff and john if a stranger turns up, what usually happens? They learn the language of the people they now live with, and it's not like languages will be wiped off the map. I'm sure there'll be some people left with knowledge of more than one, and we have Google Translate. But I suppose it would make sense for everyone that left to be able to communicate, so a new language seems smart. How it be started, though, and how to work at all the grammar, etc., well, I'll leave that to the future survivor people. Emojis, anyone? Yeah, I mean, this is, the po- this is such a pointless entry on there. Rule 3 is stupid. Number 4. Rule passion, faith, tradition, and all things with tempered reason. Okay, I mean super generic. And the uh, explanation. Faith here may be used in a religious sense. Too often people are ruled by blind faith even when it may be contrary to reason. Yeah, okay. Reason must be tempered with compassion here, but must prevail. Okay, so just be reasonable. So everyone just has to calm down and be reasonable. I don't really have a problem with this one, although some people's interpretation of what they think is reasonable is going to be the exact opposite of other people's. This particular guideline with its emphasis on reason is one of the central tenets of this group's beliefs, which we'll get into in more detail later on. That was a very short one. I think it's because, yeah, of course, rule with, rule with reason. Okay, great. Moving on, number five. Protect people and nations with fair laws and just courts. Courts must consider justice as well as the law. I mean, that's what courts do now. It's like, yeah, okay, the law's there, and it's interpreted by the courts. Isn't that what justice, isn't that what the, the law is? It's like you go there and you make an argument, and then if the law seems dumb, either, I don't know, I know it for the UK, Parliament will be like, yeah, 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 we're changing this stupid law. Or the courts will interpret it in a way that basically changes it. It's, you know, okay, well, this previous case that we should go on, if it's from a higher court or the same court or whatever, says this. But, like, we're gonna just, you know interpreted a little bit differently so that justice prevails because that's fair doesn't that explanation make it sound like the courts can just do whatever they want i mean yeah and to a large extent courts do find ways often to do what they want and it 
usually is fair because courts are generally fair, I think. People who have been wrong generally want justice over and above any, everything else. So it sounds like courts in the future will have carte blanche to dole out whatever punishments they want, regardless of the law. It also seems, uh, I don't know, Casey, I think this is open to interpretation. Which, I mean, when you're making rules for a future society, I guess it's something you probably don't want, but uh, you've definitely allowed. It also seems that in the future post-apocalyptic world, nations have remained and are going to get into arguments with other nations. Yay! <laughs> and also, hang on, who is going to be protecting these nations and overseeing how fair these laws are? An uber nation or a UN-type entity? How many people do you need in the world to have this sort of global system? And sure, who doesn't want fair laws and just courts? On paper, on granite, that seems like a good idea. In practice, though, who knows what people will come up with yeah i mean this is one of those things it's not like you can just write like this is how it's going to be the legal system has evolved over a very very long time to be the kind of shoddy thing that it is today which i mean i just said like yeah generally people get justice and like are you joking whistle boy <laughs> it's a bit of a joke i mean the justice system is like i mean i, I it's the best thing we've got but innocent people go to prison or get punished all the time and guilty people get off even more often it's definitely not perfect in any way whatsoever. I don't think we should be dictating to a future society how to do things when we haven't got it right ourselves. Number six, let all nations rule internally, resolving external disputes in the world court. And the explanation is, individual nations must be free to develop their own destinies at home as their own people wish, but cannot abuse their neighbors. Hang on, mate, but aren't you just making these granite stones telling everyone what to do? What are you up to? Wait, wait, wait. I thought the immediate concern after an apocalyptic event would be to get the place up and running again. Would all the tiny amount of people want to stay within the limits of their own pre-existing nations? No, we talked about this. When the zombie apocalypse, you listen to the ham radio and you're like, there's, you, you listen for signals of people who've set up some camp somewhere and they've got a big wall and they've got guns and food and fresh water and the zombies are at the gate and eventually they get over the gate and they're over on the camp and a band of survivors will escape. I don't even know what I'm pulling this from, but I'm guessing it's like every zombie movie ever. Or post-apocalyptic movie. Would countries even really exist anymore? Surely some populations would be almost totally annihilated, but the survivors have got to keep it all local whilst also learning a new global language at the same time. Not, don't forget, setting up a brand new legal system. And depending on what resources the countries have remaining to them, you know that some of them are going to develop way more quickly than others. Seems a bit unfair given the state the world has found itself in in this imagined future. I mean, can't we all just get along? Yes, would be nice. Probably not going to happen, though. Number seven, avoid petty laws and useless officials. And the explanation is self-explanatory. Ah, yes. And we'll probably succeed at that at the beginning. But then let me introduce you to the wonderful world of inevitable bureaucracy. Haha, the explanation says it all. I bet this person had a specific useless official in mind when they submitted this guideline. Yes, oh my God. Useless officials. Useless people. Oh my God, what was it the other day? It's like, yeah, there's this bizarre thing. I don't know how it is in other countries, but when buying property here, you uh, you buy the property, you know, you, you make an offer, it gets accepted, blah, 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 blah. And at some point you apply for a mortgage and a person from the bank comes and values the property. And this is not just like some guy who has some other job. It's like the official job is like property valuer. And you're like, well, that makes a lot of sense because the bank needs to secure the thing. In all of all the properties that I've, I mean, <laughs> I'm some property mogul, but like, you know, when I've, there's properties that I've wanted and have fallen through and all this stuff, I had a few valued. And it's like every single time, it's always come back as about 10% less than the price I'm buying it for. And I was curious about this. And I talked to other people, I talked to like the guy who got me the mortgage. And he's like, yeah, it's just how it works. It's just they go in and they value it at 10% less. So the bank, you know, so the bank has some like protection or whatever. I don't really understand it. But it's always 10% less. They always just find a way to make it 10% less. And I'm like, so this guy's job is entirely pointless. And I'm like, yeah. Yeah, I mean, but he values it. And I'm like, yeah, but he's not, is he? He's just like finding a way to push it towards that price and then check in a box. And this is just one example of many bureaucrats that exist. <laughs> I can just imagine the guy who came up with this one, the self-explanatory, is that, yeah, he wanted, to, he wanted a permit to put a pool in in his backyard and they wouldn't give it to him for some stupid ass reason. And he's like, goddamn person at City Hall. I'm making this rule just for you, Everybody hopes to avoid useless officials, so at least that's something to look forward to in the desolate, blasted future world. Number eight, balance personal rights with social duties. I mean, obviously. 
Interestingly, something that we're dealing with right now. It's like, yo, young people, like myself, obviously, I mean, not obviously, but statistically, it seems like my risk of COVID, basically, fairly, fairly minimal, because I'm a healthy, relatively young man. Risk of COVID jab, also extremely minimal, because I'm a healthy young man, but they're also kind of like about the same risk. So it's like, why would I intentionally get a vaccine? And it's like, well, because I'm not a piece of f- And I want to do my part for society that I live in so that I don't get sick and then pass it all on to some old person that I kill. But mostly because I'm not a piece of shit. Go get a vaccine. (laughs) Oh my god, some people are going to be smashing that dislike button being like, Simon, I'm a sovereign citizen. Wait, hang on, hang on. Let me put on my my appropriate voice list. Simon, I'm a sovereign citizen and I will do as I please with my body as given to me by Jesus. So, okay, chill out. Okay, chill out. Do your thing. Do your bit for humanity. All right, Simon, get off your soapbox. Be a good post-apocalypse citizen, okay? I'm a bit confused over why the guidelines want to push people to work for a greater good, yet still remain insular and within their own nations. Yeah, probably because different people wrote each guideline. (laughs) I don't really know whether the ethos of the sponsor group or the individuals within it are making different... are making their differing beliefs shown. Whatever the case, there's no denying that pulling together after a crisis is preferable to going it alone, especially if you're like me, where my best chance of survival would be definitely dependent on being in a larger group. (laughs) Yeah, Katie's writing this, but I'm also like, preach. It's like in a zombie apocalypse. I I, I don't kid myself at all. I'm definitely going to be one of the first people to go. (laughs) It's like, one, I live in a city. Two, I don't have any means of defending myself because I don't have any, like, fighting skills. I don't own a gun. I do do know how to use a gun. um, So I guess I'd have to get a gun. (laughs) But it's like, nah, I'm not not joking. I'd be be like, I'd be finding a group ASAP who has guns and then hopefully giving me one. And, uh, or hopefully not, just protecting me. (laughs) I'd be like, what What skills do you have, Simon? What do you bring to the group? It's like, I can, I, I got a good knowledge of some facts. <laughs> we could, there's no electricity. We could sit down in the evening. I could read you a script. Ah, please don't leave me. Preferably with people who can cook. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I'm not a brilliant cook either. I can cook, but I'm not a brilliant cook. Number nine, prize truth, beauty, love, seeking harmony with the infinite. <sighs> Whoever wrote this is a hippie who somehow got rich. The infinite here means the supreme being, the explanation, sorry. The infinite here means the supreme being whose will is manifest in the workings of the cosmos. God damn hippie! Whoa, dude! Get out of here! Not cool! If we will seek for it. Oh my god, okay. <laughs> Who let this guy in the rich people group? How did you get rich, hippies? I won the lotto. Oh god, get out. Come on, but we need your money, lotto guy. Okay, who let hippie Charlie have a guideline? <laughs> I don't read these ahead. Seriously, as well as learning a new language and keeping all of their emotions in check, future people are supposed to also be going on a spiritual journey. Doesn't this get doesn't this contradict guideline four about ruling everything with tempered reason? And don't let me and don't tell me to prize truth, beauty, and love, you patronizing old git. I'll do that on my own. Thank you very much. Preach, Katie! This one sounds more like something that you'd see on a fridge magnet than a line of advice for the ages. Yeah, or a shitty t-shirt, or like some platitude that again, someone who thinks they're smart but isn't says. Number 10. Be not a cancer of the earth. Leave room for nature. Leave room for nature. Did they really need to repeat? I I just assumed maybe it was a mistake earlier, but no, they really appear to have written leave room for nature twice. Dude, you're literally carving into granite. It's like... I mean, it's good. whoever's carving that is going to be like, really, my dude, <laughs> did we need to do that? Did we really? Come on. Uh, the explanation is, in our time, the growth of humanity is destroying the natural conditions of the earth, which have fostered all existing life. We must restore reasoned balance. Well, I mean, yeah. I, I know it's bad and stuff. Like, I mean, humanity, we're really, we're really screwing up the planet. I saw something the other day. It was about Europe, and it was like, there was just, I can't remember the figures or anything, but it was about... Num- amounts of CO2 that we need to be consuming to, you know, sustain the Earth and not fuck it up more than we already have. And it was like this tiny little slither. And then it was like actual consumption of uh, CO2 by people in Europe. And it was massively, like, it was just huge. And I was just like, oh my God, we're fucked. <laughs> we're so, we're so, so screwed. What I want to do, and I kind of feel bad for not having done it yet, is join one of those uh, things where you carbon offset your life. Because, I don't know, 
I'm not probably going to buy like, I mean, uh, yeah, yeah, I'll get an electric car, but right now the parking bay that I have, it doesn't have a charger. So it's like, all right, well, I can't really charge an electric car, can I? And no, I don't drive a hybrid. <laughs> um, but I realized that I probably should. And then there's all this other stuff I do, like I fly around the place. I mean, I did before COVID and I don't know, lead like a relative. I eat lots of meat. I love steak. And I realized, OK, I'm probably quite a carbon heavy person and i was like i'd love to sign up it's like it's i don't know it's not even expensive like i put my lifestyle into one of these estimate your carbon footprint things and the cost of offsetting and i think it was like 30 bucks a month maybe it's a little bit more than that but it wasn't that much and i'm like that's something i really should do and i haven't done it yet but i will because honestly just offsetting is easier than reducing my carbon emissions because i love steak and i like driving a car and uh, i like flying places and i will happily pay more to be able to do those things and is it really that simple that seems like way too an easier easier of a solution what are we talking about i'm sorry i'm just totally on a on a tangent there's that word again reason there are references to it all over the guidestones the inscription on the capstone is uh, let these be guidestones to an age of reason and the sponsors are described as a small group of americans who seek the age of reason Oh, what I was going to say, I'm sorry, the reason I went on that whole tangent, and then I totally forgot what my whole point was, it's like, yeah, 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 we're really screwing up the environment now, but by the time these guidestones come into place from, like, some nuclear apocalypse or anything, everyone's going to be like, (laughs) and we were worried about carbon dioxide, (laughs) now the whole world's irradiated, brilliant, (laughs) I'd welcome carbon dioxide back into my life. But what does it mean? the reason thing what does it mean it seems that this group has a bee in its bonnet about human overpopulation but reasonable people would not demand rigid population control to combat that that's what unreasonable people would do it's also not clear i am i an unreasonable (laughs) casey and i maybe not i haven't thought out this opinion very much at all but it does seem that a okay let's not call it reasonable immediately let's say a method of you know reducing carbon emissions is population control because obviously the most carbon heavy event that you can something just definitely fell over in my office there's no one else here like what is that terrifying sound i make another show called casual criminalist and whenever i hear like it's always something really super scary and whenever there's a knock somewhere in my office i'm like oh god today's the day that i get murdered on camera isn't it um stop going on these tangents get back to the get back to the facts i even forgot what i was talking about oh my god this is such a train wreck i'm so sorry (laughs) oh yeah well there that's it i was talking about um is population control a reasonable way to control like climate change and i mean yeah kinda is i mean we should all be better with our carbon thing but the the best thing you can do is not have like seven kids because you know they're all going to use a lot of they're all going to make a lot of carbon dioxide it's also not clear why leave room for nature is repeated and i'm not saying we should kill ever anyone by the way i'm just saying maybe we should have less kids is it to underline the importance of the message or did the stonemason accidentally keep chipping away so ended up doing the whole sentence again this one more or less says the same thing as guidelines one and nine but it's delivered in a bit in a more biblical ten commandments way than either of the other two uh nature also seems to be important to the group so but maybe they could have stuck with one guideline about overpopulation versus nature and then use the other one to give future people some more useful advice like a foolproof bread recipe or how to diversify your portfolio (laughs) i'm not altogether sure why they thought these were really worth preserving in the first places most of them are just common sense and the way many people live their lives anyway i don't know about that again do we really live our lives in like harmony with nature i really feel i i really i feel like such a bad person sometimes with all this stuff it's like why you go to the you know i get food delivered like just supermarket food and it's bags within bags within plastic like you're fight you know it's like oh, okay so there's a chocolate bar and the chocolate bar is in a wrapper which is in you know it's a multi-pack so then it's in another wrapper and then it's in a bag but because the bag was heavy the supermarket's double bagged it and it's been driven there by a man in his car and you're like oh my god what am i doing to the environment i'm a piece of shit. i'm so sorry environment the sponsors judging by what little we know about the group who sponsored the georgia guidestones we can make a few deductions okay assumptions they were all american this is stated on the explanatory tablet at least some of them were very wealthy 
The group was quoted a silly amount to get the monument built, and they accepted the price without haggling. Maybe this also means R.C. Christian in particular was a bit dim or trusting. Let's go with trusting, or alternatively, just so Richie doesn't care. You know, he's just there like, this is the price. And they're like, okay, I guess so. It's like that thing where, it was, was it on Ellen or something where Bill Gates, he, the people ask him how much it costs? Like, it's just like, what is the price of a banana? Mmm, five dollars. <laughs> And Ellen's like, 32 cents or whatever. It's like, just his guesses are so wildly wrong. And I mean, I totally get it. I mean, I'm not even sure how much a banana costs. And I'm not like Bill Gates. I think you just, I, I don't know. You just click on bananas. You know they're cheap, I guess. I mean, I don't know. That doesn't feel that out of touch. Bananas are cheap. You could just buy a bunch of bananas. Like, I'll still be in the supermarket. I'll be like, oh, well, let's not buy that because that's super expensive. But for fruit... Unless it's some exotic fruit, I know it's going to be affordable because super cheap. The overall impressions given by the messages in the Enterprise in general smacks of a group of wealthy white American men generously bestowing their largesse on the world in the form of their ten wise commandments. I'm more than happy to be proved wrong on this point, but come on, you know it's true. <laughs> yeah, I 100% agree with you, Katie. The only real lead we have to identify the group is the pseudonymous. Ask a pseudonymous? Pseudonymous. Pseudonymous. That's a weird word. R.C. Christian. As pseudonyms go, it's pretty on the nose. R.C. Christian. Either it was an obvious allusion to his religious beliefs or the total opposite and was ironically used by an atheist or, shock horror, a Satanist. I feel this is quite an atheistic thing, so I would guess it's more in irony. Like, uh, they've done the, ten the name, I mean, and then they've done their Ten Commandments, and it's like, okay chill out. Onlookers at the unveiling were swift to decry the guidestones as satanic, but I'm not really sure why. Yeah, they don't really have any bad messages. They're all like, I mean, they're, they're like I say, they're cliche, but they're not bad messages. Maybe they thought they were blasphemous alternatives to the Ten Commandments, or that the astrological aspects inherent in the monument meant that it was automatically a cult somehow. Wait, just because of, wait, astrological? astronomical Ast there's nothing astrological about this is that astrology is the one about like because i remember i was a kid and i love I've, I've always loved science and i remember like in the in the news agents there was this magazine it was called astrology monthly and i was like sweet i'm definitely gonna buy that and then i get by this magazine and i take it home and i'm like really disappointed to find out that it's about like i don't know some wizard shit. and i'm like oh for fuck's sake and that was the moment that you know that I discovered astrology and that whole piece of shit. But I don't know why they'd be thinking the astronomy aspects would make this a cult somehow. While it might make you think of Stonehenge in that it's made up of large stones with a capstone on top, that's about as far as the similarities go, as everyone knows how this baby was assembled. It's also not as accurate celestial body-wise as Stonehenge, but this wasn't really the group's chief concern. The original sponsor group did hope that another group in the future might add an additional circle around their original cluster, but so far, nobody has appeared to find this necessary. Uh, I think it's about time we got that sorted. Let's get a GoFundMe going. Expand the Georgia Guidestones. And uh, I'd make them, I'd just make it sarcastic and put like recipes for bread and in there because that'd be fun. It's been speculated that R.C. Christian is a thinly veiled reference to the Rosicrucians, a movement that sprang, sprang up in the 1600s and whose manifesto referred to a universal reformation of mankind. According to Encyclopedia Britannica, the central feature of Rosicrucianism, oh my god, the big boy words in this in this script are complicated, is the belief that its members possess secret wisdom that was handed down to them from ancient times. <laughs> okay, sounds like a conspiracy theory. All this does sound quite familiar, and from above, the guidestones even kind of resemble the Rose Cross, so maybe these 20th century members thought they should quickly pass on their secret knowledge before humanity accidentally destroyed itself. A lot of big names from the past have been linked to the Rosicrucian movement, including Thomas Jefferson, George Washington, and Thomas Paine. Paine has been widely credited with helping to inspire American revolutionaries, particularly with his pamphlet entitled Common Sense. In, in 1794, he released part one of a pamphlet called The Age of Reason. This does cover a lot of the grounds that the Guidestones espouse and comes under the umbrella of deism, which is, according to Dictionary.com, an intellectual movement of the 17th and 18th centuries that accepted the existence of a creator on the basis of reason but rejected the belief in a supernatural deity who interacts with humankind. I actually quite like that. I think that's quite sensible. I mean, I don't really believe in the existence of a creator, 
Actually, no, scratch that. I don't believe in this at all. Rosicrucianism, if I am pronouncing that correctly, pulled ideas from all over the place, including occultism and Christian Gnosticism. Oh my god. <laughs> this, this script is making me feel stupid. And some scholars are not even sure that it really existed at all or if it was some sort of hoax. The movement does exist today, though with the Rosicrucian Fellowship coming with the tagline, an association of Christian mystics. So maybe this is where old R.C. and his group were coming from. Another sponsor of the Guidestones, or maybe R.C. Christian himself, has long been thought to be Ted Turner. Turner was an American billionaire, media tycoon, entrepreneur, and philanthropist. A brief look at his CV is quite telling. As well as many other things, Turner is the chairman of the United Nations Foundation and the co-chairman and founder of the Nuclear Threat Initiative. He also created a foundation in his own name to address issues about population growth and prior to launching CNN in 1980 i was like i feel like i know the name ted turner why do i know the name ted turner because he started cnn he created a so-called doomsday video of military bands performing nearer my god to thee to be broadcast whenever the end of the world came <laughs> oh my ted turner a little bit pessimistic there mate he also grew up in georgia and is a big nature lover so it does seem to be so it does seem to be a good call but the anonymity clause has held since 1979 so i don't think anyone's about to break it now the appointed go-between Wyatt martin said in 2013 they could put a gun to my head and kill me i will never reveal his real name so i guess that's one mystery that will forever remain unsolved good news good news it's not a particularly important one <laughs> other theories While the messages were seemingly written in good faith and were meant to be taken literally, conspiracy theories, of course, still sprung up. The stones have been vandalized many times over the years, with graffiti saying things like, Death to the New World Order in 2009, and I am Isis, goddess of love. I guess that's some sort of goddess rather than Islamic State. <laughs> In 2014, uh, that was, sorry, in 2014, bits have been chipped off, and also in 2014, somebody replaced a chipped off bit with a new cube with mysterious letters and numbers engraved onto it. People went wild with numerology theories and references to what it might mean until the man responsible spoke up, saying that it just carved his and his wife's initials and their anniversary of their wedding date into it. <laughs> Uh, I love this. I love it. That's how so many conspiracies end. It's like, oh my god, this is a big mean. It's like, nah, it's nothing. It's really nothing. It's nothing at all. They had actually been married at the Guidestones the year before. The biggest conspiracy theories relate to the problematic population cap guideline, with this being interpreted as an imminent call to cull humanity and establish a new world order rather than some advice for what to do in the aftermath of a disaster. <laughs> and what of the occult nature? of the Guidestones. Religious figures in the community had always warned of satanic practices and blood sacrifices that would be carried out at the site, but maybe they just gave people the idea to do it. Shadowy groups such as the Illuminati have also apparently performed rituals at the Guidestones, but there is no real evidence that any human or animal sacrifices have been made there. There was aerial, even if there was, it's just people like having a bit of a laugh. I mean, human sacrifice and animal sacrifice obviously not a bit of a laugh but it's not people who it's got nothing to do with it it's just stupidity there was aerial footage of what looked like a big blood stain on the capstone in 2015 but people at the scene said that the video had been photoshopped and there wasn't really anything on the capstone apart from maybe some water residue and it's not like the guidestones are sitting on a particularly spiritual or holy spot or have any reference to rituals or religious practices on them they were put up in 1980, the year of the Empire Strikes Back and shoulder pads, so it's not exactly a venerated historical site yet. And I don't think it ever will be. It's kind of stupid, and the messages are stupid. And I mean, not stupid, just cliched. The languages chosen for the messages to be inscribed onto the granite slabs were deemed the most likely to be understood at the time, although this begs the question as to why there was staff written in Babylonian cuneiform around the capstone. One sentence in any language isn't enough to extrapolate a whole alphabet, so maybe they were just showing off. And while there are eight living languages represented as well as four dead ones, the explanatory key is all in English. Imagine if you made it to the stones, didn't recognize the English name for your language on the explanation tablet, and collapsed in a sobbing heap on the ground. Maybe the hope for humanity would give up before they started. Or maybe the whole monument was supposed to be a time capsule for future people or alien races to discover. I think, yeah, it's definitely designed for future post-apocalyptic people. I mean, it's definitely not designed for people in the past. That would be weird. 
If so, maybe they should have made a bit more of a song and dance about it, as I think that less than 1% of the population alive today have even heard of the Georgia Guidestones, let alone what all their extremely important tenants are. So, anyway, if you find yourself on the other side of an apocalypse and need to work out how to rebuild society according to a group of wealthy white men from 1970s North America, <laughs> where else would you go for information? Uh, sarcasm, everybody. Now you know where to find the answers. Good luck, future humans. Good luck. Yes, and that is the end of today's episode of Decoding the Unknown. <laughs> I really, there wasn't really much to decode on this one, was there? It's kind of like the Georgia Guidestones. A bit shit, really. Uh, that's, uh, that's, I mean, the mystery, of course, is who made them. But also, also, who cares? This has been an episode of Decoding the Unknown. Thank you so much for listening or watching, depending on how you get this show. If you are listening to my voice through a podcast app of some kind, Go in there, see if you can do reviews, and then just gently tap that five-star button and write something along the lines of, Simon, you legend, I've never discovered a podcast better in my entire life up until this point, and this show is what I now live for. That would be fantastic and honest. It would be honest of you. Also, if you're watching on YouTube, smash that like button, make sure you're subscribed, and I'll see you next time. Hello everybody, welcome back to another episode of Decoding the Unknown. As always, hello, I'm your host, Simon. What happens here is we decode the unknown. It's all there in the title. This is what happened to Lord Lucan. Says it right there on the page in front of me. If you're watching this, if you're listening to this, hello as well. This does go out as a podcast. So if you're on YouTube thinking, oh, I don't have that premium, so I can't listen to it in the background. Well, go grab it as a podcast. Why not? It's all good. And I think there's probably less adverts as a podcast as well if you don't have premium so that's a plus i guess i don't know why i'm saying that because <laughs> brilliant work simon brilliant business work getting people not to listen to adverts good job um what happens here is katie the wonderful writer for this channel writes me a script did i say it's called it, what happened to lord lucan i have no idea who lord lucan is so uh yeah this is a cold read and then jen our wonderful editor is going to add some uh some audio some video afterwards that's what editors do yes let's jump into it Richard John Bingham, Baron Bingham, Baron Lucan, Baronet Bingham of Castle Bar, the seventh Earl of Lucan, Lucky Lucan, the notorious RJB. <laughs> I might have made that last one up myself. How many titles does one man need? Wait, all of those were actual titles? This guy's got some Idi Amin shit going down. <laughs> you guys know that that um, the guy, the, the dictator of... Uh, I want to say Uganda, but I could be wrong. <laughs> he's in that. He's in. He's uh, the the focus part of the focus of that Last King of Scotland movie with Idi uh, with Idi Amin with Forrest Whitaker, <laughs> and uh, his title was like seven line lines long on Wikipedia, like Noble Sir God King Lord of All Beasts of the Land. It it went on. Um, anyway, we're two lines in, and I've already gone off on a tangent. That happens here if you're new. Um, I'm sorry about that. How about best moustache of 1974? Again, I made that one up, although this guy was definitely a candidate. If some of these are ringing bells, then they all refer to one person who is today most popularly referred to as Lord Lucan, and it seems that he did add one more title to his roster, that of murderer. Ooh, I feel like we're getting into an episode of Casual Criminalist here, but this is decoding the unknown that doesn't necessarily have to be murder. Although I can see why people get these sh those two shows confused, because... Well, they're really similar. Just this one's not just about true crime. It's about all sorts of mysterious stuff that uh, turns out to be not mysterious. Because, I mean, critical. Any times it's like ghosts in it. It's like, no, they didn't. Because ghosts aren't real, are they? <laughs> Turning off the primary audience. Uh, as you may have guessed from his many titles, he was a British aristocrat who made global headlines when in 1974 he disappeared into thin air after the brutal murder of his children's nanny. But how was. Oh, maybe I do know this story. Now this is ringing bells. But how involved was he in the killing, and what might he have done? What might have happened to him in the aftermath? Could he still be alive? Just a note that this story does contain details of a murder and also talk of suicide later on. If that's not your bag, no hard feelings here. Let's take it. That is a uh, what we call these days a trigger warning. You're welcome. They're very rare in my videos, and uh, sometimes they're they're probably needed. And everyone in the comments is like, Simon, a trigger warning would have been nice. <laughs> 
uh and i'm like well you're listening to a true pro- with casual criminalist you're listening to a true crime podcast aren't you mate <laughs> i feel like the whole thing should be a trigger warning let's take a dive into the story that scandalized and fascinated the british public and still makes occasional headlines to this day that's probably why i'm vaguely familiar with this uh it's like this is the murdering of the nanny by the aristocrat does feel like a story i know i couldn't remember the dude's name anyway hopefully i won't spoil anything some backgrounds Born into the wealthy Bingham family in 1934, Richard John Bingham was set up for success. Before we get going properly, just a note from now on that I'm going to refer to him as Lord Lucan or Lucan as that's how he's known in popular culture. He didn't inherit the title until his father died in 1964. That's such a weird British thing, being able to inherit titles. Like, really? (laughs) Really, Britain? I mean, can we get over the heritage thing? But I don't think there's going to be any confusion as to who we're talking about. It's basically going to be him all the time. Lucan is an area in Ireland, and the Earl of Lucan is a title that's been recognized legally since 1795. Recognized legally implies that there's some sort of benefit to it. I mean, you get to write Lord on your like passport and credit cards, I guess. But it's like, sir, I made a whole video about the benefits of knighthood. And, you know, you'd think, are you going to get some money for that? Are there going to be some, like, perks? Do you get to go to the Queen's birthday party? And it turns out, no. Basically, you just get to use sir in front of your name. And the biggest benefit seems to be, like, restaurants really like that. If you're like, uh, yeah, sir, booking for Mr. Whistler. It's a sir. Sir Simon, actually. And they're like, come this way, sir. We've got a corner table just for you. <laughs> He was the eldest son, although not the eldest child, of an Irish peer, so is in line to inherit his father's titles and his seat in the House of Lords. That's right, everybody listening who's not British, there is a part of uh, Parliament in the UK, or there's the House of Commons, the House of Lords, it's broken up into two parts, and the House of Lords is just for people who inherited their jobs. How wild is that? It's not very important anymore, and the House of Commons, which is the elected officials, can totally override them. They just can delay it for a little while, or at least they could a while ago. It's largely pointless. I think it should absolutely be got rid of. But then again, I'm, you know, I mean, (laughs) I'm pretty Republican in general, like not American Republican, like for Republicanism, like the idea of you know, electing a head of state rather than having a royal. The sort of stuff that would have got my head chopped off a few hundred years ago. Lucan went to school at Eton, the only place proper posh boys are allowed to go. I couldn't find out anything about what he studied, but the main takeaway was that while at college, he started gambling and became a bookie for the other students. Legend. (laughs) I love, I I don't know, I always got like a bit of a respect for the kids who like hustle (laughs) at school. It's like, okay. He made quite good money with his side hustle, but according to his mother, his grades were far from credible. Uh, creditable, sorry. That's a new word to me. Still, that doesn't really seem to matter if you came from the British upper class. The only other thing I saw was that he was good at racing speedboats, which feels like the biggest rich person thing ever. What does your child do as hobby? He races speedboats. Oh, I feel like racing like super expensive fiberglass catamarans might be like also up there. But um, yeah, that's a that's a that's some rich person sh- right there. Ah, yes, the old school speedboat races. After finishing eating in 1953, he did his national service stint in the army, which was still a requirement for physically fit males at the time. Oh my god! I mean, I always say that I'm really glad that there wasn't conscription and stuff, but I was in the cadets at school, like in the navy cadets, and it was I felt that was really good for me. And I kind of think that conscription in general, like not so you have to go and fight in a war and. Sh- but that you have to do, I don't know, maybe a year after school before you go to university in like the military, getting trained up and stuff. I generally think that'd be quite a good idea, it, like teach people discipline. I mean, I know it hammers out like creativity and stuff, but I don't know. It works really well. And I made a video ages ago about how in Israel, where they have like mandatory um, like conscription for like, it's like two or three years or something crazy. And they have to go fight because, you know, Israel. Um, but one of the benefits of that was like all the like rich kids would go or like all of not not just the rich kids but all of the kids would all blend together so they'd go from like you know you'd have some from like I don't know, like israeli eton or whatever and you'd somehow from like some from you know school in the middle of nowhere where only poor people go and they'd all mix together in the armed forces and it would be great for like innovation and you know people with good ideas getting money from the rich kids and all of this stuff and apparently it was good for like innovation and I'm like yeah kind of i don't know 
this was a massive tangent <laughs> no one cares about is probably an unpopular opinion so well done whistle boy let's get back to it while in germany in the cold stream guards coolest name of some guards ever he diversified his gambling portfolio by playing lots of poker uh, which is different though like playing poker i always feel like if you're the bookie at school who is taking bets <laughs> you're the house you've got an edge and then you graduate to playing graduate to playing poker i feel like that's just you know maybe you just come from a rich family and whatever veneer doesn't matter moving on after the army he was a merchant banker for a few years but his true passion was definitely gambling he won big but he also lost big i guess that's how gambling works it is and usually you lose a little bit more than you win he fell in with a set of other rich gamblers and in 1960 won 26,000 pounds playing a version of the card game baccarat known as chemin de fer according to the bank of england's inflation calculator this was about 612,000 pounds in 2020 pounds or around 841,000 dollars holy shit in 2020 dollars a pretty good pot i think you'll agree and it was one of the main reasons lucan then quit his job at the bank to become a quote quote uh quote unquote professional gambler which basically means an obnoxious playboy yes it's exactly what i talked about before in 1962 zoo owning gambling lover john aspinall founded the exclusive claremont club london's first casino in fashionable mayfair lucan was a frequent visitor to the clement club where he was in the company of many other people with hereditary titles and also big names like actor peter sellers and james bond creator ian fleming in fact it said that lucan was approached to play the iconic english spy even though he had zero acting experience but where does a lack of talent ever stand in the way of the entitled yeah that also sounds like just some that he made up doesn't it is there any evidence to say that or was he like no 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 they asked me to play james bond it'd be like yeah 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 honestly they asked me too but i turned it down i was busy doing my youtube thing and i, I just didn't have time i think uh you know i'd have made a great success of a daniel craig but i just honestly though uh, you know the time wasn't very i was just not enough time money wasn't very interesting they only offered like 20 million pounds ah, <laughs> never happens mate he was living the bonds life though with his jet-setting lifestyle love of aston martins and the aforementioned speedboats chemin de fer was also bonds preferred car game card game in the books and was shown in several of the films lucan and bonds both also enjoy vodka martinis and as a tall good-looking and charismatic man lucan definitely looked the part although with the addition of his famous tash in his career as a professional gambler lucan wasn't really that great he was known as lucky lucan after his original big win but it turned out to be pretty ironic he was extremely good at backgammon and even won tournaments including a championship in america but in total he lost far more than he won the nickname stuck though and it's not a bad nickname to have better than loser lucan i suppose definitely <laughs> definitely in 1963 lucan met veronica duncan an art school graduate model and a secretary sounds like exactly the sort of guy that in the 1960s this dude's supposed to marry doesn't it the two is it off and got married the next year shocking news lucan was going through a bit of a bad patch in his gambling results at the time so it's pretty convenient that his father gave him a whole bunch of money to basically start his own family must be nice lucan bought 46 lower belgrave street that which sounds i don't know anything like belgrave belgravia belgravia how do you say it belgravia expensive part of london so i imagine that's a very expensive address and the couple had three children over the next six years also adding a nice bum to lucan's finances was the fact that his father the sixth earl of lucan had died shortly after the wedding leaving the now seventh earl of lucan with an inheritance of around two hundred and fifty thousand pounds which in today's money is over five million pounds or seven million dollars all was not rosy in the land of the lucans though lord lucan spent a lot of his time at the clermont club gambling away his family's money that is so depressing they, this guy i mean i know it's like it's probably like his great great grandpappy's money or whatever but it is depressing that it could all just be destroyed in one generation it's like, oh brilliant so i worked super hard and then you gambled it all away drinking martinis with ian fleming i mean that does sound awesome but also god damn man i worked a long time for that money or your great great grandpappy did his wife or maybe they didn't maybe they were just like some of these english families where it's just like they were given money back in the day because one of them was a knight or some shit. and then that la or land and that land became a lot of money and you know that kind of stuff so who gives a shit? let's move on his wife veronica now the countess of lucan had been badly affected by postnatal depression and her mental condition why am i reading this so jolly <laughs> sorry his wife veronica now the countess of lucan had been badly affected by postnatal depression and a mental condition supposedly alarmed lucan 
as it should if your wife is depressed you should do something about that it should be alarming fix it sources vary on whether he tried to have a committed or just sought out psychiatric treatment for her but either way she refused to stay in any kind of clinic and was not forced to go their relationship deteriorated with veronica increasingly relying on nannies to help look after her children and lucan spending all his time losing at the club in 1972 the couple separated with lucan moving out while a lot of emphasis had been put on the state of his wife's mental health at this point it seems that he too had gone into something of a mental decline i mean his life sounds like super playboyish and stuff but at a point it's got to be a bit like what's the point you're just going to a club and just gambling all day and losing money it's just even if you've got infinite money it's really depressing i mean it would be like just play it's just you know it's just depressing there's no other way to look at it is it it would be like playing a gambling game where the money's not real and you just play it every day and you always lose be like that would get boring real fast he was dead set on getting custody of his children at the point of hiring private investigators and spying on his family himself from his car on the street in trying to prove veronica was not capable of looking after the children though link uh, luke and totally shot himself in the foot and instead proved his behavior was unwarranted and just a bit weird yes veronica was awarded custody of their three children with luke and having visitation rights every other weekend oh no dude you shouldn't have spied on them you did this to yourself this was a huge blow to luke and he really did love his children his family now taken from him coupled with his gambling woes led to even bigger money issues as lucan had lost a lot of money on the court case and still had to pay towards his family's expenses as well as living in one of the priciest areas priciest areas of the country they were used to things like regular food orders from harrods and veronica shopped for clothes on Savile Row. Due to being diagnosed with depression and anxiety, it was ruled that Veronica had to have a nanny to help her look after her children, a decision that rankled with Lucan as he tried his hardest to interfere with the process. Dude, if you love your children, it sounds really good that she should have a nanny there because she's not mentally stable. Right? She was going to be committed, but they didn't uh, force her to go. It sounds like, you know, there's more than just light, dep- <laughs> light depression. Uh, there's more mild depression. More than just mild depression going on there several well done simon you psychologist really solving all the problems here aren't you several nannies came and went through the luke and household some reporting that they're disturbing anonymous phone calls and others being investigated by private investigators again uh, looking for a nanny might carry some risk of being hounded by private investigators and having all of your personal looked into in case there's anything wrong so that you could be uh, fired brilliant yeah sounds like an appealing job Luke had even tried to get information about his wife out of them, but it didn't do him any good. Eventually, in 1974, Sandra Rivett joined the Lucan family as their nanny. Recently divorced from her husband and the mother of a boy who had been adopted short after birth, shortly after birth, Sandra used to take Thursdays off to see her new boyfriend. Meanwhile, friends began to become concerned about Lucan's apparent obsession with his children, his increase in drinking, and the huge amounts of money that he was regularly losing. He is even remembered as saying things like he could murder his wife and put an end to all his financial worries. Holy sh! Dude, it sounds like you should murder your gambling habit. To be honest, I mean, I'm sure her habits are expensive, like Savile Row's no joke. But also, um, your gambling's probably the bigger issue. On the 7th of November, 1974, all of these things came to a head. The murder. I feel like this definitely belongs on Casual Criminals, doesn't it? I'm like absolutely confused about what I'm reading, but here we are. It happens sometimes. On the night of Thursday, November the 7th, 1974, Lord Lucan's estranged wife, Veronica, was at their home on Lower Belgrave Street with their th- three children and the nanny, Sandra Rivet. As we said just a minute ago, Sandra used to have Thursdays off to see her boyfriends, but unfortunately for her, this particular week, she had seen him on Wednesday instead, so was at work when she normally wouldn't have been. Just before 9pm, after some of the Lucan juniors were in bed, Sandra Rivet asked Veronica if she wanted a cup of tea. If this was me, I would have said no, as any caffeine past about 6 p.m. will keep me up all night. But apparently, this was not the case for Sandra and Veronica. Yeah, too. Same, same for me. Like, I drink coffee all day like a monster. But it gets to around 4 or 5, and then I'm like, no, no more, because I gotta, you know, sleep. And I also go to bed at 9 o'clock, because I have two small children, and they wake up extremely early. In fact, not this morning, but yesterday morning, they decided, let's get up at 4 o'clock. And I'm like, great. Thanks, guys. Really happy to be up at 4 it's not going to make me tired throughout the day at all no problem no problem it's not i've got a busy schedule or anything ah please stop i love you though 
The layout of 46 Lower Bell Grave Street meant that the kitchen was in the basement of the house, so Sandra of it went downstairs to make the tea. It was very dark, and the light going down to the kitchen didn't work. I was... <laughs> Total tangent, but I've been like uh, 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 shopping. Do you shop for houses? No, you look for houses. I saw a house a couple of months ago where the kitchen was upstairs. <laughs> it was so strange. I walked into the house and it's like you're wandering around the downstairs, and I'm like, there's no kitchen. And then go up there, and they're like, no, no, it's upstairs. And I'm like, what is this? An upside down house? Who the hell is the kitchen upstairs? <laughs> so it was, and there was a bedroom downstairs. And I'm like, why isn't this the kitchen? I'm like, I don't want this house. I'd have to swap these two bedroom for a kitchen. It's like, why? Why did you do this? It was very dark and the light going down to the kitchen didn't work. Sandra probably thought the bulb had blown, but it was later discovered that it had been removed. As she reached the dark basement, Sandra was attacked by a man wielding a lead pipe. Beaten brutally around the head, she suffered major trauma and choked to death on her own blood. After the savage attack, her body was stuffed into a large mail sack that meant to be lying around. She was 29 years old. Not having realized there was an intruder in the house, Veronica came to the top of the stairs to see what Sandra was doing down there. As she started coming down, a man rushed up and hit her several times with the pipe. After fighting with him, she grabbed his testicles. Oh my, and managed to make her escape. Uh, I thought like kicking people in the testicles was a new thing. Grabbing though, that's uh, that's that's something. Like through the trousers? You like rummaging around? Like, I don't... How's that work? I don't know. Rushing into the nearby Plumber's Arms, that's the name of a pub, not a burly heating engineer who was hanging around outside. A bloodied Veronica screamed, Help me! I've just escaped from being murdered! My children! My children! He's murdered! My nanny! By the time the police arrived, the attacker had long scarpered, leaving the Lucan children unhurt. A few hours later, Lord Lucan turned up at his friend's house, the, the Maxwell Scotts, and he told Susan Maxwell Scott that he had seen his wife being attacked and rushed in to help. Lady Lucan had told him that the nanny was dead and then accused him of orchestrating the attack. In a panic, Lucan had fled the house and driven to the Maxwell Scots. He wrote some letters and called his mother to ask if he uh, asked her to pick up the children after as there had been a terrible catastrophe at Lower Belgrave Street. According to Susan Maxwell Scott, he was in shock but composed. After he left the house in the early hours of the 8th of November 1974, he was never seen again. <laughs> Doesn't sound guilty at all, does he? <laughs> Why it had to be Lucan. The fact that he ran and disappeared immediately after the murder and attack points the finger of blame squarely at Lord Lucan. There is a tiny bit of wiggle room that he might not have been the actual hand to wield the murder weapon, which we'll go into in a bit, but it's generally agreed upon that he was the murderer. Yeah, if you're like rich. I mean, I want to say, like, you should, like, don't you just, don't rich people, like, hire hitmen who just murder people and then totally, like, get away with it and stuff, or hopefully not. But also, yeah, as I, like, this does absolutely feel like an episode of Casual Criminalist. On Casual Criminalist, I'm always saying, you know, don't tell other people, like, the biggest thing, people are always getting caught because they're telling other people about their crimes, they're bragging about their crimes, they're, you know, doing crimes in pairs. And the biggest thing is just don't do crime with someone else. So I feel like, you're less likely to get caught if you actually do the crime yourself rather than hire someone to do the crime because, I don't know, that just always seems to end in trouble. But maybe not. I don't know what the statistics bear out. I mean, there probably aren't statistics on assassination. Not assassination. What's it called? Uh, murder for hire. Is there a word for that? Like, hitmen! Thank you. Myself. Big brain. The main witness is, of course, Lady Luke, and she testified that she recognized her husband's voice telling her to shut up as they fought in the dark on the stairs. Then, after having given his grapes a good old squeezing, the fight had gone out of him, and she had actually managed to get him to go upstairs and start cleaning himself up. He told her he had killed the nanny, and she said that she would help him escape, but they'd both need to lay low for a few days while the injuries she sustained healed up a bit. Why would she do this? While he was upstairs getting towels and possibly taking some of her sedatives, she took her chance and ran out for help. Oh, I see. Well, why would he believe this? <laughs> That's the thing. It's like the the wife who you don't, the wife who doesn't like you, is helping you get away with murder. I'd be like, yo, 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 you stay here. <laughs> You're not going anywhere right now. <laughs> In this version, it's fair to say that Lady Lucan would have been pretty hard-pressed to mistake the person who admitted to the murder to be anyone other than her estranged husband. One of his children also confirms that she saw him at the house that night and in his letters to his brother-in-law, which we'll go over in a bit, Lucan even placed himself at the house that night. After his wife raised the alarm, Lucan quickly left and drove to the Maxwell Scott House in Sussex, 68 kilometers, that's 42 miles away. 
In a strong point against him, Lucan was driving not his own Mercedes, but a Ford Corsair that he had borrowed from a friend a couple of weeks earlier. Why had he borrowed this particular car? His friends had offered him a more luxurious ride, but Luke had chosen this one, and the only real conclusion we can come to is that he was using it to spar on his family incognito. Was it already planned to be a getaway vehicle several we- weeks before the murder? That's just speculation. His Mercedes was found after his disappearance, and the battery was flat, so maybe you just couldn't be bothered to replace it and had and was using someone else's car instead, but it certainly doesn't look good. The Ford Corsair was found a couple of days later on the 11th of November at the port of New Haven in East Sussex. In the car was a lead pipe and a bottle of vodka. Blood found in the car was thought to be a match to both Sandra Rivet and Lady Lucan, although the lead piping was not the murder weapon as this was left at the scene. From the port, there's a railway station and also regular ferries that cross the channel to France, so it's quite a good base to start if you're thinking of running from the police. Yeah, I mean, the railway station is like less good than the ferry. I feel like if you're on the run for them from the police like just immediately leave go to one of those countries where they don't um extradite like just get there quickly <laughs> i mean france it's not one of those countries i guess but you know from there you can travel by car rather than the uk it's an island it's going to be hard to leave at some point once they're really looking for you especially if you're lord so-and-so of wherever the general consensus of this case has been that due to the lack of any evidence suggesting anything else, Lucan broke into his old family home or still had a key, removed the lie bulb, and waited for Veronica in the dark. When Sandra, whom he had not been expecting to be at the house, came downstairs, he attacked her, thinking it was his estranged wife. After trying to cover up the killing, he attacked his wife on the way out, but after she managed to fight back, he gave it up as a bad job. Whether he was intending to attack her again later that night is up for debate, but she stymied that plan anyway by escaping the house. Lucan then discovered that Lucan then disappeared to avoid being tried for murder. In his absence, an inquest was held in 1975, and he was formally declared guilty of the murder of Sandra Rivet, making him the first lord to be convicted of murder since 1760. The murder and disappearance understandably caused a sensation in the media, with the Sun's rather subdued Earl sought in death mystery versus the Daily Mail Mail's dawn hunt for Lucan's body. <laughs> Daily Mail, such a piece of sh. The New York Times was keeping the story alive in 1979 with Missing Lord Luke and Worldwide Enigma, and sightings popped up all over the world. Don't worry, we'll get into those a little bit later. Oh, I see. I see why this is on an episode of Decoding the Unknown rather than Casual Criminalist. Sometimes there would be an advantage to reading these ahead because everyone's like, why is this on Decoding the Unknown so far? Including myself. And that's because it's going to be, the mystery is going to be, is he alive? I mean, we did mention that really early on, but it's going to be a major part of this episode because there's still a lot of pages left to go. Uh, Whether, you know, all these sightings, is he really living somewhere else? Is he having some, like, secret life? That's why. That's why we're on Decoding the Unknown. It's all making sense now. According to Lady Lucan, he had been violent with her when they lived together, including hitting her with a cane wrapped in sticking plaster. I don't know what sticking plaster is, dude, but that sounds like some nasty shit. The lead pipe at the murder scene and the one found in the abandoned car had both been wrapped in a similar material. It seemed pretty cut and dry that Lucan was the sole perpetrator of the crimes and had somehow managed to flee from justice. But was that the only story? Not quite. Why it might not have been Lucan? Well, okay, we all know it was him. (laughs) But was it physically his hand on the murder weapon? Uh, Let's look at his side of the story for a moment. Just a moment, though. Don't want to inject too much doubt into the story after all this time. We know Lucan's explanation for the bloody events because he wrote three letters after the murder and also called his mother. It also did not seem to occur to his friend Susan Maxwell Scott that he was telling anything other than the truth, that she didn't call the police or think he was acting in any manner that suggested he just brutally attacked two women. At Susan Maxwell Scott's house, Lucan wrote two letters to his friend and brother-in-law William Shand Kidd. One detailed how to sort his various financial situations due to the sale of something that was coming up. The last line was, the other creditors can get lost for the time being. It was signed rather poignantly, Lucky. He had creditors, so not only was he gambling all of his money away, he was also borrowing money, it seems. Brilliant. Good work. His other letter went into a bit more detail about what had happened at his former family home. Let's read the whole thing and see what we think. In case you're not familiar with the phrase that crops up twice to lie doggo, it means that you keep your head down and lie low. Oh, I had no idea. I learned that phrase today. Great. It's going to be very useful. 
It's pretty obvious, but just in case you've been raised on the internet and can only think that Doggo is a type of cute dog, I thought it would avoid confusion. Here's the letter from Lord Lucan to his friend, dated the 7th of November 1974. And it's obviously a quote. The most ghastly circumstances arose tonight, which I briefly described to my mother. When I interrupted the fight at Lower Belgrave Street and the man left, Veronica accused me of having hired him. I took her upstairs and sent Francis up to bed and tried to clean her up. She lay doggo for a bit and, when I was in the bathroom, left the house. The, circumstance, the circumstantial evidence against me is strong in that V will say that it was all my doing. I will also lie doggo for a bit, but I'm only concerned for the children. If you can manage it, I want them to live with you. Coots, trustees, St. Martin's Lane, Mr. Wall will handle the school fees. V has demonstrated a hatred for me in the past and would do anything to see me accused. For George and Francis to go through life knowing that their father had stood in the dock for attempted murder would be too much. When they are old enough to understand, explain to them the dream of paranoia and look after them. Yours ever, John. As you can see, Lucan's story was that he was just passing by, as one does when one has constantly been staking out one's estranged family for months and saw his wife being attacked by an intruder. Intruder. He led himself into the house and saved Veronica from the other man. He told Susan Maxwell Scott that he had slipped in some blood at this point. His story then matches his wife's and that they went upstairs to clean up and she left the house. The major difference obviously being that in her version of the events it was him that attacked her. Maybe if you squint there is the smallest possibility that it was not Lucan who carried out the attack and that in the dark his wife then assumed he was the attacker after the actual attacker fled. Or as per his letter she hated him so much that she would pin it on him anyway even knowing it wasn't him. This is so is it dude you didn't have a contingency. You went there to murder your wife allegedly you didn't have a contingency plan for what happens if the woman was there and you ended up murdering her instead and then your wife saw and basically now you don't really have an explanation for this and uh that is why you are guilty as sin allegedly no i don't have to say allegedly he was in he was tried in absenteeism absentia absentia and guilty of murder so no allegedly there it was you mate this thread is worth pulling if only a little all right katie <laughs> Let's pull it a little. Veronica Lucan is something of an unreliable narrator. The major facts of the attack and Lucan's confession come only from one source, Veronica Lucan. After running for help to the pub, she was coherent enough to speak in sentences to get her message across, but never said that her husband was the villain. Okay, you can put that down to shock and fear, but it would have been useful to tell people that you knew who the murderer was straight away. She'd also sustained several blows to the head, so might have been confused and lost some time due to passing out. She also told police that she recognized his voice. Uh, while they were fighting on the stairs, but if they'd spent significant time together trying to clean up while she pretended she'd help him, surely she would have known it was him, and recognizing his voice is kind of not really relevant as she was seeing him with her own eyes, and he admits being there. Uh, it's thin. The main side theory is that, as Lucan wrote in his letter, he hired someone to kill his wife. The nanny was a mistake, and maybe if he was peering in to spy on proceedings, Lucan realized that it wasn't his wife who had gone downstairs first or actually had a change of heart and burst in to stop the attack. Even though he was in a hole financially and personally, Lucan was still a member of the British elite. Would he really have gone so far as to wait in the dark with a pipe to off his wife when he could pay someone else to do it? Yes, maybe. I mean, yeah. Just because you're part of the elite doesn't mean that you're not going to be you're not capable of murdering someone, for sure. He managed to tie himself to the murder anyway by leaving in a car which had an almost identical lead pipe in it and blood which was matched to both women. Dude. <laughs> this is like mega, mega guilty. This was the 1970s, so DNA proof was not available, but the blood groups appara found apparently matched Sandra Rivet and Veronica Lucan, so I guess we'll have to rely on that. Can't they retest this? Do they not have an evidence box these days and then they can test like his kid and or not? Yeah, they can test her kids and I don't know about the other women. Um, they could probably find some relative or no they'll because they were murdered she was murdered they'll have her body they'll also have samples from her so they, can't they match them up now or does no one really care because he's already been found guilty it'd be nice to have the mystery solved though wouldn't it maybe they do do it we'll find out if it wasn't their blood it was the most enormous of coincidences <laughs> speaking of coincidences what of that third letter that lucan wrote it was to his friend michael stoop he of the ford corsair that lucan was driving when the murder occurred here's what he said 
My dear Michael, I have had a traumatic night of unbelievable coincidence. However, I won't bore you with anything or involve you except to say that when you come across my children, which I hope you will, please tell them that you knew me and that all I cared about was them. The fact that a crooked solicitor and a rotten psychiatrist destroyed me between them will be of no importance to the children. I gave Bill Shandkid an account of what actually happened, but judging by my last effort in court, no one, let alone a 67-year-old judge, would believe me and I no longer care, except that my children should be protected. Yours ever, John. In both letters to his friends, Lucan is very preoccupied with what his children will think of him and that they're looked after. He makes no admissions of guilt and doesn't give any hint as to what his next moves or overall plans are, or even if he has a plan. Michael Stoop read his letter as a suicide note, especially given the phrase, I no longer care. Lucan's letter to William Shand Kidd also seems like it's a final goodbye, given the last line of, when they are old enough to understand, explain to them the dream of paranoia and look after them. Whether he was directly involved or indirectly involved, the fact that Lucan disappeared rather than going to the police is a very strong indication of guilt. Yes, no sh**. <laughs> there is, however, the faintest whiff of another man who could have been in the house and may have been totally unconnected to Lucan. Really? Lucan's sister gave a statement to the police in 1974 saying that the Lord's young daughters had mentioned a boyfriend who stayed at the house. No names were forthcoming, but as the girls had mentioned that the man sometimes stayed in the nanny's room and she stayed with them when he did, it seems unlikely that he was Rivet's boyfriend. Oh, okay, because she was sleeping with the children and he was sleeping alone in her room. Also, Rivet hadn't been working for the Lucans for a very long time, so it might have been a bit early for her to have guests staying over. Plus, it wouldn't really be very professional. So. Was it this man, possibly a boyfriend of Veronica Lucan's, who had carried out the attack? Maybe he had meant to kill Sandra of it after all. What? Why? Like, what motivation? The other guy has, like, super strong motivation here. There's, like, I, I don't know what it is. And after Veronica was attacked, maybe she momentarily backed out and came around as Lucan entered and just assumed that it had been him the whole time. Lucan, knowing this would look bad for him, whatever happened, took his chances and he left the scene. His fingerprints weren't found on the weapon or in, any, or in the basement, but this doesn't mean much as he puts himself at the scene of the crime anyway. That didn't, I mean, it does kind of mean a little bit. He's saying he's there doesn't mean he handled the lead pipe and used it to whack his, uh, or attempt to whack his wife and end up accidentally whacking the babysitter. Uh, but also, he probably just wore some gloves, didn't he? <laughs> there didn't appear to be any easy way to exit the house apart from the front door, and no witnesses came forward with sightings of this other man. There were no sightings of Lucan leaving the house either, though, so anybody could have slipped out. Sandra Rivet's blood was found in the back garden of the house, which is a bit weird, but the garden was walled, and it was deemed that nobody likely escaped from there. Lucan would have known about the wall, so is it likely that he was the one who went outside? It could have been accidental transfer during the police investigation, or maybe a third party, hired by Lucan or not, was involved. The mystery man angle was never brought up at the inquest, so who knows whether Lucan was actually telling the truth? He probably wasn't, though. The most compelling thing there is the blood in the garden, and even that is just like it was probably an accident or uh, something like that. Fairly, I'd be fairly quick to dismiss that as you know accidental transfer somehow. Because everything else seems pretty cut and dry, doesn't it, Lord? After the murder, theories. We've talked about the murder, now let's get on to the next mystery part of our story, what happened to Lord Lucan. There are two theories, either he killed himself almost immediately after driving to New Haven, or he managed to escape and went into perfect hiding for an unknown and possibly still ongoing period of time. Oh, it'd be really old though. Wasn't he born in like the 1920s? I don't remember, but it'd be a really old man. Let's talk about the suicide theory first. Supposing that Lord Lucan had been the perpetrator or instigator of the murder, knowing that it had been completely ballsed up put him in an awkward position. The death penalty had already been abolished by this point, but going to prison for murder would ruin his family name, and it seemed like the last thing he wanted for his children were for them to see him as a murderer. He had been drinking heavily in the months before the murder, and while his friends at the time say his mood had lifted in the weeks immediately prior, who knows what his mental state was actually like at the time. He might have thought that suicide would be the best resolution to the situation and simply put an end to things. If he did think that, he managed to balls that up too. It's not common for people who kill themselves to do it in such a way that they're never found. Drowning is probably one of the few ways where a body might never be recovered, but it's not a guarantee. Yeah, isn't this like the swimming out to sea thing? I always remember there's that scene in a... Uh... Oh, what was that TV show show called? Was it called MI5? Or Spooks? Was it called Spooks? 
yeah maybe mi5 was like the international name um but it was called spooks which is like the british word for spies and there's that really intense scene where the guy's like he just swims out to sea and dies i think he dies it's been a very long time since i saw that tv show but that's how he chooses to go he just like goes to the beach and just swims out to sea like, oh my god <laughs> it's so intense it's hard to think that Lucan would intentionally have meant for his body not to be found. There would be no closure in the case for his family or estate. If he had planned the murder of his wife, it was to help with his financial and family issues, and presumably if the plan had gone successfully, he would still be there to reap his ill-gotten benefits. Dude, but you're gonna be like the number one suspect. It's always the husband. What I mean is that he would not have had a plan in place to kill himself and not be found. If he did jump into the channel and got pulled out to sea or whatever, it would have been by chance. One of his friends, yeah, but it's not an impossible thing, is it? One of his friends thought he had, a, he had sailed a motorboat out into the channel and jumped overboard. After changing her mind a couple of times, Lady Lucan eventually said that she thought he'd taken the ferry out of New Haven and deciding to end his life like the nobleman he was, he jumped into the propellers of the ferry. Oh my god. <laughs> is that how noblemen are supposed to be? He decided to end his life like a nobleman. He jumped into the propellers of a massive ship. <laughs> Holy sh. Who would do that? Is that a traditional way for nobility to take their own lives? It's a good question. I believe the answer is no. John Aspinall also mentioned killing himself as a noble way out, but to me, the noble thing to do after this sort of thing would be to turn yourself in, admit your guilt, and face the consequences like a good, honorable chap. Yes, but it ruins your family name, doesn't it? Rather leave some mystery out there. Lucan had insomnia, so he took sleeping tablets as a matter of course. Wouldn't you just load up on those and slip overboard if you were planning on offing yourself in that way? Who on earth would consciously jump into a boat's propellers? It is crazy. Also, what, you, what if you don't get destroyed by them? What if you miss? I mean, then you just drown, which I suppose is the end result is the same, but I don't know. That is very strange. I would be like, no, he didn't jump into those boat propellers of that boat. That is a big stretch. And not a single trace of him has ever been found. If he got chopped up in the blades, there would be, in theory, lots of little traces to be found. Of course, I never knew the man, but this seems like a totally weird and unnecessary way to go. The detective assigned to the case was Detective Troop Chief Superintendent Roy Ranson. He initially also thought that Lord Lucan had died by suicide, but searches of the areas around New Haven Port yielded no results. Most of the searches have been described as partial, though, so it's possible that they missed things. Nonetheless, a warrant was issued for Lucan's arrest on the 12th of November 1974. In later years, even Ransom changed his mind and decided that Lucan had actually managed to escape. So, why do people think he fled? While he was no longer flush with cash, he still had means, ways, and he was connected. He had influential and very rich friends. Yeah, but if you're wanted for murder, the chances are that, you know, someone's going to turn you in. Like, yeah, it doesn't matter if they're influential and rich. There's someone you're going to be like, dude, did you murder your wife, mate? <laughs> I'm going to tell on you. His gang at the Claremont Club were totally unhelpful to police investigators, earning them the nickname the Eaton Mafia, and at least one friend publicly stated that even if he did know something, he wouldn't tell the police anything. All of Lucan's personal well, I guess he's got better friends than I would be. <laughs> Uh, of Lucan's personal belongings like his passport, car keys, and glasses were still at his flat, so either that was a red herring to make people think that he had killed himself or he was still in the country, or he just fled with the clothes on his back and had a second set of false ID papers stashed somewhere just for this occurrence. That is some spy sh**. Well, he was going to play James Bond, wasn't he? It's highly possible that he could ask someone to help him leave the country on a small private plane or boat, as this was the time before mobile phones, so news was not instantaneous. Yeah, I'd say that's a pretty good way to like leave the country. Just, I, I you know, leaving Britain is going to be harder than leaving a country that is landlocked. Uh, you know, just wander across the border in most of Europe. Um, but it's still not going to be impossible. Just jump on a boat steal a boat the channel's not that big you can cross the channel in a pretty small boat and as he seemed to be compass mentis she believed his version of events he could have easily have rushed into his club after the murder told them that he was in a pickle and then gone on to maxwell scott's while they got things set up for him we only have sandra maxwell scott's word for the time he arrived and left her house someone else could have picked him up or driven the ford corsair to new haven his friends may not have known what had happened and so were fine with aiding and abetting as they didn't know a murder rap was on the cards after they did know they didn't want to get themselves into trouble so just kept quiet about helping yeah yeah that seems pretty likely doesn't it because you'd help your friends if it wasn't like murder i mean there's definitely we've talked about this before maybe we talked about it on casual criminals there's definitely that line where it's like things i would help my friends out for and then there's like things over the line it's like oh no well mate you murdered someone didn't you so i'm not gonna help you escape 
and then but if he just lied about what the crime was then it's like yeah okay i'll help you escape you just did some like light <laughs> assault <laughs> it's like, no i still want to help you I'm a, t- I'm a bad friend but hopefully a decent citizen <laughs> The media definitely tended towards escape rather than suicide. Well, of course they do, because they're going to sell more papers. With headlines like, Where did he go from the mirror? And many references like Sea Hunt, Port Hunt, and Dawn Hunt cropping up all over the tabloids. Just the fact that neither hide nor a hair from his luxuriant moustache was ever seen again stokes the legend that he successfully evaded justice and has been living as a fugitive ever since. Sightings Okay, so let's get on to the fun part, the sightings. Almost as soon as he vanished, reports of Lucan were popping up all over the place. Obviously, all of these have come to nothing, but it seems that the world has been keeping a keen eye out for this nobleman over the last half century. Sightings have been reported in France, Iceland, Goa, Australia, Botswana, Guatemala, Ireland, New Zealand. Basically, any time someone sees a posh-sounding Englishman with a decent tash, he immediately becomes a suspect. One of these sightings hilariously led to the identification of a different fugitive when police in Melbourne, Australia were alerted to the suspicious behavior of an Englishman visiting multiple banks in December 1974. That is massively unfortunate for that dude. When they caught up with the man, it turned out not to be their top suspect, Lord Lucan, but disgraced Labour MP John Stonehouse, who had faked his own death in Miami that same year and fled to Australia. Wow, have I never heard of that story? (laughs) A Labour MP fakes his own death and uh, goes to Miami and then Australia. That's wild. Another top suspect as the missing lord for a while was someone who went by the name of Jungle Barrier, hippie beach bum living in Goa who died in 1996. A retired detective from Scotland Yard followed this lead and even co-published a book about his theory. Barry did bear some resemblance to Luke and seemed to have vast knowledge about sports cars and was a good backgammon player and only gave vague, shady answers about his past, which was seemingly enough for people to conclude that he was the missing lord. <laughs> I know how to play backgammon. I don't know much about cars, but I could learn. And also, did Lucan know much about cars? He was the boat guy, no? He loved speedboats. Bit of a stretch. I mean, maybe there's more to it, but whatever. When the book Dead Lucky was published, it was quite quickly established by English friends of the dead beach bum that he was, in fact, a folk singer called Barry Halpin. The author, Duncan McLaughlin, and his publishers quickly changed tack to suggest that Lucan took on Barry's identity, but the case fell apart from there. Yeah, it was just too unlikely, wasn't it? It just goes to show that people are willing to believe pretty much anything. Oh yes, all the time, regularly covered on this show, on my other shows, people were just, you know, it ties the leads up nicely, let's believe that, even though it's not really believable. When another suspect was outed in New Zealand in 2007, the fact that he was English, had a moustache, and was living in a 1974 Land Rover seemed to trump the fact that not only was he around a decade younger than Lucan would have been, he was almost half a foot shorter. There's some things about your appearance that you can easily change, but your height is not one of them. Lucan's brother thought he had probably fled to to Africa, and friends such as Susan Maxwell Scott also maintained that he was probably still alive. The son of Sandra Rivett, who was adopted as a baby, only found out she was his birth mother in 2007. Neil Berryman has since become deeply entrenched in the case and was given access to the notes, diaries, and case files of another detective on the case, David Gehring, after his death in 2004. You know when all the detectives investigating this are dying that the dude who escaped is either really old or definitely dead. This led Berryman to believe that Lucan is still alive but in increasingly bad health and living in Australia. An investigation by police as recently as July 2021, however, came to the conclusion that the elderly man was not the missing Lucan. Berryman declared that the police didn't carry out a very detailed investigation with no DNA tests, etc., and he is still convinced that this man is the murderer of his mother. Just test the kid and test the man. If he gives you the DNA, if he's innocent, he probably will. And, uh, yeah, you'll quickly prove that he's not Lucan. If you take a look at his website, lordlucanthetruth.com, there is a side picture of, a side-by-side picture of 1970s Lucan and the alleged modern-day Lucan. To me, they're not the same person. Sure, he could have had some cosmetic surgery, but really the similarity does not jump out. So the mystery rolls on. Having disappeared at the age of 39, if he did escape, Lord Lucan would be 87 this year. There we go. Okay, not as old as I thought. So what does that make him? Like, 19... 19- 30s i'm sure it was in the start but he's he's dead like my conclusion from all of this he murdered the babysitter and he's dead allegedly lucan was not officially declared dead until 1999 okay (laughs) there we go and i don't have to say allegedly because he's officially dead and uh he was tried in court and found guilty in absentia 
1999, meaning that he was still Lord Lucan all that time and his family could not inherit any of his titles or properties. His son, George Bingham, didn't in her, in, inherit the title of 8th Earl of Lucan until the death certificate had been issued in 2016. Damn! It took 16 years to get a death certificate. He was officially declared dead and it took 17 years? What are you up to? Get it done! You want to be that lord, you're going to get better tables in restaurants. His children have been largely vague over their father's actions and possible fate, but that's only to be expected when the only reason the media wants to talk to you is about something your dad did when you were in primary school. Yeah, you know, just be like, f*** off. <laughs> Maybe you didn't want the title of Lord Lucan because it'd be like, I just, can I just go on with my life? <laughs> please, please leave me alone. Veronica Lucan continued to live on the ho- in the house on Lower Belgrave Street. Her relationship with her children deteriorated, leading them to be looked after by her sister and her husband, William Shand Kidd, in 1982, and by adulthood, they were all completely estranged from her. She killed herself in 2017 with a cocktail of drugs after becoming convinced that she had Parkinson's disease, although this was self-diagnosed rather than confirmed by a doctor. Parkinson's disease, one of those diseases that you should probably get confirmed by a doctor rather than just being like, no, I have it. (laughs) Okay. She kept her portrait of Lucan and some of his gambling trophies in her living room and interviews she gave over the years that seemed to belie some sort of grudging, lingering respect for the man who tried to kill her. She also said that the reason it took so long to declare him dead was to avoid paying death duties, which would have prevented her from affording the fees for her children's education. Ah, how the aristocracy can fall. Whatever actually happened, the fate of the missing aristocrat far outweighed the interest in the dead Sandra Rivet, which is why her son is still trying to bring Lucan to justice or all these years later. Lucan won't out himself as he's a convicted murderer, so be arrested straight away. Unless DNA testing provides an answer in the future, it's unlikely that we'll ever find out what really happened to Lord Lucan. Unless he is still alive right now, 87 years old and living as some, you know, old man somewhere in Australia or whatever, and then there's going to be a deathbed confession and they'll confirm it by DNA. That's what I hope for because it would wrap things up really nicely, but I think the reality is he's probably dead already and there's never going to be an answer. Woo! This has been an episode of Decoding the Unknown, remarkably similar to what we do on Casual Criminalist. If you're not familiar with that show, please do check it out. It's like this. There's a podcast. There's a YouTube channel. Yes, yes. Uh, Also, if you're watching on YouTube, please use that like button below. Make sure you're subscribed. If you're watching as a podcast, a review, five stars preferred, of course, would be fantastic. If you think the show deserves less, well, you know, that's your opinion. (laughs) You're entitled to it. Do what you want. And thank you for watching or listening. Welcome, welcome, welcome to another episode of Decoding the Unknown. As always, hello there. I'm your host, Simon. In this one, what happened to Flight 739? Uh, Katie wrote this. I'm going to read it. It's a cold read. That's what we do here. I've never heard of Flight 739, although I feel like this is one of those things where you read it and you're like, ah, yeah, that mega famous flight crash where hundreds of people died or something like that. Although, there's generally not that many mystery. Well, there's that Malaysian Airlines airliner, which just completely disappeared. And no one really seems to know what happened. I mean, obviously it crashed in the ocean. It didn't get abducted by aliens or any like that. But uh, that's that's mysterious. I feel like they found parts of it, though. Didn't they find parts of it at some point? I mean, look, it's not going to be a happy ending there, is it? Look, let's just jump into it. What happens to Flight 739? Let's go. A military plane. A secret mission. A mysterious disappearance. Conspiracy theorists. Ahoy! Let's find out about the final days of Flying Tiger Lines Flight 739. Wait, so it's Flying Tiger Lines? That sounds like an airline rather than a military plane. Anyway, let's just jump in. I'm sure Katie's going to explain all of that to us because that's what she does. I have no idea what's going on. That's my job. I just sit here and read it and see what happens. The History After the end of World War II, American Robert Prescott, who had been a pilot for the Flying Tigers squads that carried out bombing raids in Japan, well, there we go, it wasn't an airline, it was a squad, started his own airline. Oh my god, and it is an airline! Oh, this is the twists and turns in the first two lines of this script, which he called the Flying Tiger Line. I mean, it's a good name, so I suppose you'd stick with it if you could. Teaming up with ten pilot pals from the original squad who had cool names like Duke Hedman, Link Laughlin, and Catfish Rain, although I'm assuming that wasn't his actual name at birth. I don't know. Catfish Rain. Who could, no one calls their kid Catfish. Although maybe in 2021, I mean, you see, like, celebrities, you see some absolutely absurd names out there. Like, really? 
Really? You know you're already the son of someone famous, right? Did you just want to make their life more difficult? Why not just call him John rather than like Cal Al? Nick Cage, looking at you on that one. Whoops! It's not already bad enough or cool enough or just different enough that Nick Cage is your dad. You had to be called Cal Al. Really? Come on. Prescott's new flying Tyler Tiger line became the US's first scheduled cargo airline in 1949 and was also used a fair bit to transport and evacuate military personnel between the 1950s and 1970s in the Korean and Vietnam Wars. With its motto of anything, anytime, anywhere, the Flying Tiger Line was hugely successful. <laughs> it sounds like it's going to open itself up for investigation. It's like, what were you, what you said would transport anything? So Pablo Escobar came along and he just wanted to transport cocaine. And we said, well, I guess we've got no choice. It's in our motto. It's in our motto. Oh, God, we're all going to jail. They were constantly pushing the envelope and using the biggest and most advanced aircraft available. It was trusted with cargo routes all over the world and, among many other things, was responsible not only for carrying the first new 50-star American flag and the torch for the Statue of Liberty, but also transporting Shamu the killer whale to a SeaWorld venue in Ohio 1974, along with 10 dolphins, a 3,000-pound elephant seal called El Google, and a duck that could apparently play the piano. That last one sounds like a lie. The duck can maybe walk on the piano, and if you call that playing, well, you're dumb. In 1980, the Flying Tiger Line became the largest cargo carrier in the world. It even set a world record back in 1965 for being the first aircraft to make an aerial circumnavigation of the Earth via the poles using a modified Boeing 707-349C. The Flying Tiger Line was a big deal. It's not that surprising as it was bought out by FedEx in the late 1980s. That's probably a happy ending. If you're the most successful carrier in the world and you're getting bought out by FedEx, someone is writing you a massive check. And for like an old military pilot, that's going to be a good time to inject a little early taste of intrigue here. I'd like to go back a bit and mention that the commander of the original World War II Flying Tigers unit was one Claire Le Cheneau. Perhaps rather sexistly of me, I thought this was a woman and was surprised and excited to find out more, but it turned out it was just a man with the first name Claire. That's you'd be like, whoa! There was a a commander of a of a World War II unit would be I feel who's being a woman like in an airline unit. Although there were the flying witches out of the Soviet Union, but that was a very specific case, and I've made a couple of videos about that. So I feel like this would definitely be something I knew about just because it's cool enough to have a video on it. But uh, no, it was just a dude named Claire. <laughs> I think it's funny. Dudes are called Hillary. Claire is worse. He was also nicknamed Old Leatherface, which might have given me a clue, but there you go. Anyway, Cheneau also created his own airline after World War II, originally called Civil Air Transport. The aim of this airline was to get relief supplies into China to help fight against Mao Zedong's communist forces. Spoiler alert, they didn't win. After this didn't work out, the airline was, on the face of it, a civilian transport service from 1950 to 1976, but it was actually owned by the CIA. Oh my god, the CIA's got so much money. <laughs> This is one of those things that's like, yeah, the CIA is the US military or whatever. You know, same sort of secret budget, just billions or not trillions, right? It's not trillions of dollars. Hundreds of billions of dollars, I'm sure, just go into the CIA. And it's like the amount of money they have, they're just like, yeah, 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 we'll buy a cargo airline just so we can move stuff around the world quietly without it having like CIA written on the side. It's just, or using military planes, I guess, is more realistic. But that is just unbelievable. It's cool. It's also terrifying. It's cool, but terrifying. It changed its name to Air America in 1959. There were many dealings between the two companies, including Civil Air Transport planes being modified at Robert Prescott's Flying Tiger Line base and various aircraft sales between the two, so let's just say there's definitely room for undercover shenanigans going on there. Yeah, at some point they get a check and it's just signed CIA, and they're like, wait a second, <laughs> what's going on? Who slipped up? Are you the CIA? So let's get back to the plane in question, Flying Tiger Line Flight 739, which also had the registration of N6921C. It was a five-year-old Lockheed L1049 Super Constellation prop liner. On March 14th, 1962, it took off from Travis Air Force Base in California with 96 military personnel on board, including three Vietnamese soldiers, a crew of 11 civilians, making a total of 107 people on the plane. It had to make a few scheduled refueling stops before reaching its destination of Saigon. 
Once there, the mission was apparently for the soldiers on board to take over training Vietnamese soldiers to fight the Viet Cong. The first couple of stops were fine, just minor delays caused by small maintenance issues to two of the four engines, but seemingly nothing to worry about. If I was on a plane and it had four engines, they were like, yeah, yeah, just a just, uh, little bit of maintenance on two out of these four engines. I'd be like, please say they're on different sides. And also, what the f***? <laughs> Flying was also way more dangerous in the past. This is like the 1960s. Planes were crashing, like, often. It was not, I mean, I guess it was relatively safe and all that. People still got on planes. But it was like people died in plane crashes. Nowadays, it's like very rare. It just makes the news because it's a lot of people. The plane took off from its third stop in Guam at 12.57 GMT on the 15th of March 1962. With apparently more than enough fuel to cover the distance to its next stop, the Clark Air Base in the Philippines, Flight 739 went on its way. All was well, according to Radio Call at 14.22 GMT, and there was supposed to be another check-in at 15.30 GMT, but the control tower at Guam was having issues with static following a call to a different plane, and it missed the window by a few minutes. When it was finally up and running again at 15.39, it could not make contact with the Flying Tiger plane. The radio communication at 14.22 was the last anyone heard of Flight 739. The plane was officially reported lost, and the largest search operation of the time was launched on the 16th of March 1962, covering around 200,000 square miles, that's 520,000 square kilometers, it's a lot of space, of the Pacific Ocean, and harnessing the combined forces of the U.S. Air Force, Navy, Marines, and U.S. Coast Guard over a period of eight days. Not a trace of the plane or its passengers has ever been found. So why is this so mysterious? Okay, yeah, I'm like, okay, it's a plane, it disappeared. Especially back in the day, I feel like it's more likely for planes to disappear because th there definitely wasn't GPS. Uh, they, I guess they would, there's radar and but that's going to be way less reliable. There's going to be way less technology. So it's going to be harder to recover. Ultimately, planes do crash and fall into the sea without much of a trace even today. Just look at Malaysian Airlines Flight 370 from 2014. What makes the disappearance of Flying Tiger Lines Flight 739 more tantalizing, though, is the whiff of conspiracy and cover-up that surrounds it, and the fact that as time goes on, it gets less and less likely that the truth will ever be fully known. But, as we've often discussed, as we've discussed on this channel before, the longer something goes on, like, if there's a conspiracy, at the start, much more likely that the conspiracy is real. Sort of. Statistically. Because, over time the chances of someone leaking it increases. The more years go by, the greater that chance becomes. So, like the moon landing, sure, 1960s, maybe people thought it would be faked. But there were thousands of people involved in that. And over the time, people have died. There would have been deathbed confessions. Something would have happened. Someone would have wrote a book. Someone would have once a cashed in. Someone would have been sent to prison. There would be a deal. And the truth would have come out because it's just too many people over too long a time. Again, like with this kind of stuff, I'm like, oh, well, the longer that goes by, the less likely it is to be a conspiracy. To begin with, the rescue party were probably reasonably sure of finding something, as they had the last known location of the plane when it had checked in the previous day, and they knew the direction that it was going. Oof, yeah, but it can go on a massive detour. It, that was a long time ago in plane flying terms. Also, there was an apparent witness to the event. Oh, a Liberian tanker was floating around, minding its own business, when the crew spotted vapor trails disappearing into some clouds. They then heard a double explosion and saw two red balls of flame falling from the sky at different speeds. That's got to be really, like, not scary, because you're not in danger, but it's like, oh my god, I just watched people die. It's pretty intense. It's like that, uh, that Formula One. I watched that Drive to Survive. And a couple of, like, when the Romain Grosjean has a crash where he goes into the wall and his car is just obliterated. And uh, a friend of mine who's really into Formula 1 sent me the clip and he was just like, dude, I think I just watched someone die on live TV. And I'm like, the, this was after we know he was okay. And you just see that car going into that wall and you're like, how did, what? The, 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 the technology is amazing. It's like the front of his car was obliterated. It didn't exist anymore. And then he was in flames for like a minute. And he walks out and he's like, yeah, my hand's a bit busted up. That's it. Wild. If you haven't seen Drive to Survive, I never watched Formula One. Didn't really have any interest in Formula One. That documentary series is incredible. Stop watching this <laughs> or listening to this and go check out Drive to Survive on Netflix. Not a sponsor. Should be a sponsor. I'd love Netflix to sponsor. <laughs> That'd be cool. The tanker's radar pegged this at about 17 miles, 27 kilometers away from them, or at 500 miles, 805 kilometers off the coast of Guam, which is where Flight 739 should have been 
at around that time. So, case closed then, right? Obviously, this was the plane with its military passengers exploding in midair and falling into the Pacific. Well, yes, probably that was the outcome, but the Lockheed Super Constellations were safe planes, specifically used by a, by the airline because of their reliability record. Yeah, I, sort of, but that's a fairly weak argument, in my opinion, because planes today, any plane, I'm sure, modern plane, would blow, except for that 737 MAX, <laughs> we all know what that story was, um, any modern plane today surely blows the safety record out of the water compared to any of these older planes doing these same routes. And planes today still crash because of, well, pilot error, probably mostly, but also mechanical stuff can go wrong. The uh, the Max thing was the, the, the autopilot was fighting them and crashing them into the ground, which is insane. Um, but yeah, planes crash. Reliable planes crash, just less. So why did this one explode and how? The tanker did immediately head over to the area of the explosion and search for several hours but found nothing. Also, I didn't mention this earlier, but now seems like a good time to say that not only were the 93 American soldiers on the plane, they all just happened to be army rangers. Oh wow, these are like elite soldiers. These are elite combat and operations specialists, so it seems a little unlikely that they were just popping over to Vietnam to train up some soldiers. And remember, this was 1962, a few years before the US officially entered the war, so something was definitely going on on the hush-hush. See? Intrigued now, eh? Yeah, I'm pretty intrigued. This sounds like way more like someone wanted to take out a whole bunch of elite army rangers who were going to Vietnam to cause some trouble. But also, they could be going there as, like, consultants. Like, consultants to, like, train the southern Vietnamese army against the North Vietnamese, right? Because that was definitely something that was... Was that going on in 1962? It was going on before, obviously, the official war in Vietnam began. I don't know, my Vietnam War history is not good enough to, to know the exact date. Theories Let's take it for granted that the tanker did see the remains of the plane falling into the ocean. If we take this eyewitness account out of the equation, we're not left with much to make a story out of, and, it could probably, and we could probably just assume that the plane ran out of fuel or had mechanical problems and ditched somewhere between Guam and the Philippines. Yes, totally. That tanker story, that I maybe there's a reason for the tanker people to lie, but it seems like a pretty unlikely thing to lie about. Also, they'd have to know about this plane, and then it also conveniently goes missing. Seems pretty likely that the tanker people are telling the truth. Maybe Katie will tell me something later on to persuade me different, but I think that plane crashed like doesn't seem to have run out of fuel does it a double explosion doesn't seem very likely but the evidence of something happening at the correct time and place to account for it being flight 739 is very compelling fully agree so what could have caused the plane to blow up mid-flight well two of the engines have been tinkered with on two different fuel stops but the pilot reported no issues in his 1422 radio report and it didn't seem that there was a serious problem with either engine even if they had stopped working the plane wouldn't be blown apart in the years since aviation experts have all agreed that this type of plane just exploding as it flew along was totally unthinkable yeah i mean planes they don't generally explode unless they're being blown up they uh, they crash into the ocean or the land by not bombs. Also, under normal circumstances, there wouldn't be anything on board powerful enough to cause this kind of thing. Something might have happened to cause the plane to explode. The weather was clear and fine, so it wasn't a storm or a lightning strike or anything like that. Let's look at some of the other theories behind the explosion. And before you get your hopes up, Simon, there really isn't an extraterrestrial angle to this one. Oh, no. I love it on exploring the unknown when the aliens come into it. Someone's always been like, I bet if you Google it, Flight 739. Flight 739? Flight 739 aliens. I bet you someone's coming up with some theory about aliens. Because of course they are. Because it's the internet. Google goes deep. I know you complain when aliens pop up. But I don't know. Deep down, you love it really. I love it. I mean, I do believe aliens are real. I just don't think they're coming to Earth and blowing up flights. Because they don't care. We watch. I'm watching this TV show with my wife called Invasion. And it just bothers me because the aliens, they come and they kill us. Like, but individually. Like, these aliens come down to the planet and there's, like, plenty of scenes when the aliens are killing people. And I'm like, yo, these aliens traveled from however far away. <laughs> really, really far in spaceships. And they seem incredibly powerful. What business do they have just killing us individually? If they want us gone, they would just make us gone. It would be like us fighting individual ants. It would be absurd. So, just for you, maybe it was aliens. Okay, now that's out of the way, let's get down to some more likely stuff. Sabotage This was a plane full of soldiers heading to an area 
in the middle of a conflict zone. Could there have been someone who deliberately messed with the plane at one of the scheduled stops to prevent it from getting to its destination? None of the three areas the plane landed in were secure, so anyone on the bases potentially had access to it every time. It is therefore possible that the engines were somehow deliberately tampered with, or maybe there was even a bomb stowed away on board. This was actually my own idea, as I haven't seen this theory pop up in any of the research that I did for the story. Yeah, that does seem pretty likely. I have to say I'm definitely leaning towards the fact that someone blew up this plane. There's motivation, there's the bomb, the the explosions in the sky. I'm kind of leaning towards that right now, and someone's slipping a bomb uh, onto the plane, like at one of these airbases where it stops refueling. Kind of seems likely. There are plenty of references to sabotage, but none to bombs in particular. I don't know anything about bomb making in the 1960s, but I suppose it's unlikely to be able to smuggle something presumably quite large onto a plane without somebody noticing it. But hey, it's a theory. Maybe you could stick some C4 near the fuel tanks or something. I don't know. I'm just throwing it out there. Yeah, you don't need much bomb to take out a plane. Really, not much at all. Just enough to like knock a wing off, blow up a fuel tank, depressurize the cabin big old hole in the side you don't need that much bomb well, i'm fairly sure if there's a grenade on a grenade goes off on a plane it's probably not gonna work it's not gonna work out for that plane that'd be fascinating what happens if a grenade does go off on a plane has that ever happened in history maybe someone in the comments would know if you're watching this on youtube if you're listening to it on a podcast then that's unfortunate you don't get to you don't get to find out the grenade discussion that probably happened in the video so you can watch on youtube as well happy days or maybe there was a traitor on board who set up an ex- set an explosion off themselves. A communist sympathizer or just an unhinged psychopath? Again, just spitballing here, but a blue sky thinking, don't roast me in the comments. I'm going to get roasted as well in the comments, aren't I? Because I'm kind of agreeing that this seems pretty likely. I don't know about the suicide bomber, though. I think, like, I don't know. Su- <laughs> I feel like before 9-11, people were like, yeah, yeah, w- I mean, wait, you got to be- you got to get off the plane, though, once you put the bomb on there. <laughs> Although, after my genius wave of blue sky thinking outside the box, I investigated a little further and did find some information that might give a bit more oomph to this theory. I didn't really think about the fuel stops that much. I just imagined them as fairly short stops to fill up the plane. But of course, they would have taken a while, and the passengers and crew would have got off to stretch their legs. The flight had also been going for over a day at this point, so the pilots especially would need to rest. At the first stop in Hawaii, the head of the flight crew complained that there wasn't enough of a crew rest area, so an extra mattress was brought aboard which added half an hour or so to the stop a mattress you say why wouldn't that be big enough to conceal some sort of explosive or maybe i'm totally overthinking it and it was a blow-up mattress in a tiny bag also it could totally been checked for security before it goes on although i feel like military planes and stuff that that's going to be way less do they have security when you go on a military flight they maybe not right because you got to be like these rangers and stuff they probably got bombs and how do they get bombs? Do they like take grenades on planes to take them around the world and take them places? That sounds dangerous. Uh, but these dudes, I don't know if they go through airport security. Also, airport security in the 1960s was probably a joke. <laughs> Even on like regular commercial flights, until someone like blew something up and we're like, whoa, someone blew up a, pe- blew up a plane. We should have some sort of security. But wait, there's more. At the next stop on Wake Island, four of the flight crew were replaced. I assume as scheduled as opposed to any other issues. Maybe one of the departing party had left something on board ready to blow up or one of the new crew brought something on. I'm not accusing anyone in particular, just trying to solve a mystery here. Also, at what would turn out to be the final stop in Guam, the plane was left unattended for a while after the routine maintenance checks had been carried out, a perfect opportunity for sabotage. So with my conspiracy hat on, this does seem like a possible explanation for the explosion. There was literally something happening every time the plane landed. Also, there's the other line of thought that as the Flying Tiger lines were increasingly being used to military transport as well as their usual cargo runs, maybe they were overstretched and maintenance and general checks on the planes went a bit by the wayside. Does that really happen? Maybe in the 1960s? I feel like today they're not just like, oh yeah, we're really busy so we didn't check that plane over before we sent it on a flight. Because that's going to open you up to such massive liability and fines and probably jail time for whoever allows that to happen because that is extremely bad. Now, I've mentioned this before. I'm learning to fly every time we get in that plane. It's like you've got to check everything. You're checking that the, the wings are attached properly. You're checking the oil. You're checking the fuel twice. You're doing all of this stuff just to make sure that this little plane is going to be okay. With big planes, I'm sure the checklist is a lot longer. And they do it every time because, you know, you're getting in that plane. You want it to be safe. 
Even if this were the case, though, aviation experts have agreed that in, uh, that in the normal course of flying operations, this sort of explosion just wouldn't happen, unless undeclared things were on board and there were no huge weapons or anything like that, just clothing and personal effects. Even the executive vice president of the Flying Tiger Line stuck his neck out and said that it was impossible for the super constellation to explode, so something violent must have happened. How come this bomb theory has never been floated online? This does seem extremely likely. There were two explosions, maybe a bomb went off and then the fuel ignited. I don't know if that's how that works, but look, there was a there was a bang. That oil tanker, which seems to be telling the truth, because I can't work out a reason for them to lie. There was a bang. A bomb went off. This seems extremely likely. Kidnap. Sure, it's possible that the plane could have been hijacked, but is it really that likely? Where would it have happened? At one of the fuel stops, presumably, but this was a plane with almost 100 elite soldiers on it. So I think any potential hijacker would realize their mistake pretty quick and just walk quietly off at the next stop. Yeah, it's like, this is like the reverse Con Air. It's like Con Air, except everyone is an elite army ranger who could probably kill you with their toes. It's like, what have I done? I've kidnapped the wrong plane. Ah! There were no reports of ransoms, and the plane seemed on course for where it was supposed to be, unless it had veered off just after the 1422 radio call and had flown for over an hour in a different direction, and the thing that exploded was just something else entirely. If this was the case, presumably it still crashed somewhere as nothing was heard from the plane or passengers again. It would have just meant that the rescue party was looking in the wrong place. The pilot did request a change of altitude from 10,000 to 18,000 feet in a radio call at 1325 GMT. This was approved with no reasons being given or queried. There was also a bit of cloud, but otherwise the weather was clear, so visibility should have been fine. The tanker saw vapor trails going into some cloud, but no one on board could confirm seeing the plane itself. And there was no explanation given for this altitude change. I don't know if it was a weird request or just a routine thing that pilots do to avoid clouds or fly faster. Basically, I have no idea if there's anything to be made of it or not. It's a fairly big change in altitude from 10 to 18,000. I don't know how high planes flew at this time or what that plane's normal altitude is or at what point of the journey it was on. But it's not an un it's definitely not crazy unreasonable. I it didn't stick out to me as something strange planes change altitude all the time it would obviously be more weird if it was flying at 10,000 feet in the middle of the flight that would be strange assuming it can fly at 18,000 feet all other radio reports had been pr perfectly normal with no strange messages or distress calls being sent after repeated attempts to contact flight 739 after radio contact was re-established by the guam tower it was officially declared lost at 22 27 gmt which is the time at which all of its fuel would have run out. Collision with an object. The crew of the tanker saw two fireballs falling towards the sea at different speeds. Maybe these were two different objects as opposed to two halves of the same plane. Yeah, but it's going to have to be a fairly massive accident. You're going to have to crash into something substantial for there to be two things. And were there any other planes that were missing at exactly the same time? I feel like the Tenerife Airport disaster is one of the most memorable. I mean, it was the worst aviation accident in history. But it was also super memorable because it was two giant planes crashing into each other on the runway. I feel like if two giant planes crashed into each other in midair, that would be something I would know about. That would be like, you know, it would be memorable like Tenerife. There was that other one. It was, was it a China Air or something where this, these two planes, they're just absolutely flying towards each other. And they missed by like 100 meters. It was crazy. And they, they changed some rules with flights um, that... This is what's so interesting about planes and, and flying. Like, anytime there's an error, they fix it so it doesn't happen again. Like, it, they report on it. There's these super transparent reporting so the pilots can say, we really screwed this up or, like, something went wrong. And then they work on fixing it. So with this one, this is such a tangent for, like, aviation nerds. But uh, these two planes were flying towards each other. However it happens, and, like, there was some confusion with air traffic control. And, uh... Basically, just at the uh, and they had their devices on board, which alert them to oncoming oncom oncoming traffic, like completely separate to uh, air traffic control. And just at the last minute, one of them just happened to pull out of the way, and there was a big argument or like a decision over: do you listen to air traffic control or do you listen to, listen to the collision avoidance thing? Because they needed to be on the same page, because that will allow them to avoid each other. And they're like, yeah, ignore air traffic control. Always just do what your collision avoidance thing says. And I'm like that's cool how oh, they just adapt and change i like it tangents over we're getting back to it
They were a fair distance away. After all, what could have that other thing been? There is an almost impossibly small but still teeny tiny chance that the plane was hit by something like a meteorite. Oh my god, guys. The odds of this are just astronomically low. Astronomically low. I mean, literally astronomical. Uh, This has apparently never happened in the history of avionics, but maybe it has, and that's what caused the odd mystery crash or two. Meteorites do make it down this far, and on rare occasions have struck things on Earth's surface. See, for example, the New York Peak Skill meteorite car, which got hit in the trunk in 1992 and hasn't stopped milking it since. It's even got its own website. So why not a plane? Well, one... There's not that many planes. (laughs) There's a lot of cars, and it seems that one car has been hit in history. The surface area of cars in the world, compared to the surface area of planes, is crazy different. (laughs) As no wreckage has ever been recovered, we can, of course, never know for sure, but we can be damn close to certain it wasn't a meteorite, guys. There's even something else that could have hit Flight 739, though, and that's a missile. Some people expressed doubt about the Russians, for at the time it was only them who could have launched such a strike that would take out a cargo plane like this. And yes, this was a plane full of army rangers. This wasn't a run-of-the-mill plane load of piano-playing ducks they were transporting. Nice callback. According to family members of the missing men, they had been handpicked from across the country, and at least a few had been confirmed as communications and electronic specialists. This points to potential wiretapping and espionage missions at the very least. The Soviet Union and the US were supporting different sides in the Vietnam conflict, so this made a large dent in the US's operational capabilities, potentially ending any plans they had before they even started. This ties into family of the missing soldiers reporting that the men had left important belongings behind, such as wedding rings and ID cards, perhaps indicating that they indeed were going on a covert mission with a high chance of capture or death. Some men even explicitly said they didn't think they'd be coming back. Holy sh**, this is some intense mission. (laughs) They have also been all but disavowed by the US government, and the names have not been added to the Vietnam Veterans Memorial Wall, as to do so would be an admission that they were indeed involved in the conflict long before the US officially landed troops on the ground. I suppose it's a weird place for the Soviet Union to have taken the plane out, but as we have discovered, it totally disappeared, so it turned out to be the perfect place to hide all traces of evidence. Yeah, I mean, you don't want to take it out in a place where it's like, yeah, 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 it's a pretty obvious place for the Soviets to do it, isn't it? Actually, then maybe they'd be like, it's too obvious, it can't be the Soviets. You're doing some out-of-the-way place where they don't expect you to be doing it. This also seems like a very credible possibility. In this one, I'm totally into the conspiracy theorists. This plane did not just disappear. It was blown up, either by a bomb or a missile. This doesn't seem like a conspiracy theory, it seems like logical thought. If the tank hadn't been there, no one would be any the wiser. No one ever took responsibility for taking the plane down, although with international tensions at a high point, maybe that's to be expected. If it wasn't the Russians, though, could friendly fire have been to blame? I hate the term friendly fire. It sounds like something that wouldn't hurt you because it likes you, or a nice place to sit around and toast marshmallows. How about snafu fire, or totally scrub fire, or getting accidentally killed by your own side fire? (laughs) Yes. As the plane was chartered through a civilian airline, this whole thing has managed to be sidestepped by the US government as not being an official armed forces or government operation. No, 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 it's just a coincidence that 60 army rangers all got on a plane together and flew to a conflict zone. Definitely not a military flight. Allegedly. The US government has never given out any further information about what might have happened, leading some people to believe that it might have been a friendly fire incident after all. And to be honest, you're not going to want to readily confess to a mistake like that. In another string to this theory's bow, the tanker that witnessed the explosion tried contacting the nearest naval bases to report it, but calls went unanswered. There are apparently no historical documents about the plane in the Travis Air Force Base's archives, and repeated requests for information to places like the CIA, National Archives, and the State Department have fallen on deaf ears. Isn't there, can't you do that thing, the freedom of information request, where you write and they have to give you the information? I mean, they can redact the out of it, but uh, they can still give you the information. Oh my god, <laughs> I have a great story about redacting. I, I mean, a great interesting story for me. I was looking at uh, buying a property, and across from the property there was like a, a, like a development going on, so I was like, oh, why is this for sale? Because they're going to be developing like some terribly ugly property across the street. And so I go onto like the government website, you know, where they have all the things, and they redact people's personal information. I download the PDFs, and you could just delete the redaction. Like, you know, the black lines over it, they're digitally added. And I was like, so it flickered when I opened it or something. And I was like, wait, did I just see that dude's name? And then you could just, you can't really delete it. You could just drag the redacting 
to another page on the pa- place on the page. And I'm like, government? Really? It, official government website? Is this really what's going on? So all of that shit is just out there. And then I found out what they were doing because I Googled the guy's name, found out the company he was running, and then saw what developments the companies were building, the company was building. And you're like, oh, okay. It's, and then I was like, it seems really unlikely you're going to get the planning permission to do that. So I didn't end up buying the house anyway. But uh, yeah, that was shocking. <laughs> I hope the CIA is better at that shit. Or do I? Here's another tasty tidbit. Flight 739 was not the only flying Tiger Lines pl- line plane with military connections to have an accident on March the 15th, 1962. Ooh, uh, but they didn't crash into each other. There's no way. Conspiracy. On the same day that Fly 739 left Travis Air Force Base, another plane left the same base at roughly the same time. It was Flying Tiger Lines Flight 7816, also a Lockheed L1049H Super Constellation. All we know about this one is it was carrying secret military cargo, which could be absolutely anything. It was headed for a base in Alaska, and for some reason the pilot decided to try and land using his own judgment rather than the help of the control tower. This ended in tragedy when he crashed the plane short of the runway and died in the ensuing fireball, presumably taking the secret military cargo with him. (laughs) Wait, who lands a plane? You don't have a choice. Like, when you're coming into land, I know this from my learning to fly. If there's a tower, you have to ask. You can't just be like, ah, uh, if it's a radio, if it's uncontrolled airspace or an uncontrolled controlled airfield, yeah, talk to the other pilots on the same frequency and be like, yo, 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 anyone around? I'm coming in for a landing. <laughs> Anybody? Hello? And then you can land. Or you, you don't even have to tell the other pilots if you like living dangerously and putting people's lives at risk. But you don't have to. You should. But if there's a tower, you have to be like, uh, hello, I'd like to land. The rest of the crew managed to escape with minor injuries. While this is most likely a coincidence, the fact that the two planes from the same airline crashed on the same day and both were being used for what were probably undercover military purposes stoked the rumor mill to the max. It's just a coincidence, guys. Pilot error was given for the cause of this other crash, and although it's fun to speculate on conspiracy theories and the possible sabotage of two planes at the same time, it does seem that this was human error and not unduly suspicious. Unless the pilot was an undercover Soviet agent. As it turned out, 1962 was not a great year for Lockheed Super Constellation. Despite the safety record, Flying Tiger Lines actually lost four of those planes that year. Didn't we start talking about this plane was reliable? Four in a year? Everyone was like, Boeing 737 Max, you lost two planes in six months. This is insane. And they're like, no, no, four in a year. 1960s is cool. Super reliable. You only lost four? A miracle. The two that we've covered, plus one in December that crashed due to the pilot having a suspected heart attack, but also one in September that crashed into the sea after a triple engine failure? Reliable planes? Triple engine failure? That does not speak much for maintenance checks, does it? Although, do please note that even with three engines out, this plane did not explode. Also, while 28 people on board died, 48 managed to survive. Aftermath As previously mentioned, the men lost in the disappearance of Flight 739 were not given recognition by the government, leaving the families left behind feeling abandoned and helpless. It took until May 2021, almost six decades later, for any sort of tribute to occur when non-profit organization Wreaths Across America erected a granite monument in Columbia Falls, Maine, bearing the names of all the American soldiers and crew who lost their lives. That's nice. Can't believe it took six decades. Yo, American government, you don't have to put them on the wall like the vietnam wall or whatever although maybe you should um but there should be a monument 60 something elite army people these are like people if you're an army ranger right that's you get you know it's not like you join the military for however long it is and then you leave these are like your elite soldiers you spent a lot of money on them they've dedicated their lives and careers to this come on do better I don't think the South Vietnamese people got recognized anywhere, though. Hopefully there's a mention of them somewhere in the world, maybe in South Vietnam. Uh, was it a deliberate act, an accident, or a mechanical failure? Maybe the plane was simply off course and ran out of fuel, crashing somewhere in the vast expanse of the ocean, never to be found, and the fireball was just a total red herring. In its report, the Civil Aeronautics Board stated, A summation of all relevant factors tends to indicate that the aircraft was destroyed in flight. However, due to the lack of any substantiating evidence, the Board is unable to state with any degree of certainty the exact flight of N6921C. If you recall, that was the registration number of Flight 739. Due to the complete and total lack of any evidence, the truth will never be known unless the remains of the plane manage to be discovered someday. 
That doesn't seem likely, however, as all of the places on Earth it could have been, the plane was near the Mariana Trench when it disappeared. That is the deepest place in the world. Also, James Cameron's been there, which is crazy. Whatever actually happens, the loss of Flight 739 takes it into the top 200 deadliest plane crashes in terms of lives lost and goes down as the worst tragedy ever, involving a Lockheed Constellation aircraft. So, thank you, Casey, for putting this together. Uh, it was bombs, right? It was a bomb or a missile. The Russians blew it up, allegedly. The USSR, sorry. Or uh, the uh, there was someone slipped a bomb on board. That tanker just happening to see that same thing at the same time. Too much of a coincidence. Yeah, like, there's, there's like the scale of coincidences, right? There's coincidences where I'm just like, that's ridiculous. Like the meteor getting hit. That's just insane. The uh, other plane crashing on the same day. That's just a coincidence. The coincidence of a tanker seeing an explosion and a plane coming out of the sky exactly where that plane was supposed to be. That is on the side of coincidence that is pushing very close to certainty. Something blew up that plane. In my opinion, that's why I'm into Flight 739. Sound off in the comments below if you're watching this on YouTube. If you're listening to this as a podcast, please do consider leaving a review. That would be wonderful. Good reviews warm my little heart. And uh, as always, thank you so much for watching or listening. And I'll see you next time. Ah, hello, and welcome back to another brand new episode of Decoding the Unknown. Yes, I'm your host, Simon, and on this show, what happens is Katie, wonderful scriptwriter Katie, has written an episode called The Flan and Isles Mystery. I have no idea where this is. I have no idea where the Flan and Isles are, but I'm going to cold read this script that I have in front of me. A nice thick one. I think this is like 14 pages, which is pretty heavy, although it's double spaced, so I guess... It doesn't matter. You already know because you can see how long this episode is. I'm going to read it and then afterwards, Jen, our wonderful video editor, Hi, everybody. is going to uh, add a little bit of magic to it. So let's just jump into it. Oh, before we do, uh, make sure you hit that like button. I believe by the time this go- goes out, according to YouTube, there's not going to be a dislike button anymore, which is incredible. If you're listening to this in its podcast form, you never had any of those options, but you can leave a review, which is always most welcome. And let's just jump in. And if it's a good review, if it's a bad review, then I guess it's not welcome, is it? That's just one of those things. But I mean, if you don't like it, that's okay. I, you know, if you're making pro- something that, that, if you're making a podcast that, or a YouTube show that pleases everyone, well, it's probably not going to be very successful because, you know, eventually, eventually you've got a loyal crew of dislikers. Uh, let's go. Imagine, if you will, a map of the world. Oh, brilliant. So Katie's going to start off by telling us where the Flannan Isles actually are. So they, they could be like off the coast of Scotland. They could be in the Caribbean. I don't, I literally no idea. Or go to Google Maps. Now think of where the, okay, United Kingdom. Here we go. Where the United Kingdom is. Big name, small place. Locate Scotland. Oh, wow. It's off Scotland. <laughs> Legend. Uh, locate Scotland. It's at the top. And then look to the west. You'll see some islands, including a large archipelago known as the Outer Hebrides of the Western Isles. Archipelago is one of those words that I often have to look up because I'm like, I I feel like I've looked it up a million times. It's always one of those words you're like, I feel like I'm pronouncing that wrong because it's written like archipelago or something. Archipelago. Complicated. Doesn't matter. Get on with the story. Keep zooming in and other, much smaller islands start to become visible. If you go west from about the middle of the larger landmass of Lewis and Harris and keep going for about 20 miles, 32 kilometers, you'll eventually spot a small cluster of tiny rocky islands. Katie, are you just unfamiliar with how Google Maps works? Because you've got four lines describing it. Here's my way of describing it. Go to Google Maps, type in Flannan Isles, hit return. Boom! (laughs) The Flannan Isles have appeared. And that is why Google Maps is superior to other forms of mapping, like Apple Maps and also paper. You'll eventually spot a small cluster of tiny, rocky islands. These are the Flannan Isles, also known as the Seven Hunters. And it's on this remote and windswept part of the planet that an enduring mystery took place at the turn of the 20th century. The Mystery In early December 1900, Principal Lighthouse Keeper James Duckett It's good this pronunciation guy, because otherwise I'd pronounce it like Ducat, like that guy from Star Trek. Second assistant Thomas Marshall and occasional lighthouse keeper Donald MacArthur started their rotation at the recently built lighthouse on the largest piece of land to make up the Flannan Isles. 
Ely. Oh my god. Ellen Moore. Again, oh, nice. There's a pronunciation guide. My bad. Oh, it, Ellen Moore. Nailed it. Nailed it. The lighthouse had only been built a year before and was located in the Outer Hebrides, where fierce winds, fog, and huge storms were putting many ships in danger. But did you need like three dudes to run like a lighthouse? Is that really necessary? Just turn. Was this twenty turn of the twentieth century? They would have, they would have had electricity. It doesn't need to be three guys. I feel like these today would be like automatic. Indeed, I just made a video on one of my other channels. I can't remember which one it was because I have so many. Um, about nuclear lighthouses where the Soviet Union was just like yo we got these lighthouses in the middle of nowhere there's no way we're stringing power out there wind technology isn't really a thing yet how are we going to do it? well we'll just put nuclear batteries in them yep little mini nuclear batteries which is uh, kind of mind blowing right but that's not what we're here to talk about today we're a good few decades before nuclear batteries existed for the first couple of weeks, all seemed well on the island. The light was reported as being visible by ships that had passed it and gone on to dark at the harbors on the larger islands of Lewis and Harris. One day, however, the light went out. After delays due to bad weather, a boat was eventually dispatched on Boxing Day 1900 to Ellen Moore, and instead of three lighthouse keepers, they found no one. Duckett, Marshall, and MacArthur had completely vanished. What had happened to these experienced lighthouse keepers? Over the years, many theories have been touted as to what fate might have befallen these unlucky fellows, so let's find out the backstory to the mystery and see what we think is the most likely explanation. By the way, there was a recent movie made of this story called The Vanishing, but I haven't seen it, and I haven't looked up the ending, so I expect at least one of these explanations is going to be a giant spoiler. Onward. Yeah, if you've got plans to see The Vanishing... Well, uh, we're about to ruin that for you, but this isn't like spoiling the new James Bond movie. It's The Vanishing, a movie from a few years ago that I've never heard of. It probably wasn't that big of a deal. Or maybe it was. All of those, if it, was, it sounds like a horror movie, right? The Vanishing. And all of those horror ones always seem the same. I never really see horror movies in a movie theater because they're just not as scary as when you watch it alone by yourself at home at night maybe out in the middle of nowhere like in the countryside or something that's when that's when horror movies are most terrifying like as a kid lived in like mostly the middle of nowhere it's like a tiny ass village and if my parents were away i'd watch a horror movie and i'd be like oh my god this is the most terrifying thing ever sitting in the movies with a bunch of other people to watch a horror movie you're like well it's just not that scary as all these people around me if the psycho killer comes in he's probably just gonna kill one of them first right there's hundreds of people here we're fine the history the inhospitable conditions of the North Atlantic have bred myths and legends aplenty in the area of the Outer and Inner Hebrides. It's a wild and sparsely populated place, so it's not surprising that fairy tales and mysterious legends have popped up, even if they just started as things to keep the locals from getting too bored. Strange, i.e. non-Christian, practices have apparently been mainstays over the decades, and because of the remoteness of the islands, it's not hard to believe that anything might be happening. The original Wicker Man film was set, although not filmed, on a Hebridean island, so if you can remember Christopher Lee skipping about in a flowery dress and a long black wig as part of a pagan ritual that might not be too far off the mark wait isn't the wicker man there was an original one is christopher christopher lee died recently and he was old right so wasn't that nicholas cage one where there's that famous myth of him being like not the bees not the bees oh, my eyes! uh isn't that called the wicker man as well or am i just totally getting that confused for something else I, I, I feel like I saw that film a long time ago, but now I just remember the memes. The ocean also provided stories, of course, with sea monsters, water spirits, and mermaids, a common feature in folk tales around the islands. The islet of Ellen Moore itself was surrounded in superstition and otherworldly beliefs, a lot of it centering on fairies. Come on, push through it, Simon. <laughs> uh, Casey, I'll just read it, and you just know in my mind, I'm like, yeah, 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 fairies mermaids other such nonsense <laughs> or being haunted and there had long been a feeling of general weirdness around the place ah oh, someone already uh, by the way since uh, when i'm recording this episode the first episode of decoding the unknown published i stacked up like eight of them so every previous recording you've heard uh, none of these have ever been released to the public and i feel like may maybe it was casual criminalist but there was one episode where someone hit me up on twitter being like simon ghosts are real i've seen one <laughs> and i just replied no it's not ghosts aren't real and people got upset about this i mean there's there's the definite dividing line between people who think ghosts are real being like simon it, it can't be explained uh and I, I i don't know i just 
It's just so silly. It's just so silly to me. It hurts me inside. Is that why? Why do you believe this? Stop it. <laughs> oh, it was rumored to be a place where bodies were cremated on pyres many centuries ago. The standing stones of Callanish on the nearby Isle of Lewis, which predate Stonehenge, also cast a somewhat mystical haze over the area. The flannel, they don't. <laughs> mystical haze. It's just a haze. They're just some rocks that were put there in the past by a, 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 an ancient culture. It's not mysterious. It's not. It's not mystical. It's not even mysterious. It's just some rocks. <laughs> it's like Stonehenge. It's just some rocks. <laughs> they're. I mean, they're really big and impressive rocks, and they're really big. Like I've seen Stonehenge. It's surprisingly big. Um, but it's just that they're just rocks. If you want to get an idea of how big Stonehenge is, people used to be able to go up to it. So there's these old pictures of people like you know standing next to Stonehenge, and you're like, oh my gosh, it's much bigger than you think. Because normally you just see pictures without people standing there, and you're like, ah, you know, it's probably they're about the size of a person. Oh no, oh no, they are large. The Flannanars, oh yeah, ripping on mystical hazes. The Flannanars have never been permanently inhabited, with shepherds coming over to graze their sheep, but never staying overnight. The remains of a chapel that is. Why are your sheep commuting? What are you up to? <laughs> the remains of a chapel to St. Flannan can still be found there, and there have been tales of it being abandoned shortly after it was built due to supernatural forces tormenting the monks that tried to worship there. When the new lighthouse was started in 1895, it was in opposition to locals who warned of the wrath of St. Flannan for disturbing his sanctuary, and indeed one of the chief inspectors of the construction project died suddenly before it was finished, which is perhaps not the greatest omen for the new lighthouse. Yeah, yeah, if omens were real. Also, can you imagine all the people who are like a pilot, I was going to say driving ships, piloting ships, do you pilot sailing ships, whatever the correct word for like captaining, captaining a ship is. Can you imagine they're like, no, 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 well, there's this really, and this is before like GPS or anything, probably even before like good maps. And they're like, yeah, why didn't you build that lighthouse, UK? Scotland, why didn't you build a lighthouse? We keep crashing our boats into it. And they're like, oh, yeah, there's ghosts. We didn't want to build it because of ghosts. And they'll be like, 700 men have died crashing into this island. There are bodies piling up. And they'll be like, yeah, but the ghosts, the ghosts. But no, obviously they built the lighthouse because that's what this video is about. Nevertheless, the Flannanars lighthouse was finished in 1899 and stood 23 meters, 75 feet tall. Counting the sheer cliff it was standing on, the lighthouse's 140,000 candle power lamp was about 84 meters or 275 feet above the sea level, with a range of about 17 nautical miles, which is just under 20 normal miles or about 32 kilometers. Yeah, the fact that nautical miles are just slightly different from regular miles is kind of annoying. And I'm, I'm, I think I've mentioned it before, I'm learning to fly. Like, I'm getting my private pilot's license, which I've wanted to do forever. And you fly in this plane, and it's like, oh, so it's in nautical miles. And you're like, so how fast are we actually going? And my pilot, the, the instructor's like, well, Simon, we're going at, you know, 80 nautical miles. And I'm like, God, but how much, what's that in normal speed? He's like, that is normal for pilots. And I'm like, you know what I mean. <laughs> There were two areas for construction and supply boats to leave provisions or transport personnel to and from the island. These were the West Landing and East Landing and were located basically as far from the lighthouse as you can get on the small island, right on the other side. That was because the lighthouse was placed at the highest point for the best visibility and the landing areas were closer to sea level and somewhat sheltered. Steep concrete steps came up from these landing platforms to the lighthouse because and because of how steep it was, railway or tram tracks as well as cranes were also built to haul up supplies by cable. There was also a steam engine next to the lighthouse that powered the stuff going up and down these cable railways. This sounds like... Look, you've already heard, like, I don't believe in any of this haunted stuff, but I'm like, this sounds haunted. <laughs> You're like, look, if ghosts were real, this is where they come. It sounds like the setting of a horror movie. As this was 1899, there were no telephones or even telegraphs to connect the lighthouse to the mainland yet. In fact, the only way the lighthouse keepers had to contact the outside world should an emergency happen, happen was by hoisting a flag and putting some discs on poles sticking out of the lighthouse balcony. Okay, what? By putting whatever number of discs on whatever poles, they could send status updates to someone on the mainland who was supposed to be keeping an eye on the lighthouse as a fail-safe safety measure. At the time, this someone was Roderick Mackenzie, a gamekeeper living almost at the closest point to the Flannanars on the larger island of Lewis. He had been given a telescope by the Northern Lighthouse Board and was charged with checking to make sure that the light was visible and if the lighthouse keepers had hung out any alerts on their poles. Okay, I see. So, I guess they're going to be... The light's going to be behind them so they can see how many things, and also it's a telescope so they can see really far. 
All right, very old school. Because of the fog and bad weather in the area, it was not unusual for Mackenzie to not even see the light, let alone the actual lighthouse, for a few consecutive days, so it wasn't particularly alarming if he couldn't see it from one day to the next. The lighthouse was manned by a team of four men, with three at the lighthouse and a fourth man living on the mainland to be rotated every three weeks or so. The first year of the Ellamore Lighthouse's operation went smoothly and without incident. Apart from one lighthouse keeper, William Ross, having an accident with the cable railway. He was fortunate in that the supply boat was still at the landing, meaning he could be taken ashore for treatment straight away, rather than being stuck on the godforsaken rock in the middle of nowhere, relying on a gamekeeper with a telescope to spot some discs hanging on a pole some 20 miles away. He'd be like, oh, for God's sake, Mackenzie, look at the discs! They say I'm ruined! There's a train on my legs! I'm sure it wasn't that bad. He recovered, but by the time December 1900 rolled around, he was once again forced to leave the island due to illness. That meant that the party working at the lighthouse when the mystery event happened were principal lightkeeper James Duckett, second assistant Thomas Marshall and Donald MacArthur, who was Ross's replacement and what was known as the occasional keeper. Basically a part-timer, drafted in as and when needed. The fourth member of the team who was on the mainland for this leg was assistant keeper Joseph Moore. A photograph of Darkett, Marshall and MacArthur standing next to Robert Murhead, who was the superintendent of lighthouses, was taken on the 7th or 8th of December 1900, all wonderfully moustached with plenty of shining buttons on display. This would be the last time that someone saw any of them alive. Living as a lighthouse keeper is one of those romanticized jobs that people say they wish they could do. Who says that? It's like, what do you want to do? I want to be a lighthouse keeper. Because I like being alone and living in a really tall building. It's like, why? You just have to climb up to the top. There's so much stairs. I've climbed up lighthouses. Why would you want to live in that? It's like there's a TV show called Grand Designs. And uh, some guys, they turned a water tower into a house. And it was awesome. And then you're like, yeah. But if you want to go to bed, you have to climb up the equivalent of like eight stories. Which is great and romantic and cool. But it would become very annoying when that's your house. (laughs) They probably envisioned spending some quality time with books and cups of tea and occasionally climbing a flight of stairs to see if that massive light at the top is still working. I don't believe that lighthouse keepers still exist. I mean, surely not. It must all be automated. And those lighthouses must work on with like LEDs and computers and stuff. It's like, when when was the last time the lighthouse, it just wasn't working? Never. Have you ever replaced an LED bulb? Actually, yes, I have, because one of the sockets in my studio is clearly dodgy, because every time I put a bulb in there, it lasts about two weeks, and then it, something happens, and it just starts flickering. So I just stopped putting bulbs in that socket, because there's nothing wrong with the bulbs, there's something wrong with the socket. What, what are we talking about? Oh, yeah, so I don't think there's lighthouse keep- keepers. I don't think they exist anymore. If there's a lighthouse keeper listening to this video, write me an email. I'll be very curious to hear about that. The vast majority of the world's lighthouses are automated now anyway, so there are barely any opportunities for eager hermits to get a foot in the door. Okay, there we go. Could have just read that ahead, couldn't I, whistle boy? In the Outer Hebrides in the year 1900, however, it was a bit of a different story. With no contact with the outside world, stuck on a storm-battered rock with two other men you had to keep the peace with, and the sheer physical labor of keeping the landings clear and general daily maintenance, it was not for the faint of hearts. How hard could it be? What are you... I mean, surely you're just like, hey, is the light still working, Jim? Yeah, 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 still working, Bob. Okay, should we have a cup of tea? Yeah, let's have a cup of tea. Done! How complicated could be a lighthouse keeper be? James Duckett was a married man with four children, which might go some way to explaining why he didn't mind being stuck on a desolate rock for weeks at a time. Ah, I mean, I love my children, but sometimes it's like, you know, I go to work every day because I gotta work. And sometimes, you know, like after a particularly troubling night, I'm like, you know, I love you guys and I'm going to miss you. But I'm also quite looking forward to going to work today. (laughs) Donald MacArthur was also married with two children, but Thomas Marshall was a single man. Yeah, but I'm not saying I wouldn't like to go out. Like after a couple of days, like if my wife goes to her parents with the kids or something, just, you know, to see them and I don't go or whatever. And I'll be like, yeah, it was was nice for like a day. And then I'm like, when are you guys coming back? (laughs) I'm bored and lonely. Or experienced men with decades decades of lighthouse keeping between them, so this rotation was just standard procedure as far as they were. We know that all was well at the beginning. Ships passing the Flan and Isles had confirmed that the light was visible on the 7th of December, but bad weather obscured it from being observed by the man with the telescope for another few days. All was still well on the 12th of December, as reported by ships coming into Lewis, but again, there came bad weather and fog, and the light was not visible from the larger islands. Okay, I have to say, I was wondering for a while, like, wait, 
isn't the point of a lighthouse so that it's visible through bad weather but then the ships are obviously going to be a lot closer to it than the islands 20 miles away so that does make sense on december the 15th 1900 the cargo ship Arctor noted that the lighthouse was not working but due to also having managed to hit some rocks and cause itself considerable damage <laughs> probably because the bloody lighthouse wasn't working reporting the light being out wasn't at the forefront of the captain's mind when they eventually limped into port really today it would be at the forefront of his mind because it'd be like who's the responsible for the bloody lighthouse it's not working and my ship's ruined who am i gonna sue <laughs> i've seen contradicting reports about whether the arctor did actually report the light being out and the report was lost or whether they never actually reported it at all but whatever the case no alarm was raised at the time and the fourth lighthouse keeper joseph moore was set to start his rotation on the 20th of december anyway due to extremely bad weather and maybe christmas who knows moore and the crew of the hesperus the boat supplied that supply the flannanars lighthouse didn't actually leave until the 26th of december 1900 at this point the light had not been officially seen since the 12th when they eventually made it to the small islands a sense of foreboding came over the party okay it's probably the mist or maybe it's ghosts there was no flag flying oh maybe it's there's the, not a flag flying uh which was usual when the relief boat came there were no empty supply boxes ready to be restocked there were no men waiting to greet them obviously worried the captain of the hesperus blew the horn and fired some rockets into the air but received no reply joseph moore headed for the lighthouse noting that the main entrance gate and two doors leading into the lighthouse were closed inside he found a cold fire and neatly made beds checking the light room itself he noted in a letter to the northern lighthouse board dated the 28th of december everything was in proper order the lamp was cleaned the fountain full blinds on the windows etc so there didn't appear to be anything wrong with the light indeed it was left in good condition with all procedures having been followed it just simply wasn't on moore lit the lamp and the next day he and the crew of the hesperus continued searching the island moore wrote the following day we traversed the island from end to end but still nothing to be seen to convince us how it happened he noted that the east landing seemed all in order with no indication that anything untoward had happened there the west landing however was a mess with the box for holding ropes and tackle missing and some of the iron railings broken he also mentioned that marshall and dark at sea boots and waterproofs were missing from the lighthouse meaning that they had been wearing them macarthur didn't have such good kip just being an occasional lighthouse keeper but his wearing coat as it was called creatively named was still in the lighthouse moore wrote donald macarthur has his wearing coat left behind him which shows as far as i know that he went out in shirt sleeves he never used any other coat on previous occasions only the one i am referring to a telegram was sent to the northern lighthouse board nlb by the captain of the hesperus on the day they reached the island and found it mysteriously abandoned it's quite short so here it is in full a dreadful accident has happened at flannan's the three keepers darkett marshall and the occasional have disappeared from the island on our arrival there this afternoon no sign of life was to be seen on the island fired a rocket but as no response was made managed to land more who went up to the station but found no keepers there the clocks were stopped and other signs indicated that the accident must have happened about a week ago poor fellows they must have been they must have been blown over the cliffs or drowned trying to secure a crane or something like that night coming on we could not wait to make something as to their fate oh my god reading the past is so hard why did people write so weird back then it's like does that even make sense <laughs> i'm like did i misread that it's like no 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 it's just the weird past writing i have left more mcdonald boymaster and two seamen on the island to keep the lights burning until you make other arrangements will not return to oban until i hear from you i have repeated this wire to moorhead in case you are not home i will remain at the telegraph office tonight until it closes if you wish to wire me as you can see everyone assumed the keepers were killed due to bad weather yeah that makes sense i mean there's lots of bad weather on the island they were all outside where or well, two of them were wearing that waterproof stuff so it makes sense while they're outside yeah they could have got blown away or like washed away or something that seems pretty likely maybe they were down at their place where there was mess and whoosh, a big wave comes and takes them away i don't know how the other maybe the other guy was down there as well maybe they he went out to get them in like a hurry and then he also got washed away i mean i don't want to i don't want to say we've already decoded the unknown but it doesn't seem like there's a whole lot of unknown to decode here i'm assuming there's more of a mystery or something as we'll discuss later however it's not really as clear-cut as that oh there you go <laughs> again why don't you just read these ahead whistle boy and you'll know everything that kind of takes the fun of it away for me to be honest if you remember the nlb superintendent isn't nlb also that 
uh, basketball or baseball league it's the nlb superintendent sounds like some guy who runs baseball robert moorhead who had taken had, blah, who had his picture taken with the vanished men at the beginning of their rotation he arrived on flannan's on the 29th of december to make the official report moorhead saw that there were entries on the lighthouse slate dated the 15th of december keepers would make notes on the slate and then transfer them to the official logbook a little while later these noted that the normal maintenance work had been carried out for the 15th coupled with the fact that the kitchen was tidied up and had concluded that the accident had happened on the afternoon of the 15th of december checking out the landing platforms he also noted that nothing seemed amiss at the east landing including that a box used to ha- hold ropes that was housed 110 feet or 33.5 meters above sea level had been washed away that is a massive wave i remember making a video about rogue waves you know those random rogue waves and i believe the highest ever recorded is 20 meters and that was kind of regarded as the like the maximum height that a wave could reach so how could something 33.5 meters high get washed away or maybe it was blown and then washed away or maybe it was ghosts well let's see let's see i mean i'm really leaning towards ghosts right now it was definitely <laughs> Ah. he also noted that a large stone weighing over 2200 pounds or over a ton had been dislodged from its position higher up and carried down to and left on the concrete path leading from the terminus of the tramway to the top of the steps he also saw that an emergency life boy was missing because the ropes had the, because the ropes used to fasten it hadn't actually been untied it seems that the boy had just been ripped off the railings by the sea moorhead's conclusion were event, of events was thus after a careful examination of the place the railings ropes etc and weighing all the evidence which i could secure i am of opinion that the most likely explanation of the disappearance of the men is that they had all gone down on the afternoon of saturday 15th december to the proximity of the west landing to secure the box with the mooring ropes etc and that an unexpectedly large roller had come up on the island and a large body of water going up higher than where they were and coming down upon them had swept them away with resistless force yeah it sounds like this guy decoded the unknown super quickly as well this sounds like a really obvious answer to to what went on here yeah there's a massive stone but also water is really powerful it moves massive stones all the time doesn't it i have considered and discussed the possibility of the men being blown away by the winds but as the wind was westerly i am of the opinion notwithstanding its great force that the more probable explanation is that they have been washed away as had the wind caught them it would from its direction have blown them up the islands and i feel certain they would have managed to throw themselves down before they reached the summit or the brow of the island yeah it makes sense it was a big ass wave so on the face of it there doesn't seem to be much of a mystery at all the keepers went down to the west landing tidy some up some stuff up got hit by a wave and unfortunately were all washed away but you see there are enough questions about the weather the procedures and the men themselves that have cast dis- cast the disappearance of the three light keepers firmly into the realm of the unknown so let's decode okay good i have to say i i did kind of know there was a bigger mystery here because if that was the bigger mystery i'd be like yo katie you know this channel's called decoding the unknown right not stating the bloody obvious <laughs> which i which I, I don't have to do and also there's a weighty amount of script left for me to get through so let's crack on theories and sticking points first of all let's just revisit that gamekeeper with the telescope roderick mckenzie if the lighthouse had been dark since at least the 15th of december why didn't he let anyone know as previously mentioned it wasn't uncommon for the lighthouse and its light itself to be hidden from the mainland for a day or sometimes several days at a time for example according to mckenzie he had seen the light on the 7th of december but not again until the 12th so he wouldn't have been worried straight away also the new rotation of keepers was due to go out on the 20th of december anyway so even if he had raised concerns everyone would have assumed that there was something technically wrong with the light which they'd sought out out on the 20th not that every man on the island was gone unfortunately due to poor weather conditions the relief ship did not set sail until six days later on the 26th of december by this time it was too late to help the keepers but it seems that even if they had known they were in trouble they still wouldn't have been able to safely mount a rescue much earlier mackenzie was getting antsy though and they had asked other people to see if they could have better luck at spotting the light from the flannan isles in his report moorhead admits that even if a trained lighthouse keeper had been on the lookout and might have reported the light being out much earlier it still wouldn't have prevented the occurrence that led to the men vanishing and presumably dying no but is anyone trying to prevent that like 
the light the, the light is out we can assume that there was at least i'm assuming i don't think unreasonably that there was a big wave it came and swept them away and then the the lighthouse was wait it did run out of fuel though so they must have turned it off which is weird but maybe they did for some reason and then they got washed away it's like no it doesn't matter how fast you mount the rescue they've still been washed away at least in terms of saving their lives but in terms of like ships being wrecked on rocks it seems like pretty urgent to get that fixed like there was that guy on that ship who was they came into port it was like nah i didn't don't even mention it what was your ship totally destroyed because the lighthouse wasn't working the not very likely theories all right let's get into some of the theories surrounding the disappearance as stated in the beginning of the piece the area of the flannan isles was home to many a superstitious and ghostly tale so let's tackle this bit head on and put simon out of his misery thank you for being so considerate katie there were rumors that when joseph moore the relief light keeper stepped onto the flannan isles from the hesperus three very large black birds took flight from the rocks and disappeared spooky as that sounds there's absolutely no evidence that this happened <laughs> it's surprising moore didn't mention it in his report and it seems to be one of those retroactively added sprinkles of intrigue that in reality never occurred would have been cool if it had though <laughs> other supposed facts facts in quotation marks about the case added later and mixed into the history was that the lighthouse logbook contained entries mentioning storms and conditions so bad that the men were crying and praying to god again these were not real moore had looked at the logbook and the daily slate entries and they made no mention of any of the men crying or having misgivings about the weather in his report if you like the slate's just some super technical thing about like weather three-fifths cloudy and uh lighthouse in good working order weather is uh tardy for the worst had a good cry <laughs> signed lighthouse keeper john all that was noted according to him at least was the routine stuff that they'd do day to day also these men were seasoned light keepers well used to being holed up while some bad storms crashed all around them <laughs> there'd be no reason for them to stud- suddenly start cracking sea monsters and giant birds have also been given as the perpetrators in the disappearance of the three men but come on when aren't they as usual it was the loch ness monster this is scotland after all as per usual the thought of a huge sea serpent or heck the loch ness monster why not <laughs> i can't believe that's actually a theory grabbing the men off the platform is exciting but as no reliable or truly credible sightings of said monster have been seen before or since i think we can leave that one on the no pile katie we should definitely cover the loch ness monster because i made a video about it before like a short one for one of my other channels but i'd love to i'd love to write about it love to read about it more and make more fun of it because it's such obvious bullshit. that'll be great there is also one very large sticking point that seems to put a hole in most of these theories it was an ironclad regulation that at least one person had to be in the lighthouse at all times so how come all three men disappeared did they do it all at once or maybe over a series of hours or even days sure you can maybe imagine a scenario where two men are outside and get into difficulty so the third rushes out to help them but as we'll discover it's not quite so obvious as all that let's look at some of the other theories before diving into that one yeah okay so if there's a regulation it's gonna be like oh my god my friends are actually dying the regulations i'm out let's go and save your friends but i guess there's a reason why that isn't a reason abduction Ooh. really for what reason for what purpose nah we're gonna abduct them so more ships crash ah that's gonna be a great laugh we're gonna abduct them for money i'm not sure but i don't imagine that lighthouse keepers are, are super rich a weird but slightly plausible idea is that of abduction no not the alien kind a teeny rock in the middle of the ocean with three life arms on it probably wouldn't catch a passing spaceship's attention our whole planet wouldn't catch a passing spaceship's attention if a spaceship is passing our planet there's nothing here for them we are we're like you're on a walk in the forest and there's an ant hill. that's it you look at the ant hill, you're like mm, ants and then you move on because that's how you know that's how aliens would view us because they've got a spaceship we've got I mean we've got spaceships but they're kind of a joke we're talking spies or pirates here maybe a shipload of swashbuckling scurvy dogs or a stealthy boat of sinister agents rocked up one night and forced the keepers to leave the island against their will 
I guess it's within the realms of possibility. However, remember that they were on an island in the Atlantic specifically to prevent ships from getting wrecked, so rocking up would be right. There was a high probability of hitting something. There's not so much chance that a boat would be able to get near enough to the island without knowing the area and if the light was working as it should have been before the 15th, the keepers would have spotted them hours before. If it did seem like there were Neodo wells approaching, they could have barricaded themselves in the lighthouse or something. Also, while they might know a bit about the weather conditions around the Hebridean coast, your average lightkeeper probably wasn't going to be the key to helping you with an invasion or make much of a hostage. As we've already established, it took 11 days from the men disappearing for anyone to realize they're gone. In the times before quick communication, they'd be pretty useless as hostages. So let's move on. If this is reminding you of that other famous maritime disappearance of the people on the Mary Celeste, well, you're correct. Both cases were also reintroduced into the public consciousness years after when people wrote fictionalized accounts of the events. With the Mary Celeste, it was Sir Arthur Conan Doyle writing a first-hand account of a survivor of the similarly named Marie Celeste. Elements from this made-up story entered the collective memory to the extent that people still refer to the real ship as Marie Celeste instead of Mary Celeste. The same thing happens with the missing lightkeepers on the Flannans. In 1912, a poem written by Wilfred Wilson Gibson, boringly called Flannan Isle, <laughs> described the event from the point of view of the men on the relief vessel getting to the island on the 26th of December. He describes the three large black birds and all also, that they were un- there was an untouched meal on the table. <laughs> Guys, this was the way. This was maybe before the Mary Celeste, though. Was the the Conan Doyle one was written? But it's the same boring tropes. He also mentions how all previous lightkeepers there had met a sticky end or gone mad. None of these things were true, but the detail about the meal being on the table especially stuck in people's minds. Another eerie but explainable fact to the story is that when the men from the Hesperus entered the lighthouse, it was noted that all the clocks had stopped. This is not a chilling pointer to the time of their deaths, however, just a sad indicator that they've been gone for a while as the clocks needed regular winding to work. Yeah, I almost commented earlier in today's video when I was like, um that the uh, the clocks had stopped which is oh that's a bit weird did the water come in there it's like no 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 they were just old clocks they need winding like every few days because they're old if they'd all wound down it meant that the men had been gone for at least a week or they need winding at least every week murder so what other things could have happened to cause three men to vanish. Well, let's just go back a bit, and despite my poo-pooing of it, reference the poem again. Gibson wrote, And how the rock had been the death of many a likely lad, how six had come to a sudden end, and three had gone stark mad. This is a working theory in some quarters, that one or more of the men had basically cracked from the pressure of so of living so far from their real homes in such claustrophobic and demanding conditions, and had either killed the other two men or had tried to kill himself, had been restrained, but unfortunately everyone had ended up falling to their death. So, is this credible? Well, yeah. I mean, sure. There's no bodies or anything, so it's really hard to prove. Maybe it happened. It doesn't seem like the most likely explanation, but... I'll give this one a bit of credit. Maybe they looked into it. Maybe we'll find out more. Oh, yeah, sure. Being a lighthouse keeper isn't for everyone. Yes, there were two other people living with you, but what if they were the world's loudest chewers or had some sort of gastrointestinal troubles? <laughs> if you fart again, John, I'm going to murder you and throw you off a cliff. <laughs> a little bit of an intense reaction. Petty issues can become major flashpoints when you're living in close proximity for extended periods of time. And it's not like people were being psychologically vetted for roles like this. In fact, Donald MacArthur, the occasional lighthouse keeper who was there as a replacement, was an ex-soldier and had a reputation as being somewhat of a hothead. Add to that that he had come almost directly from another shift somewhere else, and you've got someone who'd been working without a break in bleak conditions for a couple of months straight. Yeah, that does sound pretty tough. But also, there's a lot, there's a big difference between like, oh, work is really hard, to let's murder these two guys because, well, it won't make absolutely any difference and then kill myself. I mean, sometimes work is hard and I go home and it's not like, I'm not murderous. I'm just like, oh, let's have a beer. <laughs> Add into that the rumor, although it's quite a strong one, that he was a drinker and the drink was not allowed on the premises of the lighthouse, and you've got an individual who would be irritable, to say the very least. Well, uh, I have to say, maybe if there's the lighthouse keepers in the middle of nowhere, they should be allowed a few beers at the end of the day, because, I don't know, probably helps you unwind, doesn't it? <laughs> like, what are you doing? Well, we're stuck on this island, and uh, the food's terrible, and there's no beer. 
it's like that simpsons episode where uh he goes to the shining hotel or whatever I, is it a simpsons episode where there's no beer and he goes crazy Johnny! Oh! no tv and beer and there was definitely no tv this was like the early 20th century sounds pretty rough to be honest but not rough enough to become murderous so did he just snap and kill one or both of the other two and then in a fit of remorse throw himself over the cliffs or maybe they were all arguing or struggling way too near to the edge and they all fell to their dooms it could also be possible that one or more of the keepers was affected by mercury keith mccloskey who researched this mystery thoroughly and wrote a book called the lighthouse also posits that the mercury that the lenses floated in could have adversely affected one of the one or more of the keepers and led them to behave in a strange way wait there's lenses floating in mercury in the lighthouse is that how they used to do it that's weird okay this could have then escalated into a situation outside where strong winds could have blown them all over that is it's a bit of a stretch though isn't it it's like they're having a fight or an argument inside it's like hey you know we should have this fight outside i mean that seems reasonable outside by the edge of a cliff that seems less reasonable it's theories like this that can never be proven one way or the other like i said but there are instances even in the more recent past where people isolated in lighthouses have committed murders so it's not something that we can strike off completely i mean it just seems less likely than being swept away by the weather doesn't it and just because the lighthouse some murders have occurred in lighthouses it's like well yeah some murders have occurred everywhere there's murders all the time it doesn't mean that necessarily lighthouse keepers are murderers it also seems to be the general consensus that if anyone was going to go on a killing rampage it would have been macarthur as no bodies were ever found though any evidence of foul play has long since vanished too According to Archie McEachum, who later worked on the uh, who later worked on the lighthouse, the men disappeared in the line of duty trying to help save a ship in trouble. He suggested that a ship was spotted from the lighthouse and all the keepers rushed out and in the process of throwing ropes to aid the stricken vessel were themselves washed away. Yeah, but is there any record of a stricken vessel? The wreck of a Norwegian ship was apparently found. Just read the script, fact boy. The wreck of a Norwegian vessel was apparently found not long after the disappearance, but it does beg the question as to why all three men left the lighthouse when protocol dictated that one should remain inside at all times, especially when the light would be crucial in a situation such as this. Well, again, the same argument can be made. Well, they saw their mates in trouble, so they went out to help. Screw the law and how long does it take to put a coat on surely macarthur would have had time to throw it over his shoulders knowing that they were heading down to the landing in bad conditions if they did perish in the line of duty it was all for naught as if they did manage to save a ship it would have been it would have reported the incident once it made it to port the weather by far the most popular theory in the disappearance of Duckett, marshall and macarthur is that the two men were, is that two men were working on the west landing when a freak wave yes knocked both of them out into the sea this makes perfect sense the third man in the lighthouse generally agreed to be macarthur as his coat was left on the peg inside rushed out to help and ended up meeting the same fate this just seems like the most obvious easy answer this is what the superintendent robert moore had deduced must have happened in his report to the northern lighthouse board but there are some very big questions about this version of events the first issue is the report itself it's the only one there is so that's all the information anyone had to work with the matter was also considered closed shortly after with no fatal accident report having been carried out which would normally have been done in such circumstances the log books were never taken into evidence or just disappeared along the way leaving very little official documentation about anything relating to the disappearances this doesn't sound like a conspiracy or trying to hide anything it was just like there was an accident people were lazy they lost the records some people have suspected that this was a cover-up of some kind but covering up what or why I have no idea so let's talk about that wave now the box that held some ropes on the west landing was according to moorhead around 110 feet or 30 meters above sea level if a wave had reached that high up the island it would have been one of the largest ever anywhere in the world yeah i mean i think that was what i was saying about those rogue waves right the largest one ever recorded was like 20 meters i have a feeling maybe they would get up to 30 but it was like unbelievably rare if not just impossible 
I guess it could have been lower and the spray was scattered higher, making the concrete steps fatally slippery. But seriously, a hundred foot waves do not come along every day. And if we are to believe that, say, one man got swept away, the other man had to hot foot it back at least 160 slippery concrete steps and that steps and then run all the way across the island to his boots and heavy coat to alert the third light keeper. This would have taken a considerable amount of time. The third man apparently dropped everything and just sprinted out with his colleague back down at the landing, where, what, another freak wave occurred at exactly the same time they got there? This is not sounding likely to me. Ah, I have to say, during this whole thing, I guess I'm totally wrong, was that the lighthouse person who stayed in the lighthouse was able to see the, the west landing spot and could see his friends in trouble or hear them or something. But yeah, that does seem unlikely. So why would he head down there if he didn't know they were in trouble? Maybe they were like, we'll be back in 10 minutes. If we don't come back, come get us. But then that would be breaking the rules. I'm more like he'd break that rule if he saw his friends drowning. But he wouldn't do it if it was just like, ah, they've been a while. They'd be like, well, I'm just gonna have to wait because that's the rules. Maybe they attempted a rescue operation by throwing down ropes and just slipped in themselves or something. Honestly, one monster wave hitting the island I can cope with. But the chances of two enormous waves hitting the island twice in a short period of time are tiny. The logbook did not mention that there was a huge storm in the area either, and while there was a storm potentially large enough to have caused the damage at the West Landing, it did not happen until two days later on the 17th of December. Also, none of the bodies ever washed up, although given the long time it was between them disappearing and the relief boat coming, they may have floated out to sea. I have a theory. I have a theory. The guy in the lighthouse, right, the one who's remaining, he's watching because his mates have gone down to that uh, landing area, and... A 30 meter wave, you're gonna notice. <laughs> that is absolutely massive. So he's hanging out in the lighthouse and he sees this 30 meter wave coming towards the island. Smashes the island. The two guys are washed out to sea. Those guys are gone. He's like, oh shit, I gotta get down there. He looks out, there's no more waves coming, you know, no 30 meter waves. He goes down there and he climbs right down. And he's like, ah, oh, my friends are gone. And then a smaller but still large wave comes along and sweeps him out to sea as well. Mystery solved. Simon, you big brain. Maybe. Allegedly. Theory. There are other things that come across as weird about the whole situation, assuming it went down on the West Landing as Moorhead reported. Number one, why was anybody on the West Landing at all? According to the notes they'd made that day, all the usual lamp preparations, etc. had been done, so nothing urgent needed doing. It was December in Scotland, the sun sets at 4pm. That time of year, god that's early. Winter sucks. So lighthouses do all their chores during the day and rest up and do indoor stuff in the evening. There's no way that a seasoned lighthouse keeper like James Darkett would start some big maintenance project on some slippery concrete steps at 2 or 3 p.m., knowing that he only had an hour or so of decent daylight left. Basically, there was no reason for anyone to be outside in bad weather at that time, eh, unless something urgent came up that they did need to take care of. Could have been something. We don't know what it is, though. Number two, Moorhead stated in the report that, repl- that the prevailing winds were westerly. If that was the case, then then why were they on the exposed west landing? There were two landings available on the island, and the other was on the more sheltered east side, which had no reported damage. If they were expecting the relief boat on the 20th, it could have just been that they used the east landing. Therefore, again, there was no need to clear anything from the west landing, especially five days before the relief boat was due. I I just, again, I was just assuming maybe they had some stuff stored down there from the previous relief boat, something they needed. I mean, there's obviously a reason they went down there, and I'm sure it was dull. It wasn't like some mysterious, they had to go down there for some reason. Number three, as I previously stated, it's a long way from the landing to the lighthouse. MacArthur would not have been able to see what was going down at the landing, so it's unlikely he would have bolted outside without putting a coat on. Also, he had to stay in the lighthouse as per procedure, so he probably wouldn't have it left have left it unless notified by one of the other keepers. And again, it's such a long way from the landing to the lighthouse that he might as well have put a coat on, seeing as how much time would have already have passed. The outer and inner doors being closed when the relief boat finally made it may not mean anything as it's possible that they could have been banged shut by the wind at some later point. Okay, you totally agree with that last statement. And also, maybe he was rushing down there. Maybe the wave hadn't even hit yet, because it was still light, maybe. So uh, he could have seen this giant 30-meter wave coming and being like, oh my god, i got to get down there now to tell my friends that it's coming. In the meantime, it hits. They get washed out to sea. He goes down to blah, blah, blah. Pans out, like I said. I think it's a good theory. 
It's been mentioned that one of the keepers had previously been fined for losing supplies in a storm and that maybe they were securing some ropes on the west landing to avoid being fined again. Again, no one was coming for at least five more days, and I'm no expert in lighthouse keeping tasks, but I think there'd be enough time left during another day to do that rather than suddenly deciding to do it in the middle of bad weather with the light fading. If that is the reason the men were outside, it's a terribly sad outcome for a seemingly unplanned, reckless bit of behavior. The rope were still there after all with the storage box being smashed to pieces number five the author keith mccloskey has done research into recreating the weather at the time of the disappearance and the conclusions were that the weather was getting increasingly bad on the day of the 15th of december as the day of the 15th of december wore on making it even less likely that the men had thought nipping down to the west landing would be a good idea also as previously mentioned from what we know of the logbook and the reconstructed weather patterns there was a big storm that could have caused the damage to the west landing but it happened on the 17th of december two days after the keepers vanished so what might have washed them away two days before their deaths a rogue wave i made a video about rogue waves they're real things people didn't think they were for a long time which is probably why none of the initial reports would think about this they thought that people just didn't think they were real but now we know they're real because we have i don't know satellites or whatever detecting them i don't remember the specifics it seems that there could be another culprit where weather is concerned, and that's the winds. Maybe Darkett and Marshall were outside doing something by the lighthouse and just got blown over the cliff. MacArthur maybe did see them and rushed out to help, falling victim to the same treacherous gusts. It is a fact that winds around the Flannanals and the lighthouse itself can easily be strong enough to knock people down and even lift them off their feet. Oh my god, that is windy. So for my money, this seems to be the most likely explanation for how the three disappeared, even if Moorhead thought it unlikely. Sad though it is, it's probably that the force of nature just caught them out. Yeah, agreed. That's even more likely than my rogue wave theory. They just got blown, literally blown away. That's sad. And also not mysterious. Aftermath. Joseph Moore, who was due to relieve one of the keepers and was the first man on the island after their disappearance, was badly affected by the whole affair. Moore had said in his report, if this nervous nervousness does not leave more he will require to be transferred but i'm reluctant to recommend this as i would desire to have one man at least who knows the work of the station so poor joseph moore had to keep working in the place where three of his friends and colleagues had just vanished and presumably died he was plagued by the tragedy and felt a huge psychological burden for the rest of his life also remember the Arcta, the ship that may or may not have reported the light being out it disappeared in the north atlantic in 1912 presumably sinking with all hands lost in 1904, a new lightkeeper on the island called John McLachlan fell from the lighthouse tower while cleaning the glass, making a total of four keeper deaths in four years. William Ross, who was supposed to be on rotation at that time but was replaced by Donald MacArthur, dropped dead the year following the disappearances in another Hebridean lighthouse. The fact that the bodies of Duckett, Marshall, and MacArthur were never found adds the mystery and general spooky feeling around the islands, and nowadays we can only speculate as to what really happened. As for the lighthouse at Alamore itself, it was automated in 1971, meaning that nobody has to stay on the island ever again. I bet it's super spooky out there, because I bet there's all that old shit. They didn't like take it all away in the landings and stuff. I bet it's creepy. I'd kind of like to go. Anyway, this has been an episode of Decoding the Unknown. Thank you so much for watching it or listening to it, depending on how you consume this show. It's uh, available on YouTube, also as a podcast if you uh, prefer to get it that way. Whatever you like, really. If you're uh, watching on YouTube, please like, please subscribe. If you're listening as a podcast, make sure that you uh, leave me a review. Make sure you're subscribed. All of that good stuff. And I'll be back with another episode real soon. Thanks. Ah, oh, welcome, welcome, welcome. It's another episode of Decoding the Unknown. That show on YouTube where people like Simon just started this channel, this podcast, because he wants that supernatural money. If that's the case, I've made a huge mistake, because mostly what we do on this channel is uh, we look at the supernatural and be like, well, that is clearly a load of nonsense. Little bit of inside baseball on this channel, which is an American phrase that I love, by the way. It means like, uh, talk within the only people who within the organization or group get. And a uh, little bit of inside baseball. Originally, I was going to call this channel like, skeptic something, skeptic that. But then I decided that would turn too many people off because skeptic such a negative word. 
Uh, so we went into coding the unknown, which on the face of things makes it sound like this, you know. I mean, decoding the unknown means like, let's look into what's really going on. So that was the thoughts behind it. Why are we talking about this? Is it completely irrelevant? Uh, this is decoding the unknown. What we're doing here is we're looking at the Sydney quarantine station. Something a little bit different today. Uh, David is the author of this script rather than our regular Katie. Katie will be. I've actually got another one from Katie right here, which uh, I'll be recording probably tomorrow actually probably tomorrow and uh so david is guest authoring today david has done stuff with casual criminalists before he and i are also working on a secret project which will be launching in early 2022 i hope fingers crossed and uh he was like can i write something for decoding the unknown and it'll be a little bit weird and i was like david you're great just go ahead just write it for me and uh, so this is well he's described it as slightly unorthodox it's sort of a first-hand account of his experience and i'm like that sounds like something that i'd never done before sounds like honestly something i'd never do but david go for it man (laughs) have fun and we'll just see how it goes because you know decoding the unknowns and you there's not that many episodes yet and uh if there's ever a time to experiment it's with a channel that not very many people watch so let's just jump into it drunken ghost hunter city quarantine station thank you david b david baker davy b for putting this together let's go today's episode of decoding the unknown oh by the way i'm simon hello <laughs> i i some i sometimes forget to introduce myself it's slightly unorthodox it's a first hand account of a paranormal investigation conducted by two of the world's most unlikely investigators david and alexandra while staggering around one of the world's most haunted sites. Simon quite charitably has allowed me to write up the legendary story of our brave and intrepid efforts for you. Our loyal, faithful, kind, intelligent, and may I say, rather handsome audience. Be warned, however, Zach Bagans, we ain't. Who's Zach Bagans? (laughs) Oh no, it's like with Danny on Brain Blaze. He has so many cultural references that I just don't get. And David isn't even English, so I'm, he's, I'm sure he's got all these Australian cultural references about barbies and shrimps and thongs, which is what Australians call flip-flops, which always shook me. Um, the target also, what... Does anyone else have this problem? I know, I'm sorry, we're on like 700 tangents already this episode. But does anyone else have this problem where your printer just decides that 93% is the correct format to print a script. So this was all size 11 Calibri, which I love. That's like the perfect reading size and font. But it's made it in like 93% of the maximum, which I just don't understand. And now it's all too small, but I'm not going to print out like another 400 pages of stuff in the right size. The target, Sydney Quarantine Station, widely known as the most haunted place in Australia, mate. The challenge accepted sydney's infamous quarantine station operated for 152 years from 1832 to 1984 whoa during that time it was used to lock up over 13,000 travelers suspected of carrying disease into the country in the days of sale it sounds like they brought it need to bring it back <laughs> is that we're bringing back the quarantine station for covid 1832 to 1984 2019 to well seemingly f-ing indefinite covid what the f- <laughs> In the days of sail and steamboat travel, the idea was to prevent shipborne illnesses from entering Australia by holding any infected ships and their passengers in an isolated location until the disease could run its course. This seems remarkably forward thinking for like 1832. It's kind of depressing that that's the same sh** we're up to nearly 200 years later. I mean, plus vaccines and treatments and all of that stuff and way less horrible deaths. But it's like, if someone said like in 200 years, Will we still have disease and stuff? I'll be like, nah, 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 we'll have banged that nail on the head easy. We'll be well done with that by then. No worries. Might. I'm going to stop with my bad Australian accent. I'm sorry, David, and all Australians listening. As a result, an estimated 570 to 581 people died horrible deaths there, riddled by everything from smallpox to cholera to tuberculosis to typhoid to bubonic plague to the Spanish flu to, oh my god, that's a lot of diseases. But it's kind of amazing that only 570 people died there. That seems really low for some place. That's like a three people a year or something. Three and a bit. That's not bad. With over 500 people dying agonizing deaths in the isolated wilderness in a strange new land surrounded by the sick beds of others, also moaning and crying helplessly in pain, it's no wonder that dozens of spirits felt compelled to stalk the grounds 
for all eternity. Sounds real. The quarantine station is located just off the entrance to Sydney Harbour in an area that is still heavily forested and separated by bushland from the residential dwellings and businesses of the nearby holiday suburb of Manly. The manliest place ever. Uh, the station is composed. This is a terrible joke. I'm so sorry. The station is composed of a small number of buildings, all of which are chock full to bursting with ghosts. Oh my! Oh, they're not though. If you tried to escape the compound, you'd face the ocean on one side and high cliffs on the other. And if you tried to make your way into Manly, a couple of kilometers of dense forest made impassable by thick brush filled with poisonous brown snakes and redback spiders confronted you. Australia, you're the worst. <laughs> like. Australia seems like, you know, really nice, like, chill. They all drink Fosters, have a good time, chill out on the beach. They do surfing. There's that big reef where people go diving. Sounds like great. It's super great, except every animal there seems to just want to destroy your body. Many of the grave sites of the dead were knocked over as the years went by and new buildings were callously erected over the top of them and around them. Auxiliary graveyards still sit atop the cliffs of North Head, peering out into Sydney Harbour. The headstones are faded and chipped. The graves are overgrown with brush and signs are posted warning you of snakes should you decide to walk inside. Personally, I've never seen anything up there beyond a cute little et, etch, et, Echidna? Waddling around, digging for bugs. This must be some... Australia's like this alien land to me. It's like, you got animals that I've never heard of. Plants just from my dreams. With all those graves, with all that suffering, countless reports of paranormal activity, sometimes quite violent and troubling, have been made over the years. The Ghost Hunters I first heard about the quarantine station years ago. When I heard about the title, Most Haunted Place in Australia, this immediately presented itself to me as a challenge. I wonder if, uh, so far, I, I get the feeling, just from my email extra, I've never talked to David, I never talked to any of my writers. I don't know if, they, is that surprising to you guys? They all just send me scripts and I read them. Like, especially Danny, like on Brain Blaze. Our communication is almost 95% through scripts which is crazy and the same for david but with my brief email correspondence or not so brief email correspondence with david um i get the feeling he's probably a skeptical dude uh but i don't know he could be i mean he's obviously not going to persuade me that ghosts are real because even if i saw a ghost myself i would not believe it was real until like science or nature or one of those big prestigious peer-reviewed journals is like ghosts eh <laughs> turns out they're a thing then i'll be like nailed it cool the paranormal just became normal uh but i think david's probably skeptical he's not going to persuade me of anything and uh uh yeah yeah <laughs> this show this show sometimes it's like what is this show about it's a show about the paranormal hosted by someone who absolutely loathes that shit. why did i make this show i'm so confused anyway i'm the sort of skeptic who was ah there we go that occasionally enjoys watching ghost hunting shows and paranormal documentaries while shouting perfectly reasonable and rational explanations loudly and obnoxiously at the screen david preach it is just that uh what's that what i i, I it's more for me it's just like clips on youtube from like ghost hunters or whatever that sh show is called and it's like our readings are doing up this and there's and it's just like a bunch of jump scares and bull and i'm like oh, it's it's entertaining it's entertaining just like other fictional shows you know like every it's just fiction okay stop it whistle boy carry on for some reason the slag jawed yokels and credulous idiots who decide to humiliate themselves on television for a bit of attention never seem to listen to me neither do the hucksterish badly dressed hosts with weird haircuts who obviously don't believe any of this shit while they deliver cliched and corny lines over a spooky royalty free soundtrack unfortunately for my plans for years i had a girlfriend who kind of believed in ghosts and was too scared to ever go there with me i wasn't going to make her and so the matter rested for a time a few years later free and signal and ready to mingle with all manner of spooks and specters i decided to go and not just for a laugh i hatched an elaborate plan but more on that in a bit joining me was my friend and fellow ghost hunter alexandra who had been to the quarantine station before and had largely enjoyed herself like me she's a skeptic and she won't mind my saying that she is a somewhat cynical 
grumpy, no-nonsense sort of person who's more likely to kick a poltergeist in the balls and call it a f**kwit than to run away screaming. Alexandra, you sound like a legend. Yes! In fact, a veteran bushwalker, surfer, and spearfisher. Oh, what? <laughs> I'm not sure what a bushwalker is. Is that someone who just goes out for a walk in the bush? But I do know what a, a spearfisher. Is that someone who legitimately goes swimming around underwater with a spear? Australia, man. What is up with you? This is, I mean, I'm from the UK. Like, you try to go spearfishing in the you're looking around underwater. It's like, why is it so murky? I can't see shit. Like, no. Spearfishing sounds awesome. Oh my god, my parents have like a, a house by the beach. And uh, it's like by the beach in the UK. It's like nine months out of the year, it's freezing ass cold. And in the summer, it gets a little bit warm. And I remember as a kid, my dad would go out to swim in the sea. And I'd be like, dad, it's all rocky. There's seaweed. There's weird shit in there. I don't want to swim in there. It's so salty. And then in the evening, the tide would go out so, so far. It would be like, you can't swim when the tide's out because it's like a half hour walk to get to the bloody sea. <laughs> Oh, Australia, you land of beautiful oceans and spearfishing legends. She is ridiculously brave and brazen in the face of physical danger to the extent that it is difficult to tell who wears the, where's the pants in our ghost hunting partnership. Yo, 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 David, I hate to break it to you. But if anyone in, in any relationship is the, is, is f***ing spearfishing, mate, they're the ones wearing the pants. Uh, she's maybe a little rough around the edges and not very diplomatic, bless her. But that will come into play later. It should be said that both of us have received quite a considerable degree of academic and scientific training over the years, to a fairly experienced level. In yesteryear, we both conducted complex research involving disciplines as diverse as evolutionary biology, psychology, and a fair bit of physics. <laughs> Sounds like exactly the sort of people who will definitely not believe in ghosts. I, I don't have an education in any science. Um, and I feel like if I did, I'd be even more like, why are we even talking about this? <laughs> We weren't just curious of hooligans looking to laugh at some urban myths and popular superstitions. We had serious intentions. We had a plan. We're going to go into this with our eyes wide open, intending to deliver concrete results. There was even talk of publishing an academic journal. But nothing came of that. <laughs> David, are you slightly disappointed that your dreams of academic journal <laughs> turned out to be a strangely presented YouTube channel slash podcast several years later, read by a British fact boy? I mean, uh, it's kind of fun though, isn't it? This is more fun than an academic journal. The plan. The pseudoscientific theories surrounding ghosts and poltergeists are, unsurprisingly, somewhat of an incoherent mess, a jumble of half-baked ideas and explanations. But one thing most of them seem to have in common is that ghosts are supposed to exist on a plane of existence parallel to ours. They are held there by strong emotions, usually surrounding the circumstances of their death or the suffering they experienced in life. These ghosts supposedly manifest themselves in our reality via the electromagnetic spectrum of our quantum physics. Both versions of this explanation are pseudoscientific gibberish. Yes, it's like, do you understand what the electromagnetic spectrum is? Because it exists in our dimension, not in other parallel... T were they talking about dimensions? Uh, what was it? Different planes. The electromagnetic spectrum exists in this plane. Regular-ass reality as does quantum physics. Ghosts are leftover signatures of human energy, capable of both movement and a certain degree of consciousness. Why the brain chemistry and perpetual firing of hundreds of billions of synapses, which are required to make human emotions and thoughts exist, would physically survive decades after the brain has rotted away into putrid mush, has never been adequately explained. Now, and if it had, we'd be having a very different conversation, wouldn't we, David? <laughs> we'd be like, yeah, yeah, yeah. So in 1972, they explained how ghosts uh, exist. And we'll be like, oh, good. Okay. <laughs> Nevertheless, like vinegar mixing with baking soda, these spirit-based energy signatures are highly reactive to the presence of living humans, though no one has really cared to explain why. At least beyond the fact that they are people and we are people. The same species. I guess that's why we don't see more ghosts of woolly mammoths and saber-toothed tigers roaming about, or the ghosts of a cockroach we crushed last Tuesday. But ghosts have a profound impact on living people, and we in turn have a profound impact on them. Probably because they're figments of our f***ing imagination. <laughs> that wasn't me. That was David. <laughs> it's like, yeah, ghosts do have a profound impact on people's lives. It affects their lives doesn't mean they're real harry potter had a profound impact on my life it was a very interesting book that i read actually the impact wasn't that profound i'm sure there are better books that have a, pro a profound impact on my life 
Harry Potter is not one of them, but they exist. It doesn't mean they're real. I mean, obviously the book's real, but wizards, wizards aren't real. Some ghosts react to the living in benign and even pleasant ways. Other ghosts are a little creepy but largely indifferent to us. And some ghosts are quite malevolent, angry, and aggressive. Ghosts are also known to react differently to different people or to people with differing intentions. A ghost might calmly accept the presence of a human in one instance and may turn angry and foul to a person in another. It is on this generally vague chunk of theory that hinged our entire ghost hunting plan. We were simply playing by the rules of ghost hunters that we'd seen on television. And they could hardly all be wrong. <laughs> David, have you heard of the History Channel? I know it's sarcasm, but it's like, oh boy. Oh boy. History Channel, just because you made 11 seasons of Ancient Aliens. Is it called Ancient Aliens or Building the... Whatever that stupid show with the crazy hair guy is. Uh, doesn't just doesn't make it any more real. Our plan was twofold. Oh, by now, it's not gone live yet, but we did an episode of uh it, i mean it have gone live by the time you see this probably but i've already recorded an episode on did the, <laughs> did aliens build the pyramids it's the shortest one here was like 17 minutes because the answer was like obviously f-ing not spoiler alert our plan was twofold phase one go to the quarantine station on a ghost tour and deliberately try to provoke a negative emotional reaction from the ghosts we'd do exactly the opposite of what we thought the particular ghost in question would want and improvise the sort of thing the ghost in question would definitely not want if a ghost didn't want us to enter a certain room or stand in a certain part of it we'd barge right in <laughs> you're gonna be like going around with some guide and the guy's gonna be like these heads what the f- you're ruining the door for everybody like a legend if a ghost was angry about the manner in which he had died we'd laugh mock and tell him to get over it if a shadowy apparition appeared right in front of us we'd try to punch it in the face in short we'd brave like total jerks towards the spirit world and yes i know this sounds mean that was the point in order to augment this obnoxious behavior we'd get a little pissed up with dinner before we went <laughs> legends all in the service of provoking the most extreme supernatural phenomena no casper the friendly ghost or oh my god a door just moved and i felt a little cold <laughs> none of that pissy ass bull it was gonna be allowed here we wanted full-on demonic possession hellfire golems sadistic poltergeists flashes of the number 666 whisperings of get out upside down crucifixes chairs flying around and ceiling and blood pouring down the walls you know that kind of supernatural activity if you could handle it or if one of us died it would be in the name of science and the revolutionary breakthrough by definitively proving for the first time in history that yes ghosts and the afterlife exist such an earth-shattering revelation which would change humanity's outlook forever was surely worth one or two people dying for it especially if you find out there's an afterlife you'd be like oh okay totally worth it it's like you know that like you know most people don't i like the afterlife right no one's really sure i mean like people are like yeah yeah, god's real definitely believe in heaven gonna go to heaven and it's all right well if heaven's so great why haven't you killed yourself yet i know it's really dark to say and i don't want to be encouraging anyone to kill themselves obviously not because that would be insane but it's like if you're so a hundred (laughs) hundred percent evidence let's not go down this path of argument because it just sounds like i'm encouraging people to kill themselves which obviously i think is insane don't do that it's not real it's not real listen to that little bit of doubt in your mind hell it's not like we'd be losing much we'd probably wind up as ghosts if a ghost got angry and killed us while we were proving the existence of the afterlife we'd at least have the afterlife to go to exactly hence logically speaking win or lose we had nothing whatsoever to fear from the ghosts phase two after the initial ghost hunt we'd regroup list all the phenomena we encountered that night and make a list of plausibly sane hypotheses for what we'd experienced we'd then go back to the quarantine station again a few days or weeks later sober and during the daytime on a vanilla historical tour and science the shit out of it which i believe is the technical term there were just a couple of direly needed ground rules first we could never wander off alone human instincts particularly in dark and unfamiliar surroundings are more likely to set off alarm bells and start shooting adrenaline into our own system when we're alone than when we're when we're with other people we did not want to go the whole night imagining things were happening when really we were just startled by accidentally kicking an empty water bottle on the ground or seeing the shadow of a tree branch on a wall It is no good walking into a situation where your guide says you might experience a haunting with your mammalian instincts already on high alert. This was also the more practical reason for the booze. Ah, yes. Practical reasons for booze. (laughs) Any excuse, eh, David? Not criticizing. 
it's completely legit. A numbing effect to the natural creepiness of old buildings in the cloak of nightfall, and probably to numb a sense of growing frustration at some of the sheer bull we would likely to encounter on the tour. Two, we were not to announce our intentions to anyone. We were not to ruin the ghost tour for any other paying customers by either our statements or behavior. <laughs> When you like trying to punch ghosts in the face, though, it sounds like you're going to be ruining the tour for someone else. What are you doing? Trying to punch a ghost in the face. <laughs> are you drunk? No. We were not to harass the tour guide by peppering him with difficult questions or skeptical arguments. The poor bugger was just earning a wage. We were to keep it all to ourselves. And as an extension of that, we cannot do anything so obnoxious or horrible to antagonize a ghost that it would get us noticed and thrown off the tour or worse banned from ever returning to the quarantine station since obviously that would have the opposite effect than we intended and would ruin all of our efforts the only people we wanted to act like assholes toward were the ghosts and because we were pretty sure ghosts didn't exist at all our conscience was clear that in a nutshell was our plan phase one at this point in the show, I want to issue a disclaimer before we continue shitting on the existence of ghosts and delusional nonsense about the paranormal, primarily because I feel bad about what we did. The Sydney Quarantine sta- Station, now renamed Q Station, sounds like a Q Station makes it sound like something from a James Bond movie like Q, where he's making all his gadgets and shit, which sadly, not so much in the new James Bond movies. Like, I love the new James Bond movies, but the ones with Piers Brosnan, when he was like lasering shit with his watch and his car was invisible, I was like, yeah, it's ridiculous. But it's also cool. <laughs> After it was renovated, declared a heritage site, and turned into a hotel, is a lovely place. Oh, it became a hotel? Okay. It has a rich, vibrant history dating back to the earliest moments of the Australian nation. For example, many of the inmates of the quarantine station for a hundred years etched their names and the name of their ship into the sandstone cliffs near the entrance to the place. Each one of these etchings has its own fascinating story. Many of them are explored in an excellent book, Stories from the Sandstone, by Hobbins, Frederick, and Clark. They also don't give a damn about ghosts. Q Station also sits in a lovely sun-kissed spot away from the bustle of the city and there's a lot of good bushwalking swimming fishing and boating to be had it also is right next to the small gap of sydney harbour where 23 million years ago the ocean waters finally eroded their way through the sandstone cliffs and burst into the valleys that now form the basin of the harbour q station boasts stunning views of sydney a nice restaurant that even locals visit in a tea room where you can have high tea or a fancy gin cocktail david this sounds really awesome I feel like in a minute you're going to be like, don't forget to visit my website. It's my hotel. <laughs> no, but uh, this sounds really nice. I have spent many a happy afternoon there. Even the ghost tours are a spot of good fun, and they do a good job building up a spooky atmosphere, which never crosses the line into being utterly cheesy. This sounds great. Like, I don't believe in any of this stuff, as we already know. But I'd definitely do that, and I'd just hold my tongue and enjoy the tour, and then I'd go have a few gin cocktails. Maybe I'll do them before the tour. But I know, unlike David, I'll just be like, I'll have a couple of gin cocktails and I'll be like, yeah, 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 we could do that ghost tour. We could. We could. Or I could just continue sitting in this really comfortable chair and just looking out at the sea. (laughs) That sounds really good. That sounds really good. How about I just enjoy this moment of not working and a mild buzz from a cup of gin. That sounds brilliant. There, my guilty conscience is soothed. Now, on to kicking the veritable ectoplasm out of some ghosts. We took an Uber from Manly up the steep hill along the old military road to the gates of the quarantine station. The old sandstone archway at the camp greeted us. From here, our car could go no further. We sauntered over to a bench and waited for the next shuttle to take us down the hill to the station proper. Two other people were waiting there. A man looked at us and did a double take. A woman openly gaped. Since our tour was to take place in the evening, Alex and I decided to make an event out of it. We decided to have a fancy dinner down in the town first. As such, we were dressed to the nines. I was wearing a black three-piece suit with a red tie. (laughs) You're in a fancy-ass restaurant, David. Alex, very uncharacteristically for her, was in a red sequined evening dress. I remember feeling a little embarrassed. We were horribly overdressed. Everyone else we saw that evening was dressed in casual clothing. Yeah, as you would expect on a ghost tour. I'd be like... All right, I'm just going to take this tie off and slowly slide it into my inside pocket and hope that no one no, no, else no, no one notices the waistcoat, the jacket, the shiny shoes. <laughs> Alex has more problems. But there's no accounting for taste. We didn't want to squeeze every drop of enjoyment out of this particular stone. 
and after a few glasses of wine, we ceased to care. The shuttle took us to the bottom of the hill to Wharf Precinct, where the beach and docks were. Passengers for infected ships were dropped off here for their long isolation. We potted over to the restaurant, which is housed in the old boiler room. A brick building with giant imposing with a giant imposing smokestack. In days of plague, it fed steam into the sterilization chambers that killed off bacteria and viruses on people's luggage, and to the laundry room where people's clothes were similarly blasted clean. I feel like, you know, I'm always like the past was the worst. It's always good to be alive now because people just didn't understand like death and disease and stuff. And I'm like, this seems pretty advanced for like some 19th century, like steaming shit. It's like kind of impressive like that's kind of again why aren't we further ahead with this stuff i recently got a uv sterilizer because uh, i got two two young children and they have pacifiers dummies as we call them in the uk and uh, they got to go in this like steam thing it steams the shit out of them to make them like sterile and i was like there's got to be a better way to do this so there's uv ones which take like a minute you just put them in there there's no boiling water and stuff but it's amazing that we were steaming germs in the 19th century and we're still steaming germs in the 21st what's going on science <laughs> the boiler room was fully renovated into a two-story restaurant and we were led to a table on the second floor it was here that we experienced our first supernatural event i had tucked into an appetizer of scallops with a glass of prosecco followed by a hefty chunk of lamb washed down with liberal amounts of merlot alex says she had a portobello mushroom followed by a steak the room was filled with <laughs> i love how you're drinking prosecco and alex is having a steak after doing some spear fishing david are you still wondering about those trousers huh the room was filled with middle-aged holiday makers a bachelorette party and what looked like office pencil pushers at a corporate retreat at one point during our meal alex suddenly shivered and said don't shit yourself david but i just felt like someone touched the back of my f-ing neck <laughs> they turned around it was the waiter being a bit weird to be like what are you up to waiter! why do i always get the nuts as insignificant as this may seem many people at q station and in haunted places generally report the feeling of being touched by human hands on their legs back and neck just as well we start light with our decoding <laughs> the first thing to consider is front loading you already know you're in a place that contains ghosts the idea is already planted in your mind even if you don't believe in the damn things yeah okay i didn't know that was called front loading but this absolutely 100 percent makes sense because it's like i don't believe in ghosts i know there's no murderer in the attic but i'm still like if i'm alone and it's like 11 o'clock at night and it's fully dark and i'm just in the middle of nowhere i'm gonna be like oh boy oh boy i know ghosts aren't real and i know there's probably not murderers but what if they are and there are (laughs) if you were buying condoms in a drugstore and you felt something brush the back of your neck your thoughts would probably not be an immediate jump to ghosts but if you're already primed and ready to think in those terms your mind is more ready to play tricks on you again even if you do not believe in ghosts seconds it was evening the sun had gone down the temperature was dropping alex was sitting there in an evening dress with legs back and shoulder exposed furthermore in australia the ac is always left on too long and too cold in public buildings it's because australia is hot <laughs> and because australia is usually so warm we seem incapable of properly heating them some places are like living in a shed drafts from the restaurant doorway the circulation of cold air around the room could easily stimulate the hair follicles on the back of alex's neck yeah david you know what else could ghosts these hair follicles by the way which cover most of our sensitive areas of the human body are evolutionarily designed to pick up sensations that could potentially be dangerous like a spider malaria or mosquito or paralysis tick oh my god australia is the worst do you have malaria and par- paralysis ticks in australia and like the worst thing here there's that tick-borne encephalitis that disease that makes your brain a bit stupid if you get it badly that kind of stuff and i'm like man that's horrible so i got a vaccine against that and then there's the other one there's like two tick diseases and they're like there's no spiders there's nothing like that i'm just like okay and the ticks you they have to be in your body for like 48 hours so it's like if you're going out in the forest just make sure afterwards there's no ticks ticks on you and you're fine whereas in australia it's like i feel like i've been murdered but i've been murdered by like seven spiders if i go there i once was visiting my aunt lives out in atlanta and i just wake up one morning with a massive like eye like just one side of my face just above my eye is super swollen 
And I'm like, what the hell's going on? <laughs> and my aunt's like, ah, it was like a penny spider or a money spider or something. Mom was just like, yeah, it's normal. Don't worry about it. And I'm like, there's a, my eye is massively swollen. And she's like, it'll go down. And I'm like, this is the worst. I just imagine Australia's like South America, uh, Southern United States, like on steroids. I still want to go. It's really far. I'd still go. I've never been. Weird. So it's not such a massive stretch of the imagination to figure out that a wisp of cool air would stimulate the follicles on Alex's neck, leading her front-loading brain to amusingly think, what if it was actually a ghost? Did a creepy pervert die in the boiler room? When we returned to the boiler room restaurant a few weeks later during the day, me wearing my usual t-shirt and shorts and Alex in a tank top and leggings, both of us with plenty of exposed skin, we both noticed the exact same sensation from the AC, so next time you feel a ghost touching your neck, remember, it was probably just a spoonful of the Earth's atmosphere. Air exists. I promise you that. Dial M for Malo. Our ghost hunting then hit our first real obstacle. We had sat down for dinner at 6pm. Our ghost tour began at 9pm. We had three hours to wait. Within the first 90 minutes, we had worked our way through dinner and then slurped up whatever we had for dessert. Neither of us, for the life of us, can remember what we had. So, playing for time, generally enjoying the conversation and slow descent into madness, and with the object of being only slightly sourced for the actual tour, we shared a bit of wine. All told, we went through about two and a half bottles between us. Holy we hadn't put on we hadn't put too much of a dent in the third bottle thank god before it was nearly 9 p.m and time to go that's roughly 1000 milliliters and 9 to 10 standard drinks apiece to be clear both of us are quite thin and make for pretty cheap dates i shudder at what our blood alcohol content must have been thank god we had both eaten a heavy meal yeah i mean i mean i'm a drinker i drink i'm also pretty thin but after a bottle of wine i'll be pretty sloshed the volume of our table got louder, the use of expletives more frequent, grandiose claims and bullish self-confidence approached megalomaniacal levels, eyes bloodshot, our teeth were gradually more stained red with wine tannins as the evening progressed, oh my god, you guys are getting smashed. We swished with a bit of water to little avail, as Alex puts it, when your teeth start to match the colour of your lipstick, you should probably stop. <laughs> yes. We were thoroughly and utterly pissed, sozzled, squiffy, blottoed, couldn't find our ass with both hands, riding the pink ever elephant. That must be an Australian one, I've never heard that. Uh drunk as a hobo's fart. We had not yet lapsed into total incoherence, neither of us had pissed ourselves. <laughs> we were still I don't think I I've I I'm, I'm I don't, I don't think I need to be proud. I've never pissed myself when drunk. I've thrown up many times. I've even thrown up in my bed, but I have never wet myself <laughs> in bed or outside of it. Whereas I know some people, there's definitely, definitely friends of mine I've known who it's like, you're pretty drunk. Like, we'd get about the same level of drunk and they'd be like, yeah, I definitely wet myself. And I'll be like, not whistle boy. I just threw up in my bed. <laughs> I don't know. I'm not proud of this. I don't know why I'm saying this like it's a good thing. Don't drink. It's not good. I, I, I just don't. It's not worth it. We were still able, uh, we were still capable of maintaining some sense of sh social instinct and good decorum as we headed out of the door and marched toward the ticket area to wait for our tour to begin. Despite everything, the game was afoot. The Gas Chamber. Our tour group consisted of about 15 people. The tour guide, who professed an unshakable faith in the existence of ghosts, whether this was genuine or paid, was unknown. He led us down to the docks to begin the tour. I was already beginning to feel drowsy. A bad sign. Alex pulled on her jacket. Yeah, David, you're having that regret, you know. I don't, in this situation, I would never have gone on that ghost tour. I'd be like, yo, Alex, can we just go home? <laughs> Please, let's call an Uber. <laughs> I'm just, I don't want to anymore. Or can we just go to, let's have another bottle of wine. We're already f so let's just drink some more. Do we have to go on the ghost tour? They're not going to have booze on the ghost tour. And I'm probably going to start feeling a bit hungover halfway through. <laughs> it would never happen. The tour guide asked the group by show of hands who among us believed in ghosts. A few people put up their hands. The guides then asked who among us definitely did not believe in ghosts. Alex and I kept our hands firmly down by our sides. The guide had used a rather clever tactic. At the start of the tour, he'd take note of the easy marks among the crowds and also flag up the hardened skeptics who were likely to make his job difficult and give him a hard time. But Alex and I had no intention of giving the guide a hard time or spoiling the fun for anybody. We were on a secret mission for science. For glory 
While still on the docks, the guide mentioned the existence of two specters called the Lovers. A first-class passenger, Lady Margaret, who had an affair with a young Italian immigrant. Witnesses had seen them walking along the beach dressed in late 19th century garb arm in arm. What was more unusual is occasionally they were seen rising from the water itself. It should be mentioned, however, that the lighting on the docks is fairly dim on the water and on the beach it's almost non-existent. The water is generally black at night. I doubt you could even see a real human being swimming in it. Yeah, I, I don't know why I'm bringing this up right now, but water at night is scary. Like the sea is super black. And I've been swimming at night a few times in the sea. And it's always like, ah, oh, this is supposed to be romantic, but I'm just afraid. Can we go inside? I've had two bottles of wine. <laughs> I'm going to drown. Lighting was not particularly bright anywhere in the wharf district, probably intentionally. And remember that the entire quarantine station is a couple of kilometers from the bright lights of Manly. A shortage of artificial lighting surrounded by a stretch of dark, snake-infested forest. Essentially, a person could make out hazy shapes and see whatever they wanted to see. If they wanted to see a couple of amorous ghosts, they would see them. From there, we were led across the square towards a couple of run-down-looking sheds. The guide mentioned another spectre, a young girl aged around 14 or 15, who liked to run up to people and strangle them. People would have difficulty breathing and would later find red finger marks around their necks. Again front loading if you have already been told about a young teenage strangler you're more likely to get strangled by her second if you're susceptible to ghost nonsense you're more likely to be anxious to panic and to hyperventilate thus achieving a vague simulacrum sim simulacrum that word is always hard to say of choking finally i sincerely doubt anyone had clear hand marks on their necks i've seen those bruises in autopsy photos they are distinct and dark more likely you are willfully misconstruing harmless inflammation temporary discoloration clogged pores or a hickey your boyfriend gave you last night than the mark of another worldly land meanwhile in the back of the group alex muttered to me savagely if the little bitch tried that with me she'd be in for a punt in the <laughs> in the c word i don't like that swear word it's so savage like all my problems like f's and s's and d's but the c word always feels like so I, I think it's like maybe different in britain i don't know how it is in australia are you just going around calling each other c words all the time in britain i'm like that's heavy <laughs> that's some heavy <laughs> bro you save that you keep that in your pocket for when you really need it i tried to stop bursting out laughing a few people looked over we were rushed inside one of the compartments of the shed it was dark inside except for the dim illumination of the outside street lamps there were there the guide instructed us to guess what ro the room was for and to think about it for a few few seconds while she left us there the guide promptly shut the door and 15 people were engulfed in total darkness meanwhile alex and i had immediately gone to one of the corners and pressed our bags against the wall to avoid any cheap trickery a girl let out a blood-curdling scream her boyfriend had obviously impersonated a ghost with a roving hand <laughs> <laughs> Again, all of this was a tour tactic. Leave us locked in a pitch rack room to get us on edge. The guide opened the door. He explained that the shed was a gas chamber. Up to 50 people at a time were locked in here to kill off any parasites that were crawling in their hair or on their bodies. The Disappearing Girl We proceeded to the luggage sterilization chamber adjacent to the boiler room. Within was a fairly dirty concrete floor. Smalled rickety shelves nailed together about a century ago and some stairs leading down to a couple of enormous doors with giant wheels on them that functioned as spinning locks damn okay <laughs> like an old-fashioned bang vault the doors themselves looked like something out of 90s th 1930 science fiction there was a library that i used to go to before i had like my own office and shit like where i just go sometimes when i just needed not to work at home and uh, it was in an old bank so they'd taken this like awesome i think it was because of the communists like the communists had taken this giant bank with all this crazy marble everywhere and statues and and all of this stuff and they turned it into like a, a library and it was really awesome <laughs> and in the back the reason this is relevant is like where they kept all the index cards like in the past obviously now it's all electronic you could it was the bank vault so and they left all this giant door and stuff in there so it's this huge like bank vault room with this giant door and super thick walls that you could just wander around and i was like 
This is pretty cool. But an irrelevant story, so let's just carry on. They were unbelievably thick. In the dark, they looked quite sinister. The purpose of this room, however, was quite innocent. People's stuff would be piled in here, blasted clean from every micro, but then put on a small trolley track up the hill where the luggage would be stored. The inmates, particularly outside of first class, would have limited access to most of their clothing and stuff for weeks. All this oppressive trouble, and here I was grumbling about wearing a mask on a plane yeah but i mean I, I i'm not some anti-mask person that obviously masks do help stop spread covid around and, and all of that shit. but it does suck like i'm like i've got a big beard i've got a big face to be honest so most of the masks are quite tight on my face i re- i was wearing like these masks that my wife kept buying and they were really like uncomfortable and then she discovered that they make large size masks and i'm like oh my god <laughs> i've been living in just abominable conditions <laughs> and then i discovered a large mask and i was like oh my god my ears are no longer being brought towards my face my whole yeah it was just it was a wonderful experience as we sat on the filthy concrete stairs in front of the doors both alex and i were too drunk to care about the dust on our nice clothes the guy told us about the disappearing girl a specter who would join tour groups and walk around with them there were numerous reports where people would spot the ghost, think they were a normal person, and then several minutes later they'd notice that they couldn't see the girl in the crowd. She had dematerialized into thin air. Oh my god, it sounds so real! Or she'd simply bug it off to the toilet, or they didn't see the total stranger again because they were standing behind other people in the dark. Yes. Alex and I didn't need to come back another day to figure this one out. A tour group of 15 and at least half of them were total strangers to each other and you're saying that you think you see a stranger in the dark at one moment and then you don't recognize her amongst the group again. Say it ain't so! What is perhaps more interesting is why you would take note of a total stranger in a large group of people in the first place to even notice their absence a few minutes later. Perhaps if you were an excitable believer in the afterlife front loaded with the story of the disappearing girl, perhaps. Yes. Maybe that's it, David. <laughs> maybe. And by maybe, I mean obviously. Or maybe it is ghosts. Or maybe you just thought she was really hot and wanted to ogle her later again. Either way, she probably wasn't a ghost. A third possibility is the staff actually join tour groups as so-called ghosts periodically and then slip away to freak people out. But I didn't detect anything that elaborate at the time. I don't think they would do that because it kind of then it's like if they get caught doing that and it's like, hey, you. You're not on this group. You're a tour guide. I've been here, but then it's like busted and it's like, oh, okay. So they're faking the ghosts. Whereas if they just use like psychological tricks and stuff, then there's like plausible deniability. It's like, they're not the ones making up ghosts. It's people's imaginations making up ghosts. Or maybe it's ghosts. Ah. Ah. The Acid Showers and Shadow Man. From there, the guide led us up a few more yards to the building that housed the mass showers. It was here that new arrivals had to strip down naked, hop onto one of these cold steel showers, and scrub themselves thoroughly to get rid of any parasites or surface-level infections that they might be carrying on their persons. But after your shower, you didn't exactly dry yourself off. Instead, the water mixed with carbolic acid sat on your skin. Oh my god. I'm assuming it's not particularly strong carbolic acid. I'm not even sure what carbolic acid is, but that still doesn't sound awesome. Over the course of the next few days, you would turn red, itchy, and the top two layers of your skin would gradually peel off. It was like being sunburned all over, including on your scalp and genitalia. Oh my god. No. <laughs> There's a big difference between scalp and genitalia. Number of times I've been burned on my scalp. Well, look, I'm a very, very bald man. The answer is many, and I pretty much always wear a hat now. Um, burnt on my genitalia? Never. And never want to. Like, I can't imagine having a sunburned penis. That sounds horrible. I will admit that the shower building looked like something out of a horror film. Chipped early 20th century tiles you'd see in a creepy, derelict, insane asylum. Walls made of rusted, corrugated iron on each shower and rows and rows of them. Dozens, stretching on and on into the darkness of the building, lit only by the small windows at each end and the flashlights of the tour group. Yeah, there is something spooky, like inherently spooky about, like, derelict showers, right? It's just like, I don't know, it's just creepy. I think maybe it's because, you know, we're vulnerable in the shower. Like, there's lots of murder scenes in movies, like Famously Psycho, and all of this stuff that happened, like, when people are in showers. Because it's like you're naked, you're slippery, <laughs> there's no weapons nearby. It's like, oh, yeah, no, you're screwed. You're going to try grabbing onto a knife and it just slips out of your hands while you're getting stabbed by a murderer. Yeah, that's probably why, isn't it? That's why showers are creepy, because it's where we're vulnerable. 
like in prison. The building was too long for a single flashlight to light it from end to end. Cavernous shadows yawned onward into oblivion between the rows of acid showers. It was genuinely creepy and reminded me of something you'd see in a, uh, you'd see in a concentration camp. Perhaps it was the fact newly arrived travelers were tamely led here to have their skin burned off. Perhaps unsurprisingly, it was in this location that the tour group really started to get jumpy. While filming the shower, someone's camera turned off suddenly while while the phone is still on full battery. I guess a ghost was a bit shy of being filmed in the nude. A few people reported feeling a sudden coldness wash over them, as if a spirit had just passed by. Yet another person reported having a metallic taste in their mouth, which the guide speculated was consistent with the taste of blood. Yeah, it's like if I got a metallic taste in my mouth, I'm like, well... I know what blood tastes like. I've tasted blood many times. Not because I'm a weirdo, but it's like, oh, I cut myself. You know, you just lick that blood up. Which is a weird thing to do, isn't it? I can't be the only one who does that. Or when you bite your mouth really badly and it bleeds. You're like, I know what blood tastes like. I know what... I know... I'm extremely familiar with the taste of human blood. (laughs) That's the only time you could say that sentence. Um, Yeah, and then you're like, well, it's not that. And it's just in your mind. It's definitely in your mind. And if you're constantly tasting weird things that you're not tasting, go get a scan. Go see the doctor. So it could be a brain tumor or some shit. I think I saw that on a TV show. When Alex and I returned to the showers during the daytime a few weeks later during phase two, we discreetly took a few swab samples of dust when the historical guide wasn't looking. A simple chemical test revealed that within the dust there was plenty of iron and rust particles, most likely chipped off from the decaying shower stalls that lined the entire building. Well, Guys, you are like going above and beyond on your little research adventure. Um, yeah, I was just like, oh, the metallic taste, it's in in the mind. It's in the mind. But no, little iron particles in the air. That sounds dangerous. (laughs) I'm not going there. It's like iron particles. It sounds like, you know, it's going to cause that asbestos disease. Such dust could easily be agitated and swirled into the air by people walking around the showers and could easily have been inhaled or ingested by a person who would then report a metallic taste. But it wasn't blood. If anything, it pointed to how the air in the building was mildly unhealthy because of the particles in it. But one can inhale worse chemicals when wandering through an old building, and it's unlikely it did the bloke on the tour any lasting harm. Yeah, like asbestos. That mesothelioma disease is crazy. It's like... Uh, there was an episode of house about it and a friend of mine's dad actually died of it and it's just you go to the doctor and you're like oh yeah i've got a bit of a cough and like yeah you'll be dead in a year it's like oh my god that is so intense because it's just that's it you know people don't survive it for like very long at all and it's like i I don't know it's obviously not 100 percent fatal or whatever but it's like it's like a tumor around your lungs in the lining of your lungs from getting asbestos particles in there when you were a kid or like younger and i'm like that's intense and i'm like i hope i haven't been around any asbestos i think i'm a bit young for it to be honest but really intense disease you don't want that also during phase two we took a portable thermometer to in uh, yep sorry (laughs) i'm like is that thermometer (laughs) can you even read fact boy to investigate the flashes of cold that were frequently reported in the building it was 24 degrees celsius outside that day or 75.2 degrees fahrenheit and within the building the temperature varied between 21 and 18 degrees celsius or 69.8 to 64.4 degrees fahrenheit the construction of the building should be noted there was very little opportunity for sunlight to enter the building during the day the building itself was not built to retain heat like many buildings in australia wait why would buildings be built to maintain heat retain heat in australia that sounds like a terror isn't australia super hot be like i want a building that gets rid of heat i want terrible insulation although i guess you insulate like air conditioning inside as well right so i guess okay okay uh, i'm i'm getting it. i'm just a bit dumb okay i'm just not the smartest man around so when it was in use the showers did not become a sauna on really hot subtropical days the building was old not meant for living in even at the time of operation and thus had worse drafts than even the boiler room restaurant but it was the rows and rows of little metal cloisters each with a drain pipe through which a blast of cold air could rush upward that caused the most discrepancies in the building so it is indeed likely that it wasn't just the night or people's paranoia they were quite likely experiencing sudden slight drops in temperature as they walked around it just wasn't from ghosts <laughs> as for the camera suddenly turning off without being able to look at that smartphone specifically to see what its screensaver and lock screen settings were or whether there was a malfunctioning battery or to see how incompetent the person using it was operating a smartphone we'll just have to chalk that up to user error on the part of the living or just the phone being a bit weird it's technology it crashes all the time 
Actually, phones are fairly reliable. I find my phone doesn't crash very often. In fact, shit just seems to crash way less often than it used to in the past. But look, technology's not perfect. And uh, yeah, it was that. Because you know what? There's lots of technology repair places, uh, technical support. There's very little, you know, ghost support. Like, oh yeah, yeah, my phone stopped working because of ghosts. Uh... <laughs> The alternate explanation is a ghost could somehow operate a piece of 21st century technology better than that bloke could. And if that's the best evidence we have for ghosts, I think both Alex and I can live with that. Yes, me too. It is one of those cases of confirmation bias. If your electronic equipment messes up during a ghost hunt, then it must be spooks responsible for it through the electromagnetic spectrum. Yet if your computer were to crash or your TV were to suddenly lose power in normal life, it's unlikely you would blame it on ghosts electronic things mess up all the time thank you yes 100 percent agree and 100 percent of the time there is a mechanical explanation for it it's only when it happens in a dark room with scooby-doo vibes that it sends us into hysterics <laughs> yeah next time i'm just like working you know using adobe premiere or something and it crashes i'll be like nah not the ghosts again <laughs> god damn it it was at this point the ghosts themselves began to appear <laughs> This took a turn. And that's when I started to believe in ghosts. Not really, David didn't write that. The tour guide told us about a girl who can sometimes be heard crying in one of the shower stalls. Unsurprisingly, a few minutes later, a woman on the tour said she could faintly hear the sound of a girl crying. To this, Alex merely whispered into a nearby shower stall that the ghost should pull herself together and shouldn't hang around the showers all day, but should get her fat weeping ass into her swimmers and get to suntanning on the beach. <laughs> Savage Alex. As an afterthought, she added that today people pay hundreds of dollars to come here and do that and to stop being such a mopey idiot. The ghost did not respond. Shocking. The tour guide then told us about Shadow Man, a seven-foot-tall specter that only appeared as a black fa phantasm. Phantasm? Phantasm? I don't know. I don't care. I'm not going to look up this word because, let's be fair, I don't look up that many words anyway. And also, it's a made-up phantom word. I mean, all words are made up, but this one particularly so. And it was, at times, quite malevolent. Ghost hunters had previously talked to the ghost via a spirit box and had determined that Shadow Man was an ugly ghost disfigured by smallpox, and that is why he never shows his true form. Shortly after hearing the story, a girl screamed quite loudly and, loudly and said that she'd seen Shadow Man lurking around one of the showers. Not missing a beat, Alex said. Well, let's go find the bastard. <laughs> and she swiftly charged off in the direction that the spectre had been reported in. A few people from the ghost tour merrily followed us, while the more timid and impressionable folks remained behind near the exit. They'd be like, yeah, i go over there. <laughs> oh no, the ghosty smallpox guy, what's he gonna do? Give me smallpox, he's a ghost and he's not real. Also, Shadow Man was nowhere to be found. It should be mentioned at this point that some ghost enthusiasts will say that if you don't believe in ghosts or are otherwise spiritually closed off like Alex and I almost certainly were, that the ghosts will not appear to you. I hope most of us can agree that this is some Santa Claus level b right here. Conveniently, the only sort of person who sees ghosts is either someone who believes in ghosts or is easily startled in dark, foreboding places. And on what information are people basing this claim? Wishful thinking? And if that was the case, if homeowners want to avoid the nuisance of living in haunted houses, all they have to do is stop believing in ghosts and they'll stop appearing to them. What circular nonsense it is. Indeed, I saw an amazing picture. It was, a, it was a real picture. I don't think it was a joke of a house being sold somewhere in America. Like somewhere, I don't know, maybe like Salem or shit like that. And there was the sign that said, you know, they hang out and it says like for sale. And then underneath, there was another sign attached to it that said not haunted. It's like, oh my God. I'd like to buy a house in that town because I'd just buy the haunted ones. I'd just be like, yeah, yeah, this is haunted, right? I'm going to need like at least 20% off because of the haunting thing. And they'll be like, oof. Yeah, I guess we can do that because it's haunted. And I'll be like, <laughs> amazing. And then I'll move in and obviously there won't be any ghosts in there because they're not real. <laughs> Alex and I took note of how the lines of showers could potentially refract and restrict light through the building. Indeed, during the night, you could easily see without the aid of a flashlight just from the dim lighting from the windows. It wasn't pitch black and there was a moderate amount of visibility to walk around without tripping over stuff. Otherwise, with all those hard corners and tiles that have a massive lawsuit on their hands. This all changed when you turned on a flashlight. Suddenly, you had clear visibility immediately in front of you, and darkness lay beyond. 
In the pictures of Shadow Man posted online, the light of a flashlight ends and the yawning chasm of darkness begins just as you would expect to in any shadow. It just so happens that these shadows can take on a vaguely anthropomorphic shape. Again, if you've just been front-loaded with a story about Shadow Man, conveniently the same height as the showers, roughly speaking, it is hardly surprising you would imagine seeing something sinister. Yeah, this is one of those things, it's like, you know, why are we so good at... Humans are amazing at spotting patterns. Like, you look at the clouds, it's like, this looks like a that, this looks like a this. And it's like, obviously it doesn't, you know, they're not really this item. But it is crazy how easy it is for us to, like, spot things in random patterns. And that is exactly what's going on here. A merry jaunt to the morgue. From the acid showers, we had quite a hike to our next ghostly location. Alex swore loudly at her uncomfortable shoes, stopped, furiously kicked them off, and pulled on a pair of thongs from her purse. Oh, ah, yeah, the Australians and their thongs. Alex is not changing her underwear. <laughs> That's what I, Brit, I, is this just a British thing? But a thong is uh, an under is underwear in a, a women's underwear in British English at least. But the Australians, that's flip flops, mate, or plastic pool sandals for those not from Australia. The national footwear of our country <laughs> is that isn't that is that actually like a thing, or is that like Foster's is the national beer of Australia, or are you all actually walking around in flip flops? The flip flops are stupid. I'm sorry, Australians. They're a bit stupid because they're like sandals, except they don't have the thing on the back, which, so every step you take, you're like constantly like uh, gripping your toes to keep the shoes like, and you know, they make that slapping sound because you're using your toes to keep them on your feet. It's like, why not just have the back thing? Why not just have a pair of sandals? Or why not just wear shoes? (laughs) I remember I was reading a, a style blog once and something really stuck with me. They were like, the only place that is acceptable to wear sandals or flip-flops is when you're literally on the beach. Any other time, wear something else. (laughs) And from that, so I always have a pair of boat shoes that I typically wear like in hot climates and stuff like that, you know, without the socks on the inside. They're comfortable. Are they called boat shoes? I don't know what they're called. Like the the shoes you'd wear on a boat. They're great. Great. And they're not sandals. (laughs) I should probably just be okay with wearing sandals because I don't care that much about style. We trudged along a forested path. The tour guide continued to regale us with interesting facts. The first was that the grounds in which the quarantine station were built belonged to the Kadigal Aboriginal people of Australia, who had used this as a site of health and wellness prior to European contact. This made me reflect about where all the Aboriginal ghosts were. These people had first come to northern Australia roughly 60,000 years ago and had been in New South Wales for approximately 40,000 years or more. As long as humans had been in Europe. In 1791, three Three years after Europeans arrived in the Manly Northhead area, a smallpox epidemic wiped out an estimated 90% of the Cadigal people because they had no biological resistance to European diseases. It seems to me that there should have been thousands of years worth of very angry Aboriginal ghosts roaming around, not just some European settlers who rocked up in the last two centuries, yeah. I mean, of course, but that's way too logical and thinking about it way too much and too sensibly, aren't we? Because those Aboriginal, like the others, they're like, oh, what happens? Well, you died of a disease while you were going somewhere on a boat with other people with diseases. You know there was the risks. Where the Abor- Aboriginal people are like, what the fuck, guys? What the fuck? Why? Why? Greedy bastards. The guide then gave us an account of the twins, whom a colleague of his had seen on multiple occasions. These two eerie apparitions were 7 to 10 feet tall, but were composed of shimmering, silvery light. They nevertheless resembled very clear silhouettes of humans, with the outlines of their ribcages somewhat unnervingly moving back and forth, in and out of their bodies like pendulums, as they stood and stared at you. Oh my god, that is fairly creepy. (laughs) Who came up with this? I mean, obviously they didn't really see a ghost, so who's like, yeah, 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 the ghosts. Uh, what do they look like? Well, uh, you know, the first person who obviously made it up is like, their rib cages came out of their body. I'd be like, dude, you need to write, you need to like write some Stephen King stuff because that is, that is an imagination. I'd be like, well, they were wearing a sheet. They had red eyes. That's all, you know, that's, that's it. Not their rib cages came out and back into their body. That is some nightmare shit, my dude. One theory went that the twins were actually just one person, the abnormally tall Dr. Reed, who was once a doctor at the station. Or maybe this particular tour guide in question was just a little pissed up and seeing double 
when he ran into the good doctor. A similar story came from yet another colleague of our guide. This colleague was walking down a path near the mortuary called Paranormal Alley. <laughs> oh, what's that again, David? Is that is that that front loading? Yes. Uh, in part of the station where supernatural energy is at its highest when he saw two ghostly apparitions walking menacingly towards him. Also, filled with foreboding, he turned around to beat a retreat, and he saw two more ghosts behind him also heading in his direction. He was trapped. This, the man sat on the ground, felt dizzy, an overpowering sense of doom, and he was violently sick. It was only when he managed to rally and leave the area that he began to feel better again. In both of these cases, which were testimonies of people who worked at the station, related to us secondhand by yet another staff member who was literally paid to creep us out, they are of dubious reliability, to say the least. Oh. I just found this is completely and utterly irrelevant. I just changed my position and found a, a sticker stuck to my leg, which I've been walking around outside all day with that leg with that sticker stuck to my leg <laughs> from one of my kids brilliant <laughs> thanks for the tangent fact boy get back to it so it could all just be nonsense however with some later research i found out that numerous staff members swear up and down that they are true believers in ghosts and evidently those same true believers are drawn to apply to work at the quarantine station in the first place yeah although honestly like <laughs> They do uh, ghost tours here in Prague where you can, you know, you, there's lots of tours you could do around the city and they all have different themes. And one of them is like, you can go to a ghost tour. And I've never done it. But it's like, yo, if I needed a job and someone was like, Simon, you got to do the ghost tour. I'd be like, okay, I got no problem with this. Like, it's fake, but I can act, you know. We'll just be like, and then during the night, blah, 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 blah. And people are like, oh my God, that's so scary. But I know, right? Ghosts are so real, Michael. They are real. Absolutely. Uh, sorry, I, I don't know who Michael is. Just made him up. I always like to give people names in my stories. Like a Disneyland for kooks. So if the stories out are, aren't outright lies, if you are regularly seeing sh uh, shimmering silvery twins with moving rib cages or just being bushwhacked by fast-moving specters while walking on a forest path, these aren't just incidents where you get the creeps from a bit of darkness or a bit of gold that can easily be explained away. This is either a sign of a more serious mental illness for which you might need medication or therapy or a hallucination brought on by a neurological condition. In fact, you may want to get yourself checked out by a doctor to make sure that you don't have brain cancer or chemical poisoning. Oh, it's like this is the thing if i started seeing ghosts i would be like oh my god this is so cool i can see ghosts i'd be like oh f i'm probably really sick it's either you know i'm gonna need like drugs from a psychiatrist or i've got a brain disease i mean like non sight you know like a, a brain cancer or something like that it's either way it's not good or i'm being poisoned by something uh which probably means that my family's being poisoned as well because you know we're in the same environment all the time so that would be brilliant um that that would be my reality if i saw ghosts <laughs> I'm being serious here. Profoundly realistic and bizarre visual hallucinations while you are awake might mean there's something very serious and life-threateningly wrong with your health. Get yourself checked. Be safe. Don't just say, ooh, ghosts. Tell your friends and go on with your day while a tumor that could significantly reduce your life expectancy might be growing inside your skull. Yes. Yes, go see a doctor. <laughs> Get a brain scan. Be like, doctor, I am seeing that I know is not there. And they'll be like, get him to the MRI machine. There was a great, uh, I've, I've mentioned this on videos, not on this channel, but on other channels that I've done before, and I still haven't found it. And people have sent me so many things trying to identify this one thing that I just desperately want to find. It was on Reddit years ago, and it was this incredibly creepy letter that a tenant had written to a land, her landlord or his landlord complaining about the upstairs neighbors, being like, they uh they keep banging on and it got and it goes through the letter it's like they keep banging on the floors and uh i know they're watching me because they bang on the uh, on the floor so i hear it on the ceiling of the rooms that i'm in and i'm pretty sure they've installed a camera somewhere but i can't find it blah 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 and it just gets like spine chillingly creepy like the creepiest you've ever read and uh then the top comments on reddit was like uh, or the 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 not the title because that would have spoiled it but like under the image it was like uh a letter written by someone with schizophrenia and you're like 
I'm getting chills thinking about this right now. It was the craziest thing I've seen. Like, not not being derogatory towards that person being crazy, but it's like uh, a crazy thing to read. Like, it was mind-blowing just how that just feeling. Because at first you're like, I'm reading that thing and I'm like, oh my God, those neighbors are Who the hell does this? Why would you hate someone so much to do that to them? And then you get down and you're like, wait, something's not right here. And then you realize it was all just in their head. And it's like, whoa! <laughs> God damn! I still remember this. If anyone knows that, put it in the comments below. Because I guess if you're, if you're watching this video, if not, just uh, hit me up on Twitter at Simon Whistler. Because God damn, I would love to find that. If I find it, I'll read it on a future episode. Because it is just... <laughs> Uh, I am off on the- uh, I'm off on a massive tangent, let's get back. Mr. Slimy We arrived at the morgue. While standing outside, a man, aged in his 20s or 30s, started to have what I would describe as a panic attack. He said he couldn't head inside the morgue. There was just too much overwhelming negativity coming from the place. I once had a panic attack. It was really intense. I was quite young. I think I must have been in my late teens or early 20s. And I just smoked too much weed. <laughs> And I was just hanging out, just like by myself. And I'm like, I just suddenly felt like not good. Like, oh my God, oh my God, something's definitely wrong. And then it just, you got in this spiral of like, something is wrong, something is wrong, something is wrong. And I'm like, just trying to get a grip of myself. Like, I shut myself in the bathroom, like, <sighs> like, what is going on? Am I having a heart attack? And then a few minutes later, I feel totally fine. And I've never had a panic attack again. And uh, let's just say I've not smoked that much weed again. <laughs> because it was not a good time. The tour guide, obviously familiar with this sort of episode, was comforting him and explaining and eventually convinced him that everything would be fine and to head inside. During the man's panic attack, Alex and I happened to be standing nearby, but we said nothing and merely observed. What was interesting about it was that the man said he didn't really believe in ghosts, but that the feeling had suddenly hit him. Either this meant that he wasn't telling the whole truth or the creepy stories of the, exi- of the evening had taken a mental toll on him, which just goes to show how strong the power of suggestion can be on some people. Alex also wants me to mention that he could have been high or something which might have made him more quick to internalize the creepy atmosphere and have a profound reaction to it oh boy yes <laughs> yeah no no this is like all things that alter your mental state yeah like i'm pretty sure i i no i, I can't imagine myself having a panic attack unless there's a reason to be extremely panicked <laughs> like that i'll be like ah and I, like, i've never been in a situation where it's been like oh my god this is a disaster. I've always just been like, okay, let's logically deal with the problem. Like, even when shit's gone badly wrong, like, in a moment, I'm usually like, okay, here's what we're going to do. Because that's just how my mind works. It's only when I've been chemically altered that it's been a problem. Sounds like this guy got super high <laughs> and went on a ghost tour, which seems like, yeah, 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 that, that, that I can imagine. That I, can, I wouldn't get super high before going on the ghost tour. Indeed, the entire tour group had something of a party vibe, so I can't rule out that some pills were popped or spliffs were smoked before uh, by some people prior to the tour. Inside the morgue, there was a table, on top of which there was a mannequin from a 1980s shop window simulating the appearance of a corpse. We filed into the room and stood around the table with our backs against the wall. There was one gap where there was a large window and no pane of glass, which would not stand... Which people would not stand in front of so in order to make room i stood in front of it my own anxieties were about spiders or snakes coming through the window or maybe a flying fox a kind of giant bat rather than a ghost i'd be like david why are you scared of spiders you're an adult man they'll be like because david lives in australia where like my wife whenever she sees a spider she doesn't like spiders she's always like will you put it outside and i never do because i know if you put the spiders outside they die so i always just take it to another room and pretend to put it out the window hopefully my wife doesn't listen to this um and i'm like why are you scared of spiders she's like, i just don't like them if we lived in australia she'd be like because they could kill me and i'd be like legitimate fear i also don't want to put this outside <laughs> as it turns out in phase two in the light of day i discovered the giant window just opened into a second part of the morgue also inside so i needn't have worried on top of the mannequin the tour guide placed an emf meter a device the size of a tv remote used to detect abnormalities in electromagnetic fields so if a disturbance was picked up, the green light on the EMF meter would turn red. Thus, according to paranormal investigators, a ghost was nearby. Unfortunately, scientific testing has shown that EMF meters can be set off by anything from a mobile phone to a computer mouse to power lines to car batteries to vibrating sexual aids. Who did that research? It's like, yeah, we're going to get this ghost meter. 
and put it next to a dildo. <laughs> it's like, okay, what's up? Who? It, what? What research are you doing? The tour guide began to explain that cadavers were brought to the morgue for dissections, autopsies, and embalming once a disease killed them. As such, even today, the ghostly stench of rotting flesh could be smelled by witnesses standing in the morgue. I figure it was more likely a possum or a bandicoot had died in the bushes somewhere outside, or a nearby trash can was stinking in the Australian heat. The guide warned us of the local morgue poltergeist, a gentleman known only by the nickname of Mr. Slimy, who was nevertheless theorized to be a highly sexed mortician who used to hook up with nurses at night at his place of work. I'm not sure how many nurses would be fond of making out in a morgue, but whatever floats their boat, I'm not one to kink shame. The problem with Mr. Slimy, the guide explained, was that his libido did not abandon him at death. Numerous witnesses over the years claimed that Mr. Slimy had sexually assaulted them by groping their genitals, playing with their nipples, or kissing them on the mouth. Apparently, Mr. Slimy did not discriminate between men and women. Sounds like the tour guide's gay little hands is the ghosts! <laughs> it's like someone touched my bottom! It was the ghosts! Ah, uh, yes. Apparently, Mr. Slimy did not discriminate between men and women. This was another interesting tactic to creep out the crowd in a whole new way and draw a particularly pronounced groan from some of the women there. No boyfriend or husband had the audacity, thankfully, of impersonating Mr. Slimy to scare their better half, but I bet it's been done over the years. Oh my god. Yeah, absolutely. Just like, <laughs> to my wife, <laughs> just to be absolutely clear, be like, <laughs> yeah, that would be amusing. But I'm a child, so maybe Mr. Slimy was the reason that they left a mannequin in there. Wait, what? People filled up. A- <laughs> Am I missing something? Was he assaulting, sexually assaulting mannequins? People filed out of the morgue. I was one of the last people to exit. Just me, Alex, and a couple of people standing around the table, talking quietly to the tour guide. As I strode forward from the wall and passed the table on my way out, the EMF meter, which had previously been a placid green, started flashing an alarming red. The tour guide met my eyes and said, He likes something about you. It was probably a, probably a phone, something like that. In order to break the tension and pass over this awkward moment with a light-hearted joke, I said rather loudly to the unseen spectre, How about a blowjob? <laughs> David, you said you weren't going to ruin it for everyone. The ghost did not respond, and the guides, to my disappointment and shame, seemed, sli- seemed slightly annoyed and upset. I felt I pushed my luck too far. It's kind of a d- move. <laughs> but I like it. Just then, Alex decided to chime in and ask what a ghost. <laughs> I am going to get. Let's just. Uh, I'm going to get this video demonetized if we continue down this route, David. So, uh. Boop, 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 boop. Definitely can't read that. <laughs> Definitely can't say that one. Okay, the postmaster and the matron. <laughs> yeah, because uh, YouTube scans videos. If you're just listening, to this is a podcast. It also goes out on YouTube. YouTube scans videos for words, and if they find words they don't like, they take away your money, and they restrict it to an audience of over a certain age, which is good. I mean, everyone listening to this is probably over the age, you know, is an adult or teenager, I guess, anyway. So, like, 16 to 34 or 18 to 34 is my main audience. And then, like, around the edges of that, typically. Um, What are we talking about? Oh, yeah. If I say some of the words that David and Alex talk about there, (laughs) let's just say I'm not going to get paid for this video. And I I like to get paid, you know. This is my work. The tour continued uphill to the post office. Here was supposed to be an evil, malevolent spirit named the Postmaster. It is speculated the actual identity of the poltergeist is Superintendent James Forsyth Vincent, who ran the quite well, a name and a half, isn't it? Forsyth Vincent. Sounds like uh, anyone, you know, double barreled surnames. And I feel like, is this a difference? Because I think I made this, I've definitely made this joke before, and people are like, it's the opposite in America. Like, if you've got a double barreled surname in the UK, you're usually a bit posh. Whereas people in the US were like, ah, if you've got a double barreled surname, it means you live in a trailer park in the US or something like that. And I was like, that's an interesting difference. He ran the quarantine station. Good. His wife died mysteriously of a morphine overdose. Less good. And he married a woman 24 years his junior six months later. Well, whether that's good or not, that is uh, a matter of opinion. William Hay, to six months, dude. You could have waited till she was cold, my man. What the f? William Hay, a witness to the death, also allegedly killed by the postmaster. Hay is said to have committed suicide by shooting himself twice, first in the stomach and then in the head. Uh, people are going to be like, ah, how do you shoot yourself twice? Well, one, because you shoot yourself in the stomach. Like, oh, that's really painful. May as well shoot myself in the brain because this is, I'm just going to die. Like, getting shot in the stomach, isn't that like fam- famously a painfully 
uh, painfully way, painful way to go. I don't know. An unusual method for suicide. The postmaster had him buried within 24 hours of his death. Wait, wait, wait. Is the postmaster murdering people he doesn't like, like his wife and this dude? Uh, and personally signed off on his autopsy. William Hay also became a vengeful ghost of quarantine station. Meanwhile, the ghost of the postmaster is said to be able to reduce people to spontaneous sh- tears by sheer force of evil. But given how many reasons a person can have for bursting into tears, especially when impressionable and front-loaded by the ghost story, it's difficult to investigate the phenomenon without more time and a suitable group of crybaby test subjects. Alex nevertheless spent several minutes trying to provoke the ghost, calling the postmaster and I quote, a small loser who was too stupid to know that getting a divorce was less scandalous than murdering your wife. Alex, you savage. The phantom did not appear and smite us down despite all of Alex's come at me bro taunts and insults. The only spontaneous cry that happened was from me laughing. Uh, <laughs> we then moved toward the hospital section. The guide told us on the balcony that witnesses had detected an angry male energy there, most likely from a male doctor who used to work there. So, <laughs> angry male energy sounds like incels. <laughs> Nobody in the group detected anything. We moved inside the hospital wing to where there were two main rooms filled with hospital beds. In the first room, we were told that was a benevolent spirit, and we were asked if we felt a warm aura of kindness in the room. A few front-loaded people muttered agreement. In the second room, we were told it was inhabited by the matron, the ghost of a head nurse, and the most formidable entity in the quarantine station. We were asked if anyone noticed the energy of the second room was drastically more evil, led by the nose. Some people agreed. The matron could overpower you with negative energy if you represented even the slightest disorder to her tightly run hospital ward. At the back of the group, Alex immediately began rustling and messing up the sheets on one of the hospital beds. Nothing happens. Shocking. <laughs> the only thing of note to occur was a girl laid down on one of the hospital beds while the guide talked. She later complained that she couldn't breathe properly, which the guide speculated because people had died of tuberculosis and Spanish influenza in those beds. Unless there were still traces of the disease on the bed sheets centuries later, I suspect it was most likely hyperventilation and an active imagination. I had also sat down on one of the beds and had noticed no such disturbance. Why are you sitting down on the beds? I'll be like, I want some ghost door in some abandoned hospital with like sheets that are a hundred years old and we like used for like plague victims. I'll be like, yeah, hard pass. I mean, I might be a little bit drunk, moving into a little bit hungover, but uh, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna lean against this wall. <laughs> that sounds better. The Grave Digger's Cottage. Which brings us to the climax of the tour. The last stop, the so-called Gravedigger's Cottage, located between two grave sites. Despite the name, a gravedigger never actually li- lived there. Instead, the cottage was periodically inhabited by doctors who were said to have conducted sick and perverted experiments on women and children. One woman is said to have committed suicide in the bathtub at the back of the cottage, which is reputedly its most haunted room. Wait, I mean, like, the doctor's doing experiments and <laughs> Like, yes has absolutely happened in history but did it really happen at a place where they were just quarantining people as they go into a country it doesn't seem like you know well at some point they're going to be released it's not like this is a death camp where they're just going to be murdered it's like well people there's there's a roster and a register and these people are just coming to australia it seems a little bit less likely than you know it happening at a death camp the cottage itself is said to be inhabited by a powerful ghost (laughs) named sam (laughs) i feel like sam is the like least ghostly name Oh yes, Sam the ghost. (laughs) Alright. He sounds friendly. Of unverified origin or identity, the tour guides there all pay him a great deal of respect. Prior to entering the cottage, the guides always knock and ask Sam permission to enter. It's a great way to ramp up the tension. It's also a little bit cringe, isn't it? This is a, it, this whole thing's a little bit cringe, isn't it? Apparently, Sam was okay letting people inside today. I do wonder if, for believability and consistency, guides sometimes printed that Sam was angry and packed paying customers on their way before they could look around. Sounds like if this is the last stop on the tour. It's like, yeah, yeah, what's the time? 10 o'clock? <clears throat> Seems Sam's angry today, and uh, I want to catch the last bus, to- bus home. Some I doubt it, but certainly it paid not to make Sam angry. A few years ago, a video went semi-viral in the Australian media when a German medium pretended to be pushed by Sam into an adjoining room. The woman then claimed to have received a bruise from Sam on her elbow. The footage, if you can find it, shows a rather portly woman looking at the camera to make sure that it was pointed at her, then comically flinging herself into another room out of sight of the camera. 
If Sam was truly responsible for this, I'm comforted to know that we share the same opinion of mediums. <laughs> I think it is a little messed up that some people think it's okay to take money by lying about talking to grieving people's deceased relatives. Yeah, mediums are pieces of sh because you know it's fake you're doing cold reading like you're just looking up on like psychological hints that people are giving away and uh then you're manipulating them into thinking that you're talking to their dead relatives you know it's fake you know it's fake because you're faking it so you're kind of just a fraud aren't you it kind of feels like it should be illegal doesn't it doesn't it because it's exploitative and it makes you a piece of uh numerous ph phenomena have been noted at the gravedigger's cottage voices moving furniture randomly opening cabinets or cabinets that refuse to open sounds of crying screams strange lights being emitted from the windows late at night when nobody's there the tour guide sent us inside gave us a little talk and then told us we were going to wait outside because the energy of the building was just too overwhelming later with research i found that all tour guides are instructed to do this a perfect tactic not only is it too much for our guide but we are left alone in the darkness to wander an extremely haunted location with a ghost that might harm us if ghosts were real this would be a legal minefield <laughs> yes alex and i immediately set about our business alex seemed to be thoroughly absorbed by uttering obscenities a ghost so i didn't interrupt her meanwhile i quickly looked inside multiple cabinets to see what was inside at one point i found myself reflecting that it was actually quite a nice traditional australian cabin and i told alex i would love to have one like this at the edge of the woods alex snorted and said this place is a <laughs> hole <laughs> david are you smoking crack david this place is a dump you want to live here david get some taste Looking at the old furniture, rotary dial phone, and rickety brass-framed beds, I admitted that it certainly would be creepy to sleep all night in this place alone, at least not without a couple of lights and a nice show on the telly. May I recommend streaming a nice relaxing podcast by Simon Whistler? Yes. Although don't stream my Casual Criminalist podcast while you're staying alone in a cabin in the woods. It will scare the shit out of you and you will become convinced that you're going to be on the podcast in the future. I was going to say if you're feeling that right now, then, uh, but this isn't the Casual Criminalist podcast. That is another podcast I do, which you should absolutely subscribe to as well. Because I would say that, wouldn't I? If you don't, my ghost is going to come and haunt you. Alex and I then head into the bathroom, which was indeed a bit run down. We walked up to the bathtub and stared inside its empty contents. We did not see the specter of a woman who killed herself. Nevertheless, Alex said, Get out of there, lady! Wait, sorry. Get out of there, lady! Australian. This is an Australian accent. It's a terrible one. I'm not. Shall I try it? I'm going to try it. Get out of there, lady. You get all pruney. Come back with us. We'll have a drink. God, I'm so terrible at accents. I really need to work on that or just not do them. Let's just not do them. That's an easier task. There was no reply. Meanwhile, a girlfriend and boyfriend had followed us into the bathroom. The girl said, It's so creepy in here, mate. They, uh, I just added the mate to make it sound more Australian. Oh, they're tourists, though. They could be just from somewhere else. And turned around the door to the, to the door to leave again. She then let out a massive blood-curdling scream directly in front of her. She watched a cabinet open, seemingly on its own. Her boyfriend gripped her in his arms. They both seemed rooted to the spot. I, meanwhile, in a flash, knew what had happened. When I'd looked through the same cabinet a few minutes earlier, I'd struggled with the latch at the top that held both doors shut. It was an old-fashioned latch, and it was dark, and I was admittedly still slightly drunk. <laughs> yes, you had many bottles of wine. <laughs> so the thing had merely come free and scared the life out of this poor girl in the dark. I quickly moved past the couple, marched to the cabinet, and slammed the doors shut as half the tour group looked on. I then turned to the girl and said, it's going to be all right. Nothing to worry about here. The tour guide, meanwhile, came in, inquired what had happened, and spent a few minutes calming the girl down on the porch. Shortly thereafter, we all piled into a shuttle and, previously ignored, I got the no a number of backsnaps and compliments on my bravery, as if I had swaggered up and done something heroic instead of simply closing a cabinet. I had mucked up the first time, all of which Alex thought was hilarious. <laughs> He'd be like, nah, you're right. I'd just be like, yeah, I'm a hero. <laughs> Absolutely a hero buy me a beer but at least we had given other members of the tour group their money's worth without spoiling their fun i didn't mention the cause of this paranormal activity to anyone it just seemed like telling a child that the tooth fairy wasn't real ah david <laughs> decoding the unknown is basically it could be called telling children the tooth fairy is not real couldn't it monkeys in shoes the tooth fairy really strikes to the core of things. When we are children, the ghosts and goblins we fear in the dark seem all too real, to an extreme degree. I remember being deathly fearful for years as a young lad of an oddly shaped chest of drawers in my bedroom. 
I had nightmares about this chest of drawers coming to life and dragging me into the basement where the furnace would eat me. <laughs> God damn, David. No wonder you're a writer. Your imagination is extremely active. I was just like, it's a weird looking chest of drawers. That's a furnace. <laughs> So a very boring child. Even at a young age, we draw conclusions about natural phenomena, but our young minds often draw the wrong conclusions. Humans are pattern-seeking creatures. We are evolved to find patterns in things, and this in turn helps us to invent, to adapt, and to survive. It is a power that makes us extremely successful as a species, and has taken us from stone tools to skyscrapers in just a few thousand years. But occasionally, the wires get crossed. We see patterns that aren't really there, or we don't see the full picture. The wheels and gears behind the illusion. 3,000 years ago, thunder and lightning might be seen as the rage of an angry god. Less than 300 years ago, the death of some livestock might seem like the work of devil-worshipping witches. And the bumps we hear in the night might be attributed to ghosts. When all it is, all it ever is, is our powerful human imaginations running rampant and our instinct toward pattern seeking working overtime with limited information or misinformation we must recognize with some humility that we are just apes intellectually the same as we were a hundred thousand years ago just with more knowledge and more stuff or to put it more glibly we're just monkeys and shoes as for Alex and I, we recovered from our hangovers the next day. We decided not to write a paper. We did, however, go back to enact phase two and came to some pretty solid empirical conclusions about our experience. We mused that it was a unique idea for a TV show, for two skeptics to wander around haunted houses drunk, taking the piss out of ghosts and urban myths, then returning the next day to investigate the paranormal activity we provoked. So, if anyone steals this idea, you owe us royalties. Anyway, my fellow apes, sweet dreams and sleep tight. Thank you, David. This was very enjoyable. I hope who are you out there listening you enjoyed this. I don't know. This show is just an excuse for me to read interesting stuff. <laughs> but people watch it, which I love, or they listen to it as a podcast. If you are watching this, make sure you have smashed that subscribe button so you find out about all our new shows. Although obviously that doesn't work because YouTube is YouTube. Look, if you watch to the end, you're probably going to see more of this show because that is how YouTube works. Uh, if you're listening as a podcast, thank you so much. Please consider leaving a review. If you want to make it five stars, that's brilliant. If you want to make it one star, <laughs> Simon made a show about ghosts and all he does is make fun of ghosts. One stars. Ghosts are real. Go for it. That's okay. I don't mind. It just hurts my feelings. That so it doesn't... <laughs> That's it. That's all I got. Thanks for listening or watching, and I'll see you next time to Decode the Unknown. I just made that ending up right now. Not bad, right? Not bad. Hello everybody, welcome back to another episode of Decoding the Unknown, where we decode the unknown. What happens here is Katie, the writer for this channel, has written me a script. Hell at the bottom of a hole in Siberia. Uh, I'm vaguely familiar with this one. I made a video. This is like one of those OG internet rumors where there's like some Russian dudes who drill into the grounds and they're like, oh my god, we found hell down there. We can hear the screaming, tormented souls. Obviously, spoiler alert, I mean... <laughs> They probably didn't, did they? It's probably did. It's one of those. It's it's quite. It's just a just a legend, just a rumor. But we're gonna dive into it. We're gonna look at it, and uh, probably, probably, what we're gonna do is debunk it because that's normally what happens. Because it's not hell. It's not ghosts. It's not aliens. Is it? Ever? Let's go. <laughs> Everyone has their own personal idea of hell. For Simon, I imagine it would be something related to having to sit still with nothing to do, like waiting for a train that's been delayed or he's forgotten his phone and just has to sit there looking for a huge advert for a mortgage provider for an unknown number of minutes. Oh my god. <laughs> Katie, have you looked into my soul? Because I, I have... This is accurate beyond measure. And it's like, yeah... I will be like, if I'm on the, if I, like when my headphones run out of battery and I'm walking, it's like, what am I going to do? Just look around at what's around me. Are you insane? Do you have any idea how unstimulating that is? I'm a broken millennial and I need input and stimulation absolutely constantly. Um, this is 
absolutely bang on though for me it happens every halloween when i can't help but say through gritted teeth the monster is not called frankenstein the doctor was called frankenstein i admit to bring this on myself by being such a pedant but come on people the book's been out for over 200 years yeah i have to have to admit i really didn't know this until we did a biographics video about mary shelley who wrote frankenstein and yeah yeah the, the monster is the monster frankenstein's the doctor the more you know now you can be a dick whenever people bring that up as well Woo! great thanks the concept of hell as an afterlife or place where bad people go when they die has been around for a very long time it's usually pretty entwined with religion to serve as an opposite to the idea of heaven or paradise for true believers in whatever religion who also managed to make it through life as decent humans the god hades presided over the underworld of the ancient greeks and we still have the tales today of people like tantalus whose punishment was to stand in a pool of water with some grapes hanging over his head but every time he tried to reach up or down the water or the grapes were always just out of reach i've never heard that that sounds weird i mean that just sounds like okay (laughs) i guess i don't have any water or grapes eventually i'll die and go to like second hell it's a very like if people what's your idea well i don't know being whipped while having that being burned by a devil i guess would just be worse than oh no i'm standing into water and i'm a little bit hungry and thirsty but i can't die because i'm already dead it's a bit bit weird isn't it or sisyphus whose punishment was to shove a huge rock up a hill only for it to keep rolling back down as soon as he neared the top oh no sisyphus boohoo ah sisyphus let me introduce you to real hell i could it could be much more creative it could be much more creative i've got a true crime podcast called the casual criminalist there's all sorts of horrible shit that goes on over there that would you know it's not like, oh this is the worst thing i've ever heard of putting a rock pushing a rock up a hill and then it rolls down the hill oh sisyphus no christianity and islam have similar descriptions of their versions of hell both involving pain violence and lots of fire for the unworthy what may seem hellish to some is actually other people's idea of a good night out so it may stand to reason that if hell actually exists it might manifest differently for different people as per the ancient greeks and their underworlds the location of hell seems generally agreed to be somewhere below us just as people look up at the sky when thinking of heaven or paradise so people tend to point downwards when indicating that someone might have gone to hell but where exactly is the location of this place (laughs) it's obviously buried really far underground isn't it gacy obviously like heaven is above the clouds except we figured out that it wasn't when we went to you know above the clouds we're like oh look there's just more emptiness oh none of this is real but where exactly is the location of this place is it a realm outside of space and time somewhere south of us in the universe or is it literally below us somewhere inside planet earth (laughs) ah so do all the references to heat and fire mean that it's located somewhere near the core of our world and if we dig deep enough could we one day reach it did this in fact happen in 1989 during the drilling of the deepest hole in the world stop that skeptical interact interjection in its tracks put that eyebrow down and let's see where this story goes eh i'm vaguely familiar with this story because of the video i made about the actual deep hole that they dug the super cola super deep borehole in siberia and uh, it's just that they didn't get to hell because it's not real and even if you believe it is real dear listener and i'm surprised i haven't put you off this show yet um it's not it's 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 a, like it's not a place that's buried underneath the earth does the bible even say that does your religious teachings of choice actually even say that because that would be insane the mystery i call this section the mystery but here's some historical context first which is a hundred percent true <laughs> at some point this will seamlessly flow into the mystery event but i'll let you work out when that happens i'll give you a hint it won't be very hard (laughs) you may be familiar with the term space race this was a usa versus soviet union race which started in the 1950s and pitted the two nations against each other to be the first to do various things in space like launching satellites sending up manned flights landing on the moon etc well running concurrently to this race to the stars was another race to plumb the depths of the earth for geological and technological reasons the us and the soviet union also decided to drill as far down through the earth's crust as they could to a layer known as the oh my god discontinuity the uh, oh my godding at the pronunciation of this although maybe those c's are pronounced like i, I know that letter from czech it's a ch so mohorovichits maybe discontinuity 
Russians, let me know how I did. We are busy like attendance. Uh, or don't, you don't have to. The US got their project underway first, perhaps, because after the surprise launch of the Sputnik satellite in 1957, the science community was desperate to claim back some kudos for itself. <laughs> You'd be like, ah, Soviet Union, you launched a spacecraft into space? Ah, lame. We dug a really deep hole. Pfft, try and do that. And then they did, and it was deeper. But, uh, I mean, I'm kind of being like, digging a hole is not as impressive as putting something in space. Is it America? Is it? They'd be like, nah, Simon, that hole is way more impressive. The Soviet Union had also made public claims that it was going to be investing in the, investigating the Moho discontinuity, so the US probably thought... <laughs> We better hurry up with that one. This led to quite a bizarre quest to drill down through the Earth's crust to this region which is just above the Earth's mantle. It's known as the discontinuity as scientists worked out that seismic waves suddenly increase in speed in that area, meaning that there's a big change in materials and density, but nobody was sure how or why. In an almost exact opposite project to the space race, the race of the MOHO aimed to bring up samples of this region to further our understanding of the planet we live on. The only problem was that to get to the MOHO, the US would need to drill through a lot of crust first. It's like, yeah, I'm, you look at those pictures of the Earth, right? You know, where it's like, yeah, 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 this is the like crusty outside bit. Then there's the big, like, it's solid, right? But there's that big, like, other layer. And then inside that, there's like some molten core, and then there's like a really hot core or something going on. <laughs> Earth geography is really excellent here. But even though that crust looks super, super thin, the Earth's really big and it's really thick still. I'm pretty sure they didn't get through it. They didn't get even close to getting through the crust. Spoiler alert. If you want to try tackling it from where you're standing, you'd probably need to go at least 35 kilometers or 22 miles down, and that's only at an average point. So the US decided to dispense with a lot of that mileage from the get-go and start drilling their hole at the bottom of the ocean where the crust was much thinner, just off the coast of Mexico. Does that make sense? Well, I suppose so. Did they get very far? No, they did not. This was 1961, and the team behind the project had to make up solutions as they went on how to keep the boat still so far off the ocean floor, how to lower the pipes down, how to actually drill through the crust, and then how to bring samples back up. Oh, my God. At a point, you'd just be like, well, how about we just start drilling on land, and we'll get down to the bottom of the ocean, and then we'll just go from there. Because, like, figure out to keep a boat perfectly still. And you're probably in some really deep ocean here, because you want to avoid as much of the crust as possible, right? I don't know, that just sounds way more complicated than just start drilling on land, which the Soviets did. I feel like this is a space pen pencil thing, you know, where the Americans used the space pen and the Soviets used the pencils, which is obviously just an urban legend and it's not true. But uh, the analogy sort of works. The Soviets just were like, let's just drill down from land. And they did get further, spoiler alert. Damn Russians are watching us right now. As a test run, Project Mohol, as it was known, did manage to drill through almost two kilometers or 1.2 miles down. But after this initial drill, funding dried up and the project was shelved in 1966. While contributing valuable things to science, like how to keep boats steady without an anchor and useful information from the ocean floor, Project Mohol did not appear to breach the limits of a fiery hellscape. Enter the picture, the Soviet Union in May. 1970, the USSR started its attempt to drill through the Earth's crust. It went pretty well, with the borehole located in the remote part of Siberia officially becoming the world's deepest artificial hole in 1979. Whoa! They spent nine years drying that their funding definitely didn't dry up. They were like, let's just print more money. Or like, I don't know, communism. How does it work? As it crashed through the previous record set by the US of 9,583 meters or 31,440 feet. That's a lot further than the Americans. After this initial hole reached over 11,000 meters, that's 36,000 feet in 1982, various other holes stemming off this main one were started, and by 1989, one of the boreholes had reached over 12,200 meters, or over seven and a half miles deep. That is really deep. If you dropped like a penny down that hole, it would take a really long time to reach the bottom. <laughs> it was at this point that something happened. The drill seemed to break through into some sort of underground pocket and started spinning out of control. Strange noises could be heard emanating from what seemed like a large cavern, so the scientists on the surface sent down microphones and more tools to take readings and samples. This, hello, is uh, where the, uh, the story diverges, if you hadn't picked up on it. <laughs> 
What they found was that the temperatures in the cabin exceeded 1,000 degrees centigrade or 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit, and the microphones captured wailing and screaming with a more ominous male voice audible over the top. Yes, I know, we'll get to all of that later. Also, on the same night that the cabin was breached, a huge gas pillar shot up out of the borehole, revealing a bat-like demonic figure against the night sky, and also the words, I have conquered in Russian. I didn't know this bit. I'm vaguely familiar with the story. I remember the microphones going down there. I don't remember the gas and the bat symbol. <laughs> just just in case it wasn't unbelievable enough, they added that in. <laughs> I realized it was one of those 1990s internet rumors, which is just people were like, oh my god, it must be true. It's on the internet. So, why didn't this make headline news at the time? Well, it's simple. All the scientists either quit immediately and kept their peace, or those that remains were given a sedative and erased their, that erased their short-term memory, and therefore all knowledge of the event. So, how do we know about this so-called well to hell? Well, later, in 1989, American Christian Broadcasting Company, Trinity Broadcasting Network, I don't sense a conflict of interest at all here, <laughs> ran a piece on TV and also in print under the, site, under the title, Scientists Discover Hell. It was picked up by a few other Christian newsletters here and there, but the amazing story of how a geological expedition actually cracked through into the home of Satan himself did not make it past the pages of a few fringe publications. Why is that, we wonder? Well, let's find out. <laughs> I'm just going to go ahead and guess. It might have something to do with a significant lack of peer review. Unpicking the story. It turns out that this is more a story of how an urban legend is formed than anything else. Because, spoiler alert here, this is not actually a true story. What? I wasn't expecting this. In, in I know. Shocking, right? I usually try to drag these things out a little further, but the story you just heard is about all the information there is on the event, so I may as well just put the cards on the table now and admit that this never happens. Oh my god, I'm so skeptical. One day Katie's gonna get me. There's gonna be something that's absolutely real and just unbelievable. And she's gonna be like, Simon, I wanna write about this, and I'll be like, <laughs> That sounds ridiculous. You write there, Katie. Go ahead. And I'll be reading it, shitting all over it like I always do. And then Katie will be like, yeah, but this one's actually true. And here is all the documentation backing it up. And I'll be like, what? And then I'll feel like an idiot and I'll be put in my place. And everyone at home will be extremely satisfied that smug old fact boy has uh, been put down. We won! <laughs> we won! <laughs> Or that'll never happen because I'm just way too big brain. Okay. How can we be so sure? Well, for starters, let's take a look at this borehole into the underworld. As you probably know, urban legends are notoriously tricky to pin down because details change from telling to telling, with some aspects based in truth to give them a bit of a sheen of plausibility. In this story, the most common versions floating about usually refer to Siberia as the location for this discovery. If you look up how big Siberia is, well, it's over 5 million square miles, so you might have thought it useful to the human race that the entrance itself might be a little more accurately plotted. Yeah, Siberia. Really big. Really big. Really cold. Don't want to go there. No, don't. Siberia, I feel, is where they send people, like, to gulags. Or, like, prison. It's like, the, if someone said, where do you want to be least sent? You know, like, Family Feud style. <laughs> like, do -do 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 -do, Siberia! Our survey says, is that Family Feud? I don't watch any of these game shows. Just vaguely aware of them. Don't be stupid, some listeners might be thinking. It's where the world's deepest man-made hole is, duh. Okay, fair point. However, the deepest borehole in the world is not in a remote area of Siberia. It's on the Kola Peninsula, still part of Russia, but way over near the border of Norway and a significant distance from Siberia. The facts and figures mentioned earlier about the borehole were actually from the Kola Superdeep Borehole, as it's known. This Russian effort is still the deepest man-made hole in the world, with a depth of 12,262 meters, that's about 40,000 feet, or a whopping 7.6 miles. It hit that depth in 1989. The drilling project ended in 1994, and the hole is still only about a third of the way through the Earth's crust. So, did anything come flying out of this hole that could be regarded in any way as supernatural? If it did, no one ever mentioned it, and it seems like the sort of thing that at least one person, you know, might mention. Interestingly, one of the reasons the Kola drilling project was canned was that the deeper they got, the hotter it became, until it reached a point where the rock was becoming more porous and less solid, so drilling became just too difficult. Now you might be saying, well, it became hotter like the fires of hell, yes? Um, no, not, not quite. 
If it did become significantly hotter than scientists had predicted for the depths they were reaching, but we're talking 180 degrees Celsius here, that's about 350 Fahrenheit, not the 1000 degrees Celsius of the urban legend. And in case you had picked up on one of the major sticking points for the story, it mentions that the team lowered scientific instruments and recording devices down into the fiery hole. How on earth would that equipment survive at 1000 degrees? Why don't they make microphones that can survive 1000 degrees Celsius? I bet they do. I bet that exists. Although a thousand is really hot. There's probably some like extreme equipment that you can buy that can survive that that kind of heat. Right? <laughs> I don't know. I'm just totally guessing. There's an audio clip you can find online that most sources have as lasting 17 seconds. That would be an impressive microphone in the 1980s to manage to last that long in the fires of hell. And what of this audio clip? Yes, it does exist. It sounds like a large group of people shouting and screaming, but to be honest, it could have been recorded outside any weather spoons after 10 p.m. on a Friday night. <laughs> For our international listeners, uh, Katie's British as well. Um, weather spoons is a like cheap pub where... Uh, yeah, I don't know. Let's just say when I was a student, I had some good few nights drinking at the Weatherspoons. Beer was like two pounds or even you could get a pint for like less than two pounds. And they actually have a pretty good selection of booze. The food's dreadful. But uh, yeah, I would, I'd don't complain about Weatherspoons. It's all right. It's a bit rough. <laughs> going to be noisy outside at 10, at 10 p.m. As we now live in the days of ultimate skepticism and have access to many digital toys, these sounds of hell have been routinely picked apart with the conclusion that they're actually a continually looped and layered section from a movie called Barren Blood. Wow. <laughs> the technology's amazing. One as everyone is convinced that this was the source material, it's not exactly difficult to get a sample from any TV show, movie, or radio broadcast that has some sort of scattered crowd talk scene in it. Heck, you could even create something yourself or just go outside, stand outside the aforementioned weather spoons with a tape recorder. Yeah, I reckon it would take me about a day to make a pretty convincing sound hellscape, and I don't really know what I'm doing. <laughs> day with YouTube guiding me. <laughs> Doesn't sound complicated, does it? Now, once we get down the shaft, though, then it's a piece of cake. But how did this story get going in the first place? There's a named source in some of the versions called Mr. Dmitry Azakov, or alternatively spelled Azakov which works brilliantly in the audio formats. <laughs> They're just spelled slightly differently. Apparently, he was the project manager for the drilling program, and it was his account of the events that made it into the public domain. It wasn't until the Trinity Broadcasting Network picked up the story, though, that it really gained any serious traction at all. And how did they get a hold of it? Publishing the story under the headline, Scientists to Discover Hell, you might have thought the story would have some wider reach, or there would be some photos to go along with it. None were forthcoming, not really surprising, and TBN quoted their source as a Finnish newspaper, Amun Nasacia. Sorry, Finnish people. Uh, Finland was also quite close to the location of the Kola Super Deep Borehole, so it seems pretty legit that a Finnish paper might have the scoop on hellish goings on. Look, if they really discovered hell, that would be in big newspapers, not some weird Christian one and some random Finnish one that's also made up. Hmm. Right? You know, like someone's discovered hell. It's like that TV show where they discover heaven's real and then people start killing themselves. If you like, if people discovered that, it would be a big deal. It would be a big, people would know. People like me would be like, holy shit, really? I totally didn't believe in any of that, but it's real? And they'll be like, yeah, here's the scientific proof. And I'll be like, god damn, that's nice. That's good news. Except that Aminasatia, the Finnish paper, sorry to make you say it again, <laughs> was not a prestigious Finnish newspaper, but rather a niche Lutheran magazine. Again, do I possibly sense a conflict of interest here? Yes. Uh, that ceased publication that same year of 1989. So, how did they get a hold of it? Did someone who worked for the publication actually witness the event with their own eyes? Well, no. This was just yet another wonky link in a very fragile chain unearthed by radio host Rich Buhler. He hosted a Christian radio show after the word of the TBN story reached him via his listeners and he set out to find more. While never believing that the story was true, Bula nevertheless wanted to find out how it started, and he and his staff undertook a very thorough investigation, uncovering another mischief maker along the way. What a legend. Rich Bula's Day Off According to his blog post, Drilling to Hell, Facts, Bueller started off by contacting TBN to ask about sources for the hellhole piece. He was assured that it was true by someone who had done no fact-checking or tried to find any other source of information. <laughs> that person, please don't let them call themselves a journalist. <laughs> it's like, storyteller. They'd just taken the word of the Finnish magazine, which had been sent to them by a listener from Texas. <laughs> it's not good enough, guys. It's really not good enough. In the translated piece, the mysterious Dr. Azakov is quoted as saying, 
We could hardly believe our own ears. We heard a human voice screaming in pain. Even though one voice was discernible, we could hear thousands, perhaps millions in the background of suffering souls screaming. After this ghastly discovery, about half of the scientists quit because of fear. Hopefully that which is down there will stay there. It's just Becker's belief that anyone would actually broadcast this as fact, let alone a Christian network. Uh, on the Christian networks, there'd be my more, well, look, there's a hell, behave yourself. God's real, and he'll send you to hell. I feel like the Christian network would want to perpetrate this, which is probably why they did, rather than being like, that's not real. It's just a story, isn't it? They're basically saying, yes, we know hell is real, and here it is, without giving it second thought. What did TBN hope to achieve by doing this? I don't know, pe more people believing in religion and stuff? That people would be scared into believing in God? Yeah, if I found out it was real, I'd be like, Sh God is scared. If someone was like, yo, we found hell, and it's real, I'd be like, oh, f <laughs> Wait, can I say, is it, is it that religion where as long as you say you're sorry, you can go to heaven? And I'd be like, no, 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 it's the other one we have to believe for your whole life. Ah, oh, no, no. And then I'd have to work out a way to stay alive so I don't have to go to hell. Maybe they can store my brain in some sort of vat. So at least I'm like in some coma forever instead of like actually dying and going to hell because it's real. There'd be a whole industry of like stopping people dying because they'd be like, oh no, I've been really bad. I'm not even really bad. Just like I did something that the Bible said I envied. I envied and now I'm in hell. I was so good other than the envy and the gluttony. <laughs> And the other sins that are not that bad but still send us all to hell if you believe in that stuff. To give the science community a smug, told you so? Yeah, it's probably both of these things. But the fact that the story was just made up makes them look like gullible fools. This was the exact reaction of Mr. Of one Mr. Orglay Rendelin. I'm sorry, Mr. Orglay. Your name's spelt Mr. Age, but Katie's provided me with a pronunciation guide. Orgeh. Orgeh. Orgeh, a Norwegian man who had caught the original TBN broadcast while he was in the States in 1989. Astounded at how stupid the story was, he decided to see if he could push it further. Returning to Norway, he sent some Norwegian newspaper articles with his own translations to TBN, claiming that he had initially been skeptical of the story, but that these confirmed it was true. He also added in a bit about the cloud shooting up and the bat-winged demon appearing in the sky. <laughs> what a legend. Ah! When Rich Buer caught up with him, he immediately confirmed the whole thing was just a prank and the newspaper articles were about something completely different. <laughs> this is before Google Translate, wasn't it? Because now you'd just be like, okay, I'm just going to put my phone over it and it's going to like translate it instantly into my language. And it would just be about like parking fines being updated in the city. You'd be like, what the? Come on! Where's the bat guy? He had banked on nobody bothering to check his translation, and he was correct, so now his bat demon had entered the mythos of the well to hell story. Picking up on the original story thread, Bueller contacted the Finnish magazine, and they said they had run the story thanks to a member remembering having seen it in another Finnish paper called Etella Soman. This is the sloppiest journalism I've ever seen. So it's basically one company, the Christian Network in America, has copied a story from a Lutheran Finnish newspaper, Norwegian newspaper, Finnish newspaper, something like that, uh, that part of the world. And they basically based their story on one of their, I'm not going to call him a journalist, one of their writers, um, vaguely remembering something from another newspaper. <laughs> it's like, dudes, this is not journalism. This is not okay. Bueller contacted the paper, and eventually they found the reference he was looking for. It wasn't a front-page story like you might expect. It was very deep in correspondence from readers' section, where people can submit whatever they want. In a research mission that went almost as deep as the borehole itself, Bueller and his team managed to track down the man who wrote the letter, and he confirmed that he had seen the story in yet another Finnish Christian newspaper. We're going even deeper! This one called Veiltajat. Bueller kept digging. Did he get in touch with Vail to Jet? You bet your bottom do dollar he did. They confirmed that the Welldale story appeared in their July 1989 newsletter and had been sent in by a reader after he had apparently read about it. Oh my god, how deep is this? This is like six newspapers in. It alleged it's like Chinese whispers of urban legends. He had originally read about in a Jewish Christian newsletter called Jewels of Jericho, which was based in California. No solid trace of this publication was ever found, though, so Bueller's backtracking ended here, seemingly with the original source of the story not being in Finland at all, but rather in the US all along. This is so... Cr I love this. I love... Like, I knew that this... I vaguely knew about this story. I had no idea about this super complex backstory of how it was made up. This is great. 
As we've pretty much definitively established that the whole thing was made up from the start, where did the audio recording come into it? While it had always been part of the original story that special heat-resistant microphones managed to capture the noises of the damned, it wasn't until 1998 that this purported recording actually surfaced. After the story had done the rounds again on local TV and radio shows, someone contacted the Coast to Coast AM radio show with the audio recording in a letter which said that the writer's uncle who had recently died was a collector of all things paranormal and had a recording of the hell sounds in his collection because of course he did the letter also said uh quote the story about the digging the hearing of the sounds from hell is very real it did occur in siberia and he let me listen to one of the audio tapes that he had on the sounds from hell in siberia and i copied it he received a copy from a friend who worked at the bbc <laughs> well is this is just awesome dude he just wrote a letter that doesn't mean any of it is true and then they're like later people figure out that it's actually from a movie <laughs> why would people believe this oh he worked at the bbc so it must be real but he probably did even work at the bbc the audio recording attached was about 17 seconds of the spooky wailing and shouting which then became synonymous with the official sounds of hell again there was no real backstory or checking for the audio clip it just managed to attach itself to the story and that was that sloppy journalism isn't it aftermath that wasn't quite it for the tale of when some scientists accidentally drilled through into the portal of hell later in 1990 our friend rich bueller heard from a pastor from a small church in arizona that the story was true why did this man think he had the inside scoop one of his parishioners was on a covert drilling mission in russia and had witnessed the event with his own eyes i saw it on tv ah yes some made up eyewitness testimony finally an eyewitness also this man had a phd in physics from mit so presumably he knew what he was talking about and also had a reasonable head on his shoulders uh wait really i i mean i'm super skeptical that he had a phd from M mit because he's obviously lying <laughs> it's obviously made up and i don't get i just don't i don't know seems too smart to do something like this he was due to continue his work on heat resistant recording devices and was going to go back to russia the next year and did he Bueller heard back from the church a few months later with an update that far from being a scientist the man was actually just a con artist and had left town with over twenty thousand dollars that the church had raised to fund his trip i don't want to laugh because he's like scamming a church but it's like dudes really you think it's a well he's got to go to russia to test these recording devices that he's making with his phd in physics in uh because that's the only place we can get something to a thousand degrees celsius no it's not you can just that's easily done <laughs> it's very it's not complicated to get to a thousand degrees many many times more than that in 1992 the weekly world news did a piece on the well to hell but the headlines they run today consist of such articles as werewolf escapes from alabama prison and robot overlords abort usa invasion okay it's not a real news source is it uh you may want to take their stories with a liberal pinch of salt yeah this is like i don't know i'm in the business of like facts like my internet nickname is fact boy and what of my internet nicknames fact boy and i go onto tiktok right i'm like let's see what facts are like on tiktok and it's so bad i want to, i've been considering making a, a show called fact police and maybe doing it on my business place channel where we just look at fact channels on tiktok and correct them because they're insane like you watch this there's, there's these things and they're like this is a picture of a werewolf that was found in a library it was somewhere that this and it's like and everyone they speak like this i don't know why it must be a tiktok thing and then it's a picture of a werewolf and it's not because one werewolves aren't real and it's clearly just some weird photoshop thing and if you google image reverse search i'm sure you'd find the origin of on some crappy website so i don't know i like the idea of fact police <laughs> it'd be even more of a dicky channel than this also in the way urban legends do the story got changed again this time with the borehole being located in alaska and 13 workers dying when the incandescent bat demon exploded out of the well the story did continue to pop up from time to time with a mix of details and locations but it gradually faded back down in the public consciousness so what have we learned from this tale was there a drilling expedition that managed to find hell at the bottom of a hole in siberia well no there was never a deep drilling project in siberia in the 80s was the cola super deep borehole the way we reached the gates of satan and rudely barged in again 
No. Uh, while a real hole, nothing came out of it apart from things useful to geological study. Did a demon come shooting out of any borehole anywhere in the world again? The answer is no. This was confirmed as being made up by the guy whose name I've forgotten how to pronounce, but it's spelled age. <laughs> Age Randolin, where the sounds, where the hand sounds of hell actually ever recorded. Again, no. As well as no equipment being able to survive the purported thousand degree heat, the clip that did the rounds as being the sounds of hell has been definitively proved to be a short audio clip repeated and layered upon itself. While many players in this story absolutely believe in the concept of hell, they were also prepared to completely bash this tale for the made-up rubbish that it was. I mean, think about it. If hell had really been found literally underground, wouldn't the news have made a bigger splash? Wouldn't it have become sort of a huge tourist destination where you could go and chuck a coin in and wish to be saved or something? Also, dig a bigger hole, make it wide enough for a person, and then it'd be like, just go in and fish some people out, be like, it's okay, you don't have to be in hell anymore. When you die again, we'll just come down and get you again. It'll be fine. It'll be fine. Don't worry about it. You might have to endure it for like a couple of months while we mount an expedition. An expedi- There'll be a huge business around it. There'll be like hell expeditions. People going in to find their loved ones, paying for it. It'll be great. That's why it's not real. Capitalism would have used this. At the very least, wouldn't it become a place for teenage goths to hang out and pledge their allegiance to the Dark Lord? Some churches did apparently record an increase in their congregations after the news started filtering out. But if it was all a publicity stunt to increase bums on pews, it certainly chose an odd and winding path to reach any amount of audience at all. It seems that someone, somewhere, maybe had a nightmare and wrote it down or just made up the whole thing and submitted it to a local publication, and other people then slowly disseminated it, culminating in a few mentions on US Christian broadcast networks. But then, here we are, dredging it up over 30 years later and playing our own part in spreading the urban legends of that one time in Russia when some people drilled down into hell itself. This is exactly one of the sort of facts that you'd see on one of those fact channels on TikTok. They were drilling a hole in Russia and they got down deep enough. Eventually, they broke through into hell. A demon came up. 13 people died. This is a fact. And then the video ends and that's it. That is facts on TikTok and it's insane. Insanely sh- Regarding the drilling of the Moha projects that we talked about at the start, it seems that the scientific community is still very interested in making it down to the Earth's mantle. While there were several projects touted in the 20-teens, that's last decade, that's a confusing way of saying it. 2010s, 2010s? I don't know. Yeah, the 1910s, right? 1910s, 1920s, 1930s. Yeah, that makes sense. I couldn't find any updates in more recent years of any significance, and the Kola Super Deep Borehole is the deepest artificial hole on the planet. One of the reasons it stopped when it did was because of the increase in heat and pressure and the drills that the drills started to encounter, making it impossible to go much further. Who knows, maybe it really was a warning barrier that future drilling operations will per- penetrate at their par- peril. We'll just have to wait and see. Hell's not down there, guys. Sorry to disappoint you. This has been an episode of Decoding the Unknown. If you enjoyed it and you're watching on YouTube, there is a like button below that you're more than welcome to use. You could also subscribe. That would be grand. Uh, If you're listening as a podcast, a review, that would be the best thing you could do. It uh, gets this show in front of more people. And uh, I appreciate it. I like reading them. Thank you so much. And I will see you next time. Hello everybody, welcome back to another episode of Decoding the Unknown. As always, hello there, I'm your host Simon. What happens here is I have a mystery in front of me, one that I've never read before. This is a cold read. Uh, This one, uh, Katie is our normal writer on this channel, our regular contributor. But today's is brought to you by Kevin in a partial effort of mine to attempt to get this podcast slash YouTube channel up to two videos a week because uh, I wasn't making enough videos. And I'd like to get it to two a week. They're not super long. I think it should be manageable. I rather like making them. I get to sit down and explore a mystery. It's, uh, it's fun. It's fun. I like being able to do this. Guys, if you are enjoying this show, please do consider leaving it a review if you're listening to it in its podcast form. You can do that on Apple Podcasts. Even now, Spotify has a rating system. So you can go to Spotify. And you can rate this podcast, which uh, the higher you rate it, the more people it gets in front of, apparently. 
some sort of algorithmic magic and if you're watching this on youtube make sure you smash the like button and subscribe love all of that stuff what we're covering today or kevin has covered for me is the uh i'm gonna look up the pronunciation of that i realize i have no idea how to pronounce the name of this episode of public publius 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 it sounds like latin so obviously there's gonna be controversy over that why it's not in my pronunciation dictionary so that's not a brilliant start let's try the other one there's a backup pronunciation dictionary which is slightly less good let's try that also doesn't have it well i'm gonna guess it's publius oh it does have it in latin hello publius latin i just feel like you could say it just like publius publius i'm just gonna say publius because i uh don't want to be putting on a weird fake latin accent and all latin accents kind of fake because we don't really know how latin sounds let's go for years i will i will spoil it a little i've read this one ahead this was kevin's first piece and uh whenever it's first time with a new author uh, it's like you don't trust me do you I'll, i want to read it to make sure it's good rather than like sitting down doing all this intro and stuff and then being like oh this needs work so i have read this i will sort of pretend that i haven't i guess to keep it in format um <laughs> i don't know how that's gonna work let's see for years my family had been on the bleeding edge of technology. We got our first PC in the Christmas of 1988 when I was only six years old. Still three years before Windows 3.1 brought a vaguely user-friendly experience to the masses. I'm a little bit younger than you, Kevin, and I remember there was a time even when I remember having early PCs and we didn't have Windows. It was like you could open things up using like DOS. And then it was also a program. It was called like Magic Desktop or some shit like that. It was like a it was like a graphical user interface that you could use to control the computer, like and click on things to open them. But it wasn't Windows. And then Windows three point whatever it was came along. And then the first Windows I really remember, like I vaguely remember three point one or whatever. I really remember Windows ninety five coming along with that start menu and being like, oh boy, this makes things a whole lot easier to use. <laughs> and still, like, what, 20, 30 years later, we're still using the start menu. Which is kind of incredible, the innovation that that was. I remember once they tried to take it away and everyone was like, what the fuck, Microsoft? Are you kidding me? By age seven, I had already started, started to teach myself computer programming, albeit at an extremely rudimentary level. I laughed at my father when he brought a brand, home a brand new 800 megabyte hard drive, declaring that there was no way we could ever need that much storage space. Tell you what, this episode, what, we're three, four minutes in? It's absolutely already well over 800 megabytes in size. <laughs> Like I'll try, one of these, you know, sometimes I'll do half an hour, 40 minutes recording, take it over to my computer, it's like 15 gigabytes. And you're like, I bought a hard disk the other day just because I ran out of storage space. And I was just like, okay, what's like the best, you know, cost to, price, cost to space ratio? 16 terabytes. It was like a couple hundred bucks equivalent. I was like, wow, <laughs> what a world we live in. Eventually, my brother and I began spending entirely too much time on the computer, so my father reprogrammed it to lock us out. Upon powering on the computer, it would display nothing other than a non-interactive screen that said, Cannot be used. Eagle Scout not achieved. For Simon and his UK listeners, Eagle Scouts are like super high scouts, right? I'm saying this, I'm saying this like I don't know this, but this is the thought I had when I first read this. And now I know that Kevin's about to explain to me that it's something equivalent in the UK scouts that I also don't know because i was never a scout um <laughs> you can see the problem when it's like you're trying a cold read a script but you've already read it it's like you've literally spoiled everything for yourself and now i'm like half pretending that i haven't but i have i don't know what to do <laughs> it's not normally like this why can't you lie to me just once uh that is the boy scouts of america's version of the queen's badge no i i knew more what an eagle scout is than a queen's badge to be honest and something my father was very insistent i should attain to put on my college applications naturally we just programmed the computer to circumvent the lock he put on it in retrospect eagle scout would look much better on my college application than insolent little shit, but hindsight is 2020. i don't know if i'm an employer and someone's got an eagle scout or they're like yeah or i'm extremely good at computers i mean depending on what i'm hiring them for whether it's like forestry work or uh computer programming probably going to be more interested in the person who's been like you know playing around with computers since they were two um so yeah i guess i don't know do you remember how much we used to care about that stuff 
So I guess some some people still do if you're listening to this, or maybe some of you are so past it. But I remember like how important like we had something called a UCAS application. Well, I guess it's the British equivalent of college applications, and you had to write like a personal statement. You put your grades on there. You put all your activities on there. And I just remember how important this was. And he'd be like, "Oh my God, we'd do clubs just because you wanted to have them on there. Do you like this Duke of Edinburgh expedition where you'd go like hiking and do like charity work and stuff just to put it on you? It wasn't because we felt good about doing charity work or any of that stuff. It wasn't like I went to like these clubs because I enjoyed them. It was just because I had to put it on my bloody UCAS form. And I said, like, oh my God, what a waste of life. And how little all of that matters in the, I'm get- I mean, I guess like, look, I'm speaking from my own personal experience. Like university wasn't super important to what I'm doing right now. I enjoyed it. It was a great experience. Glad I did it. But, uh, and I guess like if you're a doctor or like, you know, <laughs> something like that, it's probably was really important that you had a good UCAS form and did all these clubs. But I just look back on it now thinking about how much I stressed out about all that stuff and how just utterly unimportant it ended up being. <laughs> if someone had told me back then, you'll be fine. Don't worry about it. You don't have to do any of this stuff. I'd be like, wait, but what? How am I going to make a living without? And they'd be like, no, no, no. None of that university stuff's going to matter for you, fact boy. And I'm like, what do you mean, fact boy? Who's a fact boy? And it would just, have been a huge weight off my chest <laughs> uh all this fighting back and forth ceased in 1991 however when my father brought home a brand new lightning fast 14.40 kilobit dial-up modem yes suddenly we had access to all the knowledge and information of the entire world and there was no time for petty bickering i've got 5g on my mobile phone now it's i mean i had it for like a year it still blows my mind like thinking back to when i first got internet like uh what was the one before i didn't have 14.4 but my first internet was like was it 28.8 like the one before 56k and it was so slow but it was so cool to have and now it's just like yeah my phone can just do hundreds of thousands of times faster than that it's just crazy that was the theory anyway the internet was a very different place back in the early and mid 1990s most of the user experience took place within the walls of the user's particular isp like aol or prodigy or in my case something called CompuServe. If you could even find them, websites were crude and aesthetically displeasing, useful information was few and far between, and a person really needed to know where to look to find what they wanted. The amount of prerequisite knowledge required to find anything on the early internet meant that if you knew how to find it, you probably already knew everything it had to offer anyway. Yeah, I remember once, like, they first got internet at school, and we could use, com- like, it was at secondary school, and we could use computers during our break. And I remember we'd just go, you know, f- around on the internet or whatever. And uh, a guy... W- asked me he was like dude i want to find some cheats for gta and i just keep trying to go to like he's like gta.com gta cheats.com and that's how he's trying to find websites because it's like i mean i think yahoo was around so i was like my dude just go to yahoo.com or ask jeeves and type in gta cheats and that's going to serve you better than just trying to guess the domain name (laughs) but it was really like we knew nothing we knew nothing the internet was so Social interaction was much smaller and more confined as well. Chat rooms topped off at a couple of dozen people. Forums were exclusive to the mem- members of whichever ISP you were subscribed to. There was only one medium back then with which to communicate to large numbers of people simultaneously in a relatively easy to find way. Next time you toss some stale bread into the basement, you can tell Danny. Oh, this is a cross. This is a reference for uh, another channel that I do, Business Place, where the ongoing joke is that Danny is stuck in the basement, my basement, where I make him churn out scripts. I'll leave whether he is up to your imagination. Uh, tell him I learned from the best because here, after 450 words, our story truly begins. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, Danny's famous for his very lengthy introductions. Although, Kevin, you got a way to go. Danny's normally span pages. Usenet. Usenet was the first truly popular variation of internet forums that existed. It could be accessed regardless of your ISP, and it could even be said that new messages would go directly to your email inbox. These were also the days before spam and folders with over 9,000 unread email existed. Oh my god, yeah. I have to say, a few years ago, I just sorted it all out and was like, I'm just gonna, it was just crazy, my email inbox. And I was just, I'm just gonna sort this properly so I don't have it constantly full. And that worked, and it's still not full to this day, which is nice. So that, configura- so that configuration was not nearly as unwieldy as it would be today. Usenet was made up of a network of news groups, which ranged from uselessly broad in scope to so niche that it was surprising that they had more than one member. Basically, it was Reddit. I've always been a huge fan of music, so when I discovered Usenet and news groups, I was quick to join alt.music.pinkfloyd. Oh, Pink Floyd. Pink Floyd. I got things about Pink Floyd. The news group for my favorite band at the time. Dude, 
okay okay so everyone loves pink floyd the dark side of the moon people are like this is the best thing ever it's so good and i was like really all i knew about pink floyd was the wall like the the album and the 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 famous song and i just never really liked it so i was like okay let's listen to dark side of the moon let's get really into it i recently bought a pair of fancy headphones and i got that title you know the the streaming service and all this stuff and i'm really listening and i'm like i just don't think it's very good and there's another band i like from the same era that i recently discovered called uh oh my god the name's absolutely escaping me right now which is crazy fleetwood mac fleetwood mac who around same time as pink floyd and i'm listening to them he's like, this is fantastic this is fantastic music this uh an album which is released at similar times to dark side called rumors is a fantastic album it's a brilliant piece of music and so much of fleetwood mac is and i'm like i feel like pink floyd are more famous than fleetwood mac but they suck in comparison <laughs> this is just bad oh people are gonna hate this but Fleet- pink floyd just kind of suck i'm sorry kevin sometimes there would be information that would be potentially exciting like reports of the band's set list at various concerts but being your standard lazy unemployed 11 year old it's not like i had money to buy tickets no matter how exciting a concert promised to be beyond that it was the same sort of insane fanboying and obsessive anal- analysis that you'd expect to see on r slash star wars r slash lord of the rings or r slash simon whistler and we all know which of the best subreddits is that it's r slash simon whistler which is a genuine subreddit which you can join this all changed on the 11th of june 1994 when a user posting under the name publius posted the following message okay so it's just like uh, uh, the format changes slightly i'm showing people watching but uh basically i'll just read it as i you know that's what we do here the message quote my friends you have heard the message pink floyd has delivered but if you listened perhaps i can be your guide but i will not solve the enigma for you all of you must open your minds and communicate with each other as this is the only way the answers can be revealed i may help you but only if obstacles arise listen read think communicate if i if i don't promise you the answers would you go publius end quote the message came amidst the 1994 division bell world tour during this tour columbia records flew a nearly 200 foot airship named the division bell between concert venues also sent a press kit to the media with several general promotional videos as well as one that simply said a spokesperson for pink floyd has issued the following statement you have spotted the pink floyd airship do not be alarmed pink floyd have sent their airship to north america to deliver a message the pink floyd airship is headed towards a destination where all will be explained upon arrival pink floyd will communicate was this post from publius very subtly titled the message the same message referred to in the press statements nah maybe or it's just a crazy dude on the internet uh it seemed a bit on the nose really but many members of the news group were intrigued and there was a lot of discussion on the matter but even if it was the message promised by columbia records what did it actually mean fortunately for us publius made a second post to clarify the message uh quote as some of you have suspected the division bell is not like its predecessors although all great music is subject to multiple interpretations in this case there is a central purpose and a design salute and a design solution for the ingenious person or group of persons i missed a page here uh who recognize this and where this information points to a unique prize has been secreted how and where the division bell listen again look again and your thoughts will steer you leading the blind while i stared out the steel in your eyes lyrics artwork and music will take you there uh later on in today's episode because as you know i've read it before kevin mentions this sounds like a bit uh, pretentious <laughs> uh, really does doesn't it so there you have it and it couldn't be possible and it couldn't possibly be more clear somewhere within the lyrics album art and or chord progressions of the division bell was a puzzle and somewhere else within them was the solution all we had to do was use the combined might and intellect of all the pink floyd fans who were nerdy enough to access usenet and find the answer to the question that we also had to find it was a daunting task or rather it was a daunting task if it was even real remember this is the early days of the internet and fact checking wasn't something that really existed it was hard enough to find information online back then finding a way to prove whether the information was true or not was damn near impossible oh my god yeah but we've really come full circle on that one haven't we with facebook publishing its fake not facebook's fake news but allowing the publication of fake news just the prevalence of fake news absolutely crazy but it wasn't unre- unreasonable to believe that this puzzle could be real in the past pink floyd albums had included a satirical backwards message a prank played on a phone operator and snippets from impromptu interviews that they conducted uh, i you know what i enjoyed i just don't enjoy that 
I'm just like, it's like, I, maybe I'm just a bit boring with my music, like, but I don't like that in my music. Although I do really like that Tenacious D album where half of it's like comedy and half of it's music. That's really clever. But with Pink Floyd, I'm just like, this just isn't, it's, I just feel it's just not as clever as you think, Pink Floyd. And maybe I'm just too stupid to get it. But as just, it just feels, felt, it feels a bit pretentious, doesn't it? But more on those in the bonus fact. The news group was split, and for a solid month, half the members scoured the division bell for clues, while the other half told them they were wasting their time on the prototypical Q. Yeah, it's like, this sounds like that fake, uh, uh, the guy from that QAnon conspiracy, which is crazy as well. <laughs> so, who was right? The fanboys or the haters? Due to increasing skepticism on the community, on July the 16th, 1994, Publius made the following prediction. To validate the trust of those who believe, as well as to reconcile the doubt of others, I have gone to great lengths to plan the following display of communication. Monday the 18th, East Rutherford, New Jersey, approximately 10 p.m. 10.30 p.m. Flashing white lights. There is an enigma. Trust. Haters gonna hate! But two days later, on July the 18th in East Rutherford, New Jersey, the lights on the front of the stage lit up at approximately 10.30 p.m. to spell out the words Enigma Publius. Publius. That is... Wait, how do they light whatever however okay yes so suddenly this is way more real than it was before when it could have just been some stupid guy on the internet now it's like this guy's connected to the band somehow unlike hugh publius had correctly predicted a future event and since the lights had not done this at any other show there was no longer any doubt in our minds there was an enigma and we were going to find the answer at all costs oh yeah we were also going to find the question too we still had no idea what that was either luckily we had publius to guide us he was going to be there every step of the way to make sure someone or someone's solved the enigma just kidding after two years and very little progress the pennet remailer service the service used by publius to remain anonymous shut down over legal threats to set anonymity of its users with the service gone so too was publius posts started appearing from many other addresses mimicking the style of the original posts but there was no way to verify if any of them were genuine all it took for someone to pretend to be publius was to write some pretentious dialogue designed to make it sound like they were smarter than everyone else it's not that hard to do just look at any tarantino film as proof yeah <laughs> yeah there's another thing i think tarantino's films are uh are good god everyone's gonna hate me in this episode i'm glad they took that dislike button away on youtube sometimes but uh, i don't think tarantino's like Tar- tarantino's films are good aaron sorkin blows tarantino out of the water when it comes to dialogue though right right it's aaron sorkin he's the king i don't i don't agree with your assessment yeah yeah don't get me wrong tarantino's good it's just fine it's just it's also super violent ponderously not present the provable per oh, you di- p- 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 so many p's ponderously not present uh the provable per pers- pers- i don't know that word it's such a small brain a purportedly publius post posts public progress paralyzed but surely if someone solved the puzzle the world would know the mere existence of the enigma garnered mainstream media attention with articles appearing in papers like the new york times and real life treasure hunts like those found in masquerade the secret and the hunt for the golden owl <laughs> oh my god these are pop culture there's so many i i just don't know these pop culture references i know none of those uh the newsworthy events so where is the goddamn treasure already what we know <laughs> considering that even after 27 years we know f- all about the puzzle itself let alone the solution we know a surprising amount about its creation the first thing we know is that the members of pink floyd don't have anything to do with it i mean someone at pink floyd does because the flashing lights right that's right i spent my teenage years trying to find a riddle and subsequent solution hidden in an album that the band didn't even intend to put there i was already into rock and roll so i would have been better served getting into sex and drugs instead of this sort of nonsense that said we also know that the enigma is real the band had no part in it likely because they were too busy writing and recording an entire studio album then making sure that the world tour went smoothly to do something so convoluted but they were still aware that it existed sorry to anyone who thought that publius was an internet troll who slipped the lighting tech in new jersey a crisp 20 dollar bill to flash the lights uh, to flash the words at the concert but it really was a planned part of the show in 2002 in an interview guitarist david gilmore said of the publius enigma that it was some silly record company thing that they thought up to puzzle people with oh no that's like <laughs> you want it to be something cool from pink floyd it's like pink floyd are cool even if i don't think they're particularly good <laughs> but uh it just turns out to be some like corporate bull thing you're like ah oh, this is like the opposite of cool 
Mark Brickman, Pink Floyd's lighting and production designer, also confirms that it came from the record company. Brickman was the man responsible for the words Enigma Publius appearing live in concert, the event that truly escalated this entire search. And he had this to say, quote, I think it really came and out of though. It came out of some guy of Washington, D.C. that used to be with the CIA or FBI or something that was in the encryption game. Oh my god, this is one of those quotes where it's just like directly transposed from like some interview he gave. <laughs> It'd be like b- making an article based on what I read, including my asides, and it would be barely readable. <laughs> like this he decided he wanted quote continues he decided he wanted to do some kind of album cover and he started talking to steve o'rourke i think what happened was steve o'rourke had in his brilliant mind that he was going to try something on the internet because he had been listening to me and he got this guy because if you notice a lot of stuff can't be traced where it comes from dude what is this since uh, end quote since simon is probably now asking aloud steve o'rourke was blink Floyd's manager oh okay i wasn't i was just desperately trying to like understand the writing <laughs> or like read it in a semi-coherent way anyway keep in mind that this was an unscripted statement made during an interview which is why borderline sign borderline sounds like a load of rambling gibberish yes it does however it was an unfounded gibberish well we can't say for sure that the originator of the enigma was in fact ex-cia or fbi in a 2005 interview pink floyd's drummer nick mason confirms the origin of the puzzle and the creators that was a ploy done by emi they had a man working for them who adored puzzles he used to work for the reagan administration his job was uh, then would be in meetings with the president and when regan would say let's bomb these people he would say that's not a good idea sir he was working for emi and suggested that a puzzle be created that followed up on that followed on the web the prize was never given out to this day it remains unsolved what's this dude's career path he's like presidential advisor in the oval office with reagan and now he works for emi i mean i'm sure working for emi is great you get to work for musicians but that does feel like a bit of a career change, doesn't it? I'm not sure how a person goes from working directly with the president to making puzzles at a record company. Indeed. I like to think that he got fired for suggesting we place a nuclear time bomb downtown in downtown Moscow, set to explode unless they could solve a series of ciphers. It sounds like something that would be on, like, uh... Is it 24? No, there's one, like, it's like... I feel like in, in that Jack Bauer 24 series, always running around trying to stop a bomb going off in a city or something like that. But, uh... What am I thinking of? Ah, the Saw movies. The Saw movies, right? Where they're like, um, I want to play a game. Except this one is, you know, nuclear games rather than just you've got your head in some weird sort of brace that's going to squash your skull. The Saw movies are horrible. I used to go watch them on Halloween with a friend of mine at university. And uh, yeah, those movies are really like, I'm not a big horror movie fan. Those movies are really like bloody and intense. But considering that Reagan famously joked into a hot mic during a sound check, my fellow Americans, I'm pleased to tell you today that I've signed legislation with outlaw Russia forever. We begin bombing in five minutes. Uh, and I, I was like, really? So I go when I read this before, because it's I've read this before. Uh, I Wikipedia this, and they have a clip. There's a clip on the the Wikipedia page of him saying this, and it's like it, you can tell he's joking in his tone of voice, and obviously he's joking. There's people laughing in the backgrounds, but it's like, dude. <laughs> That some things you probably shouldn't say. We begin bombing in five minutes. Or uh, whenever I'm around mics, I'm just generally assume they're hot. Like I'm always around mics, and it's like just generally assume that that they're hot. I have to believe that such a suggestion would not have resulted in termination. However, he made the change in career. My small corner of the internet became a very strange and interesting place for a few years because of it. So, let's recap what we know. Someone working at EMI devised a puzzle and solution based on, at the time, the newest Pink Floyd album release, possibly having input into the album art. This was done all without the participation of the band. So, to craft a riddle around a creative work made by someone else likely resulted in a puzzle so convoluted and obtruse as to be completely unsolvable. We know that as of 2005, well, I bet if that Publius dude hadn't had his anonymous email taken away, he'd have just given more clues until it was solved, right? But the thing that kicked the, uh, the, 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 the kicked the whole thing over or, you know, stopped it working was when that anonymous email service went away and he couldn't prove who he was and then the internet trolls come in. So they'd have just given more clues until someone would have got it and they'd have got the prize, which, spoiler alert, turns out to be super lame. Oh, cookies. Thank you. These look great. We know, if to, we know that as if so if you're listening to that and you're like oh, but I want to know what the prize was Simon will tell me I'll be like you're going to be disappointed 
so let me turn off now it's it's you'd be like oh, i'm still gonna listen through and it's still gonna be you know even if it's disappointing i'm not gonna be disappointed because i was i'm excited to know what it is now i'm really not trying to tease this it's really boring we know that as of 2005 the mystery had never been solved and the prize remained unclaimed and that is the most recent official statement that i could find on the matter so what of the prize is it still out there and what is the nature of the prize a golden owl one of 12 keys unlocking precious stones a golden hair stolen by the author's ex-girlfriends oh my god and another series of pop culture references that i absolutely do not get uh surely a prize like that would make a splash where it found right or is it possible that someone solved the publius enigma and kept the prize themselves as a secret since and since this is decoding the unknown what role did ghosts have to play in any of this if you're so inclined then i strongly recommend against it you can watch hours of videos on youtube of people giving their theories and solutions to the enigma most of these videos are just people slowly reciting words from their powerpoint slides over and over again as if to say it really makes you think all while donning the same shirt that they had on since the hunt began in 1994. <laughs> people reading powerpoint presentations high quality youtube content there is bound to do well says rambling fact boy uh in truth we may never know if anyone solved the puzzle because the prize isn't really a prize here it is here it's getting boring in the same 2005 interview where nick mason talked about the puzzle's creator he also revealed the true and brutally disappointing nature of the prize the prize was something like a crop of trees planted in a clear-cut area or a forest or something to that effect it was not meant to be a prize of something tangible but rather a touchy-feely sort of gift that was more of a philanthropic thing than something you could hang on a wall so after all this time the real publius enigma were the friends that you made along the way <laughs> my money back right now it's like those people are like it's not about the destination it's about the journey unless the destination is a potentially kick-ass prize and the journey is just convoluted and annoying i mean it's like yeah yeah a long drive down the m4 it's not about the destination it's about the journey what are you what are you smoking <laughs> since there's no prize of any value i can point you all towards then demand a cut of in for inspiring your search this is where the journey ends if you enjoyed this script and would like more written by kevin be sure to get in the comments <laughs> repeat call to action <laughs> kevin i love how much of a deep pull that is from my other uh youtube channel business plays where i do the ad scripts like really a little bit crazy and <laughs> they're always like read verbatim and then at the end they say repeat call to action so always read that verbatim uh, and i also love the fact that kevin's given himself a plug i've actually i like this so much i have to say that i already assigned kevin another piece <laughs> so kevin will be contributing something else to decoding the unknown i was like go find more internet mysteries i love this shit. um so hopefully we'll hear for more from kevin he's got some bonus facts for us though which is very exciting let's go for my fellow americans what actually is a division bell dude i like how kevin's like yeah all british people know what the queen's badge is they know what the division bell is i have no idea i mean i do now because i've read this before it's something to do with parliament but i had no idea before i read this the first time this was one of the first hints that i remember following i uh, remember publius giving and it's something that everyone in the uk probably already knew that except for your small brain fact boy a division of the assembly or a division for short is a means of voting in which members of parliament physically divide themselves into groups and are then counted the division bell rings for such a vote and may and also may ring at the start and end of parliamentary procedures fascinating <laughs> number two remember the backwards message that i mentioned appearing in a previous pink floyd work that gave the whole thing a bit of traction before the new jersey concert in empty spaces on the wall there's a backwards message hidden that says congratulations you've discovered the secret message please send your answer to old pink care of the funny farm chalfont many people believe this is a reference to the band's original singer sid barrett i have no idea how because i'm not super familiar with pink floyd or their history but fascinating <laughs> number three at the end of young lust on the wall there is a recording of a telephone call in which the character pink discovers his wife is cheating on him co-producer of the album james guthrie had arranged to place the collect call to his male neighbor pretending he was trying to reach his wife they wanted the operator to genuinely believe she had just caught someone having an affair so she was recorded without ever being told the truth the recording on the album was the second attempt as they weren't happy with the first operator's reaction number four the end of money on dark side of the moon features a number of people claiming that they were in the right these were various roadies and a stu and studio crew members who were handed a stack of interview cards and asked to answer each before reading the next one one card read 
have you ever punched someone followed by a card that said were you in the right it seems they interviewed a lot of people who felt justified in punching someone else the iconic line at the end of the album there's no dark side of the moon really matter of fact it's all dark was spoken by the doorman to abbey road studio some celebrities were also interviewed including including paul and linda mccartney but their answers were deemed too fake sounding to be used uh yeah okay i mean i don't know i just <laughs> i guess these are all interesting to people who really love pink floyd <laughs> but i'm just like that ah. Who cares? Number five. Finally, where did the name Publius come from? Publius was the pseudonym used by Alexander Hamilton, James Madison, and John Jay in writing the Federalist Papers. The name was chosen in honor of the great Roman Publius Valerius Publi- Publicola, an instrumental figure in the founding of the Roman Republic. Maybe they just came straight from the Roman Republic rather than via the Federalist Paper pseudonym. Just a guess. I'm guessing our story's Publius thought his title, his little circle of trees, was going to accomplish a lot more than it ever did. Ah, it was all a bit pretentious, wasn't it? It'd be like, yeah, look at these clues I'm giving to you. You're going to solve it. You got some trees. Woo! Yay! I was hoping for money. <laughs> This has been an episode of Decoding the Unknown. Uh, if you enjoyed it, please make sure you smash that like button below. Don't forget to subscribe. Yo, if you're listening as a podcast, hello. Reviews make an enormous difference. They help get this show in front of more people, which is something I like because I like it when people listen to and watch my stuff. It's kind of why I do it. It's fun, but if no one was watching, I probably wouldn't, would I? That'd be a bit weird. I don't want to make any money. Yeah, so there's that. Anyway, I'll see you next time. And thank you for watching or listening. Hello everybody, welcome back to another brand new episode of Decoding the Unknown, an episode where I have absolutely no idea what's going on, because Kevin wrote this episode and he sent me an email, and, oh, hi, welcome, um, this is a show where we decode the unknown, is that really necessary? Is a podcast, is a YouTube channel? Uh, anyway, Kevin sent me this email, and he says, hey Simon, this script's a bit different than normal, you need your tablet to record it, got that in front of me, and said the usually printed script. There's a script and there are also two videos, one to watch before reading the script and one to watch after, both while filming, of course. So here we are. I can't tell you the topic of the script, and I know this whole thing seems a bit out there right now, but I'm 99.9% confident that you're absolutely going to love this one. Thanks. And have fun. I like that this is my job. <laughs> like, this feels like I'm part of a game. And uh, this is what I this is what I do for money. Uh, okay, so I tried. I thought these would be links, but they're some sort of weird internet videos that Kevin has downloaded and attached to an email. So Jen, who edits these videos, hi Jen. Hello Simon. I'm going to I guess send these to you, and uh, I've I've absolutely I haven't cheated. I've got no idea what's about to happen, but I'm going to watch it myself. Okay, unsupported file type. I'm going to get my laptop. I hope this is one of those ones where Kevin's like, ah, the joke is that you've now got a virus, Simon. Ha 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 ha. We're like, Kevin, you d. Oh, come on. Come on. Really? No battery? I'm having all sorts of technical troubles. Hopefully, not caused by this. Ah, uh, great. I've got to download the video because it doesn't work. And. Come on, VLC player. You are like the ultimate player. It's a 9 megabyte video file. This is going to be very low quality or very short. All right, let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Hello, Simon. Would you like to play a game? You know, we're not that different, you and I. Like you, I was once also a podcast host with a running joke of having people locked up in my basement. In my case, it was Girl Scouts, chained up and forced to make me cookies. But I saw the error of my ways. I let the girls in their delicious thin ones go. And I dropped 90 pounds. Now, it is your time. As you can see, I am coming to you live from the basement where you imprison your writers and editors. In your hands is a script containing five internet mysteries. Or is it? Perhaps it is five fantastical tales conjured from my imagination to trick you. It is your task to determine whether each mystery presented is true or fiction. And to make things interesting, for everyone you guess incorrectly, I will let one of your staff go, starting with Danny. To make sure you don't cheat by peeking ahead, the answers are nowhere in the script. I'll be back at the end of the episode to tell you how you did. Good luck, Simon. Let the games begin.
What the fuck just happened? Holy shit, above and beyond, Kevin. That is legit. I, I genuinely did not expect this to be a custom made video. And this isn't just Kevin looking at the screen. He's wearing like a costume and shit. If this is Kevin, I'm assuming it's Kevin. <laughs> He's wearing like a hood for people listening at home. He's wearing like a hood. The voice changer, maybe a little over the top. I didn't make out some words, but I definitely got the gist of it. I have been presented with five internet mysteries and I have to determine whether they are true or false. And at the end, Kevin will tell me in another video. I'm excited. Let's play some games. Okay, here we go. It even says on the front here, super secret decoding the unknown script. Do not turn this page until you have begun filming and watched the first video yeah because the first thing i did when i got the script from kevin was open it up and then i saw this and i was like okay there's more to this i should read kevin's email all right internet mysteries fact or fiction and play along at home and see how you do lemantita lemantita was the name of a reddit user from argentina i'm not sure why he chose the name which translates in english to the blanket but i chose to believe it was because he was a huge michael jackson fan i don't get it wait what's michael jackson got to do with blankets in 2004 lamantita posted about wanting to enter villa 31 a notorious argentinian slum to interview people and take a tour of soup kitchens and such he was known to work uh, some sort of production company in an extremely limited capacity so perhaps he thought this project could be his big break redditors from the area had warned him vehemently not to enter the slum without a local guide and that even then <clears throat> it was a terrible idea the argentinian slums are extremely dangerous places for outsiders they're rife with the sorts of illegal activities that you would expect in a slum in any nation but there are they are also set up like mazes to make escape impossible for anyone who's not familiar with the area these areas are so dangerous the police don't even bother to enter them dude that's like that prison in prison break where they're like it's just run by the inmates they have gangs and i'm like that sounds like a horrible i'd rather be in a prison where it's run by guards because it's probably safer where they just the guards are just outside and they're like yo anyone comes out we shoot them we sometimes send some food in that doesn't sound fun lamentita posted that he had found a guide who was going to take him on a tour of the area but this was the last post he ever made the first thought was that this was just a hoax from a throwaway account but the account was over six months old with posts on a variety of subjects he posted everything from where can i watch the mayweather fight on saturday to you usa osama's not dead <laughs> okay <laughs> all right then uh this is argentina so perhaps he thought he saw osama palling around with hitler and all of his nazi buddies or maybe lamentito was just an unstable individual either way if it, this was a fake account it would have been it would have shown an immense amount of dedication and it is believed that this user was genuine so if we assume that he was real what happened ah uh, i'm assuming so far that this story is real because it has these kind of like not too many details like it's not overly detailed it reads like fact although to be fair this is the first time kevin's done this and i've only done i think three scripts from kevin before so i'm not super familiar with his writing style we play a similar game on one of my other channels uh with uh, the writer danny there and uh, oh by the way in the in the beginning kevin was saying like he'll free people from my basement it's an ongoing joke that <laughs> the writer from that channel is trapped in my basement churning out scripts and uh i mean maybe uh and kevin was saying that he will free them if i get them wrong ah i'm gonna get these all right i'm definitely not because if this is fake it's very convincing so far the most obvious answer was that against the advice of literally everyone lamentita went to villa 31 and was murdered there was no report of the crime but there may not have been a body to find either locals love to joke on reddit that he was chopped up and fed to dogs hilarious guys but whether this was the case or not with the police unwilling to enter villa 31 there's no way to know for sure what happened to him is he dead was he conscripted into slavery did he chicken out and abandon reddit so as not to have uh, to publicly reveal his shame or maybe the cia got him for trying to reveal the truth about bin laden <laughs> yeah maybe not it's been over seven years since lamentia's disappearance so we're unlikely to ever get an answer i don't like to assume the worst though in this case it seems the most plausible explanation of what happens but what do you think simon where do you think lamentia is now or do you think he ever existed at all you made a lot of videos across your channel so i did pick a mystery from argentinian reddit because i was confident you would not have tr uh, known about it to try and trick you into thinking it was fake or would you that be too obvious so instead i wrote a fictional story and chose a remote set to make you think it was real oh my god i think it's real i think this is real and i probably think the dude got murdered this is 
I don't know. It feels like dark. I think it's real. The story is real. Like this happens on Reddit. Whether the guy actually went there, I don't know. But I'm saying this is a real internet story. Number one, real. Cast your vote at home now. Iscariot.com. This is another story that dates back to the days of Usenet news groups. One day, an anonymous user on alt.pl.internet posted about the existence of a strange website, iscarrier.com. The landing page of the website didn't seem unusual. It was just an empty page requesting login information. All right, fine, so it was a private site that didn't want anyone in it. Most people would assume that they weren't invited and just leave, but the Usenet poster had decided to dig a little deeper. By examining the source codes of the website, they were able to determine that behind this login page was an amount of data that would have been unfathomable for the late 90s. We're talking files upwards of 40 gigabytes each and a server containing a total of multiple terabytes of data. That is ridiculous in the 1990s. I was watching, I've been watching, uh, re-watching Star Trek Voyager. It's like a late 90s, early 2000s. I'd, if I had to guess, 95 to 2002 or 94 to 2001, something around that. And there's one episode where the guy's like, on my servers, there's 3,000 gigabytes of information. And I, I just like, n- people watching the 90s would be like, what is that giant server farm? You got so much information. And uh, now I'm like, yeah, okay, that's like not that much. It's like a few, it's a, a few months of recorded videos or weeks. As an I make like 70, 80 gigabytes of stuff a day, roughly, on average, I think. But it's a hell of a lot of data for the 90s. This represented not only a massive amount of data being hidden, but an exorbitant cost to host such a website. Not just a financial cost either. The amount of time required to upload the data at 1990 speeds, even if they had a dedicated T1 line, was absolutely staggering. People were immediately intrigued, and of course the first step was to break in. Well, they didn't necessarily have to upload the data, did they? Because these servers behind there could be where the data originated. Like if it's the NSA gathering data, because I feel like this is some NSA shit. If this is... But then I don't feel they'd have a public logon page. Although I guess people would have to remote access into this data somehow. Anyway, if this was the NSA gathering all this data, right, then it would just be collected at their server farm and then stored there behind a thing. It wouldn't be uploaded to another server somewhere. So I'm saying that's this so far, fine. But that's where things got stranger. No one could break into this website. The methods of hacking in the 1990s weren't as sophisticated as they are now, but the scrutiny was even less sophisticated. Somehow, Iscariot was resistant to these attacks. They even tried a coordinated attempt to brute force their way through the login screen. It's a similar principle to how a DDoS or distributed denial of service attack works in present day. Even if they didn't get inside, they should have at least taken the site offline for a period of time. Normal websites back then were not meant to withstand multiple users attempting millions of passwords, but his carrier did not falter. Yeah, and I mean, if it's storing this much data behind it, you can assume that the people, that they're set up to handle huge data loads at least, so maybe people would be downloading this to another server, maybe another governmental server somewhere, so they'd have super fast internet, and so it could handle lots of incoming and outgoing data, maybe, I guess. Naturally, speculation became rampant. Between the site's massive amount of data, seemingly impenetrable security, and rather unusual name, people's imaginations ran wild. If you're not familiar with the name Iscariot, it was the second name of Apostle and the ultimate betrayer of Jesus, Judas Iscariot. So that's where I knew it. I was like, this sounds familiar. And I was like, but I don't remember it being a dot com or anything like that. The rumors ranged from the benign to the truly sinister until a user by the name of Personal Jesus, most likely a new account created specifically for this occasion and a reference to the 1989 Depeche Mode song of the same name, claimed to have broken into the site. His version of events was that the website was a complete digital vault of the Vatican's secret archive, but that when he tried to download a file labeled as the Complete Gospel of Mary Magdalene, a document of which only fragments remain and there's no consensus among scholars on which Mary the Gospel is even written by, the site went offline. If you think this person's account sounds like total b****, I'm inclined to agree. When the members of the Usenet group went to check, the site was offline and it was never to return but jesus probably saw the site was already offline and then concocted the most interesting story that he could think of to get people's attention and win some internet points agreed that does sound like nonsense for those of you who spend a lot of time arguing on twitter or reddit this is a friendly reminder that your internet points are not redeemable anywhere including the internet a much more reasonable theory is that there was a ma- this was a major piracy hub. If it was housing a digital warehouse of thousands of CDs, DVDs, and games, suddenly the multiple terabyte storage place sounds to make sense. Oh no, 
That's like way less interesting than my NSA theory. Although who's got such a huge pirate library in the 90s? And it also makes sense for the security. This also predated most file sharing programs, and while Metallica had yet to launch their lawsuit against Napster, the program was already under heavy scrutiny for illegal activity. Having such a single source for direct downloads that was kept as far out of the public eye as possible would be a much safer means for these early digital pirates to store their precious booty. Unfortunately, their site had garnered far more attention than it was ever intended to, so if this story is correct, then they likely pulled the plug on the operation in fear that the FBI would catch wind of Iscariot's viral status and investigate the rumors. If that were true, I feel like they wouldn't have chosen the name Iscariot.com. It would be like some super obscure URL that wouldn't be being found on like Google or some sh- I looked it up on the Google. So, was Iscariot a storage space for online pirates, a Vatican digital archive, or something else entirely? And why did they choose such a uniquely recognizable and intriguing name for their top-secret website? You know where I stand on the former, and I don't really have a guess on the latter, but what do you think, Simon, and most importantly, did this website ever exist at all? I am going to say no, uh, purely for the reason that I don't think someone like the government or some pirate dudes who want to fly under the radar would choose the name Iscariot.com. I also think that the idea of, you know, multiple gigabytes and huge files and stuff being stored in the past, like, because, I don't know, maybe I've mentioned this before, but I, I find the whole idea that we have so much data now and didn't in the past, all this stuff, super interesting. Apparently, I'm a huge nerd. Um, but I don't think it's real. I just have that vibe. I don't think this one is real. So one real, two false. Meridian 59. This mystery takes us all the way back to January 1997. Shortly after, I'm just going to make a note about which ones I think are true and false, actually, because sometimes I'll forget. So one true, two false. Oh no, my script went back to the beginning. <laughs> This mystery takes us all the way back to January 1997, shortly before the release of the world's first 3D graphical MMORPG, Meridian 59. This game was published by 3DO, and one of the developers was John Hank, a man who went on to co-develop Google Earth and Pokemon Go. This game... mm, 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 uh, I'm feeling it's too many details to be true. I'm getting that detail, like, too many detail vibes, like something I've never heard of and then two things that I've definitely heard of. Although Google Earth and Pokemon Go do feel like they are similar, sort of, you know, they're both big mapping things, so maybe. This game is typical high fantasy setting that you would expect from MMNO, the sort of shit that bores time Simon to tears. Yes. <laughs> I don't know, I'm just not into fantasy. I love sci-fi. I just mentioned that I'm watching the whole of Star Trek Voyager again, but fantasy just never, just never my thing. The one truly unique thing about Meridian, however, is that you don't that it doesn't use a class or level system like you find in most RPGs or fantasy games. You could increase your different skills and character attributes by performing different actions in the game, and there didn't seem to be a time limit to how powerful a character could become. The only limitations were how much time you wanted to spend playing and how much you could actually accomplish playing an MMO on dial-up. The other interesting thing about the game is that it was particularly PvP focused. PvP was a small part of early MMOs and mostly a shitty thing to do. I don't know what pe- player versus player, right? High level EverQuest players would camp around the starting town and just murder all the new players when they tried to leave for the first time. <laughs> it's not the sort of behavior you want to encourage, so Meridian had a player run justice system to try and keep this kind of douchebaggery in check, but with no upper limit on how powerful a character can become. How do you keep the most powerful player in the game in check? Enter the very creatively minded, definitely not 15-year-old edgelord Death Gun. <laughs> I love the name. <laughs> it's the most 15 what's your what's your online name? Death Gun. Yeah, big man. Death Gun boasted that he had become so powerful that if he killed someone in the game, they would die in real life. That please. In the context of the game being played safely from the privacy of your own home on a computer that is in no way able to cause physical harm to you. Well, I don't know. <laughs> Unless you start sticking your hands inside it and be like, Way! Maybe maybe put your hands in some water and then way inside with the wires. It's going to hurt you. But that's not what we're talking about here. Pointless tangent, fact boy. Get back to it. Uh, this all seemed utterly ridiculous. Players ignored it as some bragger kid that really, really needed to get out of his parents' basement and see the sun again. Completely agree. This can't be real. Enraged, uh, Death Gun killed a player in the game, and the player immediately disconnected, never to be heard from again. Sure, the player probably just rage quit or was in on the gag the whole time, but it was still pretty eerie to the people playing. 
At least at first it was. They quickly came to the same conclusion I just did, and then they were over it. So the next day, Death Gun struck again. This time he targeted a higher level player, one no one would think would just quit the game out of anger, and the same thing happened. All right, I agree with Kevin on the first one. The guy just, uh, he, you know, it was, he was either in on it or blah, blah, blah. The second one, I'm beginning to think that this very powerful player is like a developer of the game or something. And he's, you know, become so powerful because he's like, you know, an early player himself or he's cheated. And that he kills someone in the game and then he blacklists them, like he bans them. So it looks like they disconnected forever. That's what I think is going on then because I'm not thinking they died in real life, because that's absurd. An IRL friend of the fallen player disconnected as well to call and see why his friend had logged off, but there was no answer. Later that night, when his parents returned home from work, the 17-year-old was found dead at his keyboard. In total, Death Gun would claim seven victims before disappearing forever. This is bullshit. Before you start saying how ridiculous this sounds, because it does, I'm not proposing anything magical here. Obviously, the players weren't really being killed by the video game, and neither the police nor anyone else involved gave that notion any credence from the beginning. It didn't take long for police to figure out that Death Gun was merely the accomplice, and the real murderer had been inside the homes of each of the victims. I... Okay, obviously that is more... That is infinitely more plausible than the mystical version. But this is not real. (laughs) This is it's too crazy like how are you gonna find that person's id and then link them back when was this going on like 10 years ago oh like 30 years ago 20 years ago 25 years ago 1997 there's no way they're not tracing it back and then putting the guy in the house if this is real i will be so shocked these were the days before programs like ventrilo or Teamspeak, so there was no audio evidence at the time of the murders whoever the killer was they were efficient not a professional but definitely someone who had given the murders a lot of thought there was minimal forensic evidence and there were no fingerprints dna or murder weapons left at the scene the death gun account was found to have been made using a fraudulent credit card and the user masked their ip well enough it that 1997 era detectives did not know how to track the real location the how is not the mystery here and i would never have insulted your intelligence by proposing that maybe just maybe a character in a video game was able to kill someone in the real world via dial-up modem that's some like man it always brings it back to that you guys see that movie the ring i feel like i brought this up in an episode the other day that that movie with nicole kidman as a kid i watched that i was so scared of it i feel like i was talking about this in literally the last episode but man that was that was an intense film but there is still the much but there is still much that remains unknown about this case what are the identities of the real killers all of the victims were within 100 miles of the original murder so were these targeted assassinations of individuals because of some sort of grudge or murders of geographic convenience what happened to the credit score of the poor woman whose identity was stolen to apply for that fake credit card and simon did these unsolved murders ever take place no 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 a uh, strong no i am gonna be embarrassed and alarmed if that's true it's just so silly great story but it's silly this is gonna be really bad if it was actually true (laughs) the college dorm power strip for those that attend i have to say even though these are i think two of them are false so far they are written real believable for those that attend, college is almost an unforgettable experience. The friends, the parties, the YouTube videos about how you don't care about school even though your parents bribed your way in. <laughs> oh, is that that college admissions thing? That is so crazy. It's like, yeah, 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 they're on the Olympic team for rowing. It's like, no, they weren't. And it's just like, yeah, but you know, here's some money. Uh, seems pretty crazy. This, I, I went to university. Um, not college. I guess it, it, college is university is just what we call college in the uk it was unforgettable it was a great time did four years of it in total enjoyed it all for the most part um yeah i enjoy life in general to be honest though imagine you're on your computer in your college dorm one night definitely not browsing only fans i get the feeling kevin's a lot younger than me is an only fans only it's like only a few years old right i was at university like 20 years ago making me feel 15 years ago. how old am i 34 15 years ago i am feeling old right now kevster and uh, when suddenly you hear a crackle quickly followed by a loud bang the computer screen flickers off and you hear the spinning of the hard drive slow until silence maintenance tells you that there was a power surge and a fuse is blown it will take two hours to fix you get off the phone and notice the plug to your imac is charred and damaged 
With all this time to kill, and, and too much of a broke college student to be able to afford more loot boxes in Raid Shadow Legends, you decide to open up your power strip and see the extent of the damage. Uh, it's a power strip. I'll be like real bored. I guess, yeah, no, fair play. Fair play as a student. I'll be just in my room. What am I going to do? May as well crack open that unplugged power strip and have a gander inside. See what happens. I'd also be like, my Mac's probably f***ed, isn't it? The power's coming back on, but that Mac ain't coming back on. And I'll be like, I'm a student. Am I about to have to spend a grand on a Mac? Be like, ah, oh, that was, I mean, I know it's a lot of money now, but I mean, oh my God, that was a lot of money back in the day. Inside the power strip, you see a circuit board that doesn't look like it belongs. Attached is a SIM card and some other metal component that you don't recognize. You snap a bunch of pictures on your phone and start posting them to Reddit on r slash what is this thing. Because, well, you'd very much like to know what that thing is. That is f***ing scary. Someone is spying on your ass. The answers come back immediately. You're informed that it is a GPS tracker and microphone with cellular uplink. Oh my god. <laughs> I know we're surrounded by microphones all the time, but it's like private parts of my life, like private conversations, private stuff, all of this. It's like nowadays, I I don't like going to restaurants where it's like too quiet because a few times I've just been sat there. There was one time that was so awkward and it was like one of the first times it ever happened to me. I was just like sitting in a restaurant in a pub, just like talking with my friend for like two hours. And I mean, I'm not like a or anything I, i'm sure i'm not saying like anything super controversial or anything but it's just a private conversation i'm having with my mate about our lives like all of this stuff that you're like well yeah it's a private conversation and then it's one of those places where the tables are so close together and everything and then just as we're leaving the guy at the table so next to me is like hey man i just want to say i really love your stuff and i'm like oh god i'm sure it's like i did you know it's just one of those things and now when i go places it's happened a couple of times since then i mean not not quite so intimately because i'm more aware now but i'm like it's it's like i, I just don't like the idea of being spied on <laughs> and i know like a little loss of privacy is what you get when you're an internet fact boy but uh th finding this i'll be like what the f going on in short your power strip was bugged this sounds a bit far-fetched but for redditor shady business 15 not at all the suspicious username this was his new reality by all accounts shady was a regular university student in the united kingdom who had no logical reason at least none that he would disclose why anyone would be bugging his room an investigation into the sim card yielded little useful information the cell company unsurprisingly wanted a subpoena in order to give up information and shady didn't want to go to the police the Reddit Bureau of Investigation, yes, it's a real sub subreddit, also was able to identify that this was professionally done. There were too many small wires and the soldering was too professional. It was probably done by a machine, so this probably wasn't just a haphazard prank. The bug could not have been installed into the power strip on location. It had to have been already there. So where did the power strip come from? Shady assumed that he took it from his parents' house. One of his first instincts was that this was the work of helicopter parents that just couldn't leave him well alone, but he wanted to investigate further. Oh my god, dude, your dad's a spy. Or your mum's a spy. That's my vibe right now. It's like, I don't know, like power strips. You just get them from places. I moved into this office where I work now, and there were power strips here. And I just used them. And now I'm like, oh my god, am I gonna have to check inside my power strips? <laughs> this is that sort of, like... That that paranoia that you have, and you're like, wait, is this does this be like that is like checking inside your power strips? I feel is like verging on schizophrenia. But then I'll read something like this, and I'll be like, oh my god, <laughs> what if there are bugs inside my power strips? The people listening on the ends of the bugs right now are like, I hope he doesn't check the power strips. Oh. <laughs> is he looking at us? Jesus, do you think he knows? But he wanted to investigate further. He put the SIM card into his phone and then sent himself a text message to get the SIM's ca SIM card's phone number. Researching the number turned up nothing, so he left the card in his phone overnight to see if any incoming calls came, as that seemed to be triggering the mechanism for the bug to start recording again. Again, nothing. But was Shady even the target of the bug? He'd taken the power strip from his parents' house, so had they installed it themselves to give it to him and to what end? Or his parents the target? Shady could not give any details on the likelihood of this, but another hypothesis voted around that it could have been a power strip that his parents liberated from work that had been planted there for use in corporate espionage. Oh, yes, this is, okay, this is probably more realistic than the spy thing. It'd be really helpful to know what his parents did for a living. Because if it was like, yeah, he's a high-level patent clerk or whatever, you'll be like, ah, 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 that's some spying going on right there. Or if it's like, he works in tech support for a giant unnamed corporation, you'll be like, he's a spy. He's a spy. Your dad's a spy. 
you should probably tell him about this bug. He's going to, you know, he's going to want to take that into work tomorrow. Who the intended target was and for what purpose had has remained a mystery for almost a decade. But there's one thing we know for certain. The bug had been active for over a year, and at the time Shady found it, seven months after moving into his university dorm, it was still active and the SIM card still had £10 of credit on it. The card had not been topped off for three months, but logically, that wording means it had been topped off in the fourth month prior, three months after finding its way into the university dorm. However, sometimes you just have to top them up to keep them active, but then if it's only got £10 of credit, someone... This is so suspect. If we accept that both the bug and the electrical damage seem to be too authentic to be faked, an assumption that I'm willing to make, that still leaves so many questions. Who was shady, really? Why would someone bug a college student? And if they had bugged a corporation when the power strip was removed and wound up in some college dorm, why did they continue to listen in for months? All I know is that I need to go open up my power strips right now just to be safe. But before I do that, I need to know what Simon thinks the truth behind this mysterious bug is, or if it was all just in my imagination. Ah, I mean, this one's real, isn't it? (laughs) I really hope it's not, because it's f***ing scary as s***. But I think this one's real, man. I really do. And I really hope it's not. People, I'm cast your votes. I'm casting my vote. I think it's true. I think it's true. I think it's terrifyingly true. Ah! Chip Chan. Once upon a time, this is the last one, by the way. Once upon a time in 2008, an anonymous user on 4chan's X board, the board for paranormal goings on, posted a link to an unsecured webcam feed that they'd found. The feed was of a Korean woman doing nothing for hours. At first, people thought she may have been dead because she remained motionless and contorted for over 10 hours, but eventually they saw signs of life. As the stream picked up popularity, despite the Korean woman never doing anything besides being in her apartment, she began to share the story. Uh, she began to share her story with viewers. Here is the rundown of what the woman shared. She was trapped in her house because a corrupt police officer that she referred to simply as P had implanted a Vera chip in her ankle to monitor and control her. I don't believe that that happened, controlling someone with a chip, but I do believe that she believes so far this is realistic. Not the chip in her, but the fact that she would believe there's a chip in her or that she tells this lie. She claimed it allowed him to see and hear what she did, and also he could use it to control when and how she slept. It's, this is how she got the name Chip Chan. She also claims that her parents both died and left her a large inheritance, which is why she was able to afford to live on her own while almost never leaving the room, and that P is trying to get rid of her to get the money for himself. As time went on, her story changed, and the Vera Chip was no longer just a means of surveillance. It was a means of mind control. No one knows who Chip Chan is or what her real name is. We know that she lives in Seoul, South Korea, but that's pretty much it. Everything else has come directly from Chip Chan herself, but is not and but she is not a reliable source. While much of the story seems extremely improbable, though technically plausible, the mind control stuff is really is really where it breaks down. Viewers have been captivated by the strange Korean woman streaming herself do little more than sleep for 24 hours a day. But what really grabbed their attention was the genuine distress that she seemed to express while talking about what was being done to make her a captive. There are a lot of theories, but in the interest of time, I'm going to stick to one that seems to be the most likely and is far scarier than any internet ghost story. Most likely, Chip Chan is a paranoid schizophrenic. <laughs> oh, this gives me shivers. Like, none of it's real and it's all in her head. Ah! Oh. She seems genuinely distressed because to her, everything she is saying is the truth. It's also theorized that P is a social worker or a healthcare worker who is supposed to monitor her mental health in some way. Verichips are basically RFID implants for humans to be used as a means of identification. It is reasonable to say that someone who no longer seems to be on speaking terms with reality may not be so fastidious about carrying her IDs on her at all times in the off chance that she did leave her apartment. This all makes the most sense, but it still doesn't necessarily explain everything. Yeah, also, people aren't okay with having chips put in them. At the time of writing this, Chip Chan does not seem to be streaming anymore. She is still uploading videos to YouTube, but I do not recommend you watch them. She's now terrified that they've been bombarding her with a mind control device so much that it is burning her alive. Her recent videos are all of her legs burned and scabbed over. For at least, wow, that's okay on YouTube? No, I don't think so. For the past few months, all of her videos have been her burned and damaged body, predominantly her legs and hands. Chip Chan's identity remains unknown, as does her exact condition. Another mystery in this whole story is why she was streaming herself 24-7. Part of me understands that she may think P was less likely to cause her harm if she was on camera, but a bigger part of me doesn't understand why a paranoid schizophrenic would want to deliberately put themselves under that level of surveillance. 
Um, yeah, I, but Paranoid Schizophrenia, it's not just as simple as that, is it? It's going to be com- more complicated. And there's probably good spies and bad spies and people's minds get complicated. Or maybe it's all performative, some crazy art project that 14 years later has still not reached its conclusion. If Chip Chan's health keeps declining, we may never receive an answer to these questions. That is, if Chip Chan isn't just a concoction of a villainous writer hellbent on setting uh, his brethren free. And so now comes the moment of truth, Simon. Which of these five stories is a true unsolved mystery of the internet? Are any of them true? Are they all? Are you sick of rhetorical questions? <laughs> Am I so pedantic that I gave you a true mystery of the internet but omitted the fact that it is no longer unsolved so I could win on a technicality? There's only one way to find out. Let's watch the video. Uh, what do we think of that last one? I think it's true. I think it's true. So just to recap, uh, cast your vote at home. One, true. Two, false. Three, false. Four, true. Five, true. All right. I'm pretty excited, man. That power strip one better not be f-ing true. Ah! Play after script. Download the video. Let's go. So, Simon, how do you think you did? Are you ready to hear the truth? First, the mysterious disappearance of La Mantita. While the story resurfaces every couple of years, no new leads or information has been found. The man's account is believed to be genuine, and he is currently missing and presumed dead. Oh, it was true. The first one's true. Nailed it. That brings us to the mysterious site, Iscariot.com. The second one was the, uh... Uh, it's hysteria iscariot.com the big data farm thing which I thought was false the site never existed at all never existed well, many of the details were taken from the true mystery of mortis.com there were never any rumors of Vatican secrets being held on the site perhaps it is a topic we can discuss in a future video as for Meridian 59 Meridian 59 remind me how can I not remember this is like literally 20 minutes ago uh, Meridian 29 was the guy who is killing people in real life and also in games, and I thought that was false. I had to operate on two assumptions in the hopes of fooling you. The first was that you would believe I would never include such a ludicrous sounding story, except as a bluff, because it was true. And the second assumption was that you don't watch anime. I don't watch anime. Well, the details of Meridian 59 were accurate. The murder conspiracy was actually just the plot of season two of Sword Art Online. Oh. <laughs> okay, so it was false, and it was okay. So anyone watching anime who watches anime, uh, which I know some of you, because sometimes my writers will slip in jokes about anime, and people will be like, "Hey, anime reference!" Simon just whoosh over his head. Uh, okay, so I'm three for three so far. Oh God, I really think this power strip one is true. <laughs> The chain of custody of the power strip is too muddy to know who the bug was intended for or why. But the bug itself and the account of how it was discovered are genuine. Finally, that brings us to ship. I don't like it! I'm so and I'm so upset that I'm right. <laughs> oh man. Unfortunately, the story is true. Oh! Oh! Five for five! Well, her identity and her exact condition remains unknown. She appears to be a severely mentally ill woman who is unwilling and unable to get the help that she needs. So how did you do something? The continued captivity of your writers depends on it. Remember to grade yourself honestly, because I'll be watching. For the viewers at home, did you enjoy playing along as well? If you'd like to see more breaks from the normal form like this, be sure to get in the comments and let us know. Oh, my laundry's done. <laughs> and he says, oh, my laundry's done. Uh, Kevin, this was absolutely brilliant. I don't know where the creepy place you filmed this is, but your garage looks terrifying, if that's what it is. Guys, I loved the hell out of this. Please get in the comments. Please, let's do more of this. Honestly, if I just did a channel that was this, I would have an absolute blast. Um, so let me know what you think. This was this was crazy fun, and I can't believe I got five out of five. I really genuinely did expect to. And uh, they were really well done, Kevin. They were really well done. And that power strip one is going to haunt my nightmares. So, for now, this has been Decoding the Unknown. Sort of literally, I guess. Thank you so much for watching. If you enjoy or listening, if you enjoyed, thumbs up, subscribe. Also, if you're listening as a podcast, uh, please do um, leave us a review. That'd be grand. And I'll see you next time.
Hello everybody, welcome back to another episode of Decoding the Unknown, the show where what? We decode the unknown. Who would have known it? Uh, Katie writes me a script. Was Marilyn Monroe murdered? Do you ever have those gaps in your knowledge? And it's, I'm pretty sure I've made videos about Marilyn Monroe. I definitely made one where we looked at how uh, big she was. Like, uh, in terms of, like, uh, size. Because people are like, oh, in the past we looked at women differently. I mean, obviously we do it if we go back further in time. But people always point at Marilyn Monroe being, like, an example of a plus-size person, a uh, plus-size woman, uh, back when she was around and how that was, like, the most desirable thing ever. But then we made a video, like, debunking that. It's like Marilyn Monroe was, like, really thin. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, that was a fun rumor to, to, to bust. What I'm talking about today, though, is Marilyn Monroe. I know she died young. I have no idea how she died. I'm pretty sure she wasn't murdered, because I feel like I'd know that. She died young from something. I don't think it was suicide, was it? It's crazy that I don't know this or remember this, because I absolutely, I'm sure someone in the comments will be like, Simon, you you talked about this at length in this video from two years ago. And I'll be like, (laughs) ah, you assume I remember things about video where I record. My small brain can't handle it. Uh, let's just jump in, shall we? Uh, did I mention Katie writes this? I've never read it before. It's a cold read. Then Jen afterwards is going to edit it. She's going to add some music and some images and all of that good stuff. Uh, obviously, images if you're watching this show. It's also available as a podcast for your convenience. Long introduction out of the way. Let's go. Why did I print this so small? My printer has this thing of just wanting to print things at like 90% size, when really what I want is 110% size, like I printed for this one. Much better. I don't know why. It's going to be a nightmare. Um, anyway. Blonde, beautiful, and not as dumb as her public persona made her seem. I can be smart when it's important. But most men don't like it. Hollywood bombshell Marilyn Monroe was a legend in her own lifetime and still resonates as a cultural icon to this day, as famous for her love life as the acting roles she took. Her early death at the age of just 36 was front page news with plenty of references to suicide, pills, and an unhappy state of mind. While it is officially agreed that she took her own life intentionally or accidentally, okay, so she did kill herself, apparently. I didn't, allegedly. I didn't know that. There, I mean, I'm sure I did. I'm sure I did. Because I don't feel like, I, I feel like if it was like uh, uh, James Dean or whatever, he was killed in a car crash. Be like, that's quite famous. I guess Marilyn Monroe's death's quite famous. I just, I guess I'm just disappointed that I didn't know this. It'd be like one of those questions on who wants to be a millionaire, and they'd be like, for three hundred dollars, uh, how did Marilyn Monroe die? And I'd be like, God damn it, am I asking the audience on three hundred dollars? God damn it, back boy, come on. There are other threads that can be pulled that definitely put question marks over the whole event, and even point to cover-ups at the highest level like presidential while well, she did isn't that one of the things that wasn't she like rumored to have an affair with kennedy or something like that or like one of the kennedys or something i don't know it's just yeah it's a little bit of a blind spot in my knowledge i guess as you may have already guessed there will be references to suicide and murder throughout this piece so if that's something you'd prefer not to listen to please check out the variety of simon's other wares all right let's go yes that's what we call a trigger warning don't ever go at me if you're like simon this triggered suicide in me i'm like okay well now you know click off Go watch something else. I don't do these warnings typically on Casual Criminalist because it's like, yo, <laughs> it's true crime. Guys, why are you expecting? In it's just like Simon, uh, there was talk of murder. And I'm like, yeah, it's a true crime show. <laughs> Who was Marilyn Monroe? Oh, thank God we're getting some background. <laughs> pretend to know about stuff as we go through it. A little background first of all. Baby Norma Jean was born to Gladys Pearl Mortensen in 1926. Well, Marilyn Monroe is a lot of a better name than Norma Jean Mortensen. Norma Mortensen does not sound attractive in my mind. Someone called Norma Mortensen. They sound like a like someone who would shake a rolling pin at a child in a school kitchen. That's how I imagine Norma Mortensen, whereas Marilyn Monroe, that's a name. You may have heard her birth name given as Norma Jean Baker or Norma Jean Mortensen. Her mother was separated but not yet divorced from Edward Mortensen at the time of her birth and had previously been married to John Baker. It's never been confirmed that who Monroe's real father was, and it seems to be reflected in her various surname changes. As an adult, she legally changed her name to Marilyn Monroe after having used it as her stage name for a number of years. Monroe was her mother's maiden name, and Marilyn was suggested after the popular Broadway actress Marilyn Miller. Also, someone was like, yo, Norma, 
Mm-mm. Uh-uh. Not, no, no, no. Marilyn. Variously spending time in foster homes with family members and even in an orphanage, Monroe did have periods of living with her mother, but early years were overshadowed by Gladys, who was eventually diagnosed as having paranoid schizophrenia. Monroe also suffered sexual abuse at the hands of her stepfather at the age of about 10. Oh, sounds like <laughs> Whenever you read this, it's like, wait, is this casual criminalist? Is, uh, is she going to grow up and become a psycho? It's like, oh my God, the childhood abuse that leads to people becoming you know murderers and predators and all of this stuff is you know dark although marilyn monroe killed herself at 36 so again don't mess up your kids i have to have this script so close to my eyes because it's so small i wish i could be reading it like this but it would look ridiculous and possibly when she was younger and living with friends and foster families through it all she found escape in writing and going to see movies on the big screen as often as possible at the age of 16 she got married to avoid having to be put in an orphanage again when her mother and stepfather left the state of california bored and dissatisfied with her life she eventually began modeling and signed with an agency in 1945 at the age of 19 while her husband was away during the second world war after dying her hair that was naturally brown blonde monroe threw herself into modeling work appearing on the front cover of 30 magazines in the first year in 90 that is a career explosion from like being in foster homes and stuff to doing that that's like that's an upgraded life right there in 1946 monroe signed a contract with 20th century fox and started using the stage name marilyn monroe she also divorced her husband who was being kind of a drag and totally disapproved of everything she was doing and yes back then that mattered <laughs> nowadays it'd be like i don't want you modeling okay that's what you want that's not what i want F off <laughs> After a few bit parts and taking classes in an acting school, her contract with 20th Century Fox was not renewed as they didn't think she really had what it took to become a successful screen actor. She scored another contract in 1948 with Columbia Pictures after she used her, let's say, feminine wiles to persuade an executive at her old studio, Fox, to use his connections to get her an introduction. While she did manage to land a starring role in Ladies of the Chorus, it was not a big hit, and again, her contract was not renewed. Falling back on modeling again, it seems Monroe's real talent lay in knowing who and how to network. She became the mistress of the vice president of the biggest Hollywood talent agency at the time, which I think you'd agree is kind of a canny move. And it worked. She managed to make the jump from pretty model to serious actress with the small roles in The Asphalt Jungle and All About Eve, which in turn landed her a seven year contract back at 20. Century Fox. I feel like this is all well and good, but at some point, don't you have to know how to act? Because it's like, yeah, you could be the mistress of the person who's casting the movies and whatever, but it's like, if you suck at acting, at some point, they're going to be like, meh, meh. I mean, look, I don't know how you got these roles, but you shouldn't be acting. They're bad, and we don't want to pay you. Like, you, at some point, isn't that going to catch up with you? Was Marilyn Monroe a good actress? I don't even know. I want to admit I'm an actress, too. From then on, her star just rose and rose, although most film appearance, appearances played on her natural sex appeal and stereotyped her as a ditzy blonde. Monroe was able to show off a bit of acting range and a few dramatic performances over the years and had 33 acting credits attributed to her over the 15 years of her career. Unfortunately, though, behind the glossy facade of Hollywood lay a person with deep intrinsic with deep insecurities and an increasing dependence on drugs and alcohol. So, I guess to answer my question, no, she wasn't. We're kind of dancing around the fact that she wasn't very good at acting and she was just kind of typecast into the ditzy blonde role and was really good looking. I mean, I hate to shit on someone who's so famous and dead, but that's what we're dancing around, isn't it, Katie? A public personal life. It comes with the territory that famous people's lives are scrutinized by the masses, eager for gossip and schadenfreude. If only that troubled celebrity just met me, I would be able to take care of them much better than that stupid baseball player or pussycat doll ever could. Or am I just protecting them? Moving on, Marilyn Monroe's love life was obviously of great public interest, and to be honest, it deserved to be. While she wasn't backward in coming forward to advance her career, once an established star, Monroe's messy personal relationships continued to give the rumor mills plenty of grist. She dated around Hollywood, having short relationships with such big names as actors Yul Brynner and Marlon Brando, and director Elia Kazan. I only mention Kazan. Il Kazan, there's a, there's a pronunciation guide. Aaliyah Kazan, Co Kazan, Kazan, like Steve Zahn. Who the hell's Steve Zahn? How am I supposed to know this, Katie? 
To remind Simon of his rift with Danny on a Brain Blaze episode I randomly watched while procrastinating in the writing of this piece, it involved Kazan's motives for snitch. Oh, this dude! That the communists. Oh, I'm sorry, I know this is a different channel, but there was a whole big feud. I have another channel called Brain Blaze, and the writer on that channel sort of has a similar. do a similar sort of thing on that channel, but with a writer called Danny. And we had a big feud over whether there was some like communist blacklist and then the guy snitched on all his friends and i was like saying he didn't snitch for his career he snitched because he changed his ideology and danny was like no he's a and then i stopped reading danny's opinion because i thought it was wrong and now uh now he's brought up here that's why the name did seem vaguely familiar to me and that's why uh it involved kazan's motives for snitching on some communist colleagues but let's leave the red scare out of this one yeah let's <laughs> katie's gonna be like i agree with danny no i can't remember what that episode is but it was fun around 1952 she also started seeing newly retired baseball superstar dode maggio and they eventually got hitched in 1954 although the marriage lasted less than a year it seemed that as with her first husband joe didn't like too much attention on his wife and so iconic photos of marilyn standing over a subway grate in a white dress spelled the end for their relationship in 1956 monroe got married to arthur miller the playwright i i, I had no idea arthur miller and marilyn monroe were married and i know both of them uh and after having been involved i mean i don't know them obviously like that sounds like i know them we're friends no they're both dead a long time ago i mean i know of them of their work uh, and having been involved with him for a while and they had been originally introduced by simon's favorite director Elia kazan he's not my favorite director i just don't think he was the dead that danny in that script made him out to be what are you talking about it's your favorite unfortunately due to a combination of miscarriages ectopic pregnancies and increasing drug dependence on monroe's side and infidelities on miller's side at least the couple divorced in 1961. monroe then possibly had a brief th fling with frank sinatra although most of the time their relationship has been described as platonic as well as still being in touch with her second husband joe dimaggio this is also around the time that she had some encounters with then president john f kennedy there we go i thought so although it's believed that neither was looking for a serious relationship with the other the legendary tv appearance where she sang happy birthday to jfk that seemed to confirm to the entire world that they were actually bonking happened only a few months before her death in some creepy foreshadowing the presenter of the event introduces her as the late marilyn monroe this is a jab at a lack of timekeeping but it sounds just a bit off if you watch the video now especially when you know how little time she had left to live oh my god <laughs> that is like spooky after bouts of depression that left her hospitalized other illnesses and being sued for damages for apparently causing a film production to shut down monroe was also fired and attacked by her film studio fox which launched a smear campaign about her and trying to allege that she was mentally ill why do you care fox that's really petty i don't know like companies generally aren't petty they're just like okay uh we want our money back or you're fired and stuff like that and then it's like they proceed to not care because they're just a big company that have other stuff going on and they're not a real person someone at fox must have just been really bitter and petty someone powerful at fox it's like oh stop it they managed to patch this relationship up though and monroe accepted more film roles and took part in several photo shoots shortly before her death speaking of which the death of marilyn monroe in the very early hours of the 5th of august 1962 marilyn monroe was found dead in her bed having passed away the previous evening the cause was clear there were empty pill bottles everywhere and toxicology reports found huge levels of barbiturates in her blood and liver many times over the lethal limit she was naked which was usually how she slept and she was holding a telephone receiver in one hand newspapers ran headlines such as marilyn monroe found dead sleeping pill overdose blamed from the los angeles times and marilyn monroe dead pills near from the new york times the uk's daily mirror quoted the coroner its front page with the headline marilyn monroe it looks like suicide the world was shocked and saddened to see this bright light go out at the age of only 36. no suicide note was found an accidental overdose was deemed unlikely due to the sheer amount of drugs in her system on the death certificate the cause of death was given as possible suicide while the authorities more or less closed the book on the event conspiracy theories and cries of a cover-up sprang up almost immediately from the public journalists and friends of the deceased star so let's take a wander through the maze of reasons why marilyn monroe may not have killed herself and you may want to tell a friend where you're going before we start as there are many many twists along this road see this isn't one of those decoding the unknowns like the last one i recorded for this was like <laughs> and i really enjoyed it because it was just this deep exploration of essentially how an urban legend about that borehole to hell 
got started and i love like seeing how that came about but it was like from line one i'm like no 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 they didn't whereas with this i'm like i'm open to the idea that marilyn monroe could have been killed like, i'm definitely open to it i don't know anything about this i don't know much about it it does seem like prima facie she killed herself she had drugs and alcohol problems and there doesn't seem to be the police obviously i guess determines that she wasn't murdered but i know from my true crime podcast the casual criminalist that the police often don't get it right so i am absolutely going into this with an open mind and i'm willing to listen to the conspiracy theories and uh let's see how it goes by the end of it i'll see let's see where you go let's see what you think let's go there together evidence of foul play Of course, the sudden death of anyone, let alone a world-famous woman, is going to give rise to suspicions of foul play. And were there any surrounding the apparent suicide of Marilyn Monroe? Yes. While it's not possible to know how any one person is truly feeling at any time, friends and professional acquaintances of Monroe thought that suicide was far from her mind in August 1962, as she had concrete plans for the future. She had signed a new studio contract and was supposedly going to announce to the media that she was getting back together with Joe DiMaggio. Of course, it can only take one thing to send a person spiraling off track, especially if they have drug or alcohol problems and previous mental health issues like Monroe did. But in general, the event seemed to take her closest friends totally by surprise. The main tangible case against the suicide argument relates to the drugs she apparently took. While it was assumed that she took a whole bottle of pills, there was no evidence of the pills of the pill capsules in her stomach well that's super weird and also i do feel like yes one little thing can push a person to suicide certainly but i would not i don't know not an expert not a scientist not a statistician not a psychiatrist or whatever but i would imagine that most suicides there are signs there right like people close notice someone being distant or depressed or whatever and then there's a suicide rather than just a happy person seems to suddenly kill themselves that's got to be rarer right it's got to be more unusual this is strange as her death was discovered only a few hours after it happened and it's thought that for the level of drugs to be found in her system she would have needed to take over 30 pills another odd note here is that there was no glass or water bottle around most people would have needed some sort of liquid to neck that many pills she had an ensuite bathroom but the water wasn't working at the time meaning she couldn't have used the basin so how else could those barbiturates have gotten into her system there was a bruise found on the lower half of her body that some say is evidence of an injection site and that she was killed by a lethal dose of sedatives it's also been theorized that she was given a drug enema but the amount of barbiturates found in the liver compared to the blood was apparently too high to support this theory even though injecting them though that's really suspicious because there's going to be evidence of injection like that bruise and the little breaking of the skin so surely they could look at that and figure that out even the first police officer on the scene thought that the whole thing smelled a bit fishy. Homicide investigator Jack Clemens arrived at Monroe's home in the early morning of the 5th of August to find her housekeeper, Eunice Murray, washing the sheets from Monroe's bedroom. Was she getting rid of evidence to protect Marilyn from damaging rumors, or was she getting rid of evidence of a crime? Or did she really think that washing the sheets from around your very recently deceased boss at four in the morning is a sensible idea? Yes, I understand that shock and grief will cause people to act in all sorts of unpredictable ways, but this seems a little suspicious. No, it does. Like, I don't know, shock and stuff, it doesn't, like, it. obviously it affects you, but I don't think it affects you in the way of, like, let's clear up potential evidence. That's just a bit, I don't know, I cut a sort of slack, but it is a, it is a bit suspicious, isn't it? Also relating to the housekeeper, she started stated that she woke up in the night and checked on Monroe, but that her door had been locked. Fearing the worst, she contacted Monroe's personal doctor, but the first, but her first call was to Monroe's psychiatrist, Ralph Greenson, who broke into the bedroom from outside. This seems reasonable until you find out that apparently there was no lock on Marilyn Monroe's bedroom door. While it seems odd, Monroe had known to dislike locked doors. This could be for many reasons, but one that stands out would be her incarceration in a psychiatric hospital in 1961. Wait, how does that make sense? Did they just not try it? So that guy comes and he breaks down the door even though it's not locked, and then why would that? The housekeeper would know this. So why would she stumble into such an obvious lie it's definitely suspicious isn't it but then if you were if you had something to do with a murder 
You'd be like, yeah, but there's no door locks. You'd think about it more. I feel like you wouldn't make such an obvious blunder. Arranged by her psychiatrist, Dr. Marion Chris, Monroe thought that she was going to have a much-needed recuperative rest following her divorce from Arthur Miller and other mental health struggles. Instead, she was locked in a padded cell for four days. It would have been longer, but Joe DiMaggio found out what had happened and managed to get a release. So, yes, you might see why someone would start to distrust locked doors. After her death, multiple sources, including the housekeeper, later on confirmed that there was no lock on the bedroom door. Wait, so why would you say that she was locked in her room, housekeeper? The wife of the psychiatrist who broke into the room stated, uh, There was a bolt across the door, so it couldn't be opened from the outside. I looked some photos of the scene, which was never deemed a crime scene, where you could see the bedroom door and there's no obvious bolt. You can see the door frame clearly too, and there's no housing for a bolt to be slid into. Nothing was reported as being in front of the door on Monroe's side to prevent the housekeeper from entering. Why would anyone lie about this unless they were covering something up? I, I agree, it is super suspicious, but also it's like the worst lie ever. If you were covering something up, I really feel like you'd come up with a better lie. Also, be aware, if you find the same pictures, that, that they actually show the dead body of Marilyn Monroe, which I was really not expecting. There is a picture of her face with what looks like bruising around it, which led some people to believe that there'd been a struggle and that she had fought people, uh, fought people off before dying. It's also possible that it came from having lain face down for hours before being turned over to be taken out of the room. I got no idea. Not a medical professional over here, just throwing some ideas into the mix. There's lots of, there's plenty of suspicious stuff here, isn't there? I'm like, I, I don't know yet, obviously, because it's like, well, you don't know. This all could just be easily explained away somehow, I guess. But I mean, it's pretty suspicious. Other unsavory activity shortly after her death also aroused suspicion. Barely two days after she was found dead, her manager, Inez Melson, was seen leaving her home with shopping bags full of documents. What could these have related to? All right, you'd expect a manager to need to go through paperwork after the death of a client, but this was carried out in the immediate aftermath of Monroe's death while police were still interviewing eyewitnesses. What was so urgent that it needed to be removed from the house so quickly? If Eunice might... Well, I don't know. You don't want... Private documents and stuff that... With someone so famous, with someone so famous, the manager could reasonably think, well, these have absolutely nothing to do with a police investigation or a death, and I don't want these, like, how much she got paid for different movies or, like, private diaries, all of this sort of, like, personal stuff. I could see why a manager would want to remove that so the police don't rifle through it if it's got nothing to do with uh, the murder and then the police, you know, one person leaks it to the press or something. I can see that. I say, I say that. That seems reasonable. I'm okay with that. If Eunice Murray, the psychiatrist or doctor, were involved in some sort of murder for ill-gotten gains, they were out of luck. Monroe's will did not name them or her business manager in it. In fact, apart from a few cash sums and ongoing financial support for her mother, Monroe seems to have left all her personal effects and the majority of her estate to her acting coach, Lee Strasberg. The last 25% of her estate went to the psychiatrist who had locked her in the padded cell. Whoa. Okay. <laughs> Will was made in January 1961, and she was forcibly hospitalized later that same year. The doctor would definitely have been written out straight away if it was me, in fact. Well, maybe she went to the thing, and then after four days, she was like, no, I really needed that. I did need to be on these medications. I didn't like it at first, but now I appreciate it. Could be. Could be. In fact, I did see in one article that Monroe had an appointment to change her will the day after she was found dead. So maybe we could throw some suspicion Mary and Chris's way after all. If this is true, the timing does seem very convenient. Dr. Chris doesn't really appear as a main suspect in any of the sources I looked at, though, so let's just tuck that one away as a total rumor. Somewhat ironically, the main beneficiary from Monroe's will was someone that she may not have ever met. Lee Strasberg and his second wife Paula were huge influences in Monroe's life, so it's not weird that she left him so much of her will. Paula died not long after Monroe in 1966, and the following year, Strasberg remarried. His third wife, Anna Mizrahi, inherited his share of the estate after his death in 1982 and promptly milked it for all that it was worth. She won rights to Monroe's image and likeness and earned huge amounts of money from licensing deals to stick Monroe's image onto practically any product that you can think of. Apparently some kind of evil legal genius. She also managed to sue the relatives of Monroe's manager, Inez Melson, who had some of Monroe's personal items in their possession after they were gifted to Melson. Mizrahi didn't want to hold them for herself, however, she sold them at auction for over $13 million. Oh my god, this woman did incredibly well out of this. Overall, she's made many times more money off Monroe's image than Marilyn Monroe ever did. So, this person is the what the second wife of her acting coach, who she never met. <laughs> oh my god. 
we can discount her as part of a murder plot however as unless she was playing the really long game she wasn't on the scene until the early 1960s Remember how Monroe's death was declared a probable suicide? Well, the deputy coroner who signed the statement later said that it had been under duress. While he converted to Islam in the 1970s and changed his name, he was known as Lionel Granderson at the time of Monroe's death. After having signed off on our death certificate, he was apparently charged with a spurious crime and made to resign. Wanting to clear his name and trying to get to the bottom of the whole affair, Granderson did some investigating of his own, which went a long way to getting the case reopened in 1982. While criminal involvement was once again written off as the cause of Monroe's overdose and the case was closed in 1985, it did at least bring public attention to the event. In an article in the Chicago Tribune in August 1982, Granderson said, The whole thing was organized to hide the truth. An original autopsy file vanished, a scrawled note that Marilyn Monroe wrote, and which did not speak of suicide, also vanished and so did the first police report. I was told to sign the official report or I'd find myself in a position that I couldn't get out of. He also alleges in his book that he wrote called Memoirs of a Deputy Coroner, the case of Marilyn Monroe, that Monroe had a little red diary which was nowhere to be found after she died. And speaking of notes, Monroe had made or had thought about making suicide attempts before and had always left a note which gave insight into her state of mind at the time. If she killed herself with the overdose this time, it would have been a take it would have taken a concerted effort to take all those pills, meaning that she might well have written a note at some point, although this of course is speculation. This is suspicious, yes, but uh, I'm always a bit suspect when it's just one person who is coming forth with this story especially when they have a financial incentive like uh maybe a book deal perhaps it's always like mm, okay well we can't really trust you thomas nogichi the deputy medical examiner who performed monroe's autopsy in 1962 is also mentioned in the chicago tribune article now 20 years on the paper pointedly mentions that he holds the same position as he did in 1962. this misses out a lot of his career history including top promotions resignations and demotions for various reasons but this man became known perhaps a little grimly as the coroner to the stars having autopsied sharon tate janis joplin and robert f kennedy among many others his findings were not always reliable however and his successor overturned his verdict of accidental drowning in the case of natalie wood to that of drowning and other undetermined factors shortly after taking over the role so he's going through old files and stuff right that's like <laughs> i guess i didn't realize they did that going back to the first investigator on the scene jack clemens he thought right from the start that the whole scene looked staged the police were not immediately called to the house so there would have been time for some rearranging or evidence planting and or removing to have taken place in fact in the same article from the chicago tribune in 1982 clemens is directly quoted as saying she was murdered by needle injection by someone she knew and probably trusted whoa that is a statement this was the cover-up crime of the century this was the first cop on the scene the first investigator that's mad uh the cover-up of the century a matter of the los angeles police department and other officials here protecting a famous political family of the east who had good reason to shut monroe's mouth whoa oh unless you're writing that in a book that you're later trying to sell that's fairly intense wow clemens pulling absolutely no punches there he's more or less naming names and we all know to whom he's referring it's the kennedys right if you don't don't worry all will be revealed in the next section which is coming up right now the main suspects so if it wasn't suicide it was murder and who might have committed well it could have been accidental death to be fair uh and who might have committed it let's go through the list of suspects because yes there are multiple parties who have been under suspicion over the years the kennedys oh, well there we go yes easy good big brain ah let's start with the big boys yes this theory literally goes all the way to the top the political family of the east that that police investigator jack clemens reference were none other than the political powerhouses and strangely unlucky kennedys well i'm assuming that's who he meant anyway he didn't explicitly name names so if it turns out he meant a different family i missed out the top suspects altogether but i'm pretty sure that's who he meant yeah i mean even i who know nothing about this jumped to the fact that it's the kennedys and he's just not using their name because he's like don't sue me <laughs> it's like yeah the big political family plausible deniability wasn't talking about the kennedys i was talking about i don't know someone else i guess <laughs> 
And why would anyone suspect beloved and tragically short-lived John F. Kennedy, who was the President of the United States at the time, of anything so nefarious as offing a troubled film star? Well, let's get into it. As mentioned earlier, Monroe did have some sort of an affair or relationship with President John F. Kennedy. While neither admitted to anything at the time, numerous researchers in the years have since found instances where they were in the same place at the same time and concluded that they did spend the night together at least once. And yeah, singing happy birthday directly to JFK on national TV in a dress that basically made her look naked didn't exactly give off a we're just friends honest vibe. There is a backstage photo of Monroe with JFK at this event, which is apparently the only image of the two together in existence. JFK's brother, Robert, who was the United States Attorney General in 1962, is also in the photo, and Monroe is rumored to have been having an affair with him. In fact, it was more or less confirmed by other members of the Kennedy family. For example, in this extract from a note sent to Monroe from JFK and RFK's younger sister, Jean. Understand that you and Bobby are the new item. We all think you should come with him when he comes back east. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, that is that is confirmation. Ah, <clears throat> the new item. This sounds like there was something going on to me. Critics of this theory say people are reading it out of context. So, for the sake of argument, let's read the whole note to get the full context. I get the feeling this is not gonna. <laughs> it's just gonna. It's going to confirm it, right? Dear Marilyn, Mother asked me to write you and thank you for your sweet note to Daddy. He really enjoyed it, and you were very cute to send it. Understand that you and Bobby are the new item. We all think you should come with him when he comes back east. Thanks again for the note. Love, Jean Smith. That doesn't add anything either way. It just seems to be the... Yeah. Ah, uh, that's the same. There's not really much other context to read out of it. Saying that, though, Jean Kennedy Smith herself totally disavowed the potential scandal in this note when it was put up for auction in 1994. She said, The suggestion that this letter verifies an affair is utter nonsense. I'm shocked anyone would believe such innuendo about a letter obviously written in jest. <laughs> yeah, obviously. What a hilarious joke, Jean. What a hilarious joke. Uh, yeah, obviously. So much jest apparent in said letter. Well, she would say that, wouldn't she? Yeah, I mean, it's like a weak excuse to get out of something that you wrote that harms a dead person's reputation, doesn't it? It's, uh, I don't know, it doesn't... <laughs> just doesn't seem like a joke at all, does it? Marilyn Monroe also wrote letters to her stepson and father-in-law, Arthur Miller's dad, about meeting Robert Kennedy for the first time, which again, critics say don't point to any romantic feelings, but excuse me, you're not going to go on about fancying someone to your stepson or father-in-law, are you? Read between the lines, it's not that difficult. In fact, the mentions of how great a civil rights program are seem pretty shoehorned in to distract from the mentions she also makes of his wonderful sense of humor and being mature and brilliant. Find a letter written to a female friends and i can guarantee the civil rights program won't get a look in yeah uh okay i <laughs> yeah so yes the pair were widely believed to be seeing each other at the time it was it has been rumored too that robert kennedy was in la monroe's hometown the night of her death but this has been a bit hard to verify either way the diary that the deputy coroner said was missing contained detailed information about the affairs and also sensitive political things that monroe either overheard or were directly spilled to her by one or both brothers while the short-lived thing with jfk was apparently no big deal for either party she may have been more smitten with robert so with the end of their relationship possibly caused her to retaliate by exposing the information he'd given her or by confirming the details of their affair. Robert was married with at least seven children by 1962, bloody hell. And as Attorney General, he had a great deal to lose with embarrassing revelations of this kind. Yeah, there's a great deal to lose, but I mean, also, is it enough to have someone killed? That's a big jump. So, did JFK or RFK use any of the means at their disposal to get rid of the potentially problematic Monroe? It's definitely not impossible. Yeah, it's not, of course it's not impossible. It just doesn't, I mean, to have someone killed, maybe I've just got way too much faith in people. But I'm like, that's a big old step especially someone so famous the whole reason this death has been poured over so much is that things do smell of a cover-up and when no satisfactory answers are given it just makes it stink even more monroe was found with a phone in her hands where she tried to call for help it seems that the last call she did make was to someone else close to the kennedy camp actor peter lawford he was married to patricia kennedy another sister of jfk and rfk at the time of monroe's death he later confessed to a different wife he had four in the end that monroe had called him distraught over a love affair with robert kennedy that's suspicious that's pretty i mean it doesn't mean that he kills her 
does it it kind of in a way like she's distraught over this love affair with robert kennedy that kind of pushes it towards maybe she was suicidal rather than like robert kennedy had her killed which i mean i don't know i'm not really buying that yet maybe i i don't know just i don't know seems a little bit of a stretch According to his third wife, to whom he confessed all this stuff allegedly, he had advised Monroe not to leave an incriminating note behind. I mean, if your pals grew up on the verge of killing themselves, is this the best thing you could say? It's like, look, 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 if you're going to kill yourself, they don't leave a note and don't mention me. <laughs> More like, why don't you uh, not do that? Why don't you not do that? Why don't we talk? Why, uh, let me call an ambulance. Come on, Peter. Come on, Peter. But it gets worse. Still, according to his ex-wife, he then went round to Monroe's house and destroyed the note that she had apparently written. Was this the missing note that the deputy coroner mentioned in the Chicago Tribune article? Was Lawford being leaned on by the Kennedys to take care of business? Why would they leave something like this to a mediocre actor? This does all seem a bit far-fetched, and Lawford denied it all shortly before his death, even saying that it'd take a lie detector test to prove his innocence. Yeah, okay, I'm, I'm like, this is way out there. This is way out there. When he was given the chance to do just that, however, he declined to take it. Oh, okay. <laughs> Wait, they were like, okay. And he's like, Shit. I didn't think you'd say yes. This third wife, Deborah Gould, doesn't seem to have much skin in the game of whether Monroe was murdered or not. So why did she suddenly come up with a story that was used in a book called Goddess, The Secret Lives of Marilyn Monroe by Anthony Summers? I don't know. I'm, again, I'm always suspicious with this sort of stuff, but she doesn't stand to make any money from that. But then maybe Anthony Summers is like, yo, 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 you make it juicy. This book's going to do well. I'm just saying I'm going to make money from a book that does well. And now we're just wildly speculating. But whenever books and exposed books and all of this stuff come up, I'm always like super skeptical because it's like that person's making money off a scandal. And if the scandal is more juicy, obviously the book's going to sell better. And it's not just a possibly disgruntled third wife of the former actor who ties Lawford into the story. Fred Otash, a notorious Hollywood private eye, also confirms that Lawford called him hours before the police were notified, saying that Monroe was dead, Robert Kennedy had been there earlier, and that he'd removed incriminating evidence from the house. He then asked Otash to go and do another sweep, as he was in such a state that he could have easily missed something. Oh my god, this is like, okay. I mean, there's definitely some cover-up, right? I, I don't know if she was murdered or who murdered her, but there's tons of suspicious stuff here. It's like the JFK assassination thing. It's like, well, we don't really know what happened, but there's a there's a super there's a like with the moon landing stuff. That conspiracy theory is like, no, there's nothing really suspicious, and anything that is suspicious is easily discounted. With the JFK assassination, it's like there's some really sketchy stuff there. I don't know what the answer is, but something's up with that, right? And there's something up with this. The police were already there by the time Otash had arranged for someone to go to the house, however, so they couldn't get involved any further. According to Otash, Lawford had, sol had told him Monroe was in distress about her relationship with Robert Kennedy and wanted to know if he would marry her. On her last call, she apparently talked about trying to get a hold of the president, but hadn't been able to, and to tell him goodbye. Lawford's fourth and last wife confirms that he had used Otash's services several times over the years, so Otash's story does seem credible. Before we get to carried away, though, I'll just insert police officer Jack Clemens back in here. In what was a bit of a sticking point for the murder theory, Clemens's credibility as a witness takes a bit of a knock when you find out that he was indeed indicted for libel after claiming a senator and civil rights supporter had been arrested for homosexual acts. This was the 1960s, remember. Clemens resigns rather than face the charges, so anything he said about the whole thing might not be worth the paper it was later written on. Okay. That's exactly what I'm saying. Like, as soon as there's some sort of financial incentive to make something more salacious than it really is, if you're writing a book, well, there we go. Wait, he's not writing a book. He's just... Sorry, I'm confusing him with the, the guy who was writing the book famous previously. Clemens is the investigator. And so he's just... Uh, incompetent or what? Just jumping to accusations? He did seem to have a thing against supporters of civil rights in general, so would have been very anti-Kennedys. Maybe he alluded to the Kennedys' involvement just to be a complete dickhead. Weirder things have happened. What we really need to know, though, is whether Monroe killed herself and the Kennedys were scrambling to erase their presence in the situation, or whether it was they themselves who arranged to have her killed, or maybe they had nothing to do with it and these fringe players are just making it all up between them. I should probably end this section now before the Secret Service starts in investigating me <laughs> yes let's do that um uh, but you have to admit that this conspiracy theory definitely has legs yeah it does i mean i don't know it, it's much 
it's much easier to say there is something fishy going on than it is to say this is the fishy thing that's happened it's like okay yeah this is really suspect but i don't think there's definitely not enough evidence or not enough going on there to be like yeah yeah, yeah it was them i think that is definitely jumping to a conclusion um or a theory or whatever but i think it's like yeah something happened something was covered up i would say like maybe around the suicide like if there was a right now i'm thinking okay so maybe it was a suicide and then it was tidied up a bit for whatever reason although the injection thing that's weird the psychiatrist and the housekeeper here's a weird little tangent many worlds ago uh words ago sorry not worlds although that phrase i guess also works we talked about the housekeeper eunice murray and how she called monroe's psychiatrist dr ralph greenson before she called a doctor or the emergency services or anybody else who might possibly be useful in a situation like this how useful an emergency service is going to be she's clearly dead uh or a doctor um <laughs> yeah well she's dead isn't she so yes obviously that's the right person to call but if you're like marilyn monroe's housekeeper she's super famous maybe it would be like i'm just going to phone i don't know if i'd call her psychiatrist but i'd call like her manager or something and be like yo i know i should have probably called the police but i'm calling you so you could call the police and do it properly because i'm just the housekeeper and i don't want anything to do with this um check it out thank you i don't feel that this is super unreasonable why would her first call be to greenson although that is weird like the psychiatrist maybe she's just the one he knew, she the one that she knew best rather than the manager or whatever maybe she thought monroe wasn't dead but needed psychiatric support <laughs> as she stated she couldn't get any response out of monroe wouldn't call wouldn't call to a doctor or emergency services be higher up on most people's lists i guess it depends on how obviously dead she is if like you go over and she's cold <laughs> and like her eyes are open and all this stuff i haven't looked at those dead pictures i don't want to um then i'd be like well she's dead isn't she so it doesn't matter who i call we're not in a rush two weeks after monroe died eunice murray took a long european vacation with some pointing out that this was a pretty convenient way of keeping her out of the picture as she seemed to have trouble sticking to one story over the years she has added and changed things to her original statement including that robert kennedy had been there on monroe's last night and that monroe had still been alive when the doctor was called these differences are so far removed from her original story that you either have to conclude that she was involved in some sort of cover-up or just disregard everything she ever said monroe's publicist also took a trip abroad shortly after a class death and uh, she went on to work for robert kennedy not to make any accusations but that's a pretty safe place to put her if she was privy to any potentially damaging information yeah it's just more adding to the there's loads and loads of it's like the kennedy assassination there's loads and loads of really suspicious around it and it just seems like that's exactly the same thing that's going on here we can't really point the finger at anyone like reliably but we can also be like well i don't know it doesn't seem it's it, there's a lot of suspicious stuff isn't there i'm rarely convinced on these uh decoding the unknowns because normally i'm like nah, it's not aliens but this one i don't know I, i'm kind of into this i also saw multiple theories that the psychiatrist greenson was obsessed with marilyn monroe and had planted or used eunice murray as a mole to spy on her and report back on everything she was doing if this was the case it would explain why her first call was to him well that's extremely unethical <laughs> i don't think that's psychiatrists shouldn't be doing that that's going to be against some sort of code right like ethical code mario self confirmed that greenson recommended her to monroe and that it and it turns out that he was living about a mile away in what was originally murray's house wait so the psychiatrist was recommended had come right oh, this is getting complicated huh the psych the, the housekeeper recommended a psychiatrist to monroe and then the psychiatrist moved into the housekeeper's old house i mean okay I guess I had things differently in my mind that they'd be in different economic and social positions. I guess I <laughs> snobby Simon. I guess so I was like, I don't know if I'd go to. I don't have a housekeeper, but if I did, I'm not sure they're the person I'd ask for recommendations of a psychiatrist. Would I? I don't know. I guess maybe. I guess I'm just being really snobby. That's a bit. Yeah. Uh, I, I guess. Okay. <laughs> Let's just move on. But then he lives in our house. Which is also weird because i just assumed that the psychiatrist marilyn monroe makes more than a housekeeper so we live in a bigger house uh i don't know is that just an unreasonable classist sort of assumption 
Uh, let's just move on. It also seems to be true that Murray had booked this holiday and let Monroe know that she would be away for a month. Monroe told her not to come back after the break, in essence, firing her. Holy sh- would that give Murray some sort of reason to harm the star? While her behavior was a bit odd surrounding the night of Monroe's death, it seems unlikely that Murray or Greenson murdered the actress. There is a theory, though, that states that maybe they were accidentally the cause of her death. Because Monroe was known to abuse drugs, there was a system in place and that both her doctor and psychiatrist needed to confirm with each other exactly what was being prescribed. She may have got around this... <laughs> yes, obviously. Wait, is that some unusual thing? Of course, your doctor and psychiatrist should be talking to each other about what they're prescribing you. How about the regular doctor doesn't prescribe psychiatric medication, and the psychiatrist doesn't prescribe regular doctor medication, and then we'll all know we're on the same page? Is this not a normal thing that goes on in medicine? Because it bloody should be. Especially now we've got computers and stuff. That should be look upable. I know there's obviously doctor patient confidentiality, but if it's they're both your doctors, they should be able to look at that thing. Shouldn't they? That seems like sensible. And if they tell anyone well, then they'll be punished. She may have got around this somehow, either by lying to her doctors or possibly even having been given drugs by the Kennedys or Lawford to keep her quiet. Also, also, she's a celebrity with loads of money. How's that Nickelback song go where they've got drug dealers on speed dial? I'm just saying, it's not going to be very difficult for Marilyn Monroe to get drugs. (laughs) Even prescription drugs. Of course you can. It's not difficult. When she was found unresponsive, neither man knew what or how much she had taken. It's possible that they tried to administer something via injection or enema to counteract the drugs, but but because they didn't realize what she'd taken, it ended up killing her. This would then explain why Eunice Murray was washing sheets at 4am, if indeed she was at all. Clemens didn't mention this in the original 1962 report and only added in much later. Anything which is added in much later to replace reports or a special eyewitness testimony or anything, I'm so up for just discounting that, because eyewitness testimony is extremely unreliable eyewitness testimony that is barely remembered from years before is just like that's just a joke we can't have that we got to ignore that altogether and i'm a mate there's various countries around the world that have considered just getting rid of eyewitness testimony altogether as a reliable thing because it's just not that reliable which is crazy because it's like i saw it and it's like yeah yeah i don't know how to tell you this but your memory isn't as good as you think crazy uh, have I mentioned this before? There's a great experiment. I've probably mentioned this before. Sorry, so sorry for repeating this story. And it's a half-remembered story at that. There was a like a researcher who showed a bunch of people a photograph of like, it was, you know, some people doing some activities or whatever. And he said, look at everything in the photograph and memorize it. And then every year he asked them, he got them together and said, can you tell me what was in the photograph? And they'd tell him what was in the photograph. And, oh, sorry, I should have said the photograph was sealed in an envelope. And then every year he'd call them back and tell them what's in, you know, what was in the photograph without opening the envelope, without showing them the photo. After like 20 years or whatever, he brought them back, you know, having every year asked them to describe what was in the photo. And he's like, okay, describe what was in the photo. They describe what was in the photo. They open the envelope, take out the original photo. And like, everyone's like, no, it's a different photo. It's a different photo. It is. You've cheated somehow. And he hadn't cheated. It's just over time and every retelling, the memory's got more and more distorted. Because when you remember a memory, you're not actually remembering the memory. You're remembering the last time that you remembered the memory. Which is crazy. So your memories of of things that you don't think about often, like if someone like from your childhood and you are reminiscing and you for the first time in a long time remember something that uh, they bring up, then that memory is very accurate, that or more likely to be accurate. Whereas something that you go back on all the time and remember and remember and remember again, that's likely to be very inaccurate. Which is, I don't know, it's kind of crazy, isn't it? As we've already established that his credibility is a bit suspect, this may not have actually happened. But anyway, back to the psychiatrist and the doctor royally messing up. Not wanting to cop to accidentally killing one of the most famous faces on the planet, the scene was hastily staged as a suicide. Convincing? I don't know. Everything seems convincing to me as soon as I hear it. So let's try another one. The Mafia Not content with prodding the hornet's nest of the political dynasty, let's dive into the murky mafia goings on in the 90, in 1960s USA. I feel like, I don't know, I'm very hesitant to talk about like current day scary people, but when it's like back in the 1960s, I'm like, well, most of these people are dead or, you know, it's it's long, long past history and what, <laughs> all of their crime, no one's prosecuted crimes from like the 1960s unless you're like the Golden State Killer or something. <laughs> 
Uh, so let's delve into mafia goings on in the 60s. You might, but you might spot some familiar faces along the way. Hint, hint. I know who it's going to be. It's going to be the Kennedys. It's the Kennedys. Chicago moss boss Sam Giancana, uh, who had shot who had shot to gang Len Frame when he started working for Al Capone in the 1920s, was a well-known face to both Monroe and the Kennedys. Rejected from the draft for World War II on the grounds of being a constitutional psychopath. Giacana got on and then brutally took over a network of illegal gambling rackets within Chicago's black communities. Loaded with money and becoming top dog after Capone's death, Giancana, not sure if I'm pronouncing that right, sorry, uh, started hanging out with other famous rich men such as singer and friend of Marilyn Monroe, Frank Sinatra. It was through Sinatra that five uh, that Sam. <laughs> I was going to say five a.m. <laughs> the script is so small, I can barely read it. It's all my fault. It was through. Also, what's well, not my fault? Katie has a passion for extremely long paragraphs. So it's like, where was I? Oh God. <laughs> It was through Sinatra that Sam Giancana eventually became pally with none other than JFK. It has been alleged on many occasions that the Chicago mob helped JFK to win the 1960 presidential election, but that's far from conclusive, with other sides saying the mob support contributed little, if anything, to the overall number of total votes. Yeah, I mean, like, mob power, sure. In, like, Chicago or whatever, maybe it's going to wield some influence in certain parts of Chicago. When you're talking, like, a general presidential election of the whole country... So, uh, I mean, I don't want to say that the mob's not powerful, but is that, is that really? I mean, I'm pretty skeptical of that. Whatever the case, JFK and Giancana did definitely know each other, and what's more, Giancana was rumored to be sleeping with Marilyn Monroe, too. In fact, sources close to Monroe, such as her personal hairdresser, claim that Monroe was with Giancana in a lodge owned by Frank Sinatra on the night of her death. How the other half live, hmm? After maybe having brought JFK to power, <laughs> Giancana is also pegged as having been behind his assassination. He was apparently infuriated by the Kennedys' broken promises to turn a blind eye to his activities. But that sounds like a whole different episode. It does indeed. <laughs> Scary episode where I'll get killed by the mob. Anyway, stories of mafia involvement in Monroe's death come courtesy of Giancana's rage against one or both Kennedys. When Robert Kennedy became attorney general, he cracked down on organized crime, which chafed Giancana something rotten. The theory goes that to get back at him, Giancana decided to ruin RFK's reputation by outing his relationship with Monroe. Her home was bugged, but in the end they decided that murder was the easiest route to go. A few mafia hitmen broke into Monroe's home, subdued her, and administered a fatal dose of drugs via enema, leaving no obvious trace of how they got up, how they got there. Nah, eh, this is like the least likely one so far. I'm like even more leading on the Kennedys other than this like mafia story. It just feels like a story. In case you're wondering all this time, yes, an enema is something when something is squirted up your bum. I wasn't wondering, I definitely knew that. <laughs> I've never had one. I'm just familiar with what an enema is. <laughs> one of the drugs used was chloral hydrate, which, according to Wendy Lee's book, The Secret Letters, was the favorite chemical weapon of the mafia at the time. So, how valid is this claim? Uh, uh well, immediately, someone's trying to sell a book. A uh, hit would explain the bruises on Monroe's face, as well as the lack of pill casings in her stomach. So, as you flip the situation over, it's also been alleged that RFK ordered the mafia hits on Monroe to get rid of a politically devastating situation. She had had a relationship with mod boss Giancana, so it seemed a bit harsh of him to have her murdered either on the word of or to get back at Kennedy. Then, but then, what else would you expect from a diagnosed constitutional psychopath? Um, yeah, again, this is this is a stretch, isn't it? This is a bit of a stretch. The UFO Brigade. Oh, here we go. We really started most likely and then worked our way down right into the dregs, didn't we, Katie? What? We're really going to cram a bit of alien activity in right here at the end? You bet your bottom dollar we are. And guess who makes another guest appearance? Hello. Hello. Did you say the Kennedys? Well, you're absolutely right. According to a quote-unquote documentary about cover-ups concerning aliens calling called unacknowledged disclaimer i've not actually watched the documentary <laughs> don't blame you there katie uh, monroe had become privy to some very sensitive and classified information regarding roswell and things that yes president jfk had witnessed she'd come by this info in, in intimate talks with the president so it would really be doubly embarrassing for him if she were to tell the world apparently these things were sensitive enough that once she threatened to reveal all she was hushed up by the cia and i mean in a permanent way like they killed her <laughs> I mean, look, the CIA has got up to all sorts of crazy adventures, and I'm sure they're up to all sorts of crazy adventures today that we're going to learn about in a few decades. But no. <laughs> Just think what would have happened if an actress uh, known for being mentally fragile suddenly started making media statements about aliens. 
Well, no one would believe her. I don't think the whole alleged cover-up would be exposed. I think she'd find herself in a padded cell once again, and the movie contracts would dry up pretty fast. So while it is a theory as to a possible reason for murder, it's not exactly the most compelling. It is not compelling at all. In any way. <laughs> so, it was su- so was it suicide, accidental suicide, accidental murder, or straight-up cold-blooded murder? Personally, the one I feel that can be discounted is accidental suicide. It's not really possible to take 30 or 40 pills without being aware of the consequences. As to the others, a lot of roads seem to lead to the Kennedys, and there seems to be more than enough odd things about the original investigation to point to some sort of foul play. But seeing as the case isn't likely to be reopened, we'll all just have to continue to speculate on what really happened to Marilyn Monroe. Yeah. I'm pretty much of the same opinion as Katie on this one. Yo, um, something suspect is definitely up. Do I know what that suspect thing is? Absolutely not. Can I point fingers at anyone? Not really. But it's like something more is going on there. I keep relating it to the other Kennedy, the JFK assassination. It's like something's up. It's weird. There's lots of weird stuff there. There's lots of weird stuff with this one. This has been an episode of Decoding the Unknown. Thank you so much for listening, or if you're watching on YouTube, thank you for that. If you're watching, like button, subscribe. If you're on a podcast, leave a review. That would be fantastic. It helps get this show get this show in front of more people, which is wonderful. Five stars preferred, of course. Although, be honest, if you're like, that's a bit of a two-star, isn't it? This guy keeps waffling. He's got long introductions. He doesn't believe in aliens. Ah, go ahead. That's fine. It just hurts my feelings. Uh, <laughs> uh, what else? That's it. Shilling done. Thank you for watching.